Summary Our Earth and Solar System were created 78 trillion years ago. As soon as the Earth was ready, 144,000 ancestors came from another star system, the star called Sirius that was worshipped by the ancient Egyptians. They inhabited the Earth after preparing it by seeding it with plant and animal life. After about 7,000 years since their arrival, their population increased from 144,000 to 1 billion 8 million, 1 B8M. This number, 1 B8M, is the most sacred number in creation. It is the total number of original people who inhabited the first Earth of our universe countless trillions of years ago. Thus every Earth inhabited thereafter keeps this number as their final and stable population. It was determined to be the ideal number of people that can inhabit a planet the size of Earth in complete comfort, without imposing on each other or on the natural resources, as well as on the animals and plants. That enables complete freedom of movement for all life on the planet, and this is essential for peace, prosperity, and spiritual growth, the gaining of knowledge. The reason why the number is specifically 1B8M is described in the mathematics section of Black Root Science. The first Earth mentioned above was created by the B8M original gods from the stars of the previous universe. They had existed in that previous universe, toward its end, along with trillions upon countless trillions of other people, in a state of mind called divine unity, or the oneness of God. It is a state of mind where all the people in the universe unite as one. This one is God in truth, not the spirit God of modern religions. When the trillions upon trillions of people at the end of the previous universe were united as one, they experienced an indescribable expansion of their minds, which were as one mind. It expanded to such an extent that it not only circumscribed their entire universe, but exceeded its boundaries by an immeasurable extent. The one mind, or God, became so large that the previous universe could no longer contain him, her. He, she felt a need for a larger universe in which the experience of life would continue. The trillions upon trillions of people, still united as one, then decided to abandon that universe. They consciously left their perfected bodies and rose and mind far above the universe. They then looked down on it and saw it as a small sphere, the way our earth looks when seen from high above in space. Now, the mind is always attached to the body. There is no such thing as a mind without a body, as so-called spiritualists would like us to believe. The mind can extend beyond the outer reaches of space, even expand infinitely, but a magnetic attraction always attaches it to the physical body. The magnetic attraction dissipates at death, and the mind and individual personality, or soul, then ascends. I will discuss ascension at a later time. 7. The unified mind of the people, who were as one person, was so immense that the stars appeared to be the size of atoms. As this person was contemplating the universal sphere, he, she saw that it was adequate for habitation as a new earth, with all the stars being its atoms. He, she made one billion eight million new bodies corresponding to the size of the new earth, using some of its substance, the stars slash atoms. Then he, she disconnected the magnetic connection to the old bodies and left them in the old universe. The 1B8M gods then descended upon the new earth into the new bodies and became the first inhabitants. The matter of every star and planet in the universe is created in seven forms. In modern words these are magnetism, electricity, light, ether, gases, liquids, and solids. The fourth substance, ether, is the central supporting substance of the other six. It is the womb of creation called space. It is black in color, as one can see by looking out into space at night. This absolute blackness called space not only supports the other substances, but it also gives individual color to all objects because the color black contains all other colors in itself. Hence when the B8M original gods made themselves new bodies, they covered them in skin whose color is black, getting it directly from the ether. Because the gods create all plants and animals from their own bodies, they need to have all colors stored in a single color in their creative germ, which is called the dark dominant germ or gene, the source of what modern people call melanin. Upon arriving on the first earth, the one mind of God incarnated instantly in one B8M bodies, as already said. Half of them, 504 million, were female and the other half were male. 
Each pair of male slash female gods are called soul mates. They always create in soul mate pairs, even when in large groups. Because all creation has a male slash female or negative slash positive principle, negative is not used in a derogatory sense, but as the complement of positive. The B8M original people then proceeded to instantly create perfect plants and animals, called the original totems, from which all evolutionary life forms evolved. They also proceeded to create new stars and planets around the first earth by condensing part of their expanded mind. After living on that first earth for more than a trillion years, they finalized the plans for the completion of a new, much larger universe. They then gave birth to their descendants, and then passed out of life, ascended. Before passing, they established the Society of the Black Nation. They established it by withdrawing from or leaving their divine unity, in which they had existed for over a trillion years. They did this in order to be able to bring new life into the world, new persons who had never existed before, such as you and me. At the same time, in order to ensure the continuity of eternity, these same B8M original gods continue to incarnate in the new people. They reside in the unconscious part of the person's mind and are called the mind of God, or the divine gift of ancestral memory, or what modern people call the spirit of God. Thus every black person, even though he or she is born brand new, is simultaneously one of the B8M original gods. Only the personality is new. The spirit is old, even eternal. The B8M original people all withdrew from the divine unity except 24 people, 12 men and 12 women. They became the kings and queens called the 24 elders, who are really 12 gods or 12 soulmate couples. The 24 elders are called the custodians of divine unity. The 12 gods chose 12 assistants each and called them the 144 chiefs. The gods divided the population into 12 tribes of 84 million people. They further divided each tribe into six clans and set two chiefs, a man and a woman, as the heads of each clan. The chiefs chose 1,000 people each and called them the 144,000 judges. They sent them in soulmate pairs all over the earth to set the foundations for 72,000 cities. Each couple took about 14,000 people with them to establish their city. This was the basic organization of the black nation established by the original gods on the first earth. When other earths were completed and settlers sent to them, this organization was repeated and remains as the divine form of kingdom slash queendom on every inhabited earth throughout the universe. The original gods also established seven great rituals of initiation to be used by the leaders to elevate all new people to divine unity. God's purpose for creating universe after universe is to increase himself slash herself. Every person who completes the seven great rituals becomes full God, exactly like the original people. At that moment of completion, God rediscovers himself slash herself anew, as if he, she had never existed before. That is how God renews himself slash herself, thus overcoming the stagnancy that would be the case in an eternally all-knowing being who never changes. In addition to the seven great rituals, the original people also established many other rituals and customs covering every area of science and life. They then initiated the leaders of their descendants into this knowledge before passing. Their initiation rituals have been faithfully transmitted from generation to generation since the beginning. On our earth, this form of divine rule existed uninterrupted for 78 trillion years, until 6,000 years ago, when a certain god decided it was time for all the other gods, you and me, to experience that part of us contained in what is called the non-creative recessive light germ. He caused the birth of new races of people, the non-blacks, who would be the vehicles to manifest all that is in that gene. All things, without exception, are contained in God. God will experience all that is contained in him, her. He, she knows all, but has not experienced all. He, she uses the creation for this purpose of experiencing all that is known, including what is called evil. Hence 6,000 years ago, a god by the name of Yahweh, called Yakub in other ancient scripts, was born here on our earth. He together with about 60,000 volunteers who are called the Elohim made the non-blacks in our image. 
They made them by suppressing the dominant black gene and slowly unfolding the recessive light gene over a period of seven generations of offspring, or 200 years. This caused the appearance of the first light race, born to black people. After another 200 years of deliberate and careful breeding, they caused the second light race to appear out of the first. Then 200 years later the third race appeared and finally, 66 years after the appearance of the third race, yellow race, the fourth race, Caucasians, appeared. These 60,000 people, Yahweh and the Elohim, thus initiated the modern age and the process that would eventually bring our divine kingdom to a temporary end. That in brief is the sacred history leading from the first earth to our earth, and to the present situation or cycle called evil, which was preordained to last for 6,000 years. Introduction to Level 1 Very interesting read, where did you get all this information from? Who told you about it and who told the person who told you and etc., as in where did this all originate from? I was taught the ancient history of our people by the elders of my tribe. They have kept it in safe custody for many thousands of years and pass it from generation to generation through oral teachings and initiation. I may have missed it, but could you give us some indication of what part of Africa your information comes from? Some of it is very familiar, other parts are completely foreign and don't seem to correlate with any indigenous spiritual system in Africa, of which I am aware. You also spoke of initiations. To what, by whom, and of what lineage? I'm from the tribe called Botswana. My people live in different regions in southern Africa, in the countries of Malawi, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Angola, and Namibia, but mostly in South Africa and Botswana. Our language is called Setswana or Setswana. The elders that I mentioned are the custodians of secret knowledge in my tribe. This type of secret dissemination of knowledge exists in many other tribes throughout Africa. It originated, or rather became secret, in ancient Egypt 6,000 years ago. Before then it was taught openly to all black people starting at childhood. You consider all of Botswana to be one tribe? Are your initiations considered general rights which are conveyed among African community members as they reach certain ages, or are you receiving specialized training as a Dingaka and or Sagoma? If you serve in one of these two capacities, please tell us how long you have been in training. It's rather exciting to think we have some African healers or priests from Southern Africa living in the Americas. Also, if you don't consider it intrusive, please place more environmental context on your information. Tell us what the names of the Creator, Intermediary Gods, and Ancestors are within your tradition. What are some of the rituals that are safe for general public to practice? Outside of oral history, what are you authorized to share with Africans born in West? If you don't mind, I want to put a small note on the first page of this post and in the title bar indicating that your spiritual knowledge is from Botswana. Our tribe of Botswana is divided into many smaller clans. I'm from the clan called Bakadla. I'll briefly outline our initiation system for those who are new to such information. There are three types of initiatory training among my people, as is the case among many African tribes. The first is general rites, as you put it which youths undergo at about puberty. After that, a handful are selected to be trained as Dingaka, Gaka singular, Dingaka plural. The term, Sangoma, belongs to the Zulu tribe and is not used among us, but it means the same thing, as you probably know. A second group, much smaller, is then selected at a later stage to be trained as Griots. I am a Griot, a tribal historian, and not a Ngaka. There are two types of Griots. The first is called moziki, or a memorizing griot, for lack of a better word. Such initiates are trained usually from childhood in certain rites that vastly improve their powers of memory to exceed that of ordinary people. Then they are taught oral history, and memorize it word for word, so they can transmit it to following generations exactly as they received it. The second type of griot is called machiti. This word is difficult to translate but it effectively means one who lives with the ancestors. I am a Machidi. The central tenet of African initiation rites is that the lives of our ancestors, the gods, are still as vibrant today as they were in their time. With this tenet as the foundation, we are trained to access that vibrancy and transport our minds or spirit to their time. 
we are guided to travel in spirit until we reach what we call Majako, the gate, and receive the blessings of the gatekeeper. Then we are assigned a custodian, through whose eyes and mind we see the past. We are thus enabled to research and investigate the lives of our ancestors exactly as if they were living right now. The time we live in in that state we call detoro or dream time. It's not related to outside time. In just three nights we are able to live a thousand years or more in Detoro. The experience of Detoro has a vividness that far exceeds that of modern ordinary experiences. I was taught that our ancestors lived in that type of vivid consciousness as their normal everyday experience prior to 6,000 years ago. Our present minds have been severely slowed down, so to speak, due to the deterioration of our bodies, which are inferior to what our ancestors had then. What we discover in that state becomes indelibly etched in our mind. It is just as vivid today in my mind as it was when I completed my first detoro 21 years ago. That's a brief overview of the experience. The rites that are actually used to open it up for us, as well as the names of the guardians, custodians, and gods we meet are sacred. What little I've told is about as much as I'm allowed to tell. The secrecy in which we are initiated today is only a temporary phenomenon. It started 6,000 years ago to keep certain knowledge from the present rulers of the world. Before then, all black people were taught as a matter of course using the same kind of rites and rituals. We have reached a point in this 6,000 year cycle when the empire of the white man is about to crumble. The secret initiations are about to be reestablished as a common teaching method. That's the reason why I've prepared and posted these teachings. Who taught these elders, where did they get their knowledge? Is their knowledge available in other forms outside of your posts? Should you really be sharing this knowledge? Black root science, is it a way of life or like a religion? Or just a form of science which is based on earthly principles and one heaven, space, principles? Can it tell us about afterlife or the end of the flesh man and the birth of the spirit man? Does it explain the spirit as E equals MC squared, energy that is not destroyed just changing form? Can it justify how soul spirit and body work in harmony as one? Who taught my elders? They were taught by their own elders. Every generation of my tribe have their own elders. Before they pass on, ascend, they initiate new people to become the custodians of tribal knowledge. This system of education by initiation has been going on in my tribe, as well as 11 other tribes, for 6,000 years. Where did they get their knowledge? Our knowledge was established 6,000 years ago into a coherent system of initiation rites by Yakub, whose real name is Yahweh. He divided the knowledge into three compartments. The first and highest in this age consists of 360 degrees of knowledge. It is this system in which I am initiated. The second consists of 36 degrees of knowledge. It is upon this system that the mystery temples of ancient Egypt were founded. That knowledge is called the wisdom of the 36 netters. The third and final system consists of 33 degrees of knowledge. Yakub slash Yahweh established it for teaching the light-skinned races. In ancient times, the most intelligent of them were recruited from their countries into the Ethiopian Empire, including Egypt and the Middle East. They were taught the 33 degrees of knowledge and then sent back to their homelands where they established secret societies. The most predominant still in existence today are the so-called Freemasons. The Rosicrucians and Theosophists are the highest practitioners of the 33 degrees, and from them come the others such as the Templars, White Brotherhood of Light, Illuminati, and other light race secret societies. Is their knowledge available in other forms outside of your posts? Not in the way I've presented it here. I've tried to present what I've been taught in such a way that it may appeal to the largest possible audience of black people. Some of this knowledge can be found in the teachings of Elijah Muhammad. The problem is that many black people are turned off by the nation of Islam for many varied reasons, most of which have nothing to do with the teachings themselves. So in order to appeal to those black people who have been robbed of Elijah's elevating teachings, I've tried to present the truth in such a way that it does not particularly align with any of the offshoots and various groups formed since his death, and don't get me wrong, some of them know the truth. My presentation is much more general and comprehensive. 
It includes our history prior to the creation of our Earth, all the way back to the creation of our universe. Later on I'll discuss events that are soon to occur on Earth as the present cycle comes to a close. Then I'll go on to discuss what lies beyond this cycle. My goal is to present as comprehensive a version of the truth as is possible to be understood by those who have not yet experienced it firsthand through rites and initiations. Thus the short answer to your question is no, there is no published information available of what I've presented here. This is the first time this knowledge has been released publicly. Which brings me to your fourth question. Should I be sharing this knowledge? Yes. We have reached the end of the present 6,000 year cycle. In fact it ended in 1914. Since then, the light races have been given an extra 100 years to repent and save their souls. The 100 year period of mercy will soon be over. Now is the time, and the elders of all the tribes in Africa and elsewhere have given permission for the information to be released. We are entering a very dangerous time, dangerous for the souls of our people. The light races have instituted racist religions whose sole purpose is to try and stall the spiritual awakening of the black man and woman. They have set up a religious system where the coming of the Messiah must occur according to their definitions. If any other type of Messiah comes and does not fit their descriptions, they will declare him to be a false Messiah and try to kill him. Well, this is precisely how the devils want it to pan out. Those among them who know the truth know that the so-called Messiah is a black man, the God Yahweh himself and his angels. Therefore they deliberately made the whole world ready to reject him. They'll say, how can the Messiah be a black man? All their religions, Christianity, Islam, Judaism and the rest have prepared the world to expect a white Messiah. The knowledge I share here is crucial to prepare black people for the truth that is soon to manifest. Yahweh, who made this world and its present rulers, is the God of this age. He will soon come in great might and glory to reclaim his own. Those black people who have been deceived by Christianity and white Islam are in danger of rejecting him once they see that he is black. That's why this truth is being told now. And more will be revealed. Black Root Science is it a religion? Black Root Science is not a religion. It's a reminder to black people who have forgotten their glorious heritage. Prior to 6,000 years ago, religions did not exist. Black people then lived a natural life. What you call earthly principles, or the laws of nature, were designed by the B8M original people. They are the laws that govern existence in the universe. Black people, as gods, are not subject to the laws of nature. They are the creators of the laws of nature. All other creatures and beings created by black people, including the light-skinned races, are subject to the laws. We made ourselves subject to these laws only now in this 6,000-year cycle in order to experience what is caused by self-forgetfulness. All of heaven and earth are the creation of black people. What is called heaven is a mental state, it's not a physical space somewhere. It exists only in the mind. In scriptures such as the Bible and the Quran, the word heaven is also used to mean the sky. When it says the gods appear in the heavens, it means they appear in the sky in their spaceships. Einstein's law of E equals MC squared applies only to the physical universe. It does not apply to spirit. It is true that energy cannot be destroyed. That's because energy is a condensation of the mind, and the mind has neither beginning nor end. Therefore energy can be created again and again, without end. And what the black man creates can never be destroyed. Introduction to Physics Slash Astronomy From the wise ones of old, the teachers of true science. The originators of true civilization. T.O., all who desire a new perspective, and are tired of the old lies, and cannot understand what modern scientists are talking about. Here is an ancient perspective on physics and astronomy, using modern concepts. What is physics? It is the knowledge of the laws and principles of atoms and electrons. What is astronomy? It is the knowledge of the laws governing stars and planets. What is the difference between stars and atoms? Size is the only difference. The laws and principles are the same. 
Atoms and electrons are miniature stars and planets, and stars and planets are giant atoms and electrons. There is no difference except in size. The movements and revolutions are the same. The orbits are the same. The laws of magnetic attraction and repulsion are the same. Modern scientists want to keep the laws of atomic structure to themselves by cloaking it in a mystery. When I look up in the sky, I see the very same atoms they see in their electron microscopes. God put the stars out there for all to see who cannot afford the million dollar research microscopes, because the stars are what the atoms look like in miniature scale. The Earth and the Sun Would you like to stand on an electron? The Earth is a giant size electron. What is the nucleus of an atom? The Sun is a giant sized nucleus. The electrons of every atom orbit around their nucleus exactly the same way the Earth and other planets orbit around the Sun. If you don't have a multi-billion dollar electron microscope to look at the nucleus, then look at the rising sun, and there is a perfect nucleus. Look at the Earth you stand on, and there is a perfect electron. Our solar system is a giant atom. The laws ruling its motions are the same as for an atom. We stand on an electron called the Earth, and lo and behold, the electron itself is made of electrons. Is the Earth not made of atoms? Yes, it is. And if the Earth is an electron, then the electron is made of electrons. If the solar system is an atom, then the atom itself is made of atoms. Mystery solved. What is the fundamental particle of matter? It will never be found by instruments because every atom is made of miniature atoms, themselves made of even smaller atoms, to infinity. No wonder modern scientists can never find the smallest particle. They keep discovering smaller and smaller ones as their instruments improve. But we don't need instruments. They'd be handy if we could afford them, but we don't need them. We only need our minds. The solar system and the atom we already saw how the solar system perfectly models the atom. The sun is a giant nucleus and the earth is a giant electron, as are the other planets. The solar system is measured to be 7,900 million miles across, as far as the orbit of the planet Pluto. Our Earth is measured at only 7,900 miles across. That makes the solar system a million times bigger than the Earth. Let our minds make the obvious connection. If the Earth is the same as an electron, and the solar system is the same as an atom, then we conclude that the proportions must be the same. In other words, the size of the atom compared to the electron must be the same as the size of the solar system compared to the Earth. Solar system is to Earth what atom is to electron same proportions, same laws, different sizes. If the solar system is a million times bigger than the Earth, then the atom is a million times bigger than the electron. Is this true? According to modern measurements, the electron has been measured at about one quarter trillionth of an inch, and the atom at about one quarter millionth of an inch across. That gives a proportion of one million times, just like it is between the Earth and the solar system. This confirms our intuition that the solar system is a giant atom, and the Earth is a giant electron, and the Sun is the nucleus. Earth electron plus Sun nucleus equals solar system atom. The law of creation is, as above, so it is below. Now our mind has been freed and we can proceed to investigate atoms and electrons by studying our own solar system. We don't need expensive tools. We just need the knowledge that has been available since ancient times when our ancestors spent many nights studying the sky. They were looking at stars, but at the same time they were looking at the microscopic particles of matter. Modern astronomers and physicists separate themselves into two camps. In the ancient days, our ancestors, as they built great pyramids and other monuments to study and chronicle the movements of the stars, knew that there was no difference between astronomy and physics. By studying astronomy, they learned all about physics as well, because physics is the study of astronomy on a microscopic scale. As above, so it is below. That is the law of creation. Once we have a clear understanding of this law, we can use it to learn about the rest of the universe, how it was created, when it was created, what is its size and duration. All we need is our minds. The universe. 
If you have ever been far away from city lights, you'll know that when we look at the starry sky on a clear dark night, we see countless stars covering every inch of the sky. But when we look at the sky above the earth, we see a vast emptiness between our earth and the nearest neighboring star. If we let our mind think about this, we realize that even though the stars seem close to each other far, far up in the sky, they cannot really be that close together. If they were, we would see stars in our own sky above the earth, as close as the moon. The truth is the nearest star to our sun is about 32 trillion miles away. This tells us all the stars above, even though they seem close to each other, must be separated by about the same distance as well. It's like looking at the lights of a distant city. They seem closely packed together, but when I reach the city, I realize that there is plenty of space between the lights. Looking from a distance gives the illusion that they are close together. The same is true with the stars. Our intuition tells us that if we could travel to one of the many stars above, we would discover that it sits alone in the sky just like our sun, separated from its nearest neighbor by about the same distance of 32 trillion miles. This begins to give us an idea of the size of the universe. But let us continue with this thought. What can we consider as a model of the universe? The universe is made of countless solar systems. The earth is made of countless atoms. Solar systems and atoms are identical differing only in size. If the universe is made of star systems, which are identical to atoms, and the earth is made of atoms, which are identical to star systems, then the earth must be identical to the universe, only much smaller. As above, so below. UR mind concludes that the earth is a mini-universe. Its stars are the atoms that make it up. Here is the full cycle of creation. We start with the electron, then atoms, then the earth and other planets, then the solar system and other star systems, then the universe. That is going from the bottom to the top, the smallest to the largest, the beginning to the end. But a full cycle has the same beginning and end point. What does our intuition tell us? It tells us the beginning point, the electron, is the same as the end point, the universe. We have come full circle. The electron is a mini-earth, the earth is a mini-universe. As above, so below. How can we find out the size of the universe? By knowing the size of the earth. How many stars are in the universe? Same number as atoms in the earth. The law of creation is the same. The separation distance of stars and atoms. The stars are separated from each other by about 32 trillion miles, according to modern scientists. We'll use this number to find out by how. Much the atoms in the Earth are separated from each other. The proportion is the same, because the Earth is a mini-universe. Let's look at this again. The solar system is 7,900 million miles in size. It's separated from its neighbors by 32 trillion miles. How many solar systems would fit in this distance if we could line them up from the sun all the way to the next star? The answer is 32 trillion miles per 7,900 million miles equals 4,000. We may call this the proportion of separation. That means 4,000 star systems will fit in the distance separating two stars. How many atoms will fit in the distance separating two atoms? 4,000. The same law applies. As above, so below. It's clear that most of the sky consists of empty space. The distance between any two neighboring stars is so large that it can accommodate 4,000 star systems, and yet there are only two stars in that whole distance. The rest is empty space. We may think of each star system as sitting at the center of a huge bubble of empty space 32 trillion miles across. It's like that with every star system throughout the entire universe, if our intuition is correct that all star systems are separated from each other by about the same distance. The same is true then for the Earth and its atoms. Most of the volume of the Earth is empty space, because 4,000 atoms can fit in the space between any two atoms. Now we must let our minds be free to think clearly. When we say that most of the volume of the earth is empty space, someone might ask, why don't we fall through this empty space? We can fall through the empty space between stars, but not that between atoms. These are microscopic spaces. 
The atoms themselves are even more microscopic, being 4,000 times smaller. That's what we mean when we say the Earth is mostly empty space. The atoms are so tiny compared to the space between them that they occupy very little of the Earth's total volume. So yes, the Earth is made of mostly empty space just like the sky, but no, we cannot fall through. If the stars are separated by 32 trillion miles, by how much are the atoms separated? The proportion of separation is the same, it's 4,000. The size of the atom is one quarter millionth of an inch across. Multiplying this by the proportion of separation, we get one quarter millionth inch x 4,000 is equal to one thousandth of an inch. Therefore, any two atoms are separated by one thousandth of an inch, just like any two stars are separated by 32 trillion miles. Now we are closer to finding out the size of the universe. We just have to find out how many atoms make up the Earth, and that will tell us how many stars make up the universe. The law of creation has made an Earth whose size we can handle and use to understand the universe, whose size we cannot handle so easily. Actually, Black Roots, we are one light year from the closest star of Alpha Centauri. It is a fairly easy calculation. I remember it from high school. One light year equals 60 seconds asterisk 60 minutes asterisk 24 hours asterisk 365.25 days, not sidereal, asterisk 186,000 miles per second equals 5.8697136 times 10 to the power of 12 miles thus the Earth star, Sol, is 5.86 trillion miles from Alpha Centauri. According to the Amateur Astronomer's Handbook, on page 253, the nearest star to our sun is 4.33 light years away. More recently, in the Oxford Astronomer's Encyclopedia, P10. Alpha Centauri, the closest naked eye star to the sun, is 4.4 light years away. That's 25.8 trillion miles. Also, P323, Proxima Centauri is the closest star to the sun, at 4.22 light years away. This is not a naked eye star but can be seen by telescope. These are only two stars. Another is the star Altair, located at 16.8 light years away, or the well-known star Sirius, at 8.6 light years away, or 49 trill miles. The Earth, or our solar system, is surrounded by many thousands more that are a bit farther away. They all form a canopy, or bubble, so to speak, that completely surrounds our solar system. The ceiling of this bubble may indeed be approximated at 32 trillion miles. The size of the Earth and the Universe How many atoms make up the Earth? We can calculate the volume of the atom, since we know its size, and then calculate the volume of the Earth, and divide the second by the first to find the number of atoms. But that would be incorrect, because it would ignore most of the insides of the Earth, which is mostly empty space, as we already saw. A correct way is to calculate the volume of this empty space and ignore the volume of the atom, which is much smaller. Remember, the empty space between atoms is 4,000 times larger than the atom itself. Some people who are more mathematically inclined might suggest that we take both the volume of the atom and the empty space and add them together and use that number in our calculation. That would be right. The answer would be absolutely correct. But consider this, the atom is 4,000 times smaller than the space between atoms. If we ignore its size to simplify the calculation, it is exactly like someone saying, I have $40 in my pocket, when in fact he has $40 and one penny. Ignoring the penny simplifies matters. A penny is 4,000 times less than $40 and can be ignored without affecting the final answer. Similarly, the atom is 4,000 times smaller than the separating space, and its size may be ignored for the sake of simplicity without affecting the final answer. I mention this now in such great detail because we will face this situation time and again when we begin to deal with larger numbers. Although it is possible to make 100% correct calculations, most of the time it's better to make a calculation that is 99% accurate for the sake of simplicity and understanding. Once understanding is reached, anyone can then go back and improve the accuracy of the calculation. So much for that. 
The empty space between atoms, as already said, has a size of one thousandth of an inch, which we change to miles, and get sixteen billionths of a mile. It makes a volume of sixteen billionths x sixteen billionths x sixteen billionths equals four trillionths trillionths. The Earth is seven thousand nine hundred miles across. It makes a volume of seven nine hundred x seven nine hundred x seven nine hundred equals one half trillion. Dividing the second volume by the first will give us the number of atoms inside the Earth. One half trillion slash four trillionths trillionths equals one hundred twenty-five billion trillion trillion. A very large number, to say the least. Therefore, there are one hundred twenty-five billion trillion trillion atoms inside the Earth. Now, someone might be wondering about this matter of dividing volumes and not understanding how it gives us the number of atoms. Let us step aside for a moment and think of a common everyday example. A drop of water dripping out of a faucet is about a quarter inch across. There's a cup shaped like a ball underneath the faucet, catching the water, or maybe there's a tennis ball there instead, with a small hole in it. A tennis ball is about four inches across, maybe smaller. The water drips until it fills the tennis ball. If you come in right at the end of this little experiment of ours, and you see the last drop falling in, and I ask you, how many drops did it take to fill the ball, how will you calculate it? You have to use volumes because the water, once the ball is filled, will have the same volume as the tennis ball. If you divide this volume by the volume of one droplet, that will tell you how many drops it took to fill the container. So here goes. A drop of water is a quarter inch across. It makes a volume of one quarter times one quarter times one quarter is equal to 0 0.015625. A tennis ball is four inches across. It makes a volume of four times four times four is equal to 64. 64 divided by 0 0.015625 is equal to 4096. Therefore, there are 4096 drops of water inside the tennis ball. Now, imagine the drop of water coming out of a tiny syringe needle. Let's say this droplet is only one thousandth of an inch across, of course, in reality the droplet is bigger, but you know where I'm going with this. These droplets coming out of the needle are dripping into a ball as before. A much bigger ball. In fact, surprise, surprise, the ball is exactly 7,900 miles across, the same size as the Earth. How many droplets will it take to fill the Earth ball? Here goes again, the droplet is one thousandth of an inch across, which is 16 billionths of a mile. It makes a volume of 16 billionths x 16 billionths x 16 billionths equals 4 trillionths trillionths. The Earth ball is 7,900 miles across. It makes a volume of 7, 900 x 7, 900 x 7, 900 equals 1 half trillion. 1 half trillion slash 4 trillionths trillionths equals 125 billion trillion trillion. That's how many droplets are inside the Earth ball. The tiny droplet represents the bubble of empty space surrounding a single atom. At the center of this bubble or droplet is the atom itself, for thousand times smaller than the droplet in size. How many atoms are inside the earth ball? Same number as droplets, because there is one atom at the center of each. Hence we conclude again that the total number of atoms inside the earth is 125 billion trillion trillion. How many stars are in the universe? Sorry man, the earth is not an empty hollow ball like you're saying. It is a big rock with water on top. Your thoughts are nice, but those thoughts are not science. To understand how atoms make up our Earth, it's convenient to assume that at the beginning, the Earth was a hollow ball. This ball is then filled with atoms. It is these same atoms that form the rock and water on top, as you put it, as well as the atmosphere. If we take into account the magnetic separation that naturally separates the atoms, as well as the size of the Earth, the number of these atoms can be approximated at 125 billion trillion trillion, as shown in the calculations in BRS5. Are you taking the average size of an atom? As you know, depending on the atomic number, the amount of protons, therefore electrons, increases. Hydrogen has one electron orbiting the nucleus. 
In the case of iron, Fe, there are 26 electrons orbiting the nucleus. In theory, the first shell orbit can only support two electrons. The next shell can support eight. Therefore, depending on the atom, you will have space between the first shell and the nucleus and then space between the first shell and the second, then the second and third, and so on. So depending on the atomic number, the size of an atom can change. Also, the volume of the Earth would be considered spherical, not cubed, and therefore governed by the equation, pi asterisk r scare, instead of s cube, or l asterisk w asterisk h are being half the number you mentioned. The volume of the atom is tricky, but would probably measure more accurately if you use the volume of a sphere. From what I remember, the electron orbits are very irregular. I think the forces and movements of subatomic particles now fall under the theory of quantum mechanics. Whoops. My bad. I gave the area of a circle. The volume of a sphere is 4 slash 3 asterisk pi asterisk r cube. Yes, I'm using an average estimate for the atom size. The carbon atom is given as six billionths of an inch, and carbon has only six electrons. It's one of the smaller ones. The size of the electron is very small compared to the gap separating electron orbital circuits, or shells. As you rightly say, the atom sizes will vary greatly. A hundred electron atom, Fm, fermium, will be much bigger than either carbon or hydrogen. So the sizes will range from less than one billionth of an inch to over a thousandth of an inch due to these orbital gaps. The proportion of these gaps is analogous to the distance between planets in our solar system. The Earth is only 7,900 miles across. Compare that with the gap between Earth and Mars, which is about 60 million miles. This same proportion separates the electron orbital shells. So you are right about the increasing size of atoms. I took a median, or midway point between a billionth, for the smaller atoms, and a thousandth of an inch, for the larger ones, and came up with about a millionth of an inch. On the second question of the volume of the Earth and the atom, I did use the spherical volume formula, which you are right, is four-thirds pi r3. But r, or radius, can be written in terms of diameter. Clearly, as you know, diameter is twice radius, or r equals one slash two d. So the formula can be written as 4 thirds pi d slash 2, 3 or 1 sixth pi d3. The factor 1 sixth pi is common to all spheres, large and small. When dividing the volume of one sphere, Earth, by that of another, atom, the common factor cancels out. So I ignored it from the start. The effect is the same as using cubic volumes. I'm sure you'll agree that ignoring common factors from the start greatly simplifies the calculation. As to the irregularities of electron orbits and their designation to the realm of quantum mechanics, the you raise a very involved issue, but not at all complicated. It is made complicated by those who do not know, or even ignore, the true origin of things. I think you know the race I'm referring to. I will address this topic in a later BRS. You've mentioned electrons, but why not protons and neutrons? Do protons represent positive energy and electrons negative energy? Do you agree that there are 12 planets in our solar system, like the Sumerian tablets illustrate? What are called protons and neutrons refer to the makeup of the nucleus. The nucleus of an atom is a sun, literally. The sun is primarily a magnetic, electrical, and light body. As with all large bodies in space, it has magnetic poles, a negative and positive pole, or north and south, just like the Earth. The polarities of these poles give rise to what are called protons. So a proton is not a particle or separate body like an electron, which is literally a planet, but simply an effect of the magnetic poles of the sun, nucleus. The substances that make up the sun are under the influence of its magnetic field. This influence slash interaction gives rise to another effect that scientists call the neutron. Both the proton and the neutron are the effects of the sun's magnetic field. When they are studied on an electronic scale, these effects give the illusion of actual moving particles, and so modern scientists call them protons and neutrons. On the question of the number of planets, 
There are many smaller spheres slightly smaller than Pluto beyond the boundary of our solar system. They cannot be called planets. Occasionally, as the thousands of years pass, some of them enter our solar system and establish temporary orbits long enough to be regarded as planets. They were recorded as such by some ancient astronomers, especially the astronomers of Sumer. After some millennia in these orbits, they are always captured by the larger planets like Jupiter and Saturn to become their moons. So how can you age the Earth, the universe, by calculation? How old is it and how much time is it left for its completion? The estimated total number of star systems in the universe is 125 billion trillion trillion, as I described in one of the posts on astronomy slash physics. The gods send 144,000 settlers from the first Earth every 7,000 years to inhabit these star systems, most of which have Earth-like planets. This is how our Earth was first inhabited 78 trillion years ago by 144,000 of our ancestors who came from another star system. When the entire universe is inhabited by black people, then the universe will have attained its purpose and will come to an end and be replaced by a new one. This has been going on without beginning and will never end. The full age of the universe at that time will be about 875 trillion 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 years. The creation of the universe. There are 125 billion trillion trillion atoms in the earth. How many stars are there in the universe? 125 billion trillion trillion. Same number as atoms in the earth. As below, so above. The earth is a model of the universe that God presents to us to enable us to comprehend the universe and its stars. For the earth, the atoms are its stars. How big is the universe? We can find the answer by asking, how big is the earth? And what is its proportion of size in relation to the atom? In other words, how much bigger than the atom is the earth? The atom is one quarter millionth of an inch across, which in miles is four trillionths. The earth is 7,900 miles across. The proportion of size is 7,900 slash four trillionths equals 2,000 trillion. That means the earth is 2,000 trillion times bigger than the atom. What this tells us, according to the law, is that the universe is 2,000 trillion times bigger than the solar system. So its size is 2,000 trillion x 7,900 million equals 16 trillion trillion. The universe is 16 trillion trillion miles across and has 125 billion trillion trillion stars. The earth is 7,900 miles across and has 125 billion trillion trillion atoms. The creation of the universe. We must ignore the lies of modern scientists if we are to discover the truth about the creation of the universe. They say that 4.5 billion years ago there was a huge kaboom. A big bang. Our ancestors never mentioned any bang, big or small. Ignore the bang and consider this. The law of creation is the law of cycles, which says the end point is the same as the beginning point, and the cycle repeats. A flower starts with a seed and ends with a seed, so that it may start again and continue forever. The cycle starts with the electron and ends with the universe. It ends where it began, so that it may start again and continue, without beginning and without end. If the Earth is a mini-universe, is it not intuitive to think that it was a full universe at the beginning? And if the electron is a mini-Earth, could it not have been a full Earth also? If the universe is made of star systems and star systems are made of atoms, does that not say atoms are the original star systems of the beginning? The present universe originated from the universe of the past, and that one from the one before. There never was a time when a universe did not exist. Just as people are born of people, and flowers come from flowers, so also do universes come from universes. There is no beginning and no end. It has always been, and ever shall be. Our ancestors teach the story of creation as follows. Long, long ago the earth was a full-size universe. Its present atoms were the stars of that universe, and they were 125 billion trillion trillion in number, filling space farther than the eye could see, stretching across that universe, which was 16 trillion trillion miles across. 
Just like every flower grows in its season and reaches full maturity, the universe has its season also, called its duration. At the end it reaches full maturity. When that universe of our ancestors reached full maturity, it was time for it to give birth to a new universe, to continue the cycle of creation. Just as a flower folds itself into a tiny seed, which later unfolds into a full-fledged flower, so did the previous universe fold into a single earth. God, whose mind is infinite, and to whom star systems are as atoms in size, gathered all these stars into a single sphere which became our earth. The stars of that entire previous universe became the atoms of the new earth. That is how the first earth of a new universe is always created. Then new stars filled the space around that earth, and our universe came into being. There is no big bang in the creation of a new universe, just as there is none in the growth of a flower. When it is time to create a new universe, God simply expands his mind until the whole universe appears to be the size of a single earth. At that point the stars appear to be the size of atoms. The whole universe becomes one earth, and new stars are created all around it. Not only are the atoms of our earth identical to star systems, but they were actually the star systems of that universe of our ancestors. Our electrons were their planets on which they lived. When the purpose of that universe was completed, the minds of our ancestors expanded to an unimaginable extent, such that they could see the entire universe as a single sphere the size of our earth. That sphere became our earth and our ancestors made themselves new bodies from its substance. They became its first inhabitants. They are the original people called the first gods. We, as black people, are their descendants. Our lineage stretches all the way back to them. That is the story of how they created our universe. Here's a question to consider. If all the stars of the previous universe are used to form the first earth, where do all the new stars around it come from? I was curious to know which story are you using because this does not relate to the one laid down by the ancient people of the Nile. I can't quote on the Dogon people offhand, but from what I know, this isn't in relation with it either. Although I don't know your source, I'm not saying you are wrong because what you state sounds fathomable but somewhat incomplete. What's the science because all science has a basis? This is knowledge that was taught to me by the elders of my tribe. I have since educated myself in the ways of modern scientists and was able to translate the teachings of my ancestors into modern concepts. What tribe, or maybe what reference material would I be able to look up in order to corroborate this and fit the pieces of the puzzle together? I'm from the tribe called Botswana. Our language is called Setswana or Setswana. As for written references regarding the teachings of our tribe, you will not find any. We are taught orally at first. But this is only basic teaching. The most important teaching is done using only the method of initiation, which is a much more efficient way of passing on knowledge than either oral or written records. As we progress in our discussions, if all goes well, I'll talk more in detail about the ancient methods of teaching, still used today among some tribes. And to the brother who asks what is the basis of this science. As you read the coming posts, you may eventually agree with the following statement, the basis of science is the mind of our ancestors. Now if this did originate from as you say 6,000 years ago, how did they know about electrons and neutrons, etc. when no microscope was available at the time? Scientists have found the smallest particle hydrogen I believe may be wrong ages since I did the periodic table. I'm not too sure about the analogies and the mathematics in your post either but will not argue that as I'm no mathematician. You say black people, what do you define as black? Where do the other races come from? Brown, red, yellow, etc. P.S. What's your religion slash faith actually called? Thank you. Modern microscopes didn't exist 6,000 years ago, as you say. Our ancestors didn't speak about electrons and atoms in those days. In fact, even today's elders don't speak about such things. I'm the one who translated what I was taught into modern concepts in order to make the discussion clearer. The reason they didn't speak of atoms and electrons is not because they didn't know of such things, but it's because atoms and electrons don't really exist. What modern scientists call electrons are really planets, and the nucleus around which they orbit is actually a sun or star. These planets and stars are miniature in size because of the phenomenon of mind expansion. 
What happens is that the universe is created at the beginning and lasts for a certain duration, depending on its purpose. When the purpose is fulfilled then it comes to an end. Before it comes to an end the minds of all the people who live in it join together into one mind or one consciousness. This is an expanded state of consciousness. The expansion of the mind or consciousness is so immeasurably large that the entire universe would appear to you as if it were a single sphere the size of the earth. All the stars of that universe appear to be the size of atoms and all the planets the size of electrons. That's how electrons and atoms come into being. They are literally the stars and planets of the previous universe. That universe becomes a seed, as it were, for the creation of a new and much larger one. So our ancestors did not call them electrons and atoms. They called them what they really are, which is the planets and star systems of the previous universe that gave birth to ours. I'll answer the other questions next time. Cheers and we'll be waiting for the rest. Here's the answer to the rest of your questions. Let me describe in a roundabout way what I mean by black people. Besides black people, there are four light-skinned races on Earth. The Mediterranean slash Southern European people. This includes all Hispanics, Portuguese, Latins, and Greek origin people, as well as their kind in the Americas. Middle Easterners, including Arabs, Jews, Persians, light-skinned Indians, and such people. The Yellow Race the white race, or Caucasians. Those are all the original non-blacks. What is called the red race or Native Americans is a mix of the yellow race called Mongolians with black people. It may surprise you to learn that black people were the original inhabitants of the Americas. The yellow race crossed the Bering Strait some thousands of years ago and intermixed with those original black inhabitants and produced the so-called red race. That description of all the non-blacks should, I think, make clear what I mean by black people. On the question of what is my religion, I don't have one. I don't worship anyone, because I know there is no one to worship. I revere the elders and ancestors of the black nation, who hold in their custody the state of mind called heaven, to which I will ascend when the time comes. I know all this from first-hand experience, and not as a belief system. All the religions on earth came about because people could no longer directly experience the higher realities by means of rituals of initiation. There was a time when all black people openly took part in ritual initiations prior to 6,000 years ago. Since the appearance of the non-blacks, the initiations were hidden to await the end of the rule of these people. When their end comes, then the ancient system of knowledge will come back into open use. In the meantime, for the past 6,000 years, the light-skinned races have invented a spirit god and heaven to replace the direct knowledge hidden from them. But all their gods and spirits, angels and heavens exist only in the imagination and can be seen quite clearly under the right ritual conditions. Therefore, they need religion to fill their lack, whereas black people really do not in our natural circumstances. We know who God really is. The Society of the Black nation. Next, we will investigate chemistry and see how it is related to physics and astronomy. But for now, let us sidetrack for a moment from roots. Science so we may hear a story. This is a story from our ancestors about their world before the light-skinned races. Yes, black people, there was a time when we were the only people on earth. Those are the times in which the events of this story took place. Not just any story, but his story. True history. To understand true history, we first have to know the most fundamental of all fundamental things. This is what our ancestors say. In the beginning and end of every universe, now remember, creation has no beginning or end, but universes have a beginning and end, because every universe is created for a purpose. When that purpose is fulfilled, creation continues to create the next universe. So they say at the beginning and end of every universe there is only one person. How many black people are there on earth today? Over a billion? A billion separate, individual minds means we are divided. In the beginning, we are told, there is no division. Now this doesn't mean that there is only one human being on earth. There are just as many individuals as there are today, but we are united as one in mind. 
That means every person knows every other person as he knows himself. More than that, every person is every other person. That is divine unity. The reason for mentioning this is because the story we are about to tell is about the organization of the ancient society, which started from unity. It goes that long, long ago, when the first earth had just been completed, at the beginning of this universe, God came as one from the previous universe. That universe had just reached the completion of its purpose, and a new universe, ours, was just beginning. God then divided his mind from unity, or one to two. From two he divided again and became three. From three he became seven and from seven he became twelve gods. Another day we'll hear as to why he went this long route instead of going directly from one to twelve. But twelve is the crucial number because it has to do with how the original society was organized. You probably guessed it. The twelve gods represent the twelve tribes of the original nation. The only twelve tribes we hear about today are the Jews. Where did they get that from? They certainly did not originate it. They got it from the originators of true civilization, our ancestors. Each one of the twelve gods, as gods like to do, separated into a man and a woman. They became the twenty-four original kings and queens of our nation, called the twenty-four elders. Every two, a man and a woman, became the leaders of a tribe and as black people like to do, they called them the mother and father of the tribe. The twenty-four elders decided they needed assistance to help them lead the nation that was soon to come, as they planned to have a population of more than one billion people. They decided that each god will have twelve assistants. This number twelve is not arbitrary. Our ancestors say that nothing the ancients did was arbitrary. Everything they did was totally natural and simple. Therefore everything has a logical and simple reason. Anyone who tells you that there are mystical things reserved only for the spiritually evolved is either a deceiver, i.e. Y.T., or has come under the influence of deceivers, i.e. Y.T. Each god, as we said, chose to have twelve assistants. They are called the 144 chiefs. The elders then divided each tribe into six clans and put two chiefs at the head of each one, a man and his wife. Are you surprised that a woman could be a chief? We are taught to believe that women are not the equals of men. After all, didn't they come from our rib? So a man and a woman became the joint chiefs of each clan. There were 72 clans in the whole nation. Here's a mystery that ceased to be a mystery for me as soon as I learned it. Every black person, without exception, came about exactly as the 24 elders. Did, if you remember, I said the 24 elders were originally 12 gods and each god separated into a man and a woman. We are told that this happens with every two black people on earth, brothers and sisters. Before you became a brother or a sister, you were united as one with another. You then separated to be born as a boy and she as a girl. Have you ever wondered about the mystery of soulmates or love at first sight? Peace. Thanks for the information. It's very enlightening. I do have questions for you. Are there really soulmates? How would they recognize each other? How did the ancestors make the scientific information practical in the daily sense? I mean, how did they use it once they understood its nature? I'm afraid science as we know it, as you alluded, has evolved into nothing much more than a bunch of numerical formulas. Are we going to evolve back into the only race on the planet as we once were? Is this idea in line with the repetition of cycles that you mentioned? How would the ancestors use this information to fully understand their true purpose on this plane? Yes, every black person on earth has a soulmate. Many people do find their soulmates and live a happy and fulfilled life. But many more do not. It's very difficult to find a soulmate by chance, although it does happen. The instances where people find their soulmates are much more common among tribal or so-called indigenous people than they are among us western civilized people. The reason for this is quite obvious. Modern culture has been very successful in disrupting tribal cultures. The people in the old days had a definite and clear scientific system of suiting every person with his or her soulmate. 
The way white people succeeded in disrupting this aspect of our culture was by teaching young people to be independent of the influence of their elders. When I was growing up, there were still some aspects of soulmate matching still going on among our people, where adults were responsible for matching young people with their soulmates. Young people were taught by the instigators of modern culture, especially white missionaries who lived among our people. They were taught to rebel against having their mate chosen for them by their parents or relatives. Now you must realize that even at that time, that part of our culture had long been lost. The parents and relatives themselves most of the time made serious mistakes in matching young men and women. Sometimes they were motivated by the expectation of material gains and so on. Sometimes they mismatched people so badly that it didn't take much to convince youths that this whole system was corrupt. But as I said, the scientific method was lost over 4,000 years ago. Before the appearance of the light races, every person on earth was matched with his or her soul mate by this scientific method. I will discuss in detail the ancient way of finding soul mates in a coming post, soon. It's a true science called the science of compliments. Now my sister, don't despair that we have lost this part of our culture. We've lost most of our culture because this cycle of time was destined to have these very things happening. But thanks to the wisdom of our ancestors, who set the cycles in which all things happen in their allotted time, thanks to them this present cycle is coming to an end. All that was lost will be recovered. In truth, nothing was lost, but just put away until we rid ourselves of the arch deceivers. As to your other questions, to answer them now would be to put the cart before the horse, so to speak. There are other issues that I intend to explain first. By following a definite order in our discussions, we may make it easier for other people who are interested in this to follow and understand it. I ask for your patience. It's also a question of time on my part. There are other personal things to take care of, otherwise I would post more often. Having said that, I still welcome all your questions and comments. They may remind me to include some topics that I would otherwise neglect. Okay. I'll wait, anxiously. I hope your explanations include the why of some of what we've gone through. So, we were out of order before the lighter races began to dominate? This is what then made us susceptible to fall under their control? Initially, what prompted people to tamper with a system of perfection? Why would we even open that door to begin with? Were these decisions simply acts of free will or were they guided by universal forces for some unknown higher purpose? Thanks for attempting to answer these very loaded questions. Peace. You ask questions that are very involved. They go to the roots of the situation we find ourselves in today. You are right in thinking that free will plays a part in what is happening today, but unknown higher purposes and universal forces are not at all involved. Black people are not, and have never been, at the mercy of universal forces. You'll see a detailed meaning of this statement, and the reasons why, as I promised, as well as explanations to most of your questions. Please don't stop asking. But remember this, the truth is in you. You can find it even at this very moment. I appreciate the posts this brings light to the whole notion of arranged marriage. I find that your analysis is quite accurate. If this is the case for soulmates, is polygamy an incorrect practice according to Bukert's science, or can a person have more than one soulmate? No person has more than one soulmate. God divides from one to two every time he's born on earth, and the two are equal. To have two soulmates you'd have to be equal to both of them, making each one half of you, to put it in a cold mathematical way. But I think you understand my meaning. Now you'll probably be surprised when I say polygamy is not wrong. To analyze some events, it would help to divide our history into two eras, the one before the light races, prior to 6,000 years ago, and the present era, the last 6,000 years. The former era is what is called in the Bible the days of old, when the sons of God walked on earth. The society was perfect and lived a natural life. That is to say there were no diseases, war, or premature death. Every man died after reaching old age. The second era brought the races, along with war, diseases, premature death, and a drastic shortening of our lifespan. The last three we could deal with, 
but the first, war, brought untold devastation not only on the warriors, but also on the women remaining at home. Suddenly there was a shortage of men. To keep the nation surviving, polygamy became the logical solution. It was the result of both necessity and common sense. As you can imagine, it became a part of the customs. Hence long after it was no longer necessary, it was still practiced merely as an ancient custom. But there are still many places in Africa today where it's still necessary. You surely have heard of the Hutu and Tutsi wars and other tribal wars that still continue today. Customs are hard to drop once they become ritualized. Another example. You've probably seen photos of how some African tribes mutilate their faces as part of their custom. Have you ever wondered why? It had to do, again, with the light races and their evil slavery. When enslaving black people, they logically chose the strongest and most beautiful men, women, and children. Economics dictated that they would get the highest prices for the best of our people. To counter this evil, many tribes adopted customs of self-mutilation to make themselves ugly and undesirable. A drastic step, you'll agree. But it worked. Many survived who otherwise would not have. Now long after the days of slavery, those customs are still practiced because people have forgotten the original reason. When they are reminded, they become adamant and say, we must do it because our ancestors did it. We cannot go against their will. So it is that we still have some customs that are no longer justified. Good grief, Bukrutz. Your incredible information has spawned yet another wealth of questions that I hope you'll be able to answer soon. What is the idea of Parthenogenesis all about? I'd heard that Fard Muhammad was actually a member of one of the lighter races. Is this true? I'm assuming that when you tackle the issue of Yakub that you'll then address how the light races arrived and how their emergence is connected with the current patriarchal rule? How will black people repair the genealogical damage to our bloodlines done by the social invasions of the lighter races? Peace, and please keep informing us, it's great. The sense in which I use the words light races does not mean the same as light-skinned black people. There are many black people with light skin, as you well know, some so light they could pass for white. Yet they are black people. Fard Muhammad is the son of a black man and a white woman. That makes him like many black people in America, and they're not of the light races. The light races were made in a very specific way to remove every bit of the dominant dark gene that was in them. They were made in four stages such that the entire period of their making lasted for exactly 666 years. Black people made them by removing the dominant dark gene from themselves. Every black person has two types of reproductive genes, one that is dark and dominant, and another that is light and recessive. There is a method of suppressing the dominant gene, thereby allowing the recessive one to become predominant. When this procedure occurs in an uncontrolled or accidental manner, the resulting child is an albino. But a black albino is not the same as a light race person because albinos still have the dark gene in them. It is simply suppressed at conception. In the case of the light races, the dark gene is completely absent. That's the reason light race people cannot give birth to a black child. It takes exactly seven generations to completely breed out the dark gene in the first of the four stages. With our present lifespan, seven generations is approximately 200 years, if you take a single generation to be about 28 to 33 years. In other words, on average a 60-year-old person is a grandparent, being the parent of a 30-year-old, who in turn is the parent of a young child. So on average a new generation is born every 28 to 33 years. That makes seven generations approximately 200 years. That's exactly how long it took to make the first light race, the people called Hispanics, Latins, and Greeks. The second race, the Arabs, Jews, and other Middle Easterners, took about 200 more years to be bred from the first race. After about 200 more years, the third race, the yellow race, was bred out of the second. Altogether that took 600 years. Then exactly 66 years after that the first white babies were bred from the yellow race, meaning that the four light races were completed after 666 years. Hence it is said that the number of these beasts is 666. 
I'll address the matter of Yakub much later. Your other questions can wait for a while, right? Okay, my other questions can wait till you get the chance. But, I would like to know why anybody light enough to pass for white wouldn't be considered a member of the lighter races? I mean, isn't that how it begins with the deliberate intent to water down the dominant gene and make it unrecognizable? Isn't this why the current black population of the Americas has in general gotten progressively lighter with each generation because there still is a deliberate attempt to accomplish goals to that end? Further, if Fard Muhammad was mixed race, how would he be different in terms of agenda than, say, a Ramses? Thanks for your patience, and you can feel free to answer when you are ready. Your question is extremely important. It goes to the very roots of the definition of a black person. There is a scientific method by which it's known who is black and who isn't. By scientific I mean true or ancient science, not modern science. It's not possible to determine the true race of a person using modern biological slash genetic methods, except in the most obvious cases. There is only one way that is infallible in this respect. But before I get to that, let me address your very reasonable question on the motives of a light-skinned black person like Fard compared to those of another light-skinned black man such as Ramesses. Ramesses lived at a time when white people were ascending the scales or steps of power and affluence, and black people were descending. Many mixed-race people like him sided with their white ancestry, even though such people are black. I'll describe at the end of this message why it is that a person of half-black slash half-white parentage is actually black, even a person of one-quarter black three-quarters white parentage. I already touched on this yesterday when I mentioned that it takes seven generations to totally remove a black person's dark germ. Now, the mixed-race blacks in ancient Egypt sided with whites because they thought that's where the brightest future lay, in terms of power and affluence. They were not negatively impressed by the corruption and deceitfulness of these people, even when it was clear to their unmixed brethren and fellow citizens. This same phenomenon was prevalent in apartheid South Africa just a decade or two ago. The mixed-race blacks called coloreds, which means coloreds, did not want anything to do with native blacks. Even the darkest of them denied their blackness. The reason was just as simple, their economic future, and their short-sighted view, lay in the direction whites were going, and that's who they followed. I'm sure you can think of similar situations in America. Now, Fard Muhammad not only had the longest foresight possible, but he also had the hindsight of the true history of blacks and whites. He was raised, taught, and initiated so that he would gain this expanded viewpoint of the nature of reality, and not be blinded by the glamour of white civilization. That this is factually true can be seen from his teachings and achievements. He was the catalyst for a sense of pride in self and ancestry that had not been seen in our people for very many centuries. It's unfair, from my point of view, for people to reject his truth because of the controversies associated with the organization he and Elijah started. As you can see, from my perspective the way a black person is raised and taught determines his or her attitude toward the true nature of both blacks and whites. This is not determined by the shade of his black skin, whether it's on the lighter or darker side. But on the larger question, the way to determine who is a black person is not by looking to see whether or not they side with other black people or prefer to abandon their own and live the white life, so to speak. Black people who behave like that are still black, whether we like them or not. They are part of the total population of 1 billion 8 million. This number is the total number of black people in all existence. This may sound strange if you consider the size of the universe, as well as all universes that have ever existed. But this is the total number of gods. I'll explain this at another time. They are called the original people, or first gods, as I've said before. Each god incarnates again and again, endlessly. Me and you and every black person are their incarnations. They are called our first self. Every black person from the lowliest pygmy or hottentot to the highest leader of the UN, including every Uncle Tom, is the incarnation of one of the gods. When a god incarnates in a new black life, the 24 elders keep a record of that birth and give that person his or her eternal name. Thus every black person has an eternal name. 
When all the gods are incarnated, there will be an awakening wherein every black person will not only remember his or her eternal name, but the name of everyone else. We have incarnated time and again since forever, and know each other closer than you know your own mother, child, brother, or sister today. Every black person has what is called the mind of God, which my people call ancestral memory. This mind of God or ancestral memory stretches all the way along your lineage of ancestors back to your first self as you were at the creation of our universe. This mind of God or ancestral memory is unconscious in us, except when it's awakened by initiation rituals, but it's totally and always conscious in the 24 elders. Therefore, they are the final arbiters and judges of who is or is not black for as long as we remain asleep under the hypnosis of YT. When we awaken, then each one will know him slash herself and all others as we've known each other since eternity. That is the only true way to determine the racial identity of all people on earth. Okay. But, if that's the case, then what difference does it make whether or not I marry one of the lighter race males? If both my children and I are going to be called black irregardless of the disdain I might have towards my own, what stops me from becoming, say, another Diana Ross or Condoleezza Rice? I mean, I could literally go ahead, marry and breed with a white man believing for the better life through my chosen participation in a light supremacy system, and when the shift of power occurs from lighter to black, I could benefit from that too. I hate to be rambling here, but I hope you follow me. I'm not sure at this point I understand why people are being allowed to believe that they can walk the line inconsequentially if indeed we are to survive. Help me understand here, brother. Help me understand, when you have time. There was something else I meant to ask you. Recently, I went to see a movie called What the Bleep Do We Know? Produced by Europeans, it was philosophical in nature, and as usual they were discussing issues that we've been knowing for eons. There was one scene in particular, however, that fascinated me. They showed the work of a Japanese scientist who'd researched the effects of the energy of certain words, spoken and written, and thoughts on the nature of water molecules. Positive phrases produced, frozen, water molecules that were beautiful and almost perfectly symmetrical. On the other hand, negative energy produced deformed molecules. He related this to the fact that the human body is primarily composed of water. Someone told me that the same basic information showed up in the Metanetter, but I couldn't verify it because I had a difficult time getting through that book when I tried several years back. So, since you've been so kind in sharing your perspectives, I was hoping that at some point you can tie this particular information in with yours. Peace again. On your question about the movie. The human mind is creative. It affects inanimate matter as well as life, animals, and plants, as I explained in a previous post about the true law of evolution called the law of integrity. Moral character creates beautiful forms, and immoral character creates ugly forms. Starting next week, I'll discuss biology slash genetics and get into more detail about how the mind creates. To your first question, there is punishment for people who try to lighten the black nation. Nature has been reducing the sperm count of white men now for the last 100 years. The rate of reduction has increased over the past few years and will continue to increase until they can no longer procreate. That's why those who know are studying cloning. On the female side, the fertility of white women is decreasing at a rapid rate. They have to use more and more drugs to conceive. This is true also for light-skinned black men and women. The world is black by nature and will remain so forever. Any black person who, after being exposed to the facts, continues to try and lighten our people is sinning against God or the black nation. Nature has zero tolerance for stupidity. The consequence of such foolishness is extinction, or as said long ago, the wages of sin is death. On our part, we could do these brothers and sisters a big favor by exposing the truth as much as we can. Most of them are ignorant and only need to have their sense of pride built back up, pride in themselves and ancestors. If they consciously reject the truth, then they'll end up alongside the white race in the bottomless pit of hell called extinction, where there is no coming back. Their biological lineage will simply die out. You briefed us on the reasons that many traditional African people used scarification. Can you share anything about the significance of piercings? 
Can you share the background of clitoridectomies, etc. performed on many continental women mostly against their will? Gross piercings fall in the same category of reasons as scarification. I'm referring to the gross piercing of lips and the insertion of large discs in them. Ear piercings done modestly are for beauty and have been done ever since very ancient days. Clitorodectomies are performed for the reason everyone probably already knows, i.e. to discourage young women from self-pleasure. Older women who were raised very strictly believe that such an activity is harmful to the uprightness of a young person's character. Boys are also discouraged from masturbation, although circumcision is performed primarily for hygienic reasons. The custom of performing clitoridectomies arose after the science of soulmates was lost because the two are related to each other as well as to the scientific way of perfecting the character of a person. The science of character perfection and of soulmates go hand in hand. Next week or the week after I'll begin to discuss biology slash genetics and it'll become clear how the ancients raised people with absolutely perfect character in an infallible, scientific, and natural way. Sometime down the line I'll also discuss the rituals that were performed to teach pubescent youths all about sex and procreation as part of the science of soulmates. You'll see how this is tied to the perfection of character. All the lost sciences and customs will come back into use soon. It was because of their loss that young women have had to suffer the pains of forced mutilations as well as other unsavory customs that arose in an effort to counter the evils heaped upon black people by the appearance of the light races. The Mystery of Soulmates We were saying the original person became twelve gods, who then each became a man and a woman. They are called the twenty-four. Elders In order to rule the nation efficiently, the twelve gods chose twelve assistants each, called the 144 chiefs. Two chiefs, a man and his wife, are the heads of every clan, and there are seventy-two clans, six in every tribe. We were also saying every black person has a compliment. A compliment is a person who completes you. You may think as a man or a woman you are a complete person. But we are taught otherwise. We are taught the true meaning of the childish story about Eve coming from the rib of Adam. Although Adam and Eve refer to the light races, the part about the rib points to the way in which people are born on earth. Every two people of opposite gender are united as one in mind before birth. When they are born, they separate, one being born as a baby boy and the other somewhere else as a baby girl. To the immature mind of white people, who are but yesterday's children compared to the eternalness of black people, the story of the separation of one mind into two was explained to them in a sort of picture book manner appropriate to the level of their mentality. They were taught that Eve came from the rib of Adam, or Adam from the rib of Eve, because the separation can be looked at either way. Every man is incomplete without a woman, and every woman is incomplete without a man. Each one becomes complete when he or she unites with his or her complement. This is divine love, as opposed to fleshly or material love. Now I'm not passing judgment on love. I'm not qualified to do that, nor is anyone else. I'm simply stating facts as they are known to me, so please bear with me. This question of compliments is important for the understanding of why the ancient society was organized the way it was. To continue, the 144 chiefs were given 1,000 assistants each called judges, and the total number of people on earth became 144,000, plus the 144 chiefs and the 24 elders. The reason they are called judges has to do with the purpose of the universe. They pass judgment on the state of the universe at periodic intervals as to how far it has come in the achievement of its purpose. We'll explain in more detail later. The judges head every town in complementary pairs as well, a wife and husband being the two judges of each town. There were originally 72,000 towns, 6,000 in every tribe. This was a nation, brothers and sisters. It was serious business and serious organization. Black people filled the whole earth before YT came along. Don't buy into the lie that black people were only in Africa and YT etc. discovered the rest of the world. Not true. We had 12 separate countries spread over the whole earth, from Asia to Africa to the Americas and Europe. Yes, even Europe. There was a time when the climate there was not icy cold as it is today. 
black people lived there and left the same type of monuments everywhere they lived. Take a look at the monuments of Egypt, which it is finally admitted, were built by black people after many centuries of reluctance. This reluctance persisted for centuries despite the fact that Herodotus, the father of Caucasian history, stated very clearly 2,500 years ago that the ancient Egyptians were nappy hair midnight skinned black people. And how did he know? He went there while black people were still living there and ruling their own country. In those days, Egypt was to the whole world what America is today. Everybody who was anybody went there for learning, culture, fortune, and fame, just as people today come to America from all over the world. It was taken for granted then, just as it is today among whites, that black people were the most advanced people on earth. Herodotus says so without shame. Whites in those days were still in the infancy of developing their sense of superiority, which is now fully mature, albeit completely false. Take a look at the monuments of ancient Egypt as an example of what our people built. Then search all over the world for similar monuments, and you'll find them on every continent. If you want to find where Americans have been in the world, don't you look for McDonald's, Kentucky Fried, and Ford Automobiles? Those are Whitey's modern monuments that he leaves behind everywhere he goes. Black people left behind much more enduring monuments everywhere they lived. When you see megalithic stone structures so large that white people today look at them and say, how did they do that? No, without doubt when you see these monuments anywhere on earth that black people once lived there. This is true of Stonehenge in Britain, others in Europe and Asia, and the Great Walls in Central and South America, even in North America, i.e. all over the world. I hope you put this in a book. It's good to hear such a different perspective on these issues. I recently purchased a book called Song of the Stars by a Southern African man called Credo Mudwa. Have you ever heard of him? If so, what do you think of his views? Thanks. Yes, I've heard of him. He's what today is called a shaman or medicine man, but in the ancient days was called a custodian of rituals. What view of his did you have in mind that you're asking about? I didn't have a particular one in mind. I just wondered if, from your perspectives and sources, you believed him to be credible. That's all. Peace. I second that motion, the book thing. As for Credo, I have a DVD of his that was a joint project with David Ick. I have noticed that David Ick puts words into Cretito's mouth various times, but it seems that he agrees with Ick and that reptilian beings harvest humans and were the gods of old. Now I feel that Credo speaks to David in a manner which David Convey backslash eniently misinterprets to fit his own workings, but as for the reptilian thing, what's your analysis? Credo Mudwa is one of the most controversial Africans out there. He's understood much better by Africans in Africa, but very little outside, least of all by white people such as David Ick. They call him a witch doctor, as they call all indigenous shamans. If they have some measure of respect and don't call them that, then they go to them to get what they need to validate their preconceived notions and write their books, but never to learn the truth. That they cannot really do because the truth known by Mudwa and his peers concerns their origins and destiny. The minds of whites such as these cannot accept the truth of their real origin, let alone their destiny, which was predicted long ago. Shamans, knowing this, provide them with what they need to satisfy their curiosity and then send them on their way. Whenever you hear them speak, almost invariably you'll hear them say such and such a shaman confirmed such and such knowledge that I already had, which is not really knowledge but preconceived notions. Hardly ever will you hear them say I learned such and such a new thing that I never knew before. And so the shamans play right along with them. Now, Credo Mudwa, in addition to being a medicine man, is also a griot. He's one of a few people, he hardly ever forgets anything he's ever heard, seen, or read. Such people are chosen by their elders and told the history of their tribes. They must keep it safe until they can pass it to the next generation. It so happened that the next generation following his experienced a massive disruption of tribal life with the advent of large-scale urbanization all over Africa. Young people migrated in large numbers to urban areas to make a living, having no choice after they lost their land, water, and so on, mostly to white farmers, settlers, etc. 
that left almost no one that could be trained to carry on the torch of the griot, and people in Credo's craft were at a loss as to how to pass on the knowledge. The only avenue left was to publish books, and that's what he chose to do. Now and then you'll hear him say he's regarded as a traitor for publicizing secret knowledge. But the truth is, if he did not have the blessing of his peers, other shamans, he wouldn't have done it. Their brotherhood and sisterhood is very closely knit. He says these things only for the ears of whites, who after all were the only ones back in the 60s who could publish his books. Hearing him say such things couldn't have made them happier. There's nothing more pleasing to the light races than to cause mischief and strife among black people. So this infighting between Credo and other witch doctors pleased them to no end, and they published his books. He knew this, and took full advantage of it. That, in brief, is the explanation of how he became controversial. For those people who really think he's a traitor to his people and his craft, I'll quote a passage from one of his earlier books, Daba, My Children. He makes it clear what he thinks of white people. First he recalls an old African riddle, Tell me, tell me, I command you. Tell me the name of the beast I saw. Its hair was as long as a wild sable's tail. And the sun shone through its eyes and beard. And through its ears and mustache obviously this beast is the white man. He continues about whites so there is no misunderstanding. My books are intended to blast away once and for all the ludicrous fallacies about my people that are fed to us in schools and churches. The trouble seen in Africa, the unnecessary death and suffering had their origin in one thing and one thing only, the ignorance and selfish interests of your forebears, O white man and Arab. You carted millions of our people and sold them into slavery, to the cotton plantations of America and the sugar plantations of Jamaica. You set our tribes one against the other. When your attempts at exterminating us failed, you tried to civilize us, sacrificing our cultural heritage. You fed us falsehoods in your places of learning and threatened and cajoled us into accepting your religion. In your churches and mosques we suffer the humiliation of hearing our holy. Ancestors being called heathens and godless pagans. We'll leave it at that for people to make up their own minds. On the question of David Ick and reptilians and other extraterrestrials, I'll only say that Mutwa told him exactly what he expected to hear. The question of aliens, UFOs, spirits, and so on is far in the future of our discussions, almost at the very end. It cannot be understood without all the preliminary information that must be presented before. Suffice it to say that extraterrestrials are the descendants of the light races and not their progenitors. This statement will raise more questions than it will answer, but it must be left for the time when it can be addressed in its proper context. Thanks for the 411. I want to hear more, 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 more. I seem to recall that Credo Mudwin mentioned that both his son and wife met violent deaths. The son, I believe, was burned to death, necklacing is it called? Are these deaths supposed to be related to his controversiality? Oh, don't forget to write that book. I have suffered in the cause of my battle against shadows. When you are fighting against ignorance, you suffer just as much as you if you were on a battlefield under gunfire. I have lost people I love. I have lost a woman I love years ago in 1960 to the guns of the white man. To the guns of the oppressive regime and was falsely accused of being a supporter of. I lost a son, my firstborn son, innocent, to the knives of black activists, murdering people under the banner of the mass democratic movement. I came close to losing another son to the spears of the Ankata Freedom Party, God have mercy upon us. I have been cheated by whites who took advantage of my ignorance and stupidity and who robbed me of millions of rands of money I made out of my books. Even as I am talking to you now there is a white woman who deceived me into signing away everything that I wrote, everything that I painted, and everything that I sculpted. I have suffered and am still suffering. Even now there are white men that have set my own children, my sons, against me. A born-again Christian preacher of lies brain washed my daughter's mind and stole her away from me, saying, You must not talk to your father, he is a devil worshiper. Credo views a Mazalumudwa. HTTP colon slash slash www.credomutiwa.com slash biography 01.html 
The Lifespan of Ancient Black People The ancient society had 12 countries spread over the whole earth. Each country was divided into six clans, each clan was further divided into 100 districts, and each district had 10 towns. Each town was led by two judges, and there were 144,000 judges in total, as we have already said. Each judge was given 1,000 people to lead and the population became 144 million. The 24 elders then said to all the people, multiply and fill the earth. You will live for 7,000 years. Every person will replace himself or herself before passing. That is, each married couple will have two children. Here's where it becomes difficult for us black people to accept who we really are. We say, how can a person live for 7,000 years? After all, doesn't Whitey teach us that the whole creation is barely six oh years old? Rather, that's half of Whitey saying that, the half calling themselves creationists. The other half, when you think about it, say the same thing in different words. They say there were only apes before, modern people, who they call homo sapiens, are only some thousands of years old. Same story, same lie. But going back to the question of lifespan, doesn't it say in ancient writings that man's lifespan was much longer than it is today, lasting about 1,000 years? If it was 1,000 years 6,000 years ago, and declined, couldn't it have decreased from a much longer span? Our teachers say the normal lifespan of a black person is 7,000 years. They give a reason why that is so. We'll explain the reasons at another time. After the God said multiply and fill the earth, every person found his or her soulmate, got married, and had two children. After 1,000 years the population had doubled. The children grew up, became mature and responsible adults, got married, and had two children per family, just like their parents. They had a restriction on population growth, restricting each couple to only two children. A justly organized society must have population control. That is the only way for long-lived people to avoid overpopulation. You'll notice I said a justly organized society. Modern society is not justly organized. Its organization favors the light races, so population control is a negative word. More than that, it's an evil concept in the hands of white people, designed to try and exterminate the black population. The ancients called it population stabilization, and it's the polar opposite of population control as it is practiced today. The first is to foster a comfortable life, and the latter is used to fuel genocide. But to continue, after the children had their children, the population tripled. The grandchildren grew up and gave birth to the fourth generation. The fourth generation gave birth to the fifth. The fifth gave birth to the sixth. The sixth gave birth to the seventh, and the total population, starting with the first generation of 144 million, was now 7x 144 million, or 1 billion 8 million, 1b8m. 6,000 years had passed since the beginning. This became the fixed and stable population of the nation because when the next generation of 144 million was born, the first generation passed away, having lived 7,000 years. That is how our society began, and this part of our history is called, How God Became 1 Billion 8 Million People. These are the same 1B8M individual black people alive today. That's you and me. We are at the end of a cycle called the Cycle of YT. We are soon to begin a new cycle where the society returns to its original organization under the leadership of the 24 kings and queens. Just wanted to thank you for sharing this wealth of knowledge. It's most appreciated. Also, with regard to population control during our lost culture, what are your views, if any, on the idea that some Nubians have today with having as many children as possible, as opposed to limiting to let's say two children per couple as has been advocated by people such as Dr. Francis Chris Welsing? Many argue that limiting the number of children will only further weaken us by reducing our overall numbers and our battle against white supremacy and that therefore we should procreate as much as possible, strength in numbers, so to speak. To limit black couples to two children per family would not be a good idea at this time. We black people are living outside of our natural way of life and have been for 6,000 years. 
To impose such a drastic measure of population control on ourselves now would play right into the hands of YT, who would love nothing more than to see our extinction. On the other hand, some people may say such a measure would be fitting for a few people, especially those who live continuously in dire circumstances of need. But it would perhaps be wiser to improve our individual economic circumstances as best we can, rather than to stay in poverty and have fewer children. Nonetheless, the total number of black people is steadily increasing all over the world. It's approaching its natural maximum of 1 billion 8 million. When this total is reached, it will fulfill one of the two requirements for bringing this cycle of time to an end. I know I'm a little late in this, but a while back you talked about scarification and how it was a symbol of our self-hate. I may not be quoting you correctly, but anyway. From the outside looking in, I look at the scars and I like their appearance, but at the same time I am not the one suffering to receive them so I understand my position in that, but at the same time I was watching a documentary and it was showing scarification of young children, boys, around the ages of 2 to 4 I think. Anyway one of the people interviewed spoke about how it brings the children into reality in the sense that it is not always happy. This is useful today throughout the diaspora, but I can see the relation to colonizers and missionaries. Is this just a perversion to a lost but correctly order rite of passage? I wanted to point out where I cited you calling God him. How does that relate to ancient Africa? Are you calling God a man? I don't see how that concept relates to our ancestors. Does your spiritual science relate a patriarch? I'm afraid you did misquote me. Scarification was never a symbol of self-hate. On the contrary, it was out of self-love and love of each other that our people resorted to such an extreme measure. They knew that the slavers desired the most beautiful of our people in order to get the highest prices in the slave market. So they scarred themselves to make themselves ugly. This enabled them to stay with their beloved. Obviously to go to such an extreme is a result of self-love and the desire to survive among one's own beloved. Later on, when slavery was over, this custom remained even though the real reasons had long been forgotten, because customs, especially old ones, are treated with much reverence. The custodians of customs in each tribe then devised different reasons in order to continue them, and in some places, the customs were modified and made more palatable. So today there are as many different reasons for it as there are tribes. God is both him and her. God is both the black man and woman. The use of the word he is a fault of the English language. You'll agree that it's cumbersome and distracting to keep saying he's she, so I use he, following convention. When you say, I don't see how that concept relates to our ancestors, I'm afraid you're imposing a foreign concept on our ancestors. The arch deceivers designed their language specifically for this purpose of confusion, so you're playing right into their hands. This foul language has nothing whatsoever to do with our people. In our language there is only one word for both him and her. The word is O. Oh. It refers to God as he she is before separating to be born as a black baby boy or baby girl. But the word also refers to both male and female because each one is God. First off, let's not belittle each other with he said she said. Everything I presented was completely hypothetical in nature. I was not trying to impose any Freighton concepts on our ancestors. I was more or less checking to see where your head was at. Your decision to use him for God is the same one a brother of mine uses. I haven't been presented with the idea of the 25 to 35,000 year reigns. From my research I have found that there is no profound reason for while matriarchs are more common in the ancient world than present and that is solely because the child passes through the mother's womb thus so will the lineage. The ancestors used a common sense approach. The ancient idea of lineage is not one of power, but one of order and balance. The common accepted concepts of either style of lineage are more than often Euro in nature. Finally, I wanted to admit that I've never been presented with your idea on the 24 elders. I'm familiar with the 36 netters of KMT. Any appearance that I'm trying to belittle is just that, an appearance. It would be foolish of me to belittle any black person while trying to remind other black people how great they are. On the question of patriarchies, our society indeed did have patriarchies and matriarchies. 
Each one lasted for 25,000 years, after which the entire society reversed all its customs and adopted the other system. This is because our system of government is set up in such a way that the 24 elders alternate when they rotate the leadership. In other words, the rule of each king, which lasts for 25,000 years, is immediately followed by that of a queen, for the same length of time. So the people live under a patriarchy for 25,000 to 35,000 years, after which they live under a matriarchy for the same length of time, because 12 of the elders are women and 12 are men. I hope I've made it clearer. Bukurtz, I know that you are trying to answer everyone's question as ASAP therefore, I wait patiently on a reply about black holes. Just a reminder. Peace. Your question is still top priority. The topic of black holes is very involved, though. I have to talk first about cosmology in general, and how suns are created, and how they then become black holes. This will be a few weeks down the line, but I'll do it. Thanks for the continued education. Again, I hope I'm not misinterpreting you, but how was balance maintained among the ancients during the times of either patriarchal or matriarchal rule? It would seem that things could become specifically one-sided during the either slash or periods. Wouldn't this have been detrimental to some degree as opposed to a more balanced, simultaneous sharing of power? Forgive me for thinking in the Western mode of patriarchal slash matriarchal relations, but I mean how would the end of such an extensive era come about peacefully or under war conditions? Peace. When a king hands over rule to a queen, all the female judges are trained for about 100 years by the queen of their tribe and initiated into all the new rituals. The judges then initiate new custodians of rituals in every town. This entire process lasts for 1,400 years and is deliberate and meticulous. It does not involve any kind of strife at all because it has been going on back and forth for countless trillions of years, ever since it was established by the B8M original gods. Now when the transition is complete, the youngest generation is raised under this matriarchal system, while the rest of the population continues to perform patriarchal rituals, except, of course, those rituals that are gender-specific, meaning for women only or for men only. Those never change. After 6,000 years, all the older generations have passed away, and the first generation to be raised under a matriarchy are now the oldest generation. There is not a single person left on earth other than the leaders who remembers anything at all about the old patriarchal system. The matriarchy continues for 25,000 years as if the earth had always been that way until a king takes over the crown. Then the opposite occurs, a new patriarchy is established and lasts for another 25,000 years. The concept of balance was viewed differently then than it is now. To our ancestors the law of balance is the law of the pendulum, which swings one way and then the other. Our lifespan is too short to observe the fairness of this law. The ancients were so long lived that to them balance meant a totally different thing. Each king or queen who rules the earth has to fulfill a purpose unique to him or her. No two rulers have the same purpose. Altogether there are 24 purposes lasting for 700,000 years. The 24 purposes of society come in two versions, 12 male purposes and 12 female. Each one is the manifestation of one of the two aspects of God, either the male or female aspect. In order for each king to fulfill the mission of his kingdom, he must swing the pendulum all the way to the extreme in the form of a patriarchal society. The same is true with the queen. The reason for this is that it would be impossible to manifest certain attributes of the male aspect of God if the king did not have 100% power over the whole nation. If he shared power evenly with the queen in the balanced way you suggested, it would be impossible for him to fulfill his mission. He would be hindered by objections from the queen when it came to fulfilling certain plans that are contrary to a woman's nature. I'm speaking in general terms to illustrate very specific things. But I'll give you an example. Right now we are in the 15,000th year of a patriarchal system. The king of our earth has 10,000 years more to rule. He has absolute power on all important matters. If he did not, it would not have been possible to make the light races. 
Such an evil being would not have been made if the queens had a say in it, because the turmoil, disruption, and evil that was foreseen goes against the feminine nature, which is gentle and peace-loving. Similarly, there are certain feminine aspects of God that must be manifested as well, that a king would not think of on his own. In the end, the extreme female aspects of God always balance those of his male nature. My explanation above would perhaps give the impression that there is disagreement between the ruling king and his queen, or the ruling queen and her king. Such is not the case. The elders are always united in purpose, as they are always of one mind and heart. But this is not the case in all people. The ordinary people are in varying stages of reaching the perfection of divine unity in which the elders live. The mission and purpose of every king and queen ultimately depends on the cooperation of the ordinary people in order to be fulfilled. When the king or queen has absolute, unquestioned power in a patriarchy or matriarchy, it's not only easier but also efficient, and that his or her plans will be executed to the smallest detail. Obviously, our system has endured forever because the rulers are the personification of goodness itself, otherwise it would be a dictatorship. That, in brief, is the real reason for long-lasting matriarchies and patriarchies. Having said all that, I'd suggest that it would be a mistake to evaluate our ancient system using the present form of white patriarchy for comparison. Our system has nothing in common with theirs. They use patriarchy for domination. To them it's an excuse to oppress the woman, whereas to the ancients it's an opportunity to reveal the male nature of God, which is always good. Black Roots, I enjoy and have learned a lot from the knowledge of self and nature you've posted. Being that knowledge without under slash inner slash overstanding isn't complete, I ask these questions for the purpose of under slash inner slash overstanding. There are a lot of similarities between what you've shared in your posts, such as the 12 tribes and 24 elders, and the Nation of Islam's teachings. Are you familiar with any of the Nation of Islam's teachings? If so, what is your view on Master Fard Muhammad being called the Godhead of the Council of the 24 Elders, and I would also like to know your view on the teachings on Yakub. Yes, I'm familiar with the teachings of Elijah Muhammad, which are true. The rest of your questions require more time to answer, so I'll postpone answering them until Monday or Tuesday. Here's the answer to the rest of your questions. As I mentioned in a previous post, and as you're probably aware from your knowledge of our nation's history, black people used to inhabit the whole earth. We had 12 countries spread all over, on every continent starting in Asia and the Pacific, across Africa and Europe, and all the way to the Americas. 44. When the light races appeared 6,000 years ago, they forced the evacuation of some of our ancestors from all the continents and into Africa. There were remnants of our people left everywhere, and their descendants are still to be found in the most unusual places, although their bloodlines have been very much diluted. Around 6,000 years ago, when our ancestors began migrating in large numbers, the centers of civilization kept changing from place to place. There was a time when India was the center of black culture. Then it moved north into the area now called Pakistan. Then it switched completely after a couple of millennia to South and Central America. It then moved again to Asia, where Egypt and the Middle East, including Sumer, or what is now called Iraq, became the capital of the world. Toward the end of its dynasties, Egypt became lighter-skinned in its leadership as more social interaction occurred between black people and the light races. Now and then, when the lighter-skinned pharaohs totally corrupted it, a black pharaoh would be raised either from Ethiopia or southern Egypt, also known as Upper Egypt. He or she would then take over and restore civilized culture. Egypt prospered during the reigns of these black pharaohs, as can be seen in the fact that the greatest monuments were built during their reign. Examples are King Taharqa, Queen Hatshepsut, and King Zagnaton and Tutankhamun. Egypt deteriorated when light-skinned pharaohs came back into power because their allegiance was not to the black population, but only to power. A good example is Ramesses and his father. These cycles of prosperity and misery were the direct result of the infiltration of the light races into our culture. What happened in Egypt happened identically on every other continent. When the misery and oppression of the people became almost unbearable, a savior always rose up among them to offer them comfort. Over the last 6,000 years there have been seven saviors. 
They are called Mahdi's in Arabic. The first savior to comfort our people was born when India was the center of the black world at the very beginning of the existence of the light races. Since then, a savior has come approximately every 1,000 years. Now, I'll mention at this point that one of the biggest weapons of the arch deceivers is to steal our cultural legacies. Not only have white people stolen our lands, but they have also succeeded in stealing our ancestors as well, which is a much more sinister type of robbery. They adopt the culture and language, then proceed to corrupt them beyond recognition of the regions of black people that they invaded and settled either through warfare or slowly through social and economic infiltration. Then after some centuries they claim all our great ancestors as their own. The most successful at this are the Jews, Arabs, and other Middle Easterners who say that the ancients of the Old Testament were white like them, when in fact they were black people. The second savior came about a thousand years later in what is now called Pakistan. In the third millennium of the existence of the races, the center of civilization moved from Asia to the Americas. Their black people built a mighty civilization. It was also in that millennium that the hordes of marauding Mongols crossed the Bering Strait from Eastern Europe into Alaska. Some of them remained in the northern cold climates and became today's Eskimos. Most of them migrated southward to warmer climates in North, Central, and South America, where black people lived. Their social interaction with our people resulted in the people today called Native Americans, most of which, as you well know, were recently wiped out by the white Americans. In those ancient days, these Mongols drove black people out of the Americas. Their way of living was so base and foul that after they had assumed power, most black people abandoned those lands and crossed the Atlantic into Africa. There they joined their brothers and sisters in what was then the Ethiopian Empire. A few remained behind, and their descendants are still to be found today in Central and South America. At the peak of the Mongols' corrupt rule, before the mass migration into Africa, the oppression reached its climax. A third savior was born at that time among the black people. He taught his generation about their origins and about the origins of the light races. He forecast for them the end of the era of the light races. Mayans later transcribed the forecast onto a tablet of stone called the Mayan calendar. Many black people migrated into Africa soon after his passing. From Ethiopia, they sent colonists up north into the marshes and deltas of the Nile River. They transformed that land and built the mighty civilization of Egypt. After many centuries of peace, white people found their way into that country as well. Soon they had succeeded in bringing untold corruption and deceit into a peaceful society. They proceeded to occupy positions of power, and soon their mixed children became pharaohs and priests. Oppression and misery followed in short order, and at that time a fourth messiah was born among the population. His name was Moses. With the help of his brother he taught and comforted our people, while at the same time trying to re-civilize the light races who had deteriorated into the lowest state of moral and social degradation. About a thousand years later the suffering of black people again reached a peak in the Middle East, where many had settled after escaping from Egypt. In one of their settlements known today as Palestine, a fifth savior was born by the name of Jesus. Along with his assistant John, they taught and consoled the people. The dispute about the racial identity of Jesus will continue until the end, even though the Bible states that he had hair the texture of lamb's wool and skin the color of burnished copper. The sixth Messiah is also well known by the name of Muhammad of the Islamic religion. As has happened with each and every savior, his legacy was stolen by the arch deceivers and claimed as their own. They built the religion of Islam around the legend of this black man, using his teachings in a corrupted way. His teachings, like those of other saviors, were mostly about the right way of living, and about the origin, nature, and destiny of the light races, whom he called devils. These same devils turned his teaching inside out and made it into an oppressive religion by which they continue to oppress each other and Africans to this day. Islam can only be salvaged from its quagmire by black people and not by white Muslims. The same is true for Christianity, which is a similar corruption of Jesus' teachings. The seventh and last Mahdi was Fard Muhammad and the last prophet Elijah. 
They taught their generation of our people at a time when the whites were getting ready to take their deceptions to the final and highest level. Fortunately for us, and unfortunately for them, they gained worldwide power at the very time when their era comes to an end. They have simply run out of time, and are now coming face to face with their self-created destruction. All seven Mahdis were sent by the elders and the 144 chiefs, who are still in control of the Earth's destiny, despite the madness of the light races all around us. There is no person who is the god of all the other elders. All the elders are united as one in mind and heart and together form the custodianship of what we call God. In truth, God is the divine unity of all one billion eight million black people on earth. The elders are the custodians of this divine unity, the ones who keep it conscious in their minds until all people are able to join in it. 60. They choose one among them to rule the whole nation for 25,000 years and rotate this period of leadership among all 24. As they rotate, they also alternate, meaning every king is followed immediately by a queen, and vice versa, because twelve of the elders are men and twelve are women. As to whether Fard Muhammad is one of the elders or not, it is not proper for me to say. There are many things that each one of us will remember when the time comes. I only intend to outline our history and destiny in general terms. The rest of the story, as they say, will soon be known. I'll talk about Yakub when I talk about Lucifer in a later post. I'm not implying here that Yakub and Lucifer are the same. Yakub is not Lucifer, but his maker. Black Roots, before engaging any further or into a more technical dialogue, I have just one question. Do you believe that everything that them, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, taught is 100% truth? My brother, I don't concern myself with beliefs. I know that the prophet Elijah is taught the truth, because I was taught the same truth by the elders of my tribe in my initiation. Now before you engage me in a debate, stop for a moment and ask yourself, do you know the truth of Elijah from first-hand knowledge? So I would ask you to collect that truth that you are absolutely sure of and post it here for the benefit of the people. That is the higher purpose to which Elijah Muhammad dedicated his life, and not the glorification of himself or any religion. The time for such things is over. Now there is only one purpose, to end the cycle of YT without another 100 year delay. Black Roots, you've stated that Prophet Muhammad was a black man. This contradicts them in the Theology of Time lecture series dated June 4th, 1972. You can go to www.7thfam.com and hear them say in his own words that Prophet Muhammad 1400 years ago was a white man. They have it online in audio, it's the June 4th, 1972 tape part 1 side 1. As far as the Mongolians migrating here across the Bering Strait. Here's a quote also from Message to the Black Man Chapter 55. The black man produces these four colors, brown, red, yellow, and white. The original people, whom the white race found here, red people, were the brothers of the black man, they are referred to as the Red Indians. The Indian part of the name must refer to the name of the country from which they came, India. The all-wise Allah said that they came here 16,000 years ago and that they were exiled from India for breaking the law of Islam. Aren't Mongolians from Mongolia? Also, according to the teachings of the Nation of Islam, the 24 elders, also called scientists, are like a secret order. This secret order are said to be the wisest men on the planet. The 24th is said to be wiser than the other 23. The wisest one is called the Supreme Being. They teach that Master Fard Muhammad is the Supreme Being in this present cycle. They don't teach, at least I've never read it in any of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's literature nor in the Lost Found Muslim Lessons that any of these scientists are women. You did say that you don't believe, but know that the teachings of them are true. So how do you explain these contradictions? I look forward to your reply. Peace. I have a strong suspicion your goal is the same as ours concerning white people. We only differ in that you want to glorify Elijah and far above all, when in fact all black people are already glorified as one. We have been glorified since eternity, are now, and ever shall be. The reason Elijah said that Muhammad was a white man was to get the attention of his followers away from white Islam back to his own teachings. 
he made this statement in the latter part of his life, after the disagreement with Malcolm X. After that time, a lot of his followers went to white Islam and began to reject true Islam as taught by him. To dissuade them, he told them that the founder of the religion they were trying to embrace was a white man. This worked to bring a lot of black people back to his teachings. It's clear from his writings that he knew Muhammad was a black man. For instance, he made statements such as, Muhammad was given the knowledge of the devils by the elders. He was told that he could not reform the devils and that the race had 1,400 more years to live. The only way to make them righteous was to graft them back into the black nation. Does this make sense if Muhammad was himself a devil? He told the truth about him much earlier in his writings. For instance, in 1957 when he was writing a regular news column in the Pittsburgh Courier on February 2nd, he said, The old Christian missionaries who wrote on the life of Muhammad were his enemies. They were so grieved over the success of Muhammad and Islam that they wrote falsely against this man of God by attributing his success to the use of the sword instead of to Allah. All who hate Islam use these same false charges against Muhammad. As I have said before in this column, Muhammad was a member of the black nation, and the white race, by nature, is against the black man. There's an important reason why he never mentioned that twelve of the elders were women. The mission of Fard and Muhammad was to lay the foundation for the formation of the 144,000 so-called elect. In order to do this, they needed a solid plan to make sure they would succeed. Back in the 30s when they were beginning the recruitment of followers for their movement, it was still generally believed by many people, white as well as black, that men and women are not equal. This lie is 6,000 years old. It has deepened since the advent of Christianity and was spread even more after the advent of Islam, where women to this day are more oppressed than in Christianity. With this prevalent attitude, it would have been impossible to start a fledgling movement from scratch if they were to teach that God is a black woman. Who would have followed such a teaching? Even today, a lot of people are outraged when told that God is a woman as well as a man. But that is the most fundamental truth of all. God is united in the mind of the elders as two soul mates. At the time of conception, he she separates and is born as a black boy and girl. This is most difficult for some men to accept. Even some women are shaken when they hear this, they prefer to leave the creation of the universe in the hands of the strong male figure. That's wishful thinking. Reality is real. God is both male and female. To circumvent this obstacle, Fard and Elijah decided to teach that twelve of the scientists were major and twelve minor. Later on, they said twelve were fathers and the other twelve their sons. This proved to be acceptable and they proceeded to form the most significant black movement since the time of the first Muhammad. The idea that the 24 elders are not ever to reveal knowledge means that this knowledge is held in custodianship by the custodians of knowledge in some African tribes. There is certain knowledge that is held only by the 24 elders that they do not reveal for practical reasons. For example, they never reveal, for a set period, who's the next couple that will join the eldership when the king and queen pass away, or rather, ascend. There is a practical reason for this that I will discuss when I talk about the eldership and how people become elders. The idea that the 24th elder is the supreme god is a misinterpretation. It's understandable how much Elijah was awed by Fard's knowledge, and thus came to the conclusion that he must be an elder and a supreme god. The king or queen of the earth is supreme not because of being a superior person, superior to all other black people. There is no person who is superior to all other black people. All black people come from oneness. God, divine unity of all black people, separated into two then three then seven then twelve then one hundred forty four then one hundred forty four thousand then one hundred forty four million then after seven generations became one billion eight million. The 1B8M black people on earth today are those very same gods. The reason one of the elders is supreme is simply because he or she is the oldest. The king or queen of the earth is the oldest person on earth, being around 700,000 years old. This longevity, in our natural world, translates directly into wisdom. Wisdom is the accumulation of life experiences. 
When all people are equal in mental abilities, as the ancients were, the oldest is naturally the wisest, since he or she has experienced more, and has undergone more rituals of initiation. That's what makes the king or queen supreme. There is nothing mystical in the way our ancestors lived. Their way of life was simple and natural, albeit the simplest things are the highest in terms of civilization and are the hardest to comprehend in this day and age. God is ultimate simplicity, beyond which nothing is simpler. All the complexities of the universe come from this simplicity or unity. On your last point, Mongolians became Red Indians after social mixing with black people. Black people lived all over the earth, including India. They still live there, some as black as midnight. If those were the people Elijah was referring to as red Indians, he would have called them black, not red, as they still are black even today. You'll notice he said, the name Indian must be because. That word must shows this is not a definite statement. The features and stature of these people make it clear they are mongoloid. I didn't present this information for the sake of argument. I did it for the purpose of gaining clarity. Was I raised by a parent that followed them? Yes. Was I well grounded in them teachings? Yes. Do I seek to glorify W.D. Fard and them above all? No. You are the one that stated that what them taught is 100% truth. Now you say that he made misinterpretations and taught things that are in error for the purpose of gaining followers. Which is it? I seek clarity not argument on this issue. I never said that what them taught is 100% truth. I'm just a young brother searching for the truth. I thought you would be an excellent resource to guide me on my search, but now you're confusing me. I am learning a great deal from the knowledge of science you've been teaching. But on this particular issue you haven't cleared things up for me. You are being argumentative. I never used the word 100%, you did. You chose that word specifically to entrap and start an argument. Obviously we could go back and forth for a long time about the accuracy of every statement Elijah ever made. I have no interest whatsoever in rehashing his teachings. He completed his mission successfully beyond even his highest expectation. Soon there will arise many people among the followers of his teachings who will be at the forefront of forming the new society. That was his mission. Mine is different. Although I cannot tell you fully what it is now, I can tell you that part of it is to introduce the same truth from a wider perspective to people who are put off by the nation of Islam. The goal is to embrace as many black people as possible in this truth. The sooner will this cycle end when that is achieved. If Elijah said Muhammad was white for the reason I stated, of what consequence is it in the larger scheme? I already showed you where he revealed the truth about Muhammad. If he found it necessary to say certain things to guarantee success, what does it matter in the long run? The goal of true teachings is not to fossilize them into a religion or an intellectual exercise, but to outgrow them. Written and spoken truth is dynamic. A person must grow with it and accept the necessary adjustments to complete his understanding. The only form of truth that is infallible is the living truth experienced in initiation. Until then, one has to do the best he can to keep elevating himself to higher truths until the time when the ancient system of learning is re-established. If you really seek guidance from me, then continue to study my posts carefully. If you find any contradictions, first try and reconcile them using your own intuition, which is the highest form of guidance. If you cannot reconcile them, then let's discuss them, but from a point of view of goodwill and not belligerence. Black Roots, what matters in the long run is that I provided numerous examples of how you contradicted a man's teachings that you stated are true. Just because I'm questioning some things you've presented, and its authenticity, I'm being argumentative? When a student questions his or her teacher, it's not taken to be argumentative. It's taken to be that the student is seeking clarity and under slash inner slash overstanding. He never mentioned that there would be anyone coming behind with a mission. This is what he did say. Transcribed from the audio taped lecture of Theology of Time, September 3, 1972. I'm the last man to attempt pulling you out of the power of the white man and putting you in the power of divine. I'm the last one. There is no other one coming. 
the others that will come, they're coming to destroy you for not listening to what I'm teaching you. In closing, message to the black man answer to critics, my mission is to give life. The following is an excerpt from an interview granted to the National Educational Television Network. The series of interviews took place in Phoenix, Arizona, and were conducted over a period of several days by the staff of San Francisco Station KQED. Question, how would you describe your mission? Answer, my mission is to give life to the dead. What I teach brings them out of death and into life. My mission, as the messenger, is to bring the truth to the world before the world is destroyed. There will be no other messenger. I am the last, and after me will come God himself. I do not say I will live so long as that, but when God comes, if it pleases him, I may be with him. However, if I am not with him, this is the final. The truth I bring will give you the knowledge of yourself and of God. That was from the book message to the black man chapter 133. As far as the 100% part, this is how it went down. Black Roots, before engaging any further or into a more technical dialogue, I have just one question. Do you believe that everything that them taught is 100% truth? You said. My brother, I don't concern myself with beliefs. I know that the prophet Elijah taught the truth. Peace. Will you please stop mentioning this idea of 100%? This is a foolish notion. There is no such thing as 100% written or spoken truth. Truth takes on perfection or 100% ness only in the form of real, living experience. Living experience, or ultimate truth, cannot be written down or spoken, but only experienced. If you eat an apple, can you describe the experience 100%? No. And yet it's such a simple experience that even a baby or an animal knows it. What then of past experiences of universal importance? They cannot be described and understood 100%. They can only be experienced 100%. And the only way is by rituals. There is no other way. There are contradictions in what Elijah taught, but this is natural as long as it's limited and harmless. The only important thing is the final goal. I've belabored this too long already, so I'll conclude by saying the idea of 100% belongs to white people. They used it to start their religions, claiming that the Bible etc. is the 100% word of God. Then they proceeded to murder and pillage because of it. That's how dangerous this idea is, and its fallacy should be clear to the common sense that lives in every black person that the light races don't have. Black Roots, regardless of our disagreement, much of what you've posted I found to be vital and valid. You've introduced us to a unique and comprehensible way of grasping an under slash inner slash overstanding of science. I look forward to more of your posts. Much appreciated, brother. I have agreed with everything you have posted, mostly because the facts are facts, and partially because it feels right you threw me off, Jesus? Moses? John? These names are fictitious. Did you use them because of simplicity? Can you give me the real names of the ones you mentioned and also the names of the ones you did not mention, i.e. the first three saviors? Thanks. Question, I have been digging and I have found something worth noting. The white supremacy flex. When did that start? I have a feeling it was PPL who commissioned Alexander the Great, I noticed that after Alex went to Egypt he never went any further into Africa, when the Romans came and they made it no further than northern Nubia, Sudan. Josephus, author of Antiquities, was a Pharisee, and thus in opposition to the teachings of Jesus, but he writes a book supporting Jesus? This was after he was captured by the Romans, side note, wasn't he working for the Romans, thus he was protected during a major revolt by the Romans during a major revolt, and after Nero committed suicide, the next two Caesars mysteriously died then Flavius gets the throne, Josephus becomes his advisor for thirty years. Isn't that a coincidence now after Flavius dies his son's reign, and that how Josephus was the advisor to Flavius' family for thirty years? Why did the other two Caesars mysteriously die, and then Flavius gets a long reign? I have a feeling ITY has to do with the Roman senators at that time, because not so long after Eusbesia starts quoting Josephus and Christianity is established by an emperor of Rome Constantine. 
Can you shed some light on this, and don't forget to talk about Jesus because that confused me, for a sec. Jesus Christ is not a real person, so who are you referring to Waishwa Ben Pandira? Or something, like that or am I way off? The name Jesus is fictitious, as you rightly say. It's a translation to Greek then, to Latin then, to English. But the person himself is not a fiction. He's absolutely real. His language was Aramaic. His father's name is translated into English as Joseph, which is a translation of an Aramaic name that can best be approximated by the Arabic name Yusuf. So Jesus' Aramaic name can be pronounced as Yeshua ben Yusuf, which means Jesus son of Joseph. This too is an approximation. I suppose you're aware that Aramaic uses a different type of alphabet, similar to Hebrew, so the names cannot be reproduced exactly. The name of the man called John the Baptist was Yashanan, also an Aramaic name. Moses, on the other hand, was pure black Egyptian in language and culture. His Egyptian name can be approximated as Mosa. This is the closest and most accurate approximation because this name is still common among some southern African tribes and means the same thing now as it did then. Mosa means mercy. The first Mahdi was a black man by the name of Rama. Long after he passed, the Hindus began to worship him as the incarnation of Vishnu. Their god Rama is based on his legend. The second Mahdi was named Zarathustra, also recorded as Zoro or Zoroaster in ancient Persian legends. Zarathustra is the best approximation of how to pronounce his name. Long after he passed, the Persians started a religion based on his legend and called it Zoroastrianism. That religion is a corrupted interpretation of his teachings, as has happened with each and every messiah. All the great religions of the world are a corruption of the teachings of one of the first six saviors. These are Hinduism slash Buddhism, Zoroastrianism, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and the Native American worship. If it were not for the intervention of time, the teachings of Fard and Elijah would also be corrupted in due course, as white people would not pass up such an opportunity. They have done it six previous times. The third savior was a black man by the name of Quetzal. This is not Quetzalcoatl. Quetzalcoatl was a white man who came some millennia later. He was revered by the Native Americans of his time, who were white then, or rather Mongolian. But the legend of Quetzal was still so strong in their culture that they named this white ruler after the original Quetzal. The name Quetzalcoatl means pale-skin Quetzal, or white Quetzal. That's an indication that they knew by legend even though they had forgotten consciously that the original Quetzal was a black man. On the details of Greek and Roman history that you're investigating, I'll just say those issues were as complex then as modern politics. That's where the intrigues of modern politics began. To try and untangle the machinations of those people would take many volumes. It's better, I think, to simply focus on their intentions and long-term influences rather than the details of their political lives. One can get lost in such details for interminably long periods of time. I still do not believe that a Jesus Christ, a person who was in the court of Pontius Pilate, which by the way Pilate never mentions, neither does Herod, existed. Is it issue of Ben Procuria, S.P., or Ben Pandira that you are referring to, or is it someone else? It's Yeshua Ben Yusuf, as I've indicated. His name is not Christ. He was never in the court of Pilate. The story as reported in the Bible never happened. It's a complete fabrication based on the true events of a real person. This same deception happened like clockwork with the four Mahdi's prior to him. That's how we got all the major religions on earth. The deceivers use the same formula every time simply because it works. Since the case of Jesus seems so important to you, I'll prepare a post on his real teachings. Brother, maybe this could help answer some of your questions concerning Josephus. I found this on the Sousa website link. HTTP colon slash slash members dot tripod dot com slash tilde Roiklana. I don't know how accurate this is, but it's good reading. Peace. Bukurtz, when you get a chance check out that link and let me know what you think. The Roman Piso story on that website is an attempt by some to glorify the intellects of white people to superhuman status. 
They're trying to infer that Piso and company had such godly intellects that they could sit down and not only design reality, but also execute it to perfection. Reality does not work that way. There are designers of reality, but they are not white people. Whites are made people, they are not self-created. The best they can do is to go with the tide. Now it so happens that the tide is going their way, by design, so it's easy for them to take credit. But real events never come about by being designed by some super-intelligent white people behind the scenes. If you study the history of all major events as well as major inventions, you'll notice a consistent pattern. They all seem to happen accidentally. In other words, things seem to happen in a particular way, and white people are always the first in line to take advantage. And then they go a step further and claim credit for things that they, and all observant people, know were not produced by them. For example, Americans take credit for the downfall of the Soviet Union and write books about how cleverly Reagan etc. planned it and executed it. Upon a closer look, it becomes clear that like chameleons, they continually adapted themselves to every change in the situation to put themselves at an advantage. After it was all over, they claimed to have planned it. That's how they extol themselves and glorify themselves into gods. This is what is meant in the Bible where it says Lucifer is always blinded by his pride. He doesn't have the ability to see the true designers of reality, so he claims credit for it. The rise of Christianity was destined to happen. White people were destined to be the ones riding the waves leading to its formation. But they were not in command of singular events, especially the most important ones. All of history as it has unfolded over the past 6,000 years was predestined. Whites, etc. were put in it in order to reveal the nature of immoral beings. But they had a choice. Every major event in history has periods of decision in it, or forks in the road, so to speak, where the participants are given the opportunity to follow either the path of good or evil. Whites throughout all history have chosen the path of evil because it better suits their nature. They used all those crucial points in history to take selfish control of the world in order to try and appease their insatiable greed. So when history is looked at in retrospect, it's easy for them to say they and their ancestors were the coordinators and orchestrators of all major events. That is not true. Study any major invention as an example of how reality truly works. You'll see in every autobiography of every major white inventor that they really had little to do with the origination of the invention. They either got it from a black person or discovered it by accident. Major historical events work the same way on a larger, worldwide scale. The law is the same, as above, so below. 128. What is possible for them, and easy to do, is to insert themselves in the right places at the right time, and apply a little pressure. That's all it takes, somewhat like pushing a swing with a little force to get a large movement, once it has established a rhythm. Do you believe that the emerald tablets of thought that they've posted on? www.crystalinks.com slash emerald.html is not the real deal? Couldn't it be that this is just another version of the distorted translations of the Emeralds of Thoth? The true motives of these white brotherhoods such as the one on that website can be seen most of the time in what they say about black people. First off, Doriel calls his organization the White Brotherhood or Brotherhood of the White Lodge. That says a lot right there. Most of the whites that join or sympathize with such groups and read their material know that the ancient Egyptians were black people. So in the preface of that website, they call them barbarous. To call them barbarous is an outright lie. They were civilized people, their culture being more civilized than modern culture. Their purpose here is to put down our ancestors in order to elevate their own. He goes on to say that the god Thoth came into Egypt 50,000 years ago and civilized our ancestors. Although he doesn't say so directly, he's implying that Thoth was a white man, civilizing the barbarous blacks. He's mixing truth and lies in the way that whites have done for 6,000 years. This is by far the most effective way to deceive. He's mixing the story of a real black god by making him white to promote his idea of white supremacy. And he does this right at the beginning, so that the white is superior slash black is inferior scenario is established early by implication. 
Then he mixes in a lot of true facts to make the whole thing sound truthful. It's nothing but classic trignology, a fitting name used by Elijah Muhammad to describe this type of deception. The fact is that white people did not exist 6,000 years ago, but the liars and deceivers like to claim that they did. Introduction to Chemistry We will pick up later where we left off with the ancient history of our people. Some events in the history require the understanding of more scientific concepts. So we continue now with an ancient perspective on chemistry using modern concepts. We have already explained that physics and astronomy are the same. The first deals with atoms and electrons, while the latter deals with stars and planets. Atoms and electrons are tiny stars and planets. Not metaphorically, but in actual fact. They are the star systems of the previous universe that became the seed that gave birth to the present universe. That is how God expands his mind outside of eternity and simultaneously increases the creation. Not by a big bang, but as naturally as a flower grows from a seed. The law of creation is, as above, so below. By studying one, we will know the other, because what is above is identical to what is below, differing only in size. The laws and proportions are identical. The next question then to be answered is, what is chemistry? Is it related to physics slash astronomy? Chemistry is the understanding of how atoms combine to form compounds using the magnetic laws of attraction. Compounds are things like water, air, fake nails, rocks, jello, and gold teeth. They are all made of atoms combining or compounding with each. Other according to two basic laws of attraction called the first magnetic law of attraction and the second magnetic law of attraction. Modern scientists have discovered the basic natural elements. They then added artificial elements to the list to make up what they call their periodic table of elements. The periodic table of elements is a list of all the basic natural elements found on Earth. Basic natural elements are naturally occurring elements, i.e. not man-made, after being reduced to their simplest form. All that I have said so far may sound complicated. I did that on purpose to expose you, if you have never been exposed before, to how modern scientists teach and complicate simple things. Here is another way. Atoms are solar systems of the previous universe. Each solar system has planets circling around a sun. Each sun has either one planet, two planets, three planets, and so on up to 100 planets circling around. I'll repeat in case modern scientists think my tongue slipped. There are solar systems with 100 planets circling their sun, others with 99, some with 98, and so on all the way down to the smallest solar systems, which have only one planet orbiting its sun. That makes 100 different kinds of solar systems. On Earth, there are exactly 100 basic natural elements. Do you make the connection? When the first Earth of a new universe is created, the star systems of the previous universe become the atoms of that first Earth. In that previous universe, there are countless trillions of what can be called Type 1 star systems. Those are star systems with only one planet. Then there are countless trillions with two planets, or Type 2. Similarly, there are countless trillions of Type 3, Type 4, and so on, up to Type 100, which are the largest star systems having 100 planets. The first law of magnetic attraction attracts the star systems of the same type to each other. That is, type 1 stars are attracted to other type 1, type 2 to type 2, and so on. Toward the end of the universe, the star systems actually move through space over a period of trillions of years until they find each other and group together in clusters. Those with one planet form clusters that are described by modern scientists as having a nucleus and one electron, i.e. the sun and the single planet. When trillions of these star systems cluster together, they form a natural element on Earth called hydrogen. What is hydrogen? Them, it's a gas made of atoms with one electron circling a nucleus. Us, it's a gas made of star systems of the previous universe, all of which have one planet circling the sun. What is a gold tooth? Them, it's a metal made of atoms that have 79 electrons orbiting the nucleus. Us, it's a metal made of star systems from the previous universe with 79 planets circling their sun. 
The Laws of Magnetic Attraction How are the star systems brought together to form hydrogen, gold, and the rest of the natural elements? By the first law of magnetic attraction. How does this law work? It brings together all star systems that are alike, causing them to find each other. So here's a question. Which clusters of star systems will have a stronger magnetic bond, those with one planet or 100 planets? Those with 100 planets. There are more planets to form magnetic bonds, so they'll be held together more strongly. Not only that, but they'll be packed closer together, and thirdly, they'll be much heavier. Therefore iron, gold, and the other heavy metals will sink into the new earth, while hydrogen, oxygen, and other gases will float on top, forming water and the atmosphere. The gases are much lighter and loosely bonded, due to the fewer number of planets, while the metals are much heavier, with stronger bonds due to the large number of planets in their star systems, atoms. And all this happens because of the first law of magnetic attraction, which attracts like to like. What about the second law? The second law of magnetic attraction attracts unlike to unlike. Star systems are also attracted to those unlike them, those having a different number of planets, and they form what are called molecules. A molecule is made of two or more star systems, and many molecules cluster together to form compounds. What is a water molecule? Them, it's hydrogen plus hydrogen plus oxygen, or H2O. Us, it is made of two star systems, each with one planet, called hydrogen, being magnetically attracted to a third system with eight planets, called oxygen. In how many different ways does the first law of magnetic attraction work? In exactly 100 different ways. It attracts all type 1 star systems together, and it attracts all type 2s together, and so on until it attracts all type 100s together. That's exactly 100 different ways. That's why there are exactly 100 basic natural elements on Earth. They are listed in the periodic table of elements that can be found in any chemistry textbook. They start with hydrogen, one planet, followed by helium, two planets, all the way to fermium, 100 planets, or as they say, 100 electrons. The rest over 100 are artificial elements either man-made or ephemeral natural combinations, i.e. temporary elements that disintegrate almost immediately as soon as they are exposed to the air and warm temperature. In how many different ways does the second law work? In almost endless ways. That's why we have shoes, Coca-Cola, aspirin, iron oxide, water, and fake nails, all made from the basic natural elements combining in one way or another. Now here's a question that has been asked before. In a new universe, if all the stars of the previous universe are used as atoms to form the first Earth, how are all the new stars around it formed? Where does the material come from to form all the new stars? We have talked about the clustering together of the 100 different types of solar systems attracted like to like by means of the first law of magnetic attraction. They form the 100 basic natural elements found on Earth. The first of these is hydrogen, formed by all star systems having one planet and its sun. The last is fermium, bonded much more strongly, and so much heavier that when the Earth is formed, these clusters of 100 planet systems will sink into the Earth, burying themselves deep in the crust after the Earth has cooled over billions of years. Indeed, it takes billions of years for the Earth to form. It takes trillions upon trillions more for the universe to be filled with new stars that form around the first Earth and fill space up to a distance of 16 trillion trillion miles across. Where do these new stars come from? All the stars of the previous universe are used to make only the first Earth, giving it its 125 billion trillion trillion atoms. And yet the Earth has its sun and companion planets, not to mention the countless stars filling the sky. Here is their theory of where the stars come from. They, modern scientists, say a moment before the Big Bang the whole universe was concentrated into a dense ball not bigger than a fist. They say the dense ball exploded with such great force that it formed all the stars and planets of the whole universe. That is the complete theory of the Big Bang. How many people believe it? How many of them do you think believe their own theory? Our ancestors tell a completely different story of how the sky is filled with new stars, thereby expanding the universe. 
They say the purpose of creation is for God to increase. God is infinite. So how can God increase if he's already infinite? Our teachers tell us that God is infinite only in eternity, but not in creation. One of the purposes of creation is to duplicate this infinity of God as it is known in eternity and bring it into the universe. Since infinity means unfinishable, creation will go on forever because the eternal infinity of God cannot be duplicated in a final and finished form. Therefore the universes will always expand. Every new universe will be larger than the one before, without end. What does this mean in terms of new stars? It means new stars must be created out of nothing. If they are created out of something, as in the case of a dense ball exploding, there is no increase. If you start with a dense ball and explode it all over the place, you still have only the same amount of matter you started with. Increase only happens when new matter comes out of nothing, adding to what was already there. Therefore, according to our teachers, that is one of the reasons why the Big Bang Theory is a false, misguided concept. So how does matter come out of nothing? Chemistry as we have explained it using modern concepts only deals with three types of matter called gases, liquids, and solids. There are four other types of substances above these three, which modern chemistry does not include in its study. The total number of substances in the universe is seven. The first substance of the universe is magnetism, and it's created by condensation. Condensation of what? Condensation of the mind. God condenses part of his mind, which is in an expanded state, and forms the first substance, magnetism. Magnetism condenses further and forms the second substance, called electricity. Electricity condenses into light, the third substance of the universe, which further condenses into the fourth substance, called ether or space. The last three substances, gases, liquids, and solids, condense in three stages out of the ether. Those are the seven substances of the universe, all coming out of nothing, or the mind of God. You mentioned that some elements on the periodic table were man-made? I hope I didn't misinterpret that. If so, which ones? The elements 114 and 116 are synthetic elements, or man-made. 114, WUK, is called unquaternium and is made by blowing calcium on plutonium. Element 116, U, is called unanhexium and is made in a similar way, using different elements. Their weird names should tell you right there they are unnatural. Once they're made, they last for about 30 seconds before disappearing into nothingness. The Expansion of God's Mind When we say the mind of God is nothing, that doesn't mean it. Doesn't exist. It means the mind is not a thing. It's obvious too. Everyone that the mind, or consciousness, is not a tangible thing, yet it is the source of all things. At the end of the previous universe, our ancestors expanded their mind beyond measure until it encompassed their whole universe. That process of expansion caused an apparent contraction of their universe until it was reduced to the size of a single planet. The universe was not reduced in reality, but when the mind is expanding, it appears as if the universe is contracting. The apparent contraction of the universe was not followed by a Big Bang or any other kind of explosion. It was followed by a condensation process, where part of the expanded mind condensed in stages in the empty space surrounding the new Earth, creating the seven substances, which eventually formed the new stars after many trillions of years. Now since space itself is a substance, it means the mind creates space at the same time it occupies that very space. Stars are the condensation of the mind of our ancestors who came from the previous universe. They increase their own mind by expansion, which simultaneously causes the creation to increase as well. That is how God increases himself in creation to make himself like he is in eternity. How do the ancestors cause their mind to expand? The answer to this question is 90% of the subject and reason for these discussions. The achievement of this mind expansion is the primary purpose of the universe. Everything we will discuss concerning the activities of our ancestors will be seen to be directed toward the achievement of this single purpose called mind unity or mind expansion. So we may say chemistry as it is taught today is only three-sevenths of what true chemistry really is. 
It deals with only three of the seven substances of the universe, ignoring the other four. It will never reach an understanding of the fundamental reasons for the existence of the basic elements and their combining into an endless variety of compounds. Hence 99% of the concoctions that modern scientists brew in their laboratories will always be poisonous to the body and the environment. But more importantly, they ignore the source of all substances, which is the mind. All the basic natural elements are prepared at the beginning of the universe using the first law of magnetic attraction, the law of attracting like to like. What is the source of the two magnetic laws? The mind of our ancestors. These laws are simply the decision of our ancestors to combine star systems in that particular way, so that their descendants can use them to form compounds they'll need to run their society. To modern scientists, the natural elements are just objects of chance that happen to form out of a chaotic chemical soup that came out of the Big Bang. That is the essential difference between modern science and black roots science. The minds of our ancestors are the black roots of true science. When they condense part of their mind to form the stars and planets, they leave instructions that become part of the condensation. Over the trillions of years, the stars will be inwardly impelled to seek each other magnetically and then combine according to those instructions. Therefore, matter is pre-programmed, for lack of a better word. For that reason, moderners, the light races, will never be able to master matter. Matter can be mastered only by those who created it and their descendants, because the mind of our ancestors became our minds by a process of separation. Our minds will once again become one mind by a process of unity. I hope this will suffice as an introduction to Black Roots Chemistry and Physics slash Astronomy. Next we'll begin a discussion of the third science, Biology slash Genetics, and find out how the ancient people viewed this subject from their perspective. Biology slash Genetics In the ancient society, children were not taught as children are taught in. Today's schools they were not incarcerated in classrooms for hours on end. Being denied the natural physical movement that all children crave and the freedom to roam free for miles around and investigate everything. Their education was not an intellectual indoctrination that today's education clearly is. Rather, it was education through experience, allowing all children to discover firsthand what adults already knew, all the while under their guidance. Their teaching system was called initiation. The education of young people was divided into segments of seven-year periods. At the end of each segment, they graduated as a group in their town or district or clan. Their graduations were called initiation festivals. There were large feasts with music and dancing, and the entire clan was invited. They were taught biology from the age of about seven. The first lesson was to teach them the definition of biology. They asked many questions along the way, and their teachers answered every single one in a practical real-life way. In order to bring us close to their teaching situation, and in order to convey their knowledge as accurately as I can, I will narrate the following as if it is a discussion between me and one of the teachers, with me asking all the questions. So the first question I would ask is, What is biology? It is the knowledge of how the plants and animals and the body of the black man and woman were created. How were the plants and animals created? All the species of plants and animals that exist on Earth today developed from the 144,000 original prototypes. What are the 144,000 original prototypes? They are the 144,000 parts of the black person's character. They include courage, wisdom, goodness, strength, grace, honesty, authority, gentleness, abundance, beauty, friendliness, unlaziness, humor, and many, many more totaling 144,000. The vast majority of the parts or aspects of character do not have names in the English language. In the original languages, every aspect has two names, one for the animal and one for the plant. One original plant and one original animal were created for each aspect of your character. So every aspect of a black person's character is represented by a plant or animal? Yes. But only the original plants and animals represent character. All the other millions of species developed from these original prototypes. What about the body of the black person? How was it created? 
Originally the 144,000 characters were united as one character and it had a form. That form is the body of the black man and woman. The two bodies differ because while many of the aspects are neutral, a large number of them are more masculine, and the same number are more feminine, although both men and women have all 144,000. Then after the aspects were united as one in the human body, they were then separated into 144,000 individual parts and each part was given a form. Those forms became the original plants and animals. Where are these prototype plants and animals? They are in the custody of the 144,000 judges. Where? Right here on earth? They were, yes. And they will be again soon. They are temporarily removed to a safe place for a cycle. When the present cycle comes to an end, they will be returned to their original place. The causes of illness. Are they edible? Are they like chickens and cows and fruits? None of the animals are used for food. Some of the plants are edible. All the prototype plants used for food are called the trees of life. They are used by the leaders to prolong their lives beyond the normal 7,000-year lifespan. The elders live for over 700,000 years using the trees of life as nourishment. Can anyone really live that long? Believe it. You'll soon witness it. What causes sickness? Are there separate causes for every illness, or is there one genetic reason why people become ill? This may sound strange to most people, but among the people of the black nation in their natural environment there is no sickness. Sickness did not exist before 6,000 years ago, and will cease to exist after the end of this cycle. All sickness is caused by neglecting some aspect of your character. That will sound even stranger to all modern people who have been raised and educated to believe in the physical causes of illness alone. Every illness is related to some aspect of your character. The body is the unity of all aspects of character, and neglecting one or more of them results in illness in the corresponding part of the body. Among our people in our natural environment there is no neglecting of any part of our character. We also know the proper foods to eat and the right time to eat them. So sickness does not have the slightest chance to exist. Even the common cold? Even the common cold. Isn't it obvious that the common cold is caused by stress? When the weather changes, especially from one season to the next, it exerts an external stress on the body. If the body is already under the internal stress of modern life, then you easily become prey to viruses. If you could remove all internal stress, thereby restoring that aspect of your character, external stresses would have no effect on you. It's almost impossible to remove internal stress. There's so much pressure in everyday modern life. Yes. This is the time for such things. It wasn't always this way, nor will it remain like this for much longer. I know you said to keep the questions to the present subject. But you've mentioned the cycles before. Can I ask you more about that? We'll have enough time to discuss all the details concerning cycles, but first things first. So all the people were taught about the aspects of character and how to stay healthy. Yes. There are ten festivals that we call life rituals. During each one, the people are taught about the aspects. The character of every individual develops in a timely manner starting from childhood. The first 7,000 aspects of character are taught to children from the age of 7 until they are 14 years old. The school system is set up such that they attend the rituals 3 or 4 times a week for about 7 months of every year. The attendance is not continuous, naturally. They break during the planting and harvesting seasons and at other times. As I already mentioned, the ancient calendar division had a week of 10 days, making 3 weeks to every month. The 12 months have 30 days each, with 5 or 6 days added at the end of the year, depending on whether it's a regular or leap year. This calendar is exactly as our ancestors, the ancient Egyptians, recorded it in their writings. They kept that system well into about 2,000 years ago. I heard Dr. Jewel Pukram reveal in one of her lectures similar ideas about the real nature of illness, the body, and the spirit. For example, she shared that often women who are not need have suffered some sort of sexual abuse. 
As a result, and protective mechanism, the knees instinctly turned in to prevent further violation. Can you elaborate by sharing some specific illnesses and the character flaws or deficiencies to which they relate? I think sharing that information will help us who've been disconnected from the ritual process. Thanks. Diseases fall under two classes of causes, those caused by a deficiency in the individual's own character and those imposed on them due to a deficiency in someone else's character. The example you gave falls under the second class, where the deformity is not the result of a particular deficiency in that individual, but a character flaw in another person who then imposes it on her by committing a crime against her. There are many examples of this type of imposition, some due to neglect, some unintended, resulting in deformities, traumas, addictions, and diseases. One common example is improper or inadequate breastfeeding. A lot of mothers in modern society breastfeed their children very inadequately, if at all. Once a child has had mother's milk directly from her breast, there is no substitute that can take its place. But many women are advised to feed artificial formulas to their children. The most common damage that results from this comes in adulthood in the form of cigarette addiction. Unbelievable as it may sound, a large percentage of addiction to cigarettes is the result of insufficient time spent at the mother's breast. Cigarette companies know this and design cigarette butts the same color as a white woman's nipple and make the rest of it white like milk to evoke those childhood memories, not to mention the chemicals they add to make sure people stay addicted. Other drug addictions are caused by insufficient love given to infants who need it the most. Later in adulthood, after experiencing the high of drugs, it reminds them of the parental love that they experienced but a few times and have been yearning for ever since. After the first high they seek in vain to recapture that feeling and thus become addicted. All such ignorant impositions can be removed easily by training all people from childhood to develop their character properly. Such training would result in proper ways of raising children. At present this ignorance is passed from generation to generation. Adding to that are the diseases that come from the person's own character deficiencies. These are caused mostly by lack of character development or improper development as a child. The biggest of these is the non-development of the natural courage in children. So many children are raised in conditions of fear. They are taught to fear strangers, to fear their own parents, to fear the dark and even their own fantasies that come from their imaginations. This instilling of fear destroys the natural fearlessness or courage that all children are born with. The fear then later on causes many diseases such as asthma and allergies. Neglecting to develop self-love in children warps their character the most and results in a myriad of diseases such as diabetes, obesity, and so on. As we continue with biology slash genetics, I'll give more examples of other diseases and the character flaws that cause them. Can you provide more information about the science of food energy? Do foods have feminine and masculine energies? If so, how does this impact our individual health and how can you tell what energy exists around specific food? Rather than female and male, food energies would more appropriately be called positive, negative, and neutral. Even these words give a false meaning. More accurate words would be energizing, harmonizing, and neutral, or stabilizing. There are foods to be eaten when people are low in energy, and they're opposite to be eaten when they're hyperactive. These harmonize the energy back into balance. In addition, there's a third type of food in the middle, so to speak. They're called staple foods, such as grains, and keep the energy more or less steady. Human beings are vegetarians under natural circumstances. At present our bodies are in a less than natural state, so the eating of foods like cow milk is necessary, as well as a little meat, but much less than people usually consume. There are enough proteins in plant foods to nourish even the most active people, so it's possible to live completely without meat, as long as one takes a little milk. Plant foods can thus be divided into these three classes. They correspond to the three divisions of the human body, the head area, the chest area, and the intestinal area and lower body. The plant has a correspondence to these three parts in an exactly upside-down way. In other words, the roots of plants correspond to the head area. 
Foods like carrots and other edible roots nourish the brain and the head area, not potatoes, though, which are not roots but stems. Their roots are little hairs coming out of the tuber, so tubers are not root foods. Edible roots are thus positive or energizing foods. The stems of plants, which include grains like wheat and beans, are chest foods and nourish the middle part of the body. These are neutral or staple foods. The third group are those that grow at the highest part of the plant, meaning the leaves and fruits. They harmonize the body's energy level. Although both men and women need all three kinds of foods, women need the higher parts more, corresponding to the lower and middle body, and men need the lower part of the plant more, corresponding to the upper chest and head area. As far as specific foods to eat and how often to eat them, it would take too long to list. Besides, an accurate book has been written on nutrition. It's a little book you could read in a day or two, and has no equal as far as the teachings on nutrition and proper eating habits. It's called How to Eat to Live, Part 1 and 2 by Elijah Muhammad. What's your take on the tidal waves that have recently hit the area around southern Asia areas filled with black people? I remember hearing a tape by Dr. Delbert Blair where he alluded to such weather occurrences being man-made specifically created to assist in wiping out black people. What say you? My thought exactly. After reading about the incident, I thought the same thing. I believe that YT possessed the power, with the help of technology that is, to manipulate the weather and cause the earth to tremble. I knew this ever since I was a child. I remember that every time they tried to go up in space, there was a tremendous change in the weather. It would rain for days and I would think to myself that they were interfering with Mother Nature. I do believe that this was man-made to help wipe out the black race. I am not an expert on this matter, but I do believe in my heart that they do have a hand in any and everything that is the opposite of life and anything that is good. This is just my opinion. Peace. Sisters, man-made disasters are nothing compared to this. This was definitely a natural disaster. The earthquake bodily moved an entire island a few dozen feet and had the power of over 2,000 nuclear bombs. It made a crack in the earth the length of California. These large-scale natural catastrophes began last year with the Iran earthquake. They're going to continue and increase in size and devastation. To that will be added an endless war that is going to be joined by many other nations, begun by the invasion of Iraq. Add to that worldwide pestilences, and the next six years are going to see a drastic reduction in world population, never before seen in all of history. I always like to discover the why of occurrences. Bukurtz, when I saw the clippings of many of the victims' surviving family members, I saw many black faces, unless I saw wrong. If I'm not mistaken in my identification, what do you suppose the reason would be for destroying part of the one billion eight million? What are the implications for the remainder of us? Thanks again for the continued and in darkening education. Peace. There was another diet-related question I meant to ask you. I hope I didn't forget or overlook any previous information you may have shared on the topic, but I'll inquire again. What's your take on the eating according to your blood type theory that is currently on the natural health scene? Is there any validity to this idea, or is it just another European fad? Although the 100 plus dead from the tsunami is tragic, it's nonetheless a minuscule number compared to the millions who die daily on Earth, many of whom are black. I have not yet posted anything to clarify what I meant by the secondary requirement for the ending of this cycle, i.e. the incarnation of the billion eight million. I'll explain briefly what it means, and hopefully go into more detail later. 31. First, it does not mean that once all the gods are incarnated on earth, black people are never again going to die. That's impossible given the bodies we live in at present. It will be so only after all black people have original, long-lived bodies, when we will live continuously for 7,000 years. What it means is this. All the B8M gods have agreed to join in Yakub's project and take part in this world of sin and death. This was not the case at the beginning, 6,000 years ago. When Yakub started his project of making the light races, there were only 60,000 volunteers willing to carry it through, not counting the leaders. 
the leaders were neutral, knowing already that it was inevitable, preordained. So the rest of the population, amounting to over 1,007,795,000 people, opposed his project. They wanted nothing to do with it. Yakub went to a secluded island to carry it through. But since that time, all the gods, the entire black population, have agreed to join in the project and take part in it. Some things that are not easy to understand and accept while we are living on earth become easy after ascension when both hindsight and foresight are crystal clear. So then it was predicted that as soon as all the gods have incarnated in this 6,000 year period, that will bring the cycle to an end. That's the reason why the black population has steadily increased over 6,000 years to reach the maximum of 1B8M. To take part in Yakub's project, the gods only have to live on earth at one time or another, but not continuously. They, we, live and die frequently because that's the normal rhythm of our short-lived bodies. We don't even have to live a full life on earth to experience evil. A child who dies after four or five years has experienced enough of this world to know what evil is, because this world of white people is absolutely unlike our ancient world. It is opposite and contrary in every way imaginable. So we will continue to be born and to die until the end, when we regain our ancient original bodies. And yes, the eat according to blood type thing is a scam. Probably an opportunity to sell another diet or nutrition book. The only way to stay healthy is to eat less often. No one can be unhealthy from eating once a day. I'm not sure that all of the 1B8M have decided to assist in the Yakubian destruction of the black race. My question to you are those who continue to choose not to participate in self-destruction doomed along with the others? I apologize if I keep re-asking questions, but it's important to gather as much information as I can. Thanks. You're incorrect to call Yakub's work the destruction of black people. Black people cannot be destroyed. God cannot destroy himself, let alone be destroyed by the puff of smoke called white people. So your question of whether you are doomed to perish with those who choose self-destruction is based on a wrong premise. There is no self-destruction, so there is no black person doomed to it. Your question begs a much larger issue, i.e. the whole question of evil. The fact of your living presence here on earth is proof that you consented to participate in Yakub's world. If you hadn't, you would not have incarnated in this 6,000 year period. This holds true for all black people. Don't ever be deceived by the teachings of the ignorant who say the appearance of black people on earth is a matter of chance, accident of birth, or other terms they coin. The incarnation of every black person on earth is intentional and is never a mistake. This whole question of why God does some things that seem contrary to logic has been debated for millennia. But all the speculations that so-called philosophers and religionists have put forth are based on ignorance, so they cannot reveal the true answer. The answer to this age-long question is simple, and I'll address it in the next few days when I start a discussion of Yakub. I'm sure that's going to be an interesting story, because everything I've heard of the Yakubian legend says, for some reason or other, he was out to destroy us. It'll be interesting to find out why we would want to arrive on this plane to participate in Yakub's world, and why a smaller number of us would arrive here and then not want to be a part. I mean, how would you explain the existence of an individual such as yourself? You exist during Yakub's age, but what you present of yourself doesn't reveal the Yakubian essence slash spirit. Okay. I sincerely appreciate you, I mean that, but I don't have a problem in admitting I'm a bit confused with a few things. Thanks for your patience, and I'll be waiting for that next installment. Peace. I'm postponing the promised discussion until a later time in order to cover some other topics first. Everything in its time, as the saying goes. Okay, I'll be waiting. Meanwhile, give me your take on the Mamiwata Watts the history with that particular Vodun image. Peace. Part 1 of Vodun slash religions. The religion of Vodun with all its symbols and God slash S, as with all other African religions, are creations of the past 6,000 years. They did not exist before then. They all came about as a consequence of the teachings of Yakub. Notice how many of your questions relate directly or indirectly to Yakub, even when you apparently intend to ask an unrelated question. 
The reason is because this is really Yakub's world, and just about everything in it results directly or indirectly from some part of his teachings. I'll answer your question by relating briefly how modern African religions arose as a result of his work, but I'll leave the larger question of Yakub until later. Briefly speaking, Yakub, after he made the light races, was compelled to teach them how to live. Civilization is always taught. It can never evolve naturally, as modern sociologists and the like would have us believe. It is not in the same realm of natural events as eating, sleeping, and procreating. In fact, without civilization, human beings naturally decline. Yakub was a great scientist knowledgeable in the entire circle of wisdom. Knowledge is called a circle because it starts at the starting point and goes around until it ends at the same point, but higher and larger. If you will, imagine a coil or a snake coiled on itself with its head resting on its tail. The head and tail are at the same point on the circle, but the head is at a higher elevation. So it is too that the universe will end at the same point it began, which is divine unity, but at a higher level of wisdom due to the experience gained. That in brief is the true definition of wisdom, and in our language it's called a serpent due to the metaphor I just mentioned. Yakub took the circle or serpent of wisdom and condensed it into six major parts of knowledge. He left out the seventh part, divine unity, because it cannot be taught, but only experienced. He further divided each of the six parts into sixty parts, each one corresponding to one year of an individual's life. In his original plan of making the light races, the normal lifespan was to be sixty years, and in fact this is the average worldwide. So the sixty parts of knowledge correspond to, or sum up, what each year of an individual's life brings, or is supposed to bring, in terms of experience. Life is supposed to be lived such that when a person reaches a certain age, he or she has gained an experience, the equivalent of that amount of knowledge corresponding to that section of the sixty parts. For example, when a boy or girl reaches puberty, he or she is supposed to have learned all that can be taught about sex and its two purposes. But this is no longer the case today. The same holds true for almost every avenue of civilized life, including such basic things as how to cook properly, or clean house, or grow fruits and vegetables. How many youths can do these things today, or if not actually do them, know them theoretically? So the circle of knowledge was reduced by Yakub into 360 parts, 6 by 60. The 360 parts or degrees of knowledge were not taught to the light races, but only to black people. All this applies to the past 6,000 year period. Before then, the division of knowledge was as follows. Bukurtz, I like the way you break everything down so that others may understand in depth. Please keep up the good work. Peace. Peace. Part 2. Ancient knowledge was divided into seven major parts, then the seven were each divided into seven thousand parts, each one corresponding to one year of the seven thousand year lifespan. That made a total of forty-nine thousand subjects of learning. Therefore there were a total of forty-nine thousand rituals. The vast majority of them are called minor rituals, and were performed differently in every town. Second are the major rituals, fewer in number and performed differently in every clan according to the chief's teaching. The third type are seven in number and were performed exactly the same in every tribe. They are called the seven great rituals or festivals of the black nation. Hence the ancient circle had 49,000 divisions as opposed to the modern 360 degrees. Yakub took 33 degrees of knowledge out of the 360 and established mystery or initiation temples to teach them to the leaders of the light races. In addition, he took three more degrees and added them to the 33 for a total of 36 and taught these to highly qualified individuals who passed the standards of selection he set up. These 36 degrees of knowledge became the science of all the highest secret societies of the light races. They had their foundation in the temple schools of ancient Egypt. Selected individuals of the light races were recruited from around the world to the mystery schools and taught. They then went back and started secret societies, a few of which still exist to this day. In Egypt, the 36 truths of Yakub became known as the 36 netters. The word netter means truth and has been misinterpreted by Egyptologists to mean gods. 
The original 360 degrees of knowledge formulated by Yakub were taught in even deeper secret among the high priests of that time, all of whom were black. This knowledge was withheld from the Netter Mystery Schools. The high priests migrated down into Africa when it became obvious that the decline of Egypt was inevitable. They took with them the original 360 degrees of knowledge and settled among ten African tribes located across the entire African continent. These became the foundation of the ten African schools of ritual initiation, as well as two others located outside Africa, which are practiced the same way to this day. At the same time, the knowledge of the 36 netters filtered down into the various African tribes when the priests began migrating out of Egypt into West, East, Central, and Southern Africa. It was from the science of these 36 netters that all the tribal religious systems of Africa originated. So in Africa today there are two types of schools of initiation, those of the original 360 degrees and those of the 36 degrees or netters. Add to that the 33 degree mystery schools that exist all over the world, especially among the light races, and that will give you an idea of the origin of the mystery or secret religions of the world. Now, each secret religion is different. Hence there is Vodun, or the religion of the goddess Mamiwata, Mummy Water, or the mermaid goddess. It arose primarily out of reverence for water as sustenance of all life. So too did every religion have its primary god or goddess, as well as many lesser deities and all their symbols. Now, here is the important thing. This present cycle is the cycle of decay. We can also use the word deterioration or corruption or any other word with a similar meaning. Everything decays in this age, especially knowledge. God has increased or waxed in wisdom since eternity, and has never known what it is to decrease or wane in wisdom. One of the purposes of this cycle is to gain this experience. It befell Yakub by preordination as the one to prepare the necessary conditions for evil, decay, ignorance, self-forgetfulness, to manifest. 56. He went about it basically by first deteriorating the human body to a 60-year lifespan and reducing the serpent of knowledge to 360 degrees, then further to 36 degrees, and finally to 33 degrees. The 360 degrees are practiced by 12 modern black tribes today. The 49,000 degrees are held in abeyance in the custody of the 24 elders until the end of the age. The 33 degrees are practiced by Freemasons, especially the secret group called Rosicrucians on one side, and their opponents called Theosophists on the other side. The 3 plus 33 or 36 degrees are practiced by so-called masters of the light races, as well as others I will mention later. They are also practiced by the adherents of indigenous African and other religions such as Vodun. White people call this knowledge witchcraft or black magic in the hands of blacks, and white magic when practiced by them. The connotation is totally false, even though literally speaking the black and white terms are racially appropriate. When one considers the intent of the magic, then black magic is the true form of magic, whereas white magic is false. Both systems may use basically the same scientific principles, but the purposes to which each one is put determines whether it is true or false magic. Both systems rely on the three highest degrees of knowledge out of the 36 to formulate their highest principles. Of these three, I'll mention only one. I'll mention the other two later, as they relate directly to the larger Yakub story. This one degree of knowledge is called psychic science. It's a science of the imagination. You may remember I introduced a brief account of this science in the biology discussion. This is a natural science, as are all true sciences, that relies on the natural God-given power of the mind to be creative. The mind is naturally and spontaneously creative, and one can see this in dreams, where whole worlds are created out of nothing. Although dreams are unreal, given that they are imaginary, the same applies to daydreams and fantasies, nonetheless their effects on the human soul is absolutely real. A person may wake up from the most awful nightmare and be relieved that it was just a dream, but the fear he experienced was real. If he had come from somewhere where he had never experienced fear before, his dream experience of it will teach it to him as effectively as experiencing it in real life. It may not last long, but it is real at the moment he experiences it. This is one manifestation of the natural psychic power of all people. 
Now the art or science of controlling this power comes in a phenomenon called lucid dreaming. This power, although powerful enough on an individual basis, can be increased dramatically by involving other people in it. This too is natural, following the law of rhythms. Human minds, with their seat in the brain, oscillate within a particular spectrum of frequencies. It's possible to entrap this oscillation using the law of rhythms, according to which oscillations of the same frequency enhance one another and unite into a larger whole. When a person with a strong mind starts a certain type of imagination and finds other people who are sympathetic to it, the rhythm of his mind will entrap those willing participants such that all of them engage in the same rhythm and thus imagine the same reality. That is exactly how children were taught in ancient days. The word entrapment is totally inappropriate in the ancient context. A more proper word would perhaps be resonance, where a teacher gets the children's minds and hearts to resonate at the same rhythm as his. But entrapment is quite appropriate in the modern context because the intentions and use of this science have become perverted in many, but not all cases. The truth of a science is determined by the intent of the user, so the same scientific principles can be used for both good and bad. By this entrapment, it's possible to make willing people to believe in a reality that does not exist, that is totally imaginary. As the knowledge of the 36 netters deteriorated, so too were the proper uses of psychic science forgotten. In the passage of many millennia, the uses went from one end to the extreme until a whole slew of ancestral religions were formulated. Many psychically gifted people down the ages came and contributed to them and started new ones, or changed and modified the old ones. Hence as time went by, there arose entire worlds of ancestral spirits that are totally imaginary. The spirits possessed those willing to participate, causing them to prophesy, divinate, cure illnesses, cast spells, and many other related activities that you are no doubt aware of. They gave rise to fetishes, symbols, gods and goddesses, and new forms of rituals and sacrifices for enhancing the psychic power. What arose out of the corruption of psychic science is so convoluted and old in terms of centuries that to try and outline it all would take many pages. Suffice it to say that in every system that comes out of the original, there always remains a kernel of truth at its center. It is this kernel that is important for the reminding of black people about our ancient history. Those people who are involved in ancestral religions like Vodun are already at a decided advantage and can comprehend the larger truths much more easily. However, there is always the danger of getting lost in the maze of the psychic worlds if one believes in them and takes them to be real. The truth is that they only affect those who are willing participants because their power, even the power of their symbols, actually emanate out of the mind of the participant and from nowhere else. Others with stronger minds get it started with suggestions, but the participant has to pick it up from there and take it all the way for it to be effective. Without willing participation it has no power. That, in brief, is an explanation of the origin of secret religions. I've read that the Mamawata was supposed to have been a foreign figure this is supposedly why all the images are of a lighter raced woman. Is this the Yakubian influence? What is the significance of the science of cartography? Yes, it is. The practice of using whites as the standard of beauty goes far back, the brainwashing in this regard is deep. For the same reason black Christians today prefer to worship a white god. The idea of a black god is repulsive to most of them, if not outright disgusting. But truth is eternally true. It can't be changed by personal feelings. Eventually, all will come around to the true beauty of the blackness of God. Are you interested in maps? Bukruts. Thanks again for the info. Yes, I'm interested in fully understanding, so I can more effectively understand what's going on around me why I'm here and where in the world I'm supposed to be. I heard once that cartography was one angle to explore. Peace. I'll look deeper into cartography to see if there's an angle I missed, and we'll see from there. Peace. Not much of interest in cartography, except to those who want to carve up other people's lands and steal their gold. I'm almost sure you meant cartomancy, tarot cards. It's more interesting to talk about anyway. Bukruts. No, I'm pretty sure it's cartography, because the issue of dowsing comes up. 
although you can proceed with the cartomancy discussion that definitely should be interesting. Another thing I'd like to know is about the idea of super learning and mega memory. You provided some information about educating young students. I'd like you to elaborate on what activities can be used to quickly increase memory slash retention. Thanks. Very good. We'll do it like that and talk about dowsing and cards, but after I catch up with some regular posts. I'm falling behind my schedule. Super learning or memory retention depends directly on habituation, i.e. making it a habit to remember. The human mind is organized in such a way that it can be trained by repetition. Forgetfulness is nothing more than the habit of forgetting. Similarly recall is no more than getting the mind into a habit of remembering, and this takes practice. Obviously the best time to start training the mind is when one is a child, when the conscious mind is very pliable, but one can do it as an adult also. The key to success is to be aware that superlearning or recalling is like making a path through a field by constantly walking it. Once this idea becomes clear in the mind, then the training plan will succeed. There are many systems formulated by many authors to do this, some more successful than others. The differences in success is caused by whether or not the learner is aware of the mechanics of conscious recall, which as I said, is to walk a path through the nerve circuits that make up the forest of the human brain. Most of the books, if not all, use the same technique of learning by repetition. There's a better method, though, that doesn't depend on books, using the details of your own dreams or daily activities. These two methods are the best and quickest because they are personal and therefore geared to each individual's uniqueness. What you do is keep a pencil and paper next to your bed and write down your dreams every morning in as much detail as possible. Another alternative is to keep a daily journal and write down your daily activities every evening in as much detail as you can. The longer you do this, the more details you'll remember. Recollection is directly related to learning. The easier you can recall details, the easier you can learn new ones, thus super learning and super recall are two sides of the same coin. In tribal societies where there is no writing, children are trained by adults by being asked to recount their dreams of the night before in detail and then relate their day's adventures when everyone is sitting around the home fire at night. This is done in an atmosphere of fun, making it enjoyable to the children and so their memories become well-trained, making it easy for them to remember and understand stories used to teach them. The 10-Stage Initiation Process The teacher continues discussing the children's ritual of character development as it was in ancient days. When the children are in attendance, they don't sit in classrooms as modern children do. The lessons take place mostly outside in a natural setting. In every ritual, they are taught about the character development of a person. They are taught that each aspect of character is directly reflected in a specific part of the human body and how each one created its plant and animal. The format of the lessons is somewhat like this. First of all, children are never discouraged from indulging in their imaginary worlds. Everyone knows that young children have imaginary friends and imaginary worlds that are as real to them as you and me sitting here. They are encouraged to indulge in these worlds of the imagination to the utmost degree possible for their minds. As they grow older and eventually become adults, they retain this power of vivid imagination, having brought it under complete mental control under the guidance of their teachers. As a result, all adults have this power, but more so the teachers of rituals. They use this natural gift, to us it's a natural gift, whereas to modern people it's a curse from which they must disabuse their children, the teachers take advantage of this gift and use it to impart their lessons. They encourage all the children to create a common imaginary world. The teachers then magnify it with their own minds until it is clearly visible to every child. To all those modern people who have forgotten the imaginary worlds of their childhood, it's somewhat like a lucid dream, but wide awake. Once all the children have entered this imaginary world, the teachers put in it about seven of the original plants and animals, using their own imagination. They recreate them into this world the same way you intentionally create objects in your lucid dreams. 
The first seven or so plants and animals they put in it correspond to those aspects of character that are the first to develop in a child, which are happiness, friendliness, activeness, and so on, corresponding to the appropriate body parts like the heart, the eyes, the feet, and so on. Then the teachers create a situation in the imaginary worlds that leads, for example, to sadness in the children. They feel this sadness and immediately become sick in the corresponding part of the body, and they also notice the same effect on one of the animals and plants. The animal becomes sick and the plant begins to decay. They are then encouraged to remove the sadness and replace it with a happy situation. For example, if the sadness was caused by the older children taking the younger children's toys, they give them back, thus restoring their happiness. Because it all happens in the imagination, the animal and plant are immediately healed, and the sickness disappears from the children's bodies. By the use of simple exercises such as these they are taught about the anatomy of the human body, and which body part corresponds to which aspect of their character, and which plant and animal were created from it. Because of the wisdom of the teachers, the imaginary situations come in endless variety, stimulating their young minds. After seven years they graduate in a ceremony that celebrates the first 7,000 aspects of character and their prototypes. They spend 40 days of the graduation period in a place whose name has come to the present from the past as the Garden of Eden. This was one of 12 such places on earth, one in each tribe's country. Every country's garden of prototypes is in 10 sections. The first section has 7,000 prototypes of both plants and animals, corresponding to elementary education, or the first 7 years from age 7 to 14. Every following section is larger than the one before, with more prototypes. The next 9 sections have prototypes corresponding to the rest of the person's ritual education every 7 years until the age of 77. At this age, the person's character reaches full maturity and perfection. At the elementary graduation festival, the children see the perfect plants and animals for the first time in their natural habitat. After the 40-day period, the ceremony concludes with the preparation of food from the trees of life that grow in that section. The festival is held at the clan capital. It's a huge celebration with children from a thousand towns all coming together at the capital for a week. There is music and dancing, and the whole clan is invited. For at least one day of that week, most citizens will make sure not to miss the opportunity to attend and enjoy the feast. The final graduation. You said they are educated until the age of 77. What happens at that age? They have a final graduation. All the graduates of the clan come together. They gather at the chief's temple at the capital and all 72 clans. 2,000 judges welcome them there and guide them in the final ritual, called the ritual for the creation of life. The graduating group and the judges together make 144,000 people. They are led by the 2,000 judges and the two chiefs into a state of consciousness called divine unity. We will talk at great length about this state of mind because it is the culmination of every major ritual of the black nation. It is fostered methodically from childhood, where it begins as shared childhood dreams during children's classes. It is then developed in 10 stages until its culmination at 77 years of age. For now, suffice it to say that it is a state where all the people become one in mind. Their hearts and minds become single as if it were the heart and mind of one person, yet each one remaining as a distinct individual. As soon as this divine unity is attained by all, they proceed to raise from their hearts, which beat as one heart, every aspect of their character one at a time in the order they were taught beginning at childhood. When the first aspect has risen to fullness in the heart and mind of every man and woman, it takes form right before their mind's eye. As soon as they release it from their minds, two versions of it, a male and a female, flash into physical existence in the appropriate section of the Garden of Prototypes. Then they go on to the next one. They continue this way non-stop for 40 days and 40 nights, without eating, drinking, or sleeping. They completely lose sense of time and space, and all physical cravings like hunger and thirst. The state of divine unity is such that it balances the body's physical energies for as long as a person is enraptured in it. 
They continue this way until they create all 144,000 prototypes, both plants and animals. At the end of the 40-day period, they reach a climax of fully mature, perfect character, magnified many times by being united as one. They have then perfected every aspect of their character and are considered from then on to be fully mature adults. They go on to take their places of responsibility in society. That is the perspective from which we consider what modern scientists call biology. We look at it from above, as creators, whereas modern scientists look at it from below, as creatures. Brother Afrin Roots, is there any education system still set up like the one you describe in the above post, here in the Americas or anywhere in the world today? If so, where can one find such teachings? When you talk about the animal and the plants, it brings to mind the pot netteru that I am reading about in a book called Meta Netter by R.A. Un Nefer Amen. He talks about the ten stages of initiation and the preliminary requirements. I had no idea that this process would start with children as young as seven. Although it does make sense to do so. I really enjoy reading you. Keep on enlightening us brothers. The ancient system of education by initiation is no longer taught in its complete form. It hasn't been taught like that now for 6,000 years. The reason is that the entire initiation system of character development took 70 years to complete in 10 stages. Each stage lasted 7 years, starting from 7 to 14 and so on, and 70 to 77 years old being the final stage. It's impossible to teach it today in its complete form because we are much shorter lived than our ancient ancestors. So the system is taught in a shortened form suitable for our time. But it's no longer taught openly. It has been taught in secrecy ever since the appearance of the light-skinned races 6,000 years ago. It's taught only by the elders of a few African tribes, including the tribe of Botswana in the southern region of Africa where I was born and raised. Unfortunately, initiation is not taught in America. Even in Africa, it's still the deepest secret. This will remain so until the end of this cycle called the cycle of white people, which is nearing its end. When it ends, then the ancient teaching system will come back into the open. This brings me to your first question of how to teach children some of the ancient knowledge. All the important knowledge in ancient times was taught in the form of rituals. We have a ritual for every important aspect of life just as moderners today have a textbook for every important subject. But the difference between ancient and modern learning is exactly the difference between intellectual or book learning and real life experience. This is why it's difficult under the modern system to teach true science and mathematics. They are intricately related to life, whereas the architects of modern education divorce them from everyday real life. They created a school system that incarcerates children all day inside a fenced-up prison, completely removed from society, and expect them to learn how to live in that very society. The result is nothing more than superficial intellectual knowledge. Ultimately, everyone has to start from scratch after leaving school and try to educate themselves about real life, sometimes gaining some contribution from their schooling, sometimes not. To educate black children properly, we must separate them from other children. There is no way, I repeat, and you can disagree with me as much as you want, there is no way to teach our children properly as long as they are mixed in with the other races. There are many reasons why that is so, but I'll mention just one. We black people made the other races in our image 6,000 years ago. All the troubles on earth started as a result of this. Now, if you truly believe this, how will you teach it to our children in a multi-ethnic setting? How will the other parents let you teach it in their school? You may say, well, I just want to teach them the principles of ancient science and mathematics. But these principles are based on the fact that God is the black person, and all other people were made in his, her image. They involve rituals whose foundation is that we do not study science and mathematics, but manifest it on earth. Made human beings can only study what has been made or created. Creators, on the other hand, can only manifest the principles of creation because these principles originate from within them. These two modes of learning are worlds apart and 180 degrees opposite each other. Now, having said all that, I'm sure that you can proceed with your good intentions, and they are good and worthwhile. 
Every way we can help our people, especially children, is more than worth the time, by mentioning some of the truths to them, namely that the ancients had ways of perfecting people's characters, and they also had ways of finding soulmates for everyone, as well as methods of health and hygiene that totally prevented all forms of illnesses, and many other truths we'll discuss in the future. And it's also important to tell them that these sciences and customs will come back into use very soon. As to teaching them the sciences in detail, it's not possible to do it except by the method of rituals and initiations. Black people did not choose this method of learning arbitrarily. They chose it because it's natural and superior to any other method imaginable, now or at any other time. I'm doing some studying of the Medu Netter. And R.A. Unnefer Emin makes a statement regarding humans possessing reptilian and mammalian brains. I do not quite understand the implication. Is that correct? If so, could you elaborate on that? In order to understand the following discussion on the different types of brains, it's important to know that the theory of evolution taught by modern scientists is the exact opposite of the truth. Modern scientists claim that all higher life forms evolve from the lower types. In other words, they claim that all people came from animals. This claim is the direct opposite of the truth. People did not come from animals. Animals came from people. I repeat, to understand biology slash genetics, it's important to realize that all plants and animals on earth came from people. At the end of the universe, the B8M original gods absorb all life into themselves by uniting their minds and life with the minds and life of all living things. That is to say they absorb the beingness of all things, even inanimate objects, by joining it with their own being. They become all that is, which is a state of mind called divine unity, or the oneness of God. They then come into the present universe while in this state, and live on the first earth. I'll describe later in the cosmology section how they come from the previous universe into the present one, and how they create it. At any rate, they bring all life from the past universe as a part of their very being. As soon as they descend on the first earth, they create perfect plant and animal life from the integrity of their perfect character. These perfect plants and animals are called prototypes or the original totems of life. They are the first plant and animal life forms of the universe. All subsequent prototype life forms will be modeled after them and be identical to them in every way. The reason for this is because all totems that are subsequently created are created after the creators have perfected their own character, such that it is as perfect as the character of the B8M original people. The totems then issue forth spontaneously from the overflowing beauty of the perfection of their integrity, meaning their perfect character. They issue forth from their vivid imagination and condense instantly into physical life. That is how all plant and animal life begins in every universe. The life of the black man and woman, on the other hand, has no beginning. It is self-generated and self-created at the beginning of creation that has no beginning. Therefore, the human bodies, the bodies of the black man and woman, have always existed. They are the primary form of life, without beginning or end, without source or sink. These two bodies are the source of all life in the universe, as well as the sink of all life in that at the end of the universe they take all life back into themselves. Together they are the unification of every form of life that has ever existed in the past, all the way back to eternity, and also life that exists now as well as life that will ever exist in the endless future. All the past, present, and future life forms are contained and unified in the body of the black person, the man with male life and the woman having all forms of female life, but only when the two are united as one in mind and heart. The original totems or prototypes are the source of all other types of life forms. The later forms evolve from these by means of a law of evolution called the law of integrity. According to modern scientists, all life forms evolve from lower life forms by a law of evolution called survival of the fittest. That is false. The true law of evolution is called the law of integrity of character. This law means that all plants and animals evolve according to the integrity of the character of the dominant culture on earth. The evolution or the physical development of plants and animals follows precisely in the footsteps of the morality or immorality of those who comprise the dominant civilization. 
In the case of the ancient culture of our ancestors before the advent of the light races, the animals and plants were far different than they are today. The largest animals were much larger than they are today, and the tallest trees were much taller also. They reflected the stature of the people who lived then. They were tall people, averaging about 71 slash 2 feet tall. The sizes of the largest animals and the tallest trees were a symbol of the dignified stature of these people. Furthermore, there were no animals like apes, hyenas, crows, bats, rats, mosquitoes, and other foul animals. All these vile animals as well as poisonous plants started developing 6,000 years ago. Their development is a direct reflection of the nature of the rulers of the world. To be specific, blood-sucking animals and other parasites are a direct reflection of the parasitic nature of the light races, especially as it is most obvious among Jews, Arabs, and other Near East Asians. Foul animals like snakes reflect their deceptive nature, especially those of Caucasians and Far East Asians like the Chinese and Japanese. Other disgusting animals represent other foul natures of these people. Before the light races came into existence, these animals did not exist as they are today. After the races were born and started showing their evil nature, the foul animals then began to develop accordingly. But not all animals were affected to the same extent. Some animals still retained a large part of their purity. For example, most cats, especially lions, tigers, etc. retain most of their pure nature. Dogs, on the other hand, were mostly affected, as can be seen in the dog families like coyotes, hyenas, and all the dogs that have been bred from them. There is only one dog that remained unaffected by the appearance of the evil nature of the light races, and that is the African dog known as Pharaoh's Hound, which is black in color and still exists today in some parts of Africa. This clean, non-smelling, non-barking, majestic dog is represented in ancient Egyptian art as the god Anubis. Other graceful animals and plants like butterflies, some birds, flowers, and trees also remain unaffected. The evolution of all plants and animals therefore follows the inner nature of the most influential people in any civilization. All development of life is recorded in the magnetic field of the earth. This recording comes directly from the minds of people. It condenses into magnetic substance and combines with the magnetic field of the earth. The plants and animals receive the direction for their development directly from this magnetic field, which acts as the mind of the earth. It is influenced by the collective minds of the members of the dominant civilization. This knowledge is important in order to understand the effect of the human mind on animals. Now, the mind obviously uses the brain as its seat of operation. And so the brains of all animals are a partial manifestation of the human brain, and not the other way around. People did not get their brain by evolving it from the brain of animals. The exact opposite is the case, that is, all animals got their brain by developing it using the human brain as a source of their development. Animals are not fully unified beings as humans are. Human beings are the full unity of life in all its aspects. The perfect animals called totems each manifest one of these aspects. Developing animals then develop from them, taking on various aspects according to different combinations, all the while under the direct influence of the integrity of the dominant society. Therefore, when you ask, what is the implication that humans have a reptilian and a mammalian brain, the answer is that reptiles and mammals develop their brains modeled on the human brain, but emphasizing only certain parts. In other words, reptiles developed with an emphasis on the reptilian part of the human brain, and so with mammals. The human brain has three parts, reptilian, mammalian, and insectoid. The insectoid brain is the smallest of the three, but its contribution to the whole is not affected by its size. I hope I've made it clear that when I call the parts of the human brain reptilian, mammalian, and insectoid, this doesn't mean they are named after reptiles, insects, and mammals. The very opposite is true. These animals got their names from the three parts of the human brain. First and foremost comes the human brain. We'll call its three parts reptilian, mammalian, and insectoid, although in the ancient languages they are called by their proper names. Now when the animals developed, the three types of animals each took one part of the human brain as the main source of its brain development and are thus named after that respective part. 
This distinction is important. It is exactly the opposite of modern teaching about evolution. Its importance will become clear later when we discuss how certain extraterrestrial life forms came into being, especially those called greys and reptilians. I hope this answers part of your question. The rest of it will have to wait until later. How will the process of absorption of all life by the original people take place? Further, considering that much of the life, especially human, on this plane is very toxic, what would be the implications for the original people for reabsorption? The B8M gods reabsorb all life into themselves at the end of the universe when they get ready to create the next one. That's countless trillions of years in the future. By then the light races, who are but a passing fancy, will be no more than a dim memory. Their toxicity, which lasts for only 6,000 years, will be no more than a drop of spit in the ocean of eternity. All life originates from God at the beginning of the universe and is taken back by Him at the end. He takes it back by the act of divine unity. Divine unity is a state of mind where you unite your consciousness with all that exists. All existence is in God's imagination. The universe is the divine dream of God. When you enter the state of divine unity you discover to your amazement that you are the dreamer, as is everyone who is united with you. You are they and they are you in the most real sense. All is oneness at that moment. At the end of the universe, all people reach this state of oneness simultaneously, and the universe comes to an end. Divine unity, or being one with God, is the purpose of the universe. The purpose is achieved in stages by taking part in the rituals designed for it, especially the seven great rituals of the black nation. As always, very informative. I was wondering about the so-called dinosaurs, were there any? You did say, however, that the animals were much larger and that people were too. So does that mean that dinosaurs as we know it did exist? Peace. Yes, dinosaurs did exist. Scientists have made a good enough representation of what they looked like. If you see some ancient Egyptian art and see what is called the plate of Narmer, there's a better drawing there of what the large animals looked like. Very interesting and informative post. In one of your posts, you stated that black people have always existed. You have also stated that dinosaurs did exist. We have always been taught that man slash woman and dinosaur did not live during the same period. Is this true? If the animals of the earth come from humans, and dolphins are said to be millions of years old, what evidence do you know proves that we are older than dolphins? It's a very tricky thing to prove using physical evidence that black people existed prior to a time that white people consider as being acceptable. They laid down the rules of proof, and anyone who wants to prove any scientific fact has to play by their rules. If he doesn't then the proof is said to be unacceptable. Their rules are set up such that they can be fully satisfied only by those who subscribe to their preconceived notions. And every rule of theirs is founded on a preconceived notion. For example, they say that man slash woman and dinosaurs did not live during the same period. This is a preconceived statement not based on any facts. If you oppose it then the burden is on you to prove otherwise. Those who made the statement do not feel obligated to prove it first. I could easily turn it around and say that people and dinosaurs lived at the same time and ask them to prove otherwise. All they can say is that people's bones have never been found in the same place as those of dinosaurs. That is the extent of their proof. On further thinking, what kind of proof is this, really? What people would bury their dead next to dinosaurs? They'll say that primitive people did not always bury their dead, but let them rot anywhere, because those people were not civilized. According to them civilization began only 2,000 years ago with the Greeks. If they're generous, they'll say it began 5,000 years ago with the ancient Egyptians, or maybe the Sumerians a little earlier, but no sooner than that. So now the argument has turned from physical proof to subjective feelings about the civilized status of primitive people. And on and on it would go in circles. There is no winning when using their rules. Nonetheless, recently some anthropologists found human and dinosaur footprints embedded next to each other on a rock that came from a strata of rocks deep down, making them millions of years old. Here's a quote. 
In Glen Rose, the fossils indicate that man and dinosaur lived not only at the same time, but even at the same place. To make matters worse, the particular layer in which the footprints are found is known as the Glen Rose Formation, designated Lower Cretaceous, and supposedly was laid down early in the Cretaceous period, estimated about 120 million years ago. One aspect that has caused no little amount of speculation has been the presence of giant tracks, prints made by individuals with huge feet and huge strides. It may be that humans before the flood were much larger on the average than today. This is consistent with the fossil record, which frequently exhibits animals larger than their modern-day counterparts. Scripture may provide an insight when it claims so matter-of-factly that there were giants in the earth in those days, Genesis 6 verse 4. Quite a few of the tracks are in the 16-inch range, but several trails are of a man with a 7-foot stride and a foot of 211 to 2 inches in length. Whether or not there is any connection has not yet been determined, but several years ago the skeleton of a woman seven feet tall was excavated from the Paluxy River Basin and exhibited in the Somerville County Museum in Glen Rose. By John Morris, Ph.D., Institute for Creation Research. When this was announced, the scientists came out with guns blazing to disprove the discovery. They suppress such discoveries with the utmost ruthlessness, even to the extent of alienating their peers who go against their cherished but false notions. There is a different and higher type of proof for historical events. It's the accurate recording of ancient events by people trained to do this in their minds and to pass the knowledge from generation to generation. This type of evidence is valued much more among black people than cooked up physical evidence that can be interpreted every which way. It's wise to regard the teaching of modern scientists with the same skepticism one regards all new information. Then weigh it in your mind, relying on your intuition first and foremost, as well as your life experience, and then come to a conclusion. That is infinitely better than believing people whose facts change every six months or so. Their only goal is to deceive in order to prolong the status quo. Widespread knowledge of the truth would overturn their fragile and faulty belief system, which is already standing on one leg. Dang. Just when I thought you couldn't get any deeper. Really. I have no debate with you. I've been having a deep feeling of unhappiness in my current work environment for a while now and haven't been exactly sure how to proceed. Most of the children I work with are non-black, and the few blacks that are there aren't exactly what you'd call on the path. So, even with good intentions, I'm not exactly sure how they'd respond to the use of ritual they read more likely to bust me out than the non-blacks would. Yeah. I totally understand your view on the all-black environment. I've thought for a while we needed the lack of interference from outsiders in order to begin the recovery process. But, given what you've revealed and the kind of environment in which we live, how would I begin reconstructing my role as an educator? At this point, What's the best I can do at least in terms of transitioning to the higher learning that you mentioned? As much as the idea appeals to me, I'm not sure of the likelihood of finding an all-black environment in this country. Many of the so-called Afrocentric private schools are now admitting non-black students to my dismay. My fear is that they will begin to sway the curriculum to fit the outsiders. Again, I really appreciate your insight. It's refreshing to throw these ideas slash questions by someone who seems to have a clue. Keep talking. Although I've never been a school teacher myself, I do understand to a degree your desire to teach children true knowledge, or at least useful knowledge that can help to reverse the lies and deceits that form the foundation of Eurocentric education. That is the same desire I have to expose this type of knowledge to all black people who are open to it, or at least to the possibility that our ancient glory was as I've described it. So because of our common desire, we are kindred spirits. The black person is the architect slash designer of all his situations and experiences. We conceived our present world situation many eons ago and executed the plan necessary to bring it about. At the same time we conceived a plan to bring it to an end, and that plan is in progress. We have the power to bring it to an end, just as we had the power to bring it about. Two conditions were laid down as being required to end this cycle. The first is that the black population should reach the number equal to the original gods, which is one billion eight million. That condition has been fulfilled, or will be in a few more years. 
The second but primary condition is that there will be a group of 144,000 people who will form the foundation for a new society. Every new society starts with this basic minimum, which becomes the foundation stone for the new temple, to use biblical language. Or as Bob Marley used to sing it, they are the stone that the builder refused, and shall be the head cornerstone. There is one requirement needed to be part of the cornerstone. The foundation population will be formed by those people who have consciously and willingly removed from within themselves all sympathy for the light races. This does not mean to hate them, because hate is just as strong an emotion as love, and fixes one's attention on its object. All that's needed is simply to know who we are and who they are. When this knowledge becomes clear in our minds, then it's not hard to see that we cannot exist forever side by side with them. Our natures are too different, even 180 degrees apart. It's like grain trying to survive side by side with weeds. When a person knows the natures of grain and weeds, it's only a short step to realize they must be separated. When there's a minimum of 144,000 people who come to this full realization, then the cycle will come to an end. It has been estimated by my teachers that this number will come predominantly from the Americas, the place of 400 years of slavery. A few will come from other regions where black people have suffered for 400 years under the oppression of colonialism, even though our suffering was not as severe. It's these people who will better understand and fully acknowledge the true nature of the races because they have lived among them most closely. They will seek to separate from them. Initially, it will not be a physical separation, but a mental one. It will come in the form of totally rejecting the point of view of white people that has been ruling the world for 6,000 years. The people will replace it with a more truthful and natural point of view. The two points of view will be seen to be diametrically opposed. Soon after this mental rebirth takes place, they will then begin to organize physically in order to come together. Then they'll rediscover the ancient knowledge and put it into practice. On this foundation stone, the entire black population will become free. All the B8M gods will then be incarnated in us, and our society will begin afresh. Peace, brother Black Roots. Yes, I have more questions. You said you'd speak on this later, but I'll ask anyway, if all animals came from humans and certain animals, the ugly ones, started in the last 6,000 years, why then do you find less majestic animal fossils in the rock record? What about vampires, energy suckers, and other derivations of the human form? Do they really exist, and if so, are they also devolving manifest ions of the light races? Also, why are there no, well, published, investigations showing the devolution progression of these forms in the historical slash rock record? Or are we just reading things backward, hum? A lot is known geologically about the last 6,000 years. What are scientists missing? Also, 6,000 years is a very, very short time period for these things to have occurred. How do you rectify the time scale? The only people talking in this time scale are creationists, and I know they can't be right. In addition, the dates of the devolved humans and apes are much older than 6,000 years. Are modern dating methods faulty, i.e. radiometric, laws of superposition, uniformitarianism, u slash pb, thermoluminance, carbon age dating, magnetic dating, etc. I'm quite aware of the errors in Darwin's theories, and I'm pretty familiar with these dating methods. Does your information mesh with at least portions of the geologic timescale? I'm also on the edge of my seat, waiting to hear about aliens being spawned by the light races. I'm so curious. Also about spirits. You said this would be toward the end, after I presume you speak on Yakub and why on earth he'd create this situation we're currently experiencing. Why would he want to suppress the dark gene anyway? Was he curious what would happen, or was he a mad scientist, like Frankenstein? I suppose it's a lesson my original self needs to learn to help fulfill the puppos for this universe, but damn need we suffer so? I'm guessing, yes. Again, thank you for taking the time to connect, love. There are two reasons why the animals' fossils are not found. Many of them lived on two continents that have since been submerged. One was in the Atlantic Ocean, the one rumored today as Atlantis, and the other in the Pacific. The two continents were submerged about 9,000 years before the advent of the light races. The fossils exist, but they are undersea. 
The second reason is that during the time of that cataclysm reported in the Bible as the flood there were also massive earthquakes and volcanic eruptions all over the earth that buried many other animals. The earthquakes were more severe than any that have occurred recently. They turned over the crust of the earth and buried many animals thousands of feet under. The fossils dating schemes of modern scientists are mostly based on where in the earth's layers they were found. They have divided the layers into geologic eras and assumed that the layers are laid down uniformly over the entire history of the earth. This couldn't be farther from the truth. The earth experiences a complete overhaul of its continents every 700,000 years at the end of the reign of all 24 elders. The 24 elders each rule for about 25,000 years. After 700,000 all of them have ruled and they reset history for another 700,000 years. This is accompanied by a cleansing of the earth that involves major cataclysms that completely rearrange the continents. The last one was 15,000 years ago. To give you an idea of the error resulting from the theories of modern scientists, they claim that the Grand Canyon was carved over millions of years by the Colorado River that flows in it. This is not true. It was formed overnight by a series of earthquakes and aftershocks. A similar effect, on a smaller scale, was formed under the sea by the earthquake that caused last year's Pacific Tsunami. So certain fossils that are found deep underground and are reported to be millions of years old are only 15,000 years old, placed there during the mighty turbulence caused by massive earth movements. As to the other methods of dating, there is a lot of info on the web that proves that their reliability is well under 10%. They inflate it for the sake of their academic careers and other such superficial reasons. And about the development of the ugly animals and plants, these are mutations. Mutations do not evolve by the rules of Darwin. They show up in one generation. As soon as the evil mentality of the races condensed into the Earth's magnetic mind, these mutations started to form almost immediately and became established after only seven or eight generations. Vampires are psychic manifestations. We'll talk about them at some other time. Make a list of your questions, if you like, and send them to me and we'll discuss them when I return. Till later, peace. I'm afraid the Rasta question will have to wait also, Black Roots. Peace brother Black Roots. I still have a lot of questions, I'll list them, let's begin with the geology and earth history. If certain mutations of animal, let's take a nasty mammal, rats, began in the last 6k YRS, why do you find older fossils in the rock record, i.e. rodents begin to appear well into the Mesozoic, beyond 1.5 million years? If beds are overturned, there are indicators, such as overturned ripple marks, inverted raindrops, etc. Not all dating methods have such low reliability, for instance magnetics dating, where the strength and direction of the Earth's magnetic field is imprinted to a rock at solidification, this works well for dating lava flows. Also carbon dating and radioactive decay, not all these methods can discount it as working only 10% of the time. Are there any dating techniques you feel might work better, or are useful? Or do you feel that there is no real point in unraveling the Earth's history in this way? If the Earth underwent drastic catastrophic upheaval fairly recently, why wouldn't deposition records be characteristic of rapid deposition, i.e. landslides, large-scale mass wasting? When I look at movement along a fault line, there's evidence for displacement and mass wasting can be linked to a trigger. I'm still curious where scientists went wrong. The geologic timescale is riddled with errors I know, but I didn't think it was so grossly an error. What epochs or periods do you find to be correct? Are the oldest rocks found on the planet not really that old, i.e. continental cratonic material? Canada, Africa, Australia, dated at 1.2 bill YRS. Is the island you're speaking of in the Pacific, the continent of Mu? Will you tell the story of its existence? As a side note, I read an article about three years ago about a Berkeley scientist that found evidence for a submerged island off the coast of California. Some were saying it might be a piece of Mu moving with the Pacific plate toward the N.A. subduction zone. As you can see, I'm very interested in how our ancient elders view geology, geologic change, and our response to Earth fluctuations. I've searched a lot, 
looking for how we view the sciences, specifically geology as a culmination of all the sciences, physics, chemistry, biology, etc. As I've learned, science is very intuitive, which is a staunch contrast to the types of people typically seen as scientists. Generally, could you speak about geology as an ancient art form and how it should be practiced? Or will be practiced again? Thanks again for taking the time to answer my questions. One love. Modern scientists classify the living things mainly by their form. The ancients did the exact opposite. They classified them by their function, paying little attention to the form when it comes to naming and classifying. Thus, if you were to study the modern African names of some animals, you'd realize that they describe what the animal does rather than how it looks. That's important and is the proper way to classify animals because a slight change in genetic structure might not show in the animal's form, but could change its function drastically. All animals and plants were put on earth to serve a specific function. When the function of that animal changes, it can no longer be called by that name. To the ancients, it becomes an entirely new creature, which in fact it is, because the change in function is brought about by a genetic mutation, no matter how slight. So animals like rats, roaches, and other modern ugly types did exist, but were not ugly then. The reason these animals are foul today is not because of how they look, but what they do to people and other life forms, i.e. being parasitic, causing diseases, etc. Such animals did not exist 6,000 years ago. In fact, prior to 50,000 years ago, there were not even animals that preyed on other animals. All animals then ate only plants. The only kind that ate flesh were small animals that ate only dead flesh, helping to break it down. Thus you'll find rats, mosquitoes, and the like in ancient fossils, but they are not the same foul creatures in existence today. They mutated as a direct result of the nature of modern people, taking on their current despicable functions to directly reflect those natures in the races. As for the dating time scales that I said are wrong, I'm referring mostly to human fossils, Neanderthal, Homo erectus, etc., none of which are more than 50,000 years old, although I still maintain that all their dating schemes are grossly in error, being less than 10% accurate. Till next time. Love and Peace. Peace Brother BLK Roots. I know you are busy, and I certainly appreciate love the time you take to listen and answer my questions. I've been contemplating your posts and working to wrap my mind around the new slash old concepts while continuing down my own spiritual path. I've been learning about traditional African religions, specifically IFA, and spent some time with a well-regarded IFA priest in order to solve a very real spiritual slash psychic energy manifestation problem. The priest was able to solve my problem through a cleaning, but now my spiritual journey to realize my purpose and goals on earth still remain unanswered. And I do not believe the answer lies in religion, traditional African, or otherwise. You spoke about traditional African religions beginning with the lighter races 6K YRS ago, this true spiritual path for the original 1B8M, how will this be revealed to those of us who seek? The IFA priest I spoke of told me straight, through divination, that religion is not my path, but an internal spiritual journey, learning to hear slash listen my true spiritual self, Ori, will lead me to where I need to go. Do you have any suggestions for hearing? What is the elder's plan? Thanks again, and I understand that you are busy and will reply when time permits. One love and protection. Peace. I posted a simple exercise some time ago on hearing the inner guide in answer to an identical question from a brother. I'll quote it here, as it may be useful to you too. Dear brother, As I mentioned some time ago, every black person has the truth in him her, because God is incarnated in each one of us. Or more accurately, each one of us is God incarnated as a new personality. God comes from the completed previous universe in the form of one billion eight million black people united as one in mind and heart. After they create the new universe, they leave the divine oneness and become separate minds. From that time until the end of the universe they, or rather we, incarnate time and again as new persons. Although we are new personalities who have never lived before, we are at the same time those very same original gods who created the universe. That is how God renews him slash herself. 
God is a brand new baby who has never existed before, but is simultaneously the oldest person there is who has always existed and is hoary with ageless wisdom. The eternal self that is incarnated in us is called our first self, one of the original B8M gods. Whenever we think a thought, ask a question, or wonder about anything whatsoever, the first self is always the first to answer. He, she is the great interferer, so to speak. But he, she never imposes. His, her answer comes as direct knowledge, as if you are remembering something you always knew. 112. Now, although the first self always answers, we don't always hear. Or rather, we always hear, but we immediately enter into a debate within ourselves, especially when we don't like the answer. But his, her answer is always the only true one. So the trick is to train ourselves to hear it. 113. There's a simple exercise anyone can do to hear better. Whenever you have a mundane question, try and remember the first answer you received in your mind. This is easy to do once you are aware that you are doing it. It's possible to remember that first answer every time, even after you have gone through the usual internal debate. All you have to do is become aware that you are debating with yourself and simply stop and try to recall the first thought that led to the inner argument. When you try this, you'll discover that you can easily remember it. It's important when you try this exercise to start with mundane questions, never serious issues. By mundane, I mean things like, what should I wear today? What should I have for breakfast, dinner? What movie should I go see? And so on. After a few weeks, you'll be able to stop and remember the first answer to your questions before you start debating within. In a few months, you'll discover to your surprise that you even receive answers concerning knowledge you thought you never knew at all, even ancestral knowledge. This exercise is most effective when one does not dwell on it and turn it into a chore. Do it once or twice a day, whenever you remember. It will pick up its own momentum effortlessly, and the long-term results will be quite surprising. Till later. Thanks. I did read that post a while back and was practicing, but I suppose the internal debate got the better of me for the moment. I'll go back to my exercises. Thanks for the reminder. Test questions and answers. What is physics? It is the knowledge of the laws and principles of atoms and electrons. What is astronomy? It is the knowledge of the laws governing stars and planets. What is the only difference between stars and atoms? Size is the only difference. The laws and principles are the same. What is the electron like on a giant size scale? The Earth is a giant size electron. What is the nucleus like on a giant size scale? The Sun is a giant sized nucleus. 5b. What is the atom like on a giant scale? Our solar system is a giant atom. What is the atom made of? The atom itself is made of atoms. Why will the fundamental particle of matter never be found by scientific instruments? It will never be found by instruments because every atom is made of miniature atoms, themselves made of even smaller atoms, to infinity. BRS2 What is the size of the solar system? The solar system is measured to be 7,900 million miles across. What is the size of the Earth? Our Earth is measured at only 7,900 miles across. What is the size of the electron? The electron has been measured at about 1 slash 4 trillionth of an inch. What is the size of the atom? The atom at about 1 quarter millionth of an inch across. What is the law of creation? The law of creation is, as above, so it is below. BRS 3 and 4. What can be considered as a mini-Earth, the electron or the atom? The electron. What can be considered as a mini-universe, the Earth or the solar system? The Earth. How can we find out the size of the universe? By knowing the size of the Earth. What is the distance separating stars? The stars are separated from each other by about 32 trillion miles. How many solar systems can fit in the distance separating stars? 4,000 star systems will fit in the distance separating two stars. How many atoms can fit in the distance separating atoms? 4,000. Why are the answers to 17 and 18 the same? The same law applies. 
As above, so below. By how much are atoms separated? Any two atoms are separated by one thousandth of an inch. BRS 5 and 6. How many atoms make up the Earth? There are 125 billion trillion trillion atoms inside the Earth. How many stars make up the universe? 125 billion trillion trillion. Why are the answers to 21 and 22 the same? The same law applies. As above, so below. How much bigger is the Earth than the atom? The Earth is 2,000 trillion times bigger than the atom. How much bigger is the universe than the solar system? The universe is 2,000 trillion times bigger than the solar system. Why are the answers to 24 and 25 the same? The same law applies. As above, so below. What is the size of the universe? The universe is 16 trillion trillion miles across and has 125 billion trillion trillion stars. BRS 6. Was the universe created by a huge explosion, Big Bang? No. What does the law of cycles say? The law of creation is the law of cycles, which says the end point is the same as the beginning point, and the cycle repeats. Where did the present universe originate? The present universe originated from the previous one. Where did the previous universe originate? The previous universe originated from the one before. When was the beginning? There is no beginning and no end. It has always been, and ever shall be. Where did the Earth's atoms come from? They were actually the star systems of that previous universe of our ancestors. Who created our universe? Our ancestors, the original people called the first gods. The Holy Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Mother, the Daughter, and the Divine Life. The twenty-four elders are called the fathers and mothers of the nation. Each elder is called father by his tribe, and his wife, the queen, is called mother. The 144 chiefs are called the sons and daughters of the elders. Each chief is called the son by his clan, and the co-chief, his wife, is called the daughter. The 144,000 judges are called the Holy Spirit, or divine life, by the residents of their town. The three groups of our leaders, the elders, chiefs, and judges, are called the Highest Holy Trinity. The designation as the Highest Holy Trinity comes from the following teaching. We are taught that the true name of reality, or all of existence, is the Holy Trinity. At the beginning of creation that has no beginning, God created reality in the form of a triangle, or three-sided form, or trinity. To this day, all reality is created in exactly the same way, every time. First God divided into two, and then into three, and when he she became three, then reality, or all of existence in the universe, came into being. Since that moment, every event in reality, every action in life, every movement in the universe, every facet of life whatsoever, is in the form of the holy triangle. We are taught that when a young girl sweeps the floor of her house, that event is in the form of the divine trinity. When a boy plays a drum or a woman dances to music, all those movements are in the form of the holy trinity, or triangle of reality. In the case of the young girl, she is called the mother of her divine trinity. The clean floor that results from her sweeping is called the daughter of her divine trinity, and the act of sweeping is called her holy spirit. The boy playing the drum is called the father of his actions. The music he brings into existence is called his son, and the act of playing the drum is called his Holy Spirit. The dancing woman is also the mother of her actions. The dance resulting from her actions is her daughter, and the action of her swaying hips is called her Holy Spirit. To our ancestors, every action is holy, and is called the Holy Spirit. When you type a message on the computer, that typing action is your Holy Spirit. The message you create is your son or daughter, and you are the father or mother of your holy trinity, or triangle of reality. Every result of every action is called the son or daughter of its creator, and the individual creating it is its father or mother. This is called the divine trinity by means of which reality comes into existence. All reality exists by the manifestation of the divine trinity in every universal event, however serious or mundane. 
Reality manifests on the highest level as God, the Father-slash-Mother, the Universe, the Son-slash-Daughter, and Life, the Holy Spirit. So God, the Universe, and Life are the highest manifestation of the Holy Trinity, or Triangle of Existence. The Holy Trinity is personified on the highest level in the persons of the 24 elders as the fathers slash mothers, the custodians of unity, the 144 chiefs as the sons slash daughters, or custodians of universal energy, and the 144,000 judges as the Holy Spirit, or custodians of divine life. Our leaders are called the highest Holy Trinity. In addition, the elders are called the custodians of divine unity. Divine means perfect, complete, whole, or holy. Divine unity is another name for the oneness of God. The 24 elders are also called the home of eternity. When the singers compose their songs, they call them by many other names. The poets use even more names as they feel inspired to sing their praises. But of all the names of the elders, the most popular and most beloved is simply mother and father. In the eternal language of the black nation, mother is Ma and father is R.A. R.A. and Ma, or simply Rama. That is the eternal name of God. And it is by the will of God that reality manifests on earth in the form of the divine triangle. That is the origin of the expression, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, also called by our people, the Mother, the Daughter, and the Divine Life. The True Teachings of Jesus Jesus came 2,000 years ago in order to reintroduce, among other things, soon after he passed, the light-skinned races latched onto this concept and corrupted it beyond recognition. Today it is no more than the concept of the Holy Trinity, a useless mystery, causing untold confusion as to who God really is. But he taught other lessons as well. The events associated with his teachings are recorded reasonably accurately in the Bible, but the teachings themselves are no longer discernible in the events. As I mentioned before, Jesus came into Palestine at a time when the misery and oppression of black people living in the Middle East was at an all-time high, coming from the Romans, Persians, and every race that ever conquered Egypt and the Middle East in those days. He came to offer comfort to black people, his people, and to remind them of their origins and everlasting glory, which they had forgotten over the passage of many centuries. One thing he did not come to do was to start a religion or to be worshipped. Yet that was to be expected of the light races, as they have done the same thing with the four other Mahdi's or messiahs that came before him. The first lesson he taught was that true love is mind and heart unity. True or divine love happens only when two or more people unite in mind and heart as one person. There is no other kind of real love. Any other kind is material or physical love, of which animals are also capable. He taught this by means of the statements, I and the Father are one, and I will be there only when two or more of you are united in my name, i.e. in mind and heart unity. Jesus, as well as the six other Mahdi's that have been born, are said to have had a virgin birth. Every person born on earth is born with two types of minds, a conscious and unconscious, or subconscious, mind. The unconscious mind is called ancestral memory by our people, and is called the collective unconscious by modern psychiatrists. This unconscious mind is not to be confused with suppressed memories. Suppressed memories, or what Freud mistakenly called the subconscious mind, is really part of the conscious mind. It was conscious at one point and became subconscious by being suppressed for various reasons, chief of which is self-preservation in the case where such memories cause trauma. This type of suppressed memory is not subconscious or unconscious in all people. There are people who have what is called total recall. They never forget anything they have ever experienced. In Africa, such people are called griots, or reciters of tribal history. True unconscious memory is a gift from our ancestors. It is a record of the lives of our ancestors going back to the beginning of the universe. In the case of the light races, their gift of ancestral memory, or their collective unconscious, only goes back 6,000 years to their beginning point. This unconscious mind or ancestral memory is always unconscious in each individual. On the other hand, it is always conscious in the 24 elders, who are the conscious mind of the nation, or the custodians of eternal consciousness. But it is always unconscious in individuals. 
It was unconscious when it entered the individual's mind at conception and remains unconscious until it is kindled by rituals of initiation. Now, it so happens that there are seven individuals who were born on earth with their ancestral memory being conscious from conception. These individuals, when they are born, are said to have had an immaculate conception or a virgin birth. The gift of ancestral memory, also called the mind of God, comes directly from the 24 elders. When every individual is born on earth, the elders send this incarnation or mind of God into that person by detaching it from themselves. When the elders send the incarnation into a newly conceived baby without detaching it from themselves, then that ancestral memory becomes conscious in that individual, who is then united with the elders. The person spontaneously becomes aware of it as soon as he reaches puberty. In Jesus' case this happened when he was 12 years old. Such an individual is sent on a mission by the elders. By being born in unity with them, he is said to have had an immaculate or virgin birth. Jesus was one of seven such people in the last 6,000 years. By divine love he meant this unity with the two elders of his tribe, whom he called the father and mother. In teaching about true or divine love he said, Be one with your neighbor even as I and the father, mother, are one. That is, people can experience divine love only by being united as one in mind and heart. He did not say, love your neighbor as you love yourself, but rather, love your neighbor as yourself, meaning you literally become your soulmate, and he, she becomes you, the two as one in divine unity. That was his first lesson. The next lesson he taught was that in order to reach heaven, or the eternal state of mind in which the elders live, the individual can only get there through the Son and by the help of the Holy Spirit, and no other way. The judges, the chiefs, and the elders form the steps of a pyramid of ascendance, with the elders being the pinnacle or capstone, the final point of eternity. To climb to this pinnacle during the rituals of initiation, it is necessary that individuals do so with the help of the judges and chiefs. In each of the seven great rituals of the black nation, the people unite first with the minds of the 144,000 judges, then with the 144 chiefs, and only then are they able to reach the state of mind of the elders. Any other direct way would result in failure, as the divine state of the elders is too far up to reach without the help of the chiefs and judges, who are called the Son, Daughter, and the Holy Spirit. That is the meaning of the second teaching that one can enter heaven, divine unity, only through the Son, Daughter, and by the help of the Holy Spirit. The third fact that Jesus came to remind black people of is that the black woman is God, just as perfectly as the black man. Two thousand years ago black people who lived in the Middle East, especially in the region today called Israel and Palestine, had been under the influence of the light races for so long that they had adopted some of their oppressive customs, especially the evil custom of oppressing women. They believed the lie that the woman was made from the man's rib. People such as Paul the Apostle and his followers did the most damage after Jesus was gone and furthering this lie. Jesus not only taught that the black woman was the black man's equal and soulmate without whom neither one is complete, but he actually demonstrated this truth in his relationship with Mary of Magdala. He developed a relationship of equality with this black woman and elevated her to a status beyond even his male disciples. They were initially outraged by his attitude, but soon learned the truth they had forgotten. Because of his unity with the chiefs, the custodians of all universal forces and energy, Jesus also had what is called supernatural power, or power over the elements, as in the case of turning water into wine, quieting the seas, and so on. He made use of these miracles to teach the lesson that black people are not subject to the laws of nature, but rather the laws of nature are subject to, and originate from us. Our ancestors of his time, in the midst of their misery, had become superstitious and turned to worshipping natural forces in order to placate them. Such behavior was the result of centuries of ignorance and self-forgetfulness. By demonstrating total control of nature, he reminded them that all the laws and conditions of nature originate from the minds of the 144 chiefs, who are the custodians of all universal conditions. His fifth lesson had to do with the renewal of the laws of Moses, who came before him as the fourth Messiah. Moses established many laws and customs that had been lost. 
After he passed, the light races turned his laws and customs into oppressive superstitions. Their leaders turned them into religious rituals with which they ruled and oppressed the masses, even as they do today in the superstitious religion called Judaism. Jesus said he had come to fulfill the laws of Moses, meaning to reestablish them and explain their purpose. Their main purpose was to promote a clean, hygienic way of life, whereby people avoid disease through the proper treatment of their bodies, food, and animals. In addition, the law served the purpose of promoting peaceful coexistence through the so-called Ten Commandments. These two things, proper hygiene and proper social relations, lead to a healthy mind and body, and to peace, both of which are essential for the attainment of divine unity, which is the purpose of life. These simple laws had been corrupted beyond recognition, and Jesus simplified them in his fifth teaching. His sixth lesson was about the origin, nature, and destiny of the light races. He described to his disciples all that will happen when the rule of the light races comes to an end. His description of the end times was taken by the races and turned into the scenario of Armageddon as it is well known today. He also taught a seventh lesson which completed his mission on earth. I will discuss it at some other time, as it has to do with the process of ascension. Don't get me wrong, I do appreciate the knowledge that you are dispensing. However, his name was not Jesus who are you referring to? Waishwa ben Pindara, S.P., Waishwa ben Procuria, S.P. Jesus Christ is a figment of white man's imagination, and clarification of this is vital. KRST is a principle that I aspire towards. It is not a person, and it never was, it can be emulated by PPL, but to define it as a particular individual who was born of a virgin suffered under Pontius Pilate, wait Pilate never mentions him, hmm, neither does Herod hmm, didn't he go around slaying the male children? He doesn't mention this either. I try to analyze facts and allegories and parables, but there are differences within those three things, truth can be learned from facts, allegory, myth, and parables, but to equate a fact with an allegory, or a myth, or a parable is incorrect, and untrue. Greetings, brother. If I were to change the title to, The True Teachings of Ishua Ben Pandira or Ishua Ben Procuria, you would no doubt find it more acceptable. Why? Ask yourself, where did you get these names? I'll be very immodest, allow me this one time, and answer the question for you, you got them from a white man. Would you deny this? If that's the case, then why are they not also a figment of YT's imagination? I don't intend to sound arrogant, but I must call it like it is. You are arguing about the falsehood of one name that comes from YT and want to replace it with a true one. But that also comes from YT. So now you reject one of YT's figments and try to replace it with another one of YT's figments of the imagination. This is a preposterous situation. The true name of Jesus is a particular sound. After all, alphabets only represent sounds. Now that sound which is his name can best be approximated using the Aramaic alphabet. All other approximations are translations, the closest being Hebrew and Arabic, as these two languages are the closest to Aramaic. So I approximate his name as Yeshua ben Yusuf. That sound, not the letters, comes the closest to the original Aramaic sound. But I prefer to use the name Jesus. The reason is because that's the common name most people are familiar with. If I were to use an obscure name like Yeshua ben Pandira, it would serve those who are well-read in religious matters, but it would leave most people with the impression that I'm referring to another Jesus different than the one in the Bible. My goal is to reveal that the Jesus of the Bible actually existed, but his teachings were stolen and changed to serve the money and power interests of the Catholic Church. The best way to get back what they stole is not to claim that he never existed just because we hate what the church did with his teachings, but to reveal his true teachings, which were, and still are, for the benefit of black people. This is stolen merchandise. We must get it back by direct positive confrontation of their lies, and not by a negative method of denial or trying to erase history. I only have one minute here at this time, but I would find it more truthful if correct names were used. Waishwa ben Pindara etc. are cataloged in the annals of various historians that lived around the time and after, I can verify this info, whereas with Jesus, it is fiction. 
Additionally, Weishau B. Pindara and Weishwa bin Procuria are two different PPL. The two names Pandara and Procuria refer to the same person, Joseph, the father of Yeshua, Jesus. They are what today would be called descriptive names, that's a name a person is known by instead of his proper name. For example, a small town carpenter would be called Joe the Carpenter instead of Joe Smith to distinguish him from other Joes in the town. In addition to being a carpenter, Joseph was a debt collector for rich people, money lenders. Hence he was called Procurios in Greek, which became Procurius in Latin. It means to take care of something for someone else. The word Pandaira is a corruption of the ancient African word patella, which literally means pay up. The Dutch word betal, to pay, is derived from it. So the two words are identical and were used interchangeably to refer to Joseph. As has happened many times with the translations of other people's names, translators assumed these were two different people and even assigned different time periods to them. To add to the confusion, there were many other people by the name of Pandaira, which was as common as the name for Carpenter. And so there are other Yeshua bin Pandairas who also became famous for different reasons. So when you see this name mentioned, don't assume the narrator knows the difference between one person and another of the same name. If I may add my 0.02 to this discussion. Yeshua ben Pandera, the Talmudic character, is fictional. A major northern sanctuary of the worship of Azar, Azit and Haru, and this held true also very heavily in the Christian era, is a city called Tata, often written with the matut slash symbol for the soft T or D. It is pronounced Dada. It is often spelled Tetetu or Tetet. The triad of the city was Baneb Tata, Hatmihit, and Harupakart. A bishop was sent from this region to the Council of Nicaea. Remember bishop is actually defined in by Webster as the head of a non-Christian religious sect slash group, etc. Azar was identified with Baneb Tata. Look at the names of Azar in all the shrines wherein he dwells, see Budge's Gods of the Egyptians, Volume 2, Osiris Chapter, one of Azar's titles is Azar Ba Neb Tata. Ba means ram. Neb means master, lord. Tata, Dada, is the name of the city. Ba Neb Dada is thus the great ram, lord of the city Tata, Dada. The Greeks called the city Mendes. Hatmihit was identified with Azit. Haru Pakart, meaning Haru the child, was identified with Haru or Kensu son of Azar and Azit. Baneb Tata or Baneb Dada became corrupted into Banadada, Bandada, Bandata, Pandata, and Pandera. Remember, the rolling R in our ancestral languages, tongue tapping the roof of the mouth once, sounds like a soft D. This is why Tuesday in the Akan language, Banada Benada, is veritably indistinguishable with Benera, Benera, when the rolling R is pronounced. This is why our A is pronounced slash called D in Uvodown. B and P are interchangeable. The N is nasal. Azar or Banabdata slash Bandara slash Pandara slash Pandera is the father symbolized as a ram. Haru Pakart is Haru, Kensu slash Jesus slash Yeshu, son of Pandera. The son of the ram is the lamb. There is no historical Jesus named Ben Pandara. This was a major mistake made by Gerald Massey. 25. All of this information is in the texts of our ancestresses and ancestors and in the languages and cultural slash spiritual practices of our contemporary ancestral clans, Akin, Bakongo, Yoruba, Igbo, Bambara, Nguni, Dogon, etc. Source, Kwesi Arania Akin. 26. It's not possible to discover the truth by tracing it backwards. Truth can be known only by starting at the origin and going forward. Any other method will lead to error. God starts as a singularity or divine unity of all black people and separates into the endless multiplicity that make up the universe. To try and discover the unity of God by reconstructing the multiple parts as in a jigsaw puzzle will always result in error. 27. In the same way, so too do all living systems in creation originate from unity and diversify into multiplicity. This is true of life forms, which originate from the unity of character into the 144,000 totems and then multitudes of species. 
It's also true of language, which is itself a living system. All languages on earth, without exception, developed from the twelve original languages of the black nation. The twelve languages originate from one language called the unspoken language. It's a language of thought symbols, or telepathy, and all genuine symbols of initiation, including genuine hieroglyphs, originate from the mental symbols. As soon as this language is uttered, it differentiates into twelve spoken languages because there are twelve gods at the heads of the twelve tribes, twelve gods in mind unity, twenty-four elders in physical manifestation. Twenty-eight, that's how the twelve languages came about. All other languages in turn came from the twelve, and they developed by a process of corruption. Corruption comes about as a result of the deterioration of the human body. All human bodies on earth have been deteriorating steadily for 6,000 years, or longer if one goes back 50,000 years. As they deteriorate, the tongue and the vocal cords, as well as the parts of the brain responsible for speech, also decline. This causes a downward change in speech, or a devolution, if you will. Thus all earth's languages today are inferior to those of the past, and those are inferior to the original twelve. 29. Now, the twelve original languages are spoken by twelve modern tribal societies on earth. Ten of these societies are in Africa. Of these ten, one is the language called Sichuana. The Botswana tribe of southern Africa speak a modern version of it called Sichuana. The original itself, Sichuana, is the language of initiation of the Botswana. Similarly, the eleven other black societies that are custodians of the ancient languages use them in their initiations. 30. In order to discover how the modern languages of the Bakongo, Yoruba, Igbo, etc. became what they are, one must start with the original language and follow its differentiation going forward in time until the present. 31. It's not possible to start with the multitudes of languages and reconstruct the original by a backward tracing type of scholarly investigation. It's as impossible as trying to put together a broken eggshell. There are so many discontinuities in the devolution from singularity to multiplicity that you would encounter insurmountable pitfalls. It's somewhat similar to the pitfalls modern paleontologists encounter when they try to reconstruct the original totems from the multitudes of plants and animals on earth. The discontinuities make it difficult to bridge across many of the gaps and variations. 32. By discontinuities I mean sudden changes that show no relationship between what came before and what followed immediately after. For example, the change from a chrysalis, worm, to a butterfly is an insurmountable discontinuity. It's not possible to trace this change backwards by a scholarly or intellectual study. You can only understand this type of transformation by actually witnessing it, otherwise you'd never believe that a worm could turn into a butterfly. Similarly, there are many such traps awaiting scholars in the development of languages. 33. The erroneous reconstruction of Pandera from Ba Tata is just such an example. This type of intellectual exercise relies entirely on guesswork. The scholar searches for words that sound alike and then associates them. This is completely arbitrary. By necessity, the scholar must restrict himself to only those words he knows. What if the correct association is with words he's never heard of? He must perforce exclude them since he has no inkling of their existence. 34. As you can see, the only correct way is to start with the original language and then follow it forward experientially over the millennia to see how it became the various languages. The only way to do this is by the infallible method of initiation. It allows the mind to travel back in time and live the lives of the ancestors and actually experience firsthand the diversification of languages and at the same time confirm beyond the possibility of doubt the existence of these very same ancestors and discover their true names. 35. First off, I disagree with most of what you have stated, more notably concerning your comment about the impossibility of discovering the truth by tracing it backwards. Especially since after you made that comment, you proceeded to go backwards to try and prove a point. You stated that the twelve languages originate from one language called the unspoken language. The unspoken language? Are you saying this is the name of the original language, the unspoken language? 48. I'll wait for you to comment on that while I compose other questions. 49. 
the unspoken language is the mother of the twelve spoken languages. The reason it's called the unspoken language is because it doesn't involve speech, but only thought symbols. So it's a silent communication and cannot possibly have a name. Hence it's called the silent language. The word language may be an inappropriate translation here since it implies speech, but look, in English, computer programming is called a language. So too is the communication of deaf and dumb people called sign language even though neither one involves speech. 50. This is the nature of all corrupted human languages, especially the light race languages. They've reached a state of extreme devolution and are riddled with self-contradictions. Such is not the case with the ancient languages. They are a perfect means of communication whose words are so absolutely clear that they admit no possibility of misinterpretation. This may sound far-fetched, but that's because the majority of black people on earth have forgotten our original languages due to the circumstances of the past 6,000 years. 51. I had brother in the priesthood named Kwesi R.A. Niamakin have a look at your initial response to me, and we both concluded the same thing. Since I referred to his work as a source of my explanation, and being that you discredited his work, I had him respond to your response. Here's what he had to say. 52. The post made by the brother is simply a litany of errors. He makes a number of false assumptions and then draws conclusions which are equally false. There are also a number of inaccuracies promoted as facts, 12 languages, 10 in Africa, deterioration of bodies for 6,000 years, etc., etc. There are a number of influences, direct and or indirect, that lead to these kinds of misguided notions Nation of Islam Doctrine, 5% Doctrine, Moorish Science Doctrine, Bobby Hemet, Phil Valentine, Delbert Blair, Nuapian, White and Non-White New Age Writings, White and Non-White Misinterpretations of Afurikani slash Afurate Katenet, African, Ancestral Religious Culture and Practice, etc. 53. I won't waste time addressing every single point, because the central theme is that in reality we do start from the beginning. The Kukutuntum begins with the creation of the universe. The languages of the Akan, Yoruba, Igbo, etc. are not recent perversions or fragments of ancient languages, they are direct descendants with alterations in tonality and speech articulation patterns which were slashed or sanctioned by the deities and ancestral spirits themselves. This brings up the other essential point, which is that the ritual practices we employ are from the beginning as well. 54. We still become possessed, empowered, and guided by the deities, the same deities who have governed the universe since its inception and our most ancient ancestresses and ancestors. They still speak to and through us. Our contemporary languages on the continent carry spiritual potency of the divine. We have authentic initiations for priest slash Esud and other offices, he speaks of initiation, but it sounds like new age initiation because no authentic initiations in Akin, Yoruba, etc. or any other Afurikani slash Afurite Katenet culture would confer upon the new priest slash Est such misguided doctrine. The deities speak through us at the shrines, through possession, through divination, audibly, visibly, and also symbolically. This, by the way, is how the proper derivations of the name Baneb Tata, Pandira, came from slash comes from as well as all of the other etymologies. Our scholarship is based on communication with the deities and ancestral spirits. They then direct us to the specific physical evidence, languages, matutu, ritual practices, etc., which confirm for us physically what they have shared with us non-physically. 55. The brother's analysis of my vantage point, intentions, methods, etc. are wholly inaccurate. The fact that such a depth of inaccuracies are manifest in his single response is almost astonishing. 56. Ultimately, any of us who actually embraces our ancestral culture will begin to communicate with and ritually engage the deities and ancestral spirits themselves. This is the major goal of informing our people about our culture the re-embrace of Afurikani slash Afurite Katenet ancestral religion. They will then avail themselves of the various mechanisms in our culture which can be used to verify the accuracy of any kind of information including the info. I've published. This verification has already been done by a number of people who are involved in authentic Afurikani slash Afurite Katenet ancestral religion. Ma'asambuihitip. Arainium. Introduction to Mathematics. 
mathematics is the knowledge of the origin of numbers. We're closely followed by 5 and 10. The numbers 1, 2, 3, 7, and 12 came before all other numbers. They. These seven numbers are the parents of all other numbers. They are the only perfect and complete numbers. The rest are transitional or combinations of the seven. All systems in existence, natural or social, are the result of some combination of these seven primary numbers. One is the number of divine unity, the beginning and end of all things. Two is the number of equality or soulmates, man and woman. Three is the number of reality manifestation, called the holy trinity of doer, deed, and action. The origin of the other numbers will be explained in what follows. All numbers lead to the most sacred of all numbers, which is one billion eight million, the number of gods in the universe. The billion eight million gods are the creators of the universe. They, we, are the first gods and the original people. The number one billion eight million comes about the following way. God begins as the divine unity of all black people, in the beginning there were no non-blacks. They were made much later from black people. God thus begins as unity. Then he, she divides and becomes two, represented by man and woman. From two he, she becomes three, represented by man, woman, and child on a personal level, and by the highest holy trinity of elders, chiefs, and judges on the highest personal level. Also by the triad of doer, deed, and action, or father, son, and holy spirit, mother, daughter, and divine life, on the existential level. Existential simply means how reality comes into being. It always comes into being in threes, or trinity of doer, deed, and action, as I explained in the post about the Holy Trinity. From this three or trinity, God divides further and becomes seven, which is called the number of completion. This number belongs to all complete and perfect natural systems, for example the seven colors of the rainbow, the seven tones of music, the seven openings in the human head, and so on. So all perfect and complete natural systems come in sevens, that's why seven is the number of completion. The reason it's seven is as follows. First of all, all reality in the universe exists in the form of a trinity. The highest holy trinity is personified in the persons of the elders, chiefs, and judges. They are the creators and custodians of all that exists. First are the elders, who are the divine unity of God. Second are the chiefs who are the creators and custodians of all physical conditions in the universe. Third are the judges, who are the creators and custodians of all life. The universe consists of these three things, unity, physical energy, and life. They interact with each other in various ways and result in the endless number of things that make up all reality. 7. 7. The Number of Completion all of the things that make up reality are the combination of these three of the elders, chiefs, and judges. Fundamental things, unity, energy, and life, personified in the persons. Thus whenever any major natural system is to be created, for example the colors of the rainbow, the highest holy trinity determine how it will manifest. The elders are the highest of the three groups and have the first say in every major creation. Next are the chiefs, then the judges. So when the universe was being created, right at the very beginning when all was in darkness, the Holy Trinity came together to decide how it should all come about. The elders spoke first, followed by the chiefs, then the judges. When all three have had a say, creation manifests the first three independent and primary manifestations. In terms of color, these are red, yellow, and blue. They are called the primary and independent colors because each one was created independently by each group of leaders. The elders created the red color, the chiefs yellow, and the judges blue. Next the leaders collaborated to create what can be called secondary and dependent manifestations. First the elders collaborated with the chiefs, and their creativity resulted in a fourth manifestation, following the three primaries. In terms of color this was the combination of red and yellow, resulting in orange, which is a secondary color and the fourth manifestation. Then the elders worked with the judges and created the fifth type of creation. In terms of color this is the combination of red and blue, resulting in indigo. 
the chiefs and judges then created together and brought about the sixth manifestation. It's represented in color by the combination of yellow and blue, resulting in green. Then all three groups of leaders got together for the final type of creation, which brought about the seventh manifestation. In terms of color, it's the combination of red, yellow, and blue, giving violet, the seventh color of the rainbow. As is clear from the combinations above, seven completes the total number of ways in which creations can be created, both independently, three creations, and by collaboration, four creations. Hence seven is called the number of completion. The example given using colors applies to all natural systems. That is the reason why there are seven basic colors, seven tones of music, seven great rituals of the black nation, and other numbers that are multiples of seven. From seven God divided further and became twelve. Twelve, twelve, the number of tribes. From seven God became twelve. Just as one is the number of divine unity, two the number of soulmates, three the number of reality manifestation, and seven the number of completion of natural systems, twelve is the number of societal relations. The purpose of all social relations is to cause mind expansion. From the most basic type of relationship between two people, to the most complex type among all twelve tribes and seventy-two clans, the social activities that go on have this expansion as the primary purpose. A conversation between two people results in the sharing of information, and if some of that information has some truth in it, it causes the conscious mind to gain something new it didn't have before. This increases knowledge and causes the mind to naturally expand. In a similar way, but on a much larger scale, the interactions that go on among the tribes also cause mind expansion. The ultimate form of mind and heart expansion comes from divine unity, where you share your whole being with another or others. It's necessary to have expansion occur in the most efficient way possible, because God is perfect and efficiency is one of his, her attributes. When creating society, black people naturally chose the most efficiently perfect number for expansion. To discover which number among all numbers is the most efficiently perfect for expansion, we have to talk about abstract forms. All things in the universe, seen and unseen, have forms. Physical things like trees and stones have obvious forms that can be seen, but unseen things also have forms, and their forms are called abstract forms. The shape of every abstract form is determined by its purpose. For example, the divine abstract form of the concept of leadership is a pyramid. This is determined by the purpose of leadership, which is to lead people to divine unity. The pyramid is the ideal abstract form for this. People climb as a mass of separate individuals from all four directions and go to the top, and stages, where they become one like the capstone, as I've described in a previous discussion. Similarly, the divine abstract form of social relationships is a sphere. In truth, all things have abstract forms, including physical objects. Everything starts as an abstract idea until it manifests as a physical reality. The abstract forms of all physical objects, past, present, and future, exist in perfection and eternity, in the minds of the twenty-four elders. So then the abstract form of all social relations is a sphere. This is determined by their purpose, which, as stated before, is expansion. The sphere is the most efficient form for expansion in that it expands equally in all directions at once. No other form has this type of quality. If you watch children build a snowball by adding snow to it from all sides, or by rolling it, it takes the shape of a sphere. This is the best shape for it to expand and grow as quickly as possible with minimum effort. For this same reason all planets and stars are spherical in shape. The expansion of the mind is also spherical in its abstract shape. So too is the abstract shape of all nations and tribes, as well as friendships and every form of human relationship, including divine unity, because all of them have expansion as their primary purpose. So it can be said that God designed the tribes of the black nation in the form of perfect spheres so that they can interact and expand in the most efficient way possible. God is the greatest mathematician. Not in the sense of one who studies mathematics, but one who is the source of all mathematical ideas. What God creates is perfect in every way, including mathematically, and becomes the source of all mathematical ideas and principles. 
the tribes of the black nation are thus spherical in their social abstract shape. Now, there's a limit to the number of social spheres that allows optimum efficiency of interaction, and that limit is 12. It can be demonstrated mathematically in the following way. Take small spherical objects like ping pong balls, for example, and put them together such that you have a number of them on the outside surrounding one in the center. Make sure there is no gap for another ball to fit, and see how many balls you can have surrounding the central one, all touching it. That number is 12. No more and no less. This is a mathematical law of maximum efficient interaction. It's the perfect abstract ideal for the formation of society, whose purpose is to advance mind and heart unity, which is identical to mind and heart expansion. The perfect form for manifesting this purpose is a sphere because of its natural quality as the most perfect form for expansion. There is a natural maximum number of social spheres or tribes that can surround the central unity of God. The tribes are all equal to one another and to God. None is closer to or farther removed from God than any other, and they are all in touch with His her divine unity. That natural maximum number is 12, as can be seen in the physical model described above. That's the reason the number of tribes of the black nation is 12. The seven fundamental numbers. Those are the first five divisions of God. They are represented by the five, the five fingers and toes. Limbs surrounding the human torso, the legs, arms, and neck, and also by. For the purposes of teaching the fundamental origins of numbers, the middle finger is associated with one, divine unity. The middle finger and ring finger together represent two, or soul mates, man and woman. The middle finger, ring finger, and small finger all together represent three, man, woman, and child, or the manifestation of reality in the universe. The pointing finger by itself represents seven, the number of completion. The thumb, which stands aloof by itself from the other fingers, represents twelve, which is not derived from the previous numbers in the way that the others before it are. By symmetry, the five fingers become ten fingers, and ten naturally becomes the basis for counting. If you study the counting systems of our ancestors, the best recorded example being that of the ancient Egyptians, you will see that they used ten as the basis for counting. Their week had ten days. Their day had ten hours from sunrise to sunrise, and each hour had one hundred minutes. Each minute had 100 seconds for a total of 100,000 seconds from sunrise to sunrise, corresponding to the total number of heartbeats per day in our original bodies. A second was measured by one heartbeat, and a minute by 100 heartbeats. Because of the deterioration of our bodies, our heartbeats have increased from 100,000 per day to about 110,000. But that is the explanation for the basis of our ancient clock and calendar system, and it was founded on the number 10. This system of counting was copied by succeeding civilizations and remains so to this day. Now, by repetition of the number 12, the gods surrounded themselves with 12 assistants each. They became the 144 chiefs. By using the number 10 repeated three times for a total of 1,000, 10 by 10 by 10, the 144 chiefs chose 1,000 assistants each, who became the 144,000 judges. By symmetry of soulmates, the 12 gods became 24 elders, and hence all the chiefs and judges also were chosen in soulmate couples, every man and his wife, every woman and her husband. The 144,000 judges did like the chiefs and chose 1,000 people each to lead in their town, and the population on earth became 144 million. The 24 elders allowed each citizen 7,000 years to live, and two children per couple, one child to replace each citizen. The population doubled then and became 2x144 million or 288 million. The children grew up and became adults, and they too had two children per couple, tripling the population to three by 144 million. A new generation was born every 1,000 years, and this continued for seven generations until the total population reached its natural maximum of 7x144000000 or 1,008,000,000. After that, 
When a new generation of 144 million people were born each millennium, the same number of senior citizens passed away, having lived 7,000 years, and so 1B8M became the fixed and permanent population on earth. That's how God became the sacred number of 1B8M people, who are the same 1B8M black people alive today. That is the maximum population for a planet the size of earth in order for the people to live in perfect comfort. It allows complete freedom of movement over the whole earth, as well as proper land development without being overbearing on the natural resources or imposing on the plants and animals. Any number beyond this maximum is overpopulation. 2. The world today is grossly overpopulated by six times its natural capacity, in other words, by an amount equaling the number of non-blacks on earth. Cosmology Cosmology is the knowledge of how the cosmos, the universe, was created. Our universe was created by our ancestors many trillions of years ago. One billion eight million ancestors came from the previous universe and created the present one. At the end of every universe, these same 1B8M original people form a new earth using the stars of the old universe as atoms and become its first inhabitants. Then they create new stars and planets around the first earth to complete the creation. At the end of the previous universe, all the people in the universe were in an expanded state of mind called divine unity. They were all united in mind and heart as one person. This one person is called God. Although there are many individuals in the divine unity, they nonetheless know themselves only as one. Each person knows himself slash herself as the one and only God, without losing his her sense of individuality. He, she is also aware that every other person is this same God because they are all united as one. That is a state of mind that the ancestors call heaven or eternity. And so heaven is not a place, but the state of mind described. It comes about as the end result of taking part in the various rituals of initiation. At the end of the universe, every person that has ever lived has taken part in all the rituals, especially the seven great rituals of the black nation, and this state of mind becomes permanent in every individual. At that point the judges declare that the universe has attained its purpose, and it comes to an end. When each and every individual in the universe enters this state of mind at the same time, the mind naturally expands. The expansion is so great that the mind not only encompasses the entire universe and everything in it, but it exceeds the universe boundaries by an immeasurable extent. God becomes so much greater than the universe that the entire universal sphere is, so to speak, held in the palm of his hand. And so God totally outgrows the universe. This brings about the necessity for a new and much larger universe where God can continue the experience of life. The newly expanded mind of God creates new space that extends far, far beyond the boundaries of the old universe. A new boundary of the universe is then set. It exceeds the old one by the same proportion that the whole universe exceeds the earth in size, and God's mind fills the new space right to its limits. So large is the expanded mind of the united people that the old universe can be seen far below as an object the size of the earth. It becomes the first earth of the new universe. The original people then descend upon this new earth in one billion eight million new bodies. The new bodies are made instantly, the very moment they decide to descend upon the earth. They are made of the seven substances of the new earth, which are magnetism, electricity, light, ether, gases, liquids, and solid matter. The fourth substance, ether, which is the pure blackness called space, is the central substance of the universe. It's the womb that contains the six other substances in itself. When the original people create bodies for themselves, their bodies take the color of the ether, black, which contains all colors in itself. Therefore God naturally has a black skin color. The new earth is called the first earth, and its inhabitants are called the first gods. The first earth sits alone in space, in utter, complete darkness. The B8M gods are able to see directly by the power of their minds. They are still united with all things, and see them by being them. Mind sight, or inner vision, is different than eyesight. The mind recognizes all external objects as a part of itself, and thus sees them with a self-generated inner light. The illumination that comes from this type of seeing is glorious beyond description. 
Its brightness and vividness are unimaginably beautiful. It is second only to the pure light of eternity in its magnificence. The perfect plants and animals of the first earth, called the original totems of life, come into existence instantly as well, the very moment the gods appear on the first earth. They issue forth spontaneously from the 144,000 aspects of their perfect character. For many billions of years they are the only plants and animals on earth. The rest of the evolutionary species develop from them after the sun has been created. The first earth is the center of the universe. It becomes the central place, or hub, from which the rest of the universe is created. The creation of time. God, in the bodies of 1B8M people, physically lives on the first earth, new universe. But is her mind fills space all around to the set boundaries of the for the first trillion years that the original gods live on the first earth, there is no time. They know only in retrospect that the period of timelessness lasts for a trillion years because that is how long it takes for each subsequent star to form, and they all form the same way as the first solar system, except for the first earth. During this early stage the first earth is alone in absolute darkness. This darkness is called ether or space in modern words. It surrounds the first earth up to a distance of nearly one million miles, beyond which there is nothing. There are no physical substances beyond the boundaries of the universe. No physical bodies can go there. That region is occupied only by the mind, which has yet to condense into the seven substances. The first earth is totally still and dark. This absence of movement is the reason for the absence of time. Time comes into being the moment the Earth starts to spin on its axis and orbit around the Sun. The Sun is the generator of time. But at this beginning period it has not yet been created and so time does not yet exist. During this timeless period the gods measure time by measuring duration. They set their appointments with each other by determining the duration of their activities. Since every person is united with every other person, they all know what all are doing and how long it takes. Therefore, when they set appointments, they say, I'll meet you at the end of such and such an activity, and then meet when the duration of that activity has come to an end. This type of time measurement by duration is used in the eternal state of mind of the elders in the future as well, where there is also no time. Although the gods are involved in many earthly activities, their main activities involve the condensation of the expanded part of their mind into the seven substances, which will ultimately form the first sun and subsequent star systems that will eventually fill the entire universe. They take turns in the creative activity, in groups of 144,000 people or 72,000 couples. At important junctures in the creation, all 1B8M gods work together. They create the universe by meditation. They bring the plan for each star system from its original place in eternity, in their united minds, where all things, past, present, and future, exist in perfection. They concentrate their minds on the type of sun that they want to create, and hold its image steady in their united mind. After meditating on the image for some time, that part of their expanded mind will begin to condense in the chosen location. The first substance of the sun will begin to condense as magnetism. It takes a period of 6,000 years of meditation to initiate the formation of one solar system. The gods divide this time among the 7,000 groups of 144,000 people. Each group meditates on the creation for a set period whose length is determined by their progress. The creation of the sun advances in very precise stages, and the duration of these stages is their way of measuring time. After 6,000 years of creative activity, they rest for 1,000 years before starting the creation of the next star system. The creation of stars is sequential for the most part, meaning one star system is created at a time. Simultaneously with the sequential creation, the gods are involved in a larger process of prearranging the placement of each system. They determine beforehand where the location of each star will be, what its movements will be, as well as its magnetic relationship with the rest of the universe. By magnetic relationship I mean what modern scientists call gravitational relationships. In reality, gravity does not exist. What they call gravity on Earth is mostly atmospheric pressure. On a larger scale out in space, gravitational attraction is actually magnetic attraction. 
And so every 7,000 years the gods begin the creation of a new star system. This creative process continues even today, and will continue until the entire universe is filled with its allocated number of star systems. It takes a trillion years for the first star system to be completed, and about the same amount of time for each subsequent system to reach completion. But the actual creative process of initiating the formation of each system takes only 6,000 years. After 6,000 years of continuous meditation, with the 7,000 groups relieving each other, all the necessary conditions are set in place for the star system to reach completion automatically. In other words, once the initial process is completed in the 6,000 year period, the rest of the process follows natural laws. If there is an Earth-like planet in that star system, it will be ready for habitation in about 1 trillion years. Thus the second Earth is inhabited by settlers sent from the first Earth after 1 trillion years. After that a new Earth is inhabited every 7,000 years. The Seven Tiers of Suns when the 6,000 year period of creative meditation is completed, the substances will begin to condense. The first substance that condenses from the mind into existence is magnetism. So the first sun starts as a purely magnetic sun and remains that way for many billions of years. Now, the creation of the universe is a simple effortless process involving only the imagination, but the description of the process using words, written or spoken, is very difficult. The creation of all stars is sequential, as already stated, with one star being initiated or set in place every 7,000 years. But before each star is set in its place, there is a larger process of coordination of all the heavenly bodies that will coexist in a given region. Such regions are divided into seven tiers, like circles within circles. The first tier, or smallest circle, is a solar system such as ours, and is made up of planets orbiting a sun. The second tier is made up of a group of solar systems revolving around a larger sun. These larger suns also form a group or family of suns that revolve around an even larger sun, forming a third tier. This pattern is repeated identically, with each tier much larger than the one before, up to the seventh tier. The seventh tier is a group of galaxies orbiting around what may be called a galactic sun, for lack of a better word. Therefore there are seven tiers, or classes of suns. Our sun is a first tier sun, and together with its companions such as Alpha Centauri, Sirius, the Pleiades, and many other, revolve around a much larger sun, called a second tier, or second class sun. The second class suns are created before the first class suns, and the third class suns are created before the second class, and so on, up to the seventh tier sun, which is the largest and the first to be created. But all the higher class suns remain as purely magnetic suns for a long time, even after the first class suns like ours have completely condensed and appear as orbs of light. Thus the higher tier suns remain invisible, and are known to modern scientists only by their gravitational effects. As stated before, these effects are not gravitational, unless gravitational is redefined as magnetic. Because of the large size of these suns compared to first class suns like our sun, their magnetic attraction is much stronger. And because they remain as purely magnetic suns for a long time, without any light substance to make them visible, they're quite an enigma to modern scientists. They can detect the gravitational pull, magnetic attraction, that it exerts on all neighboring space objects, even on light itself, yet they themselves remain invisible. For this reason they are called black holes. Black holes. They're called black holes because modern instruments cannot detect them, but can detect only their physical effects on surrounding bodies, including the effects they have on light. They exist in deep blackness because they have not yet formed an electrical and light substance. In addition, there is no ether around them for light to travel. So when light waves enter their region, the light appears to be swallowed into an abyss and disappears. It becomes invisible due to the lack of ether. Light can only travel in ether or space. Without it, the movement of light is inhibited and the light waves eventually disintegrate and become one with the magnetic substance. Thus these magnetic suns form a region around themselves of pure blackness where only their magnetic presence exists. Therefore they appear to the telescope as black holes. 
That is the first type of black hole. A second type is formed when a regular sun or group of suns have reached the end of their allotted time of existence as light orbs. They then evaporate and their light, ether, and electrical substances revert back to magnetic substance. Such suns, when they become purely magnetic suns, usually join together with others in their vicinity and form a large invisible magnetic body, though not as large as the higher tier suns. They form a second type of black hole for the same reason. Those that do not join with others form a smaller black hole still. Other suns die differently, not by reverting to a higher substance, but by condensing further from light orbs and becoming gas orbs, somewhat like the planet Jupiter, but much larger. If they collapse further, they go from the gaseous stage and actually become giant solid planets. Because of their intense magnetic quality, they are not the type of planet suitable for habitation. When they're detected by modern instruments, they're called black or red or white dwarf suns, depending on their color. The first appearance of light. Back on the first Earth, many trillions of years before the other suns are formed, after about one half trillion years since the beginning of the universe, the first sun has condensed through its first three stages of magnetism, electricity, and light. The sun is still invisible. The first Earth is still enveloped in the darkness of its own ether, which only extends a relatively short distance beyond the Earth's atmosphere, about one million miles. Soon after, the sun's light condenses further and becomes ether. This ether extends to the boundaries of the solar system and beyond, and will soon meet up with the ethers of other star systems as they come into being, and eventually cover all space. The appearance of the ether for the first time allows the movement of light across space. Light depends on the ether to travel and be seen, just like sound depends on air to travel and be heard. Modern scientists are oftentimes puzzled by the sudden appearance of a star in a region where their telescopes revealed no star before. Usually they explain this by saying they did not have a strong enough telescope, or due to careless observation, or some such explanation. The real reason is that the star was there all the time, forming over a trillion years, but had not yet condensed an etheric substance by which its light could be seen. The entire spectrum of light and color, from red to violet and infrared, below red, to ultraviolet, above violet, requires ether to travel and cannot be detected otherwise. When the ether condenses enough to provide movement of light, the light appears instantly, as if a star just appeared out of nowhere, when in fact it had been there all along, invisible. As soon as the ether of the first sun appears, the first earth is suddenly and instantly lit with physical light for the first time. This is heralded as the creation of the first moment of time for our universe. As soon as the light reaches the earth, magnetism and electricity from the sun also reach it. These two substances also travel in the ether, the dark womb of space. The sun's magnetic interaction with the earth caused a differentiation of the earth's magnetic poles, which were previously undifferentiated. They now obtain opposite polarities. The sun's electrical substance also interacts with that of the earth and causes the first movement of electrical currents. This electrical movement is the first signal for the development of growth and movement on earth and initiates the development of new, evolutionary type plants and animals from the perfect totems. The electrical and magnetic movements also cause the first circulation of currents, both of air and water. The waters of Earth are separated for the first time, allowing clouds to form, and rain and rivers to flow, which had been perfectly still before then. The electrical movement due to the appearance of the sun also causes many other kinds of movements, growth and separations on Earth, but perhaps the most significant is the first movement of the Earth about its own axis. As the electrical and magnetic interaction between the Earth and the Sun increases, it increases the currents that circulate between the Earth's north and south magnetic poles. These currents cause the rotation of the Earth about its axis, exactly the same way that electromagnetic currents cause the rotation of an electric motor as they circulate between its opposite poles. As the Earth rotates about its axis, day and night begin to alternate for the first time. The sun rises and sets as the earth alternately presents its opposite hemispheres, east and west, to the sun. This is the beginning of the first day. At the same time light falls upon the surface of the earth. 
Light is the first substance that provides friction. Magnetism and electricity are frictionless substances. They do not cause friction to objects passing through them. They may provide opposition, but it's a clean, frictionless force. Therefore, they are perfectly non-coarse substances. Light is the first coarse substance, but its coarseness is so fine that it cannot be detected by instruments. It can only be known by its effects. As the light falls on the earth for the first time, and as the earth begins to rotate about, its axis creating the first hour of daytime, the coarseness of the sunlight provides enough friction on the rotating surface of the earth for the earth to actually roll on this friction in the same way a wheel rolls on a road. For the sake of description, the sun's rays falling on the earth can be thought of as a coarse substance as it covers the entire side of the earth exposed to it. Because the earth is spinning on its axis, the friction between the light and the surface of the earth provides traction. The traction is so minute that it takes thousands of years for its effects to show. The earth's surface grabs on this traction the same way a spinning wheel grabs the traction on the road and moves forward. In the same way the earth rides on sunlight due to the friction it provides. This causes the earth to move forward ever so slightly. The sun's magnetic attraction pulls the earth toward itself while the sunlight gently pushes it away. The two opposing forces cause a state of balance. The earth slowly accelerates through space ever so gently. The acceleration is so gentle that it takes millions of years for the earth to reach the equilibrium speed of 66,666 miles per hour. That is the speed at which Earth-like planets move through space as they orbit the Sun, and is the same speed for our Earth well. The first movement of the first Earth through space is the beginning of the first year, which is by far the longest. Thus the day and the year begin simultaneously. The day is due to the rotation of the Earth about its axis, caused by electrical and magnetic currents. The year is due to the Earth's movement through space around the Sun, caused by the rotation of the Earth and the friction of sunlight. And thus time begins. The first Earth does not have seasons. It exists in an eternal spring, where there is neither the cold of winter nor the heat of summer. This is because its axis is perfectly vertical and is not tipped over like that of our Earth and other planets. It's the only Earth in the universe like that, because it's the only one formed before its Sun. All other Earths and planets, including our Earth, are formed after their Sun has been formed, and come directly from their Sun's substance. That is how our Earth was formed, from our Sun's substance, 78 trillion years ago, some billions of years after our Sun was formed. Soon after the first Sun reaches this stage of its completion, other Suns begin to form nearby, surrounding the first solar system. More Suns form farther out as the trillions of years go by, until the entire set boundary of the universe is filled with stars. The planets accompanying the first Earth, as well as those of other stars, are formed in the following way. As soon as the sun's ether condenses into existence, God's mind starts the sun rotating on its axis. The rotation of the sun causes a movement of its magnetic field, which reaches the Earth and causes an electrical system to be set up between its opposite poles, as already described. As soon as the sun starts spinning about its axis, its etheric substance condenses further and forms gases. These gases are thrown off the surface of the sun due to its spinning motion, or what is called centrifugal force. The gases are thrown off in large masses toward the edges of the solar system. They experience a magnetic pull from the sun such that they only travel so far before they stop and establish an orbital circuit. How far they go depends on their size and the force with which they were thrown off. Because the sun was spinning when it threw them off, the gaseous masses continue this rotational movement given them by the sun and orbit around it. They also spin around their axis for the same reason of electromagnetic current movements between their north and south poles. As soon as they reach a stable circuit away from the sun, they begin to condense further and form the last two types of substances, liquids and solids. Now the seven substances of the solar system are complete, magnetism, electricity, light, ether, gases, liquids, and solid substances. The smaller masses that are thrown off cool the quickest, forming the smaller planets and all the meteors, meteorites, and space dust particles. 
During this period of planet formation, as long as the sun continues to eject masses, a lot of collisions take place in space. The first Earth in the meantime is protected from the debris of these collisions by its electrical and magnetic fields, as well as a high layer of atmosphere. The collisions break up some large masses that could have become planets and these become asteroids instead, scattered throughout the surrounding space. Some of the material is thrown off so far away that it forms comets whose orbits are so large that they circle the sun only once every dozens of years, some even longer. After many billions of years of this violent activity, the sun stabilizes and stops condensing. It stops throwing off gaseous material and the whole solar system becomes stable. All the planets plow their way through this debris, so to speak. The larger planets collect many smaller bodies that become their moons and hold them to themselves by a magnetic attraction. Some smaller planets lose their atmosphere and liquids to the larger planets and become dry barren planets. As time moves on, all the space bodies establish their steady circuits. Each one finds its place in the solar system, and the solar system is complete. About a trillion years have passed. The first solar system, the abode of the first gods, becomes stable and complete at that point. Far out in space, and stages lasting for many more trillions of years, other solar systems form in the same way, including our solar system. The end result of it is that the expanded mind of the B8M gods, by a process of condensation, creates a new universe, its many stars and planets being formed, as it were, out of nothing. The B8M original people live for a trillion years. That is how long it takes for the first solar system to become complete. During this time, they live in their everlasting, perfect bodies. They nourish their bodies with the food from the perfect plants. During this entire period, no new people are born on the first Earth. After the solar system has reached a stable state, the original gods form a model society. They themselves are perfect people, having reached absolute perfection in their previous universe. They do not need an organized society. They form a model society for the benefit of their descendants. That model society will be emulated for the rest of time, until the new universe reaches its own perfection, when all the people to be born in it will consciously become full God, just like their ancestors. The original gods choose 24 among them, 12 men and 12 women, to be the elders of the new nation. Then they choose 144 to be the chiefs and 144,000 to be the judges. They send the judges to lay the foundations for 72,000 towns over the whole earth in 12 separate countries. The people separate themselves into 12 groups of 84 million people to form 12 tribes. Each tribe has a king and a queen, 12 chiefs, and 12,000 judges. They deliberately leave the divine unity or oneness of their minds. They had existed in this unity for about one trillion years, most of which the earth was in physical darkness, alone in space. When they separate from the state of divine unity, they separate themselves from the twenty-four elders, who are the only gods that remain permanently in that state of mind. God separates himself slash herself from eternity in order to bring new life to the universe, life that has never existed before. It is by this means that God creates himself slash herself anew. When the universe attains its purpose, God rediscovers himself slash herself again for the first time. The rediscovery is a brand new experience for all the new people of the universe. Thus God is born anew again and again, rediscovering his her eternal and glorious infiniteness for the first time every time. That is God's whole joy, delight, and ecstasy. It is how God increases and begins a brand new experience with every newborn baby, while in the elders he, she remains as an eternal being who has no beginning. At the end of the trillion years, the B8M gods begin to procreate. They stop eating the food of the trees of life and begin to eat ordinary food. Soon most of them pass out of life and ascend after giving birth to a new generation. The new generations have no experience of divine unity. They are born as ordinary people, with a lifespan of 7,000 years. This becomes the normal lifespan of all ordinary people. 
Part of the reason for the 7,000-year lifespan is because the seven great rituals of the black nation occur over a period of 7,000 years, with one great festival every millennium. The ordinary human body slash mind is designed to withstand the ecstasy of only one great ritual every 1,000 years. More than that it cannot stand. Another reason is that by agreement, concerning population control, 144 million people are born every millennium, such that the total number born after seven generations or 7,000 years is 1 billion 8 million, which is the maximum population the earth can sustain comfortably forever. So the oldest generation passes after 7,000 years when this maximum number is reached. Only the leaders are longer lived, but much shorter than the original gods. The 24 elders of the new generation live for 700,000 years and are the longest lived people on earth. They are trained and then initiated into the eldership by the original elders before they pass. The original people also established the seven great rituals. These rituals will guarantee each person the experience of divine unity. Divine unity itself is held consciously and permanently by every generation of elders. Every couple that is initiated into the eldership remain in that state of eternity for the rest of their lives until they initiate a new couple before passing. Before they all pass, the B8M gods also establish many other rituals and customs. They cover the entire spectrum of knowledge and science, beginning with farming, the cultivation of new plants, the taming of animals, genetics, the building of cities, commerce, agriculture, transportation, and space travel, as well as all the knowledge concerning human and societal relations, the science of soulmates, marriage, and procreation. They leave all this knowledge in the hands of their initiates. The knowledge is passed from generation to generation in the form of customs and rituals of initiations, and not a bit of it is ever lost. Soon after the second star system is completed, the new inhabitants of the first earth, the descendants of the original gods, send 144,000 settlers to inhabit it. Most star systems in the universe are created with an earth-like planet. As the planets form, one of them will find itself in an ideal orbit at the proper distance from the sun, and about the size of an earth. When such a planet is completed, the scientists will travel to it from the first earth and seed it with life. They will take the germs of the original prototypes, first of plants, and seed them on that planet. Much later, when the plants have developed enough variety to support animal life, the scientists, or rather their descendants, will travel again and seed it with animal germs. After about a million years, such a planet will be ready to support human life. A new solar system is completed every 7,000 years, and the vast majority of them have an Earth-like planet. Thus every 7,000 year settlers are sent from the first earth to inhabit a new earth. 144,000 volunteers leave their people and travel there to start a new life. Countless trillions of planets have been inhabited this way since the beginning of our universe. That is how our own planet was inhabited 78 trillion years ago. 144,000 ancestors came here from another star system to live on our earth. After about 7,000 years, their population had increased to 1 billion 8 million. Our Earth has been continuously inhabited since then. This settlement of the universe continues to this day, and will continue until every star system designed for the support of life has been inhabited. After many countless trillions of years, the entire universe will be inhabited, and our universe will attain its purpose and come to an end. My dear elder teacher, I find your lessons very, very enlightening. May I know your view of the sun and creation? The sun is the generator of time. When a new universe is being created, right at the beginning, there is no time. There is no movement, no planets, no stars, only the first earth exists by itself. So all is still and there is no way to measure time due to this absence of motion. As soon as the first sun is created by the minds of the creators, it slowly condenses and solidifies, but is without light. After it has condensed through the four stages of magnetism, electricity, ether, and light, then it shines light on the first earth for the first time. This causes the first earth to start orbiting around this new sun, and that's how time begins. Therefore the sun is called the giver of life because by creating time, it measures and allocates the lifespan of every living thing on earth. 
Reincarnation The question of reincarnation has been misrepresented by modern people, so much so that it has led to a great deal of misunderstanding. 2. The misunderstanding arises due to a lack of knowledge about the different types of ancestral memories, or what modern people call Collective memory There are two types of ancestral memories. One is biological, and is handed down from generation to generation. The other is spiritual ancestral memory and does not depend on genes. This latter type of ancestral memory is the true basis for reincarnation, and I'll describe it last. First I'll describe the former kind, which is biologically based ancestral memory. This is the type of reincarnation that has been described in most New Age books. It is a false concept of reincarnation. What it is is simply genetic memory of a person's ancestors. Every living person has in his DNA the genetic code of all his her ancestors. The body's DNA is a recording mechanism that stores all of a person's life experiences. That is how ancestral memories are physically passed from generation to generation. The strands of DNA that pass from parents to child have a wide spectrum of frequencies, somewhat like the frequencies of sound or light. When a person is born, a particular segment of the DNA spectrum stands out as the strongest and is unique to every person. So there is a fine-tuning of the DNA frequencies that result in every person having a unique type of body. Obviously, siblings will have DNA frequencies that are very close in the entire spectrum of what they receive from their parents, and identical twins even closer. During the life of a person, it may happen that certain incidents will cause his her DNA frequency to tune out of its normal state or frequency within the spectrum. Each frequency is a recording of the life experiences of that person's ancestors. Many white people and other light-skinned races, especially here in America, have remote black ancestors. Now, these people are totally white, not part black because after seven generations of white-slash-white breeding, the entire black germ is removed. In other words, if the mixed-race child of a black-slash-non-black couple later marries a non-black, and all the generations that follow do the same, then after the seventh generation there will not be a black germ in their progeny, and they're no longer part black, but totally white or other races. That is the reason why whites and other non-blacks can have black ancestors who lived seven, eight, or more generations before. When such a person is under hypnosis, trance, or some other appropriate condition, even though she will mostly remember her white ancestors, sometimes he or she can relive the life of the black ancestor and believe it to be her own past incarnation as a black queen, pharaoh, chief, or whatever. Note though that most reported cases of reincarnation are frauds perpetrated by charlatans. The misunderstanding about reincarnation comes when the person identifies that life is his her own, instead of recognizing it as part of the wide spectrum of ancestral genetic memories. And so the modern person under trance mistakenly believes that he she is reliving a past incarnation. This remembrance or reliving, caused by genetic memory, is purely biological, depending only on DNA, and is what modern people call reincarnation. This is a false concept of reincarnation. True reincarnation is spiritual and does not depend on genetic memory. It depends on eternal ancestral memory, or what we call the mind of God. I'll mention at the onset that the light race people do not have the mind of God in them, therefore they do not experience true reincarnation. This statement may surprise many black people, but that's because most of us have lost the knowledge of who God really is. The reason God cannot incarnate in them is as follows. At the beginning of every new universe, there is only one earth, the first earth. It sits alone in infinite space, and is inhabited by one billion eight million original people. They are eternal people, the first gods, who come from a recently completed universe. They descend upon the first earth in one billion eight million black bodies, whose blackness comes from the ether that surrounds the first earth. As I've described in an earlier post, ether, or space, is pure blackness. The gods take the blackness of the ether as their skin color, because from this blackness they can create every color of every living thing since the black color contains all other colors in it. The black color lives physically in the body in the dominant black gene, which is the source of what modern people call melanin. The dominant black gene is what in ancient scriptures is called the throne of God. 
The body is called the temple of God, and the black gene is the throne upon which God is seated. Without the dominant black gene, there is no throne upon which God can sit. In other words, God uses the black gene as the source for the creation of all living things. It is the seat of the 144,000 aspects of God's goodness or morality. It is the central point from which the original prototypes of life are created, each one taking its form according to each aspect of God's pure character, and each one also taking its coloring from the infinitude of colors contained in the black germ. Therefore, simply put, without the black germ God cannot incarnate in a human body. He, she would be impotent, unable to create life or to give form and color to the universe. When I say create life, I don't mean reproducing babies, I mean creating animals and plants out of nothing, as described in the biology post. All the non-black people on earth were made from black people. They were made not in the same way that animals and plants were created, i.e. by giving form and color to new life, but rather, they were made by removing color from their original black ancestors. The way the original ancestors removed color from themselves was by suppressing their own dominant black gene. Every black person has a dominant black gene and a recessive light gene. When the black gene is accidentally suppressed, then the light gene comes to the fore, and the child born to such parents among black people is an albino. Now, a black albino still has the black gene, the seed of God, but it's suppressed at conception. It's possible to create even from a suppressed black gene, but the albino would have to undergo extensive rituals of initiation to bring the suppressed germ back to the forefront, much more so than is ordinarily the case. The light-skinned races are different than black albinos in that in them the black gene is completely absent. It takes exactly seven generations of deliberate breeding to completely breed out the dominant black gene. That is how the first race of light-skinned people was made 6,000 years ago. From the first race, Hispanic slash Latin slash Greek people, was made the second race, Semitics, i.e. Arabs, Jews, Persians, etc. From them was made the yellow race, and from the yellow race was made the white race. All these races of non-blacks no longer have the black gene in them. This is the reason why no light race parents can ever give birth to a black baby. Because of the absence of the black gene, there is no throne in the temple, body, upon which God can be seated. Therefore God incarnates only in black people. Any black person who feels even the slightest degree of discomfort when reading the above statement should know that this is caused by sympathy due to a lack of knowledge. If all black people on earth regained the true knowledge of who God is and who the devil is, they would immediately lose all sympathy for the light-skinned races. The billion eight million original gods are the ones who incarnate on earth every time a black baby is born. They incarnate again and again, endlessly. Their incarnation is not determined by biological lineage. It is preordained by them an eternity long before they're born. The repeated incarnation of the B8M original gods is the true form of reincarnation. Every black person alive on earth today is an incarnation of one of the B8M original gods. We have incarnated time and again since the beginning of the universe. Not only do we incarnate on Earth, but we also simultaneously incarnate on other Earths throughout the universe. God, the black person, is not restricted to one location. Our incarnations transcend both time and space. At the conclusion of the universe, when every Earth that can be inhabited will be inhabited, there will be over 125 billion trillion trillion inhabited Earths in the universe, each one having a population of 1 billion 8 million black people, all of whom are the incarnated personalities of the B8M original gods, that is you and me, and every black person on Earth. I hope that clarifies the falsehoods heard from New Agers about reincarnation. I was disappointed though that you didn't go deep enough into the difference between the two types of reincarnation, biological and ancestral, was it? Is it the ancestors reincarnating in successive generations? Could you expound on that? And you mentioned that the non-black races were created by suppressing the black gene. Why were the light-skinned races created? The people reincarnating as us are the one billion eight million original gods. That's you and me. We have incarnated again and again, forming new personalities with every reincarnation. 
therefore our ancestors are ourselves as different personalities. You have incarnated countless trillions of times ever since you, along with the B.A.M. gods, created our universe. But each personality is an independent, separate individual exactly as you are today. All these personalities, our ancestors, continue to exist forever as individuals after ascending into eternity in the divine custodianship of the 24 elders of our earth. At the end of the universe, you will unite with all your incarnational personalities, as will each of the B.A.M. gods. Even though there will be countless trillions upon trillions of individual personalities, they will be your personalities, meaning you as the original god, one of the B.A.M. Again, there will be one billion eight million gods, manifesting as innumerable personalities, each one knowing himself or herself as the one and only god due to the indescribable state of divine unity. Biological incarnation, on the other hand, is purely a recollection, a memory of the lives of our biological ancestors, never spiritual ancestors. The memories are permanently recorded in our DNA. When a light race person sees these lives or relives them in her mind, she is not reliving her own past incarnation, because only the gods reincarnate, and they reincarnate only in black people. There is eternal continuity in the lives of black people, caused by the repeated reincarnation of the same B8M gods. There is no such continuity in the light-skinned races. Every newborn one is brand new with only biological ancestors, but not spiritual ones, i.e. no mind of God in them. At the end of the universe, long after the light races are extinct, their incarnational experiences will be taken by their maker, the god Yakub, who will permanently hold them for all posterity as his creation and possession. As to why the non-black races were created, I'll answer that when I talk about ascension and the true Israelites, the chosen people of Yahweh. Entrick said, Incorrect. This assumes that the mystical concept of reincarnation and karma is true. It is not. It's a complete fabrication. Every person born is brand new, never having lived before. It's God's way of renewing himself slash herself. Only the mind of God, or as it's called, the spirit of God, is eternal in the person. It has no karma and does not take part in the so-called spiritual evolution, which is a fallacy. You said that every black person was a reincarnation of one of the B8M gods, is that not true? Is there a different type of reincarnation you speak about? Reincarnation as I've described it above, is true only for black people. There is a vast difference between true reincarnation and the mystical concept of reincarnation and karma that originated out of the East, especially India. This false concept of reincarnation was brought to the West by various Indian gurus and gullible Westerners who went to India to learn it. It's a false concept, but like everything taught by the light races, its falseness is so subtle and close to the truth that it's easy to be misled. They teach that the souls, by which they obviously mean consciousness, of all people are engaged in a never-ending spiritual evolution. The mechanics of this evolution are such that the sins committed by the soul in a previous life are atoned for in the next life or lives. This cumbersome burden of a concept is called by them karma. They also make other outrageous claims. For example, they say that it's possible to evolve backwards and lose ground, so to speak. The upshot of all this is that, according to them, the souls go back and forth endlessly, trying to detach themselves from the merciless wheel of birth and rebirth. Some lucky souls, by means of some fluke of perhaps meeting the right guru and parting with the right amount of money, can be taught certain mystical practices by which they can reach enlightenment and be done with the world. Then they'll live in nirvana, sucking eternally on nectar if they're Buddhists or Hindus, or playing the harp forever if they are Christians, or if she's a Muslim woman, she'll be turned into a virgin along with 71 of her sisters so they can service the perversions of some man. This is such a pathetic corruption of the truth invented by white people that it's not worth wasting any more time on it. There is a type of spiritual evolution that applies to non-blacks in the mental realms. It's a search by them for God's absolute perfection, which they can never find because absolute perfection was absolute right from the beginning of eternity. Anyone who is not eternal, i.e. who cannot unite with the eternal self, cannot reach absolute perfection. 
therefore they will be involved in an endless perfecting of their character, gaining forever in knowledge and glory as they ascend from heaven to heaven. This spiritual evolution will not occur on earth. There will be no reincarnating of the non-blacks on earth, as there has never been such. They do not have an original self who reincarnates in them, as is the case with black people. They were created as images of us, and for a purpose. They will fulfill the purpose for which Yahweh made them, and cannot transform their existence to match that of black people, who are eternal beings. Thus by classing all people together, including us, and their mystical concept of reincarnation and karma, they do not serve the truth. They only serve to mislead those black people who will believe them, thinking that black people are the same as the light-skinned races. Ascension Ascension is the process whereby a person leaves his her body and unites the mind with the minds of the elders of his her tribe. In our natural ancient world, before the appearance of the light races, all people died consciously. When they had completed all seven great rituals of the black nation, they soon thereafter decided it was time to ascend to eternity. They simply laid down their bodies while perfectly conscious. Their mind expanded until it united with the minds of the two elders of their tribe. At the instant of unity, the magnetic connection, the so-called spiritual cord that linked them to the physical body is severed automatically, and the body is permanently abandoned and left to be buried by family and friends. Today people ascend the same way, but they do so unconsciously. Moreover, they die not of their own choosing, but either by accident, disease, or other causes. Thus today a person can die at any age, according to the circumstances of his or her life, whereas in ancient days, every person died only at old age, after completing the seven great rituals. The great rituals, along with the major and minor ones they engaged in during their seven thousand years of life, developed their souls to the point where they became one with God. They reached a state of being where they became equal to the twenty-four elders in knowledge, lacking equality with them only in wisdom. The twenty-four elders exceed all people in wisdom because of their age. The youngest couple of the elders are about twenty-five thousand years old, and the oldest over seven hundred thousand years old. They have long since completed the great rituals, and have been living consciously in a state of divine unity. Thus they have accumulated more life experience than all other people, and life experience is turned into wisdom by the knowledge and application of truth. So even though the senior citizens, 7,000 years old or older, who ascended to eternity in the minds of the 24 elders have accumulated all the knowledge possible while living on earth, they do not have as much wisdom as the elders due to being younger. But the perfection of their knowledge is equal to that of the elders, whereby they are equal to God in knowledge. Thus when they ascend, they ascend as full gods in knowledge, lacking only in experience and wisdom. In the modern age, people still ascend into the minds of the twenty-four elders, but they do not consciously unite with them as they did in ancient days. The reason is because individuals are no longer taught and trained by the ritual methods of ancient days. Thus people today die before gaining enough knowledge and truth to make them full gods. As a result of this lack of knowledge, this ignorance or self-forgetfulness, they are unable to consciously unite with the elders of their tribe. As I've mentioned before, every person has an unconscious mind as well as a conscious mind. The unconscious mind is the eternal part of the person, the original self and creator of the universe, one of the B8M gods. The conscious mind of the person on the other hand, is what makes the individual's personality, and is always made brand new in every life, whereas the unconscious mind is the same eternal, unchanging godly aspect of the person. When a person ascends today, only the unconscious mind, the God in him, her, unites with the elders. The individual personality on the other hand goes to a different place in heaven, where his or her life continues in a different state. When the light race people die, they are also separated, i.e. the conscious personality is separated from the unconscious mind. Now, the unconscious minds of all the non-blacks belong to the God Yahweh. When Yahweh, also known as Yakub, created the non-blacks 6,000 years ago, he gave them a collective unconscious from part of his own mind. Every person that lives must have both a conscious mind as well as an unconscious mind, which acts as a true guide in the person's life. 
No person that is called human can exist as a purely new personality without the presence of this inner guide, or what modern people call conscience. This does not necessarily mean the person will listen to his or her inner guide, as each person has complete free will. But the inner guide always suggests advice to the person's conscious mind, to either be accepted or rejected according to the person's nature and inclinations. In the case of black people, the inner guide is a particular god, one of the B8M original gods, because black people are eternal, having no beginning, and so provide their own inner guide. In the case of the non-blacks, their inner guide is Yahweh, or one of the 60,000 Elohim with whom he created the light races in our image. In order to guide these new people, they gave part of their mind to them to become their collective unconscious. Thus when a non-black person dies, his or her unconscious mind ascends back into the mind of the god Yahweh, whose mind is united with the minds of the Elohim. Their conscious individual minds go to the same place called heaven where all black people go today. Therefore in this present cycle, we live in a time when there is no longer conscious ascension of black people into eternity. Such conscious ascension will resume at the end of this age, when all the non-blacks that can be saved will be saved. They will ascend to a special heaven where they will continue to be trained in order to remove most of their imperfections that have led them to a sinful existence. Now, these heavens that individuals go to in this age are also in the minds of the elders. The minds of the elders are an expansive, infinite state of being consisting of an infinite number of levels of existence. These levels of existence are brought into reality as needed to accommodate the states of mind of the people who die and ascend to them. There are many levels of existence in the elders' minds that are brand new. These new levels were brought into existence by necessity due to the existence of the non-blacks, who are a new form of people that never existed before. This type of person lives, by and large, contrary to nature. Therefore they necessarily have a short life. They cannot be initiated into the seven great rituals, which require a much longer lifespan. The great rituals guarantee the perfection of a person's character while still living on earth. They are a powerful means of personality transformation. They require a continuous lifespan of at least 7,000 years and a physical body for a person to be initiated into all of them while living on earth. No person can be initiated into more than one great ritual every 1,000 years. There is no physical body that can withstand the ecstasy of eternity more than once every 1,000 years. In order to make the non-blacks, black people first had to shorten their own lifespan before they could give birth to new individuals who live a shorter life. Thus as was decided at the time of the making of the light races that all those gods who so choose would join the world of Yakub and the light races by sharing in their shortened lifespan and the subsequent self-forgetfulness. This was seen as the most efficient way to gain the full experience of their world. The gods did so fearlessly, even though they anticipated a world full of sin and error. To them the experience and all that would be gained from it in terms of wisdom was worth all the anticipated suffering. Hence we are in a situation today where black people no longer ascend consciously to eternity. Also, when we die and ascend, we are sent to a place in heaven where we can continue to gain knowledge to complete what we could not be taught here on earth due to the absence of ancient rites of passage. Thus in the elders' heaven there are many levels that people occupy according to their state of ignorance or wisdom at the time of death. In short then, there are two types of ascension. One is conscious ascension as it was in ancient days before the appearance of the light races. In this type of natural life every individual born on earth was educated using the various forms of initiation, climaxing in the seven great rituals. At the end of our life, our conscious and unconscious minds became one, and the person became full God. He, she was then equal to the elders in every way except in longevity of experience or wisdom. So then, in ancient days people died by consciously laying down their bodies and uniting with the elders in eternity. Their individual personality formed in that life continues to exist until the end of the universe. Their original self, on the other hand, would incarnate again and again, forming new personalities in each life, even as we continue to do today. The ascended individual personalities that remain in eternity until the end of the universe have an opportunity to gain more universal experience and increase in wisdom. Being in an eternal state, 
they're no longer bound by time and space. They move freely in every part of the universe, even in other universes and heavenly realms. That is the ancient form of ascension. The modern form is different and adjusted to today's conditions of self-forgetfulness. To summarize, when a person dies, either a black person or non-black, he or she cannot unite with his or her unconscious mind, called the mind of God in black people and the mind of Yahweh in non-blacks, who also call it their collective unconscious. This unconscious part of the non-blacks is reunited with its origin, which is the mind of Yahweh and the Elohim. It takes with it all that is of value in terms of goodness and truth, which is usually not much from the life of that non-black. The person himself or herself is directed by his her inner nature to one of the levels of heaven prepared for them by the elders. Now, the existence of personalities in these levels of heaven is not a material or physical existence such as we have on earth. It's a type of existence somewhat like in a dream world. The person gains a body just like he or she had on earth, but this body has no weight. It's made stable not by its own weight, as is the case on earth, but entirely by thought. It can move about without effort, exactly the same way you move your dream body. Moreover, it can be improved as a person's character improves, and made glorious without end, if the person chooses everlasting life. Everything in that realm is made of mental substance, exactly the same substance used to make your dream world. The only difference between that reality and the dream world is that those heavenly worlds are more coherent. They are as permanent as the earth, and do not fluctuate like the worlds of dreams or fantasy. Other than that they are like the dream world in that everything in them is created directly by using the mind, without having to condense it into physical substance slowly over trillions of years, as is the case in the physical universe. That is the reason objects that do not have weight, and can be created almost instantly, and people can move about at will without effort. There are as many of those heavenly worlds as there are types of people separated according to their different natures, from the lowest and most evil to the most elevated, loving, and kind. Each person becomes part of a community of people of the same nature as his. This is a natural way of dividing people because people of like mind and character are naturally attracted together. The purpose of dividing the light race people into different levels of goodness in those heavens is so that those who are inclined to goodness can have the opportunity to be saved. When Yakub made the light races, he knew that their bodies, as a new physical species, would only last for 7,000 years maximum. The first 6,000 years of their existence, they would rule the world according to their nature, which is inclined more to evil than good. During the last 1,000 years of their 7,000-year existence on earth, they would be given the opportunity to undo all the evil they did. This coming 1,000 years will thus see the application of justice in the form of punishment for all the sins committed by them and their ancestors. Every wrong committed by them or their ancestors will be righted by them. Many will suffer horribly and perish as a result of the coming application of justice. But some will survive and eventually repent. After that 1,000 year period, around the year 3000 AD, they will all cease to exist as a physical species. Those individuals among them who have any chance of being reformed will be reformed if they so choose. They will ascend to the higher heavenly spheres. Their reformation, once started in the heavenly realms, will continue forever if they so choose. The reformation of the light races is an effort to make them perfect like eternal beings. But because the races are not eternal from the past, they cannot reach the full and complete perfection of eternal gods. Therefore their spiritual improvement will continue forever. For them this is an ideal form of heavenly existence where they will continue to improve without end. It is a form of one-sided eternalness called everlasting life, about which the more enlightened among them have preached over the ages. It's one-sided in that they will be eternal into the future without being eternal from the past. The difference between eternalness and everlastingness is that to be truly eternal, a being has to be eternal from the past, meaning to be without beginning. A person who has a beginning and cannot unite with his her eternal self can continue to live forever as long as he she continues to improve in goodness and truth. Such improvement is unlimited because God's perfection, which is their goal, is unlimited. 
then such a person has everlasting life depended upon the condition that he never regresses back into evil, but always improves in character. Under that condition, such a person will live forever in heaven. On earth and in the rest of the universe, matters are entirely different. The universe is the place where all new life first comes into being, created by those with eternal life in them. The only people that can continue to live forever in the universe as physical beings are those that have self-generated eternal life in themselves, having no beginning. Eternity is synonymous with goodness. If it were not so, eternal beings would have self-destructed long ago, because evil naturally leads to self-destruction. Thus any people that are made by removing goodness from them, in the way the light-skinned races were made, cannot have an everlasting physical life in the universe. Their lack of goodness or self-generation guarantees that they will self-destruct. The light races were not made to be permanent residents of the earth. Like many species that have come and gone, they too are destined to disappear. The purpose for their creation is for the manifestation and experience of that part of God commonly called evil, but better called self-forgetfulness. Once all the gods have gained this experience, then the species used to manifest it is no longer needed in the universe. Once a species of life has served its purpose, it disappears from the earth like any other species. The only difference between animal species and the light races is that they have individual personalities, or what is called a soul. But unlike black people, they do not have self-generation. Individual personalities have the capacity for self-knowledge, a quality that animals and plants do not have. Because of this quality, there is naturally the opportunity for self-improvement directed by the individual's will. Other life forms do not have this quality of self-will. Therefore, when the earthly purpose of these other life forms is fulfilled, they cannot perpetuate their own existence in another state by the power of self-will, as people can. As stated before, the light-skinned races do not have the power to perpetuate their physical existence forever. They have tried other methods to extend the life of their species. They started about 4,000 years ago to genetically produce new races. They combined their own procreative genes with the hardy and more enduring genes of certain insects, reptiles, and mammals to engineer new races out of themselves. Many of their genetic experiments were unsuccessful, and the leftover products, those that survived, became abnormal monsters and beasts, some of which still exist to this day. But with the help of the Elohim, they finally became successful and created three basic new types of races. These new races were highly intelligent. They soon gained their independence from their genetic engineers and were helped by the Elohim to leave the earth. They settled in different parts of our galaxy and became what are called extraterrestrials. They were created in three basic forms, human-looking, just like earth humans, reptilian-looking, and insect-like creatures. The first type, the mammalian human-looking genetic products are the most popularly seen types of extraterrestrials and have been reported to look either like blonde Caucasian or dark-haired Asian humans. The reptilians also look human, but have a scaly skin like snakes and lizards. The insectoid beings are mostly what are called greys, who look somewhat like human-sized ants on two legs. These three races originated from Earth as a product of genetic engineering by the light races with the help of the Elohim, which took place about 4,000 years ago. The genetically engineered races have since colonized many planets in our galaxy. They have not only increased their populations, but they themselves have also genetically engineered many different types of new humanoid beings from their own genes in combination with other life forms, both animals and plants. As a result, our galaxy is teeming with multitudes of humanoid beings. Many of them are self-conscious humans, whereas others are non-self-conscious and function as biological robots. At this point in time, as we reach the end of this present cycle, these genetically engineered humans have come up against a difficult problem. They are unable to prolong their physical existence by ordinary sexual procreation. The conditions under which they were engineered were such that they came from a severely limited genetic pool. The foundation of their genetic structure is based on the biology of the light races, who themselves are a genetically limited species because of the way they were made. 
The extraterrestrial races thus need a frequent infusion of fresh genetic material from the light races, as well from animals and plants, to bolster their genetic pool. Therefore, they have come back to Earth in large numbers and are presently involved in a gigantic project of collecting genetic material from the light races and even from black people whenever they can. But because the light races are themselves a dying species, all the work of artificial insemination, hybridization, cloning, and so on going on can only extend the physical bodies of these races for a short time, 1,000 more years at the most for the entire species. They too will perish like the light-skinned races at the end of the coming 1,000 years. Those among them who choose everlasting life will also ascend into the heavens of Yahweh, along with the light races. The races, terrestrial and extraterrestrial, do not have the power to perpetuate their physical existence forever, as stated. All these races have the opportunity for continued everlasting life in heaven by retaining the awareness and memory of their existence. This is called self-consciousness. Now, self-consciousness can be made everlasting if the individual sustains it with truth and goodness. The same self-consciousness can be destroyed if the individual willingly rejects the truth and dwells in ignorance and evil. All self-conscious existence lives for the purpose of attaining the goodness of God. And God is eternal life, meaning that goodness and eternity are two sides of the same coin. Any person who rejects goodness is automatically choosing self-destruction. According to the laws of nature set down by the original B8M gods, every such person has exactly 7,000 years as an individual or as a race to choose either everlasting life or cessation of existence. Thus it will happen in the coming 1,000 years, which is the final part of the 7,000-year existence of the light races, that all of them will get to the heavenly realms where they will either choose to live forever or to cease to exist. In the mental or heavenly realms, a person's true nature cannot be hidden inside the body the way it can on earth. Thus every individual's true nature is revealed there. So every one of them will have the choice to either follow their evil nature as they did on earth, or to repent and seek everlasting life. Now, just as black people are present on earth among the light races, so will they be present in their heavens as well, to complete the experience. Just as we witnessed and experienced the manifestation of evil on earth, so will we witness and experience the reformation of those few among the races who will choose everlasting life. Many of them have so succumbed to their evil natures that it will be impossible for them to repent. And so they will die the second and final death, which is cessation of existence. But even among those who perish, whatever little is of value in their corrupt lives will be taken from them before they finally cease to exist, and will become the property of all black people, to be kept in the custody of their maker for the benefit of all posterity. The rest, who choose everlasting life, will live under the guidance and benevolence of their God and Maker, Yahweh. He will be their God, and they will be His people forever and ever. Black people who were born in the last 6,000 years also need to complete the seven great rituals of the black nation, as well as the other minor and major rites leading to the seven. They'll have this opportunity after they ascend into the elders' special heavens. Once there, they'll begin a ritual education suited to their state of mind. The forms these rites will take will be suitable to the culture of each group or community. The forms of all the rites of passage change all the time according to circumstances, except the seven great rituals. The seven are always led by the elders and remain the same everywhere. But the other major and minor rites change according to the designs of the leaders and their people. The rites as they are practiced in Africa today would be unsuitable for African Americans, African British, Jamaicans, and the rest of the Diasporians. They all have a present culture that is different than that of Africans in many respects. For example, in Africa we still have poets called griots, who recite history and stories in a certain way. Here in the United States and other non-black countries, black people have created a modified form of griotship in the art of rap music. Much of rap music is contaminated by the destructive tendencies of some rappers to emulate the perversions and overly materialistic lifestyles of the light races. But there is nevertheless a small but potent segment of it dedicated to storytelling in the old style of African griotship. This is especially the case among those rappers allied with the teachings of the 5% nation of gods and earths and other offshoots of the teachings of Elijah Muhammad. 
Their music represents an example of an ancient African teaching tool modified to suit modern times and a different culture. So too will the ritual education of each group of black people be modified to conform to their cultural spirit. In these new heavens, no people are thrust into a strange culture in which they will be made uncomfortable. Thus the divisions in the heavenly realm take into account not only the mental differences between people, but also regional differences as well as those of historical eras. Only at the end, when the people's education climaxes in one of the great rituals, will they come together and share the experience as one. The seven great rituals by their nature reconcile all differences of time and space. So each group or community will go from lesson to lesson according to how it suits their background. As black people progress with their education in the special heavens, they will increase in knowledge and wisdom. Their bodies will become progressively glorified by the power of their own will to reflect their wisdom until they reach the same level of glory as the ancients. All their ritual education will be completed in the next 1,000 years instead of taking 7,000 years, as is the case on earth. This is possible because in the heavenly state, people are outside the bounds of time and space. Their progress is totally self-directed, meaning that time for them unfolds at a pace set by them, not by planetary orbits as is the case in the physical universe. After 1,000 years have passed on earth, all the black people ever born on earth will have completed the seven great rituals. There will be a great celebration in heaven at that time. All the people will unite with their original self and become full God. Their dependence on Yahweh's world and heavens will then come to an end. They will be full God like all our ancestors who ascended consciously from earth before the advent of the light-skinned races. As soon as they attain full godhood, they will gain the power to leave the special heavens of Yahweh. They will join all the ancestors that have ascended in the past, since the beginning of the universe, who live in the original eternal heavens of the twenty-four elders. After one thousand years, the special heavens of Yahweh will be permanently inhabited only by the non-blacks. All the black people that were initiated in them in this 6,000 year cycle will be able to come and go in them as they please, as will all other black people from the past or future who have an interest in seeing the progress of Yahweh's creatures. The new heavens of the non-blacks exist in Yakub's mind, as already stated. But that part of his mind dedicated to them is held in the custody of the 24 elders, who are the custodians of every type of mind unity. The fact that they exist in Yahweh's mind means that the non-blacks can never leave these heavens. Their entire future existence is restricted to these realms. To black people who are outside these realms and are free to come and go in them as they please, this may seem like a severe restriction. But to the inhabitants themselves, the non-blacks, this is not a real restriction because the expansion of each heaven is unlimited. Not only that, but the number of levels that they can ascend to is also unlimited. Mathematically speaking, the part of Yahweh's mind in which the new heavens exist is an infinity within a larger infinity. Yahweh, as one of the B8M gods, is an infinite being, as are all the other gods. Therefore the expansion of his mind cannot be limited. And so the expansion of part of his mind cannot be limited either. The mind, even though it is one, can be divided into an infinite number of parts, as is clear from the fact that new people are born every day on earth, each one with his or her own mind. Yahweh's creation of an entirely new realm of existence is an example of God's creative ability common to all the B8M gods. This is not the first time such a creation has come into being. It is the first of its kind, but every god has his or her own creations. There are many such realms of existence created by other gods individually or in collaboration with others, as Yahweh has done in this case. There are individual creations that all the B8M gods produce, aside from the creation of the physical universe, which is produced by all of them together. The original people, in addition to creating collectively, also have an endless number of individual and group creations that they have been creating since the beginning of eternity that has no beginning. Yahweh's creation is unique only in the sense that it is the only one where God manifests what has been hidden as evil in him her until now. But it is not unique in terms of being an individual creation of a particular God or group of gods. Every one of the B8M gods has produced unique, individual creations before and not once, but countless trillions of times. 
these creations still exist in the minds of their creators, and will continue to exist forever, as will Yahweh's creation. The living creatures that inhabit these creations worship their Maker as their God. In the same way, all the non-black people will worship Yahweh as their God as soon as they discover the truth. Ultimately, the fact of the matter is that he brought them into existence and will give everlasting life to those among them who will accept it. Reverence for him, when the time comes, will be nothing more than a natural reaction of their soon-to-be-enlightened minds to show their inexpressible gratitude to their Maker for making them. In the same way do all the creatures of the other gods show their appreciation through worship. Now, many black people born in this age of Yahweh will also worship him when he and the 60,000 Elohim come back to earth. They will rule the earth in peace for a period of 1,000 years. When Yahweh makes his majestic physical appearance on earth and makes himself known as its maker, all God-fearing people, including many black people, will fall to their knees in grateful worship of him. That is natural for persons who have come into being in the way that we and all the non-blacks have been brought into being in this 6,000-year cycle. But there will come a time, at the end of the coming 1,000 years of peace under Yahweh's rule, when all black people will complete their initiation, both those in heaven and on earth. They will unite with their original self and then know Yahweh, their God, as their brother, one whom they have known and loved since eternity. They will stop worshipping him at that time, not out of spite or disrespect, but as a result of knowing the true facts of their situation. Thus, at the end of the coming 1,000 year period, only Yahweh's creatures, the non-black races here on earth and extraterrestrial, will be left as the permanent inhabitants of his heavenly realms. They will continue to love and worship their God Yahweh forever, even as they grow in goodness and perfection in an attempt to be like him and his soul mate, and also to be like his brothers and sisters, the Elohim. Non-blacks are our images. There are many subtle differences between beings and living images of beings. One such difference, concerning this aspect of ascension, is in the way ascended blacks and non-blacks gain their glorious bodies in heaven. Of all the differences between a being and his her image, the most important is this. Real beings, black people, attain full godhood after 7,000 years. Those created as images of real beings go on an everlasting spiritual evolution, increasing in perfection forever and ever, but never reaching absolute perfection, which is possible only in the state of divine unity. That is the fundamental difference between God and his her creatures. This difference plays a part in heaven when blacks and non-blacks increase in glory due to increasing knowledge and wisdom. The body of a non-black reaches stages of glory conforming to his spiritual development, meaning the improvement of his moral character. As he improves to a certain point, he is able to ascend to the next level of heaven, and the higher glory of that level is reflected in the increased glory of his body. He lives in that level for an age and continues to improve until he has learned all that is available there before ascending to the next level. He cannot live in any of the higher heavens as a permanent resident until he has spiritually evolved to that level. When he does, his body gains more in glory and he ascends again. This goes on forever without end. That is the situation for non-blacks. In the case of black people, our spiritual evolution does not come in endless steps. It reaches a climax when we permanently unite with our first self and become full God. As soon as the unity takes place, all the levels of all the heavens ever created open up for us, including the most recent heavens, those of Yahweh where the non-blacks are to be found. Thus when a black person reaches divine unity after the completion of the seven great rituals, he, she gains the power to access all the heavens in existence and their infinitude. Perfected gods have the power to create a body for themselves with which they can inhabit any of the heavens in existence and there is no end to their number. So the difference then is that people who progress in stages gain a glorified body corresponding to the level of their spiritual development and are detained in that level until they gain more knowledge, wisdom, and perfection to ascend further. Those who have attained divine unity create a body for themselves according to which level of heaven they desire to visit. 3. That is one subtle difference between a creator and an image. I'll mention others in their proper contexts in future discussions.
This series of lessons has hopefully provided a brief but clear explanation of today's modified form of ascension, which gave rise to all the special heavens of Yahweh. Like every past creation of every god, these new realms of existence will continue forever, because what God creates can never be destroyed. In conclusion, I'll say the following. God is perfect and good. He, she has been so ever since eternity, and has never known other than complete perfection. Thanks to Yakub's idea, a creation has been brought about wherein God can experience other than goodness, commonly called evil. In addition, God will experience what it's like to seek perfection and never find it in an absolute form. The non-black races are part of Yakub slash Yahweh's mind and are his personalities. Even though they are independent free will beings, they are nonetheless the manifestation of Yakub. He lives in them as their mind of God, or divine spirit that will indwell every one of them who chooses everlasting life. Their experiences as evil beings in the past 6,000 years will become Yakub's experiences. Because of the divine unity of black people, they will become the experiences of all black people as well. Their coming spiritual progress in search of perfection will also become our experiences. God, who is eternally perfect and has known none other than absolute perfection, has created images of himself slash herself through which he, she can experience the absence of absolute perfection. All things are in God, both in their eternal perfect nature as well as their opposites. It is God's intent today, as it has been throughout all time, to experience all that is in him, her. Those opposite qualities that God cannot experience directly as a perfect being, he, she will find a way to experience by creating beings in an image suitable for their manifestation. Some of these qualities have a limited cycle of time, such as evil or self-forgetfulness, which cannot last for longer than 6,000 years. But some of the opposite qualities can continue forever, as will be the case with the pursuit of God's absolute perfection by the non-black races. Next, I intend to start a series of discussions on the true Israelites, the chosen people of Yahweh. Because of the effort you have put into this thread, take what I write in good heart. Is there anything in antiquity that backs up what you have taken time to put in this forum? If you mean anything in the way of physical evidence, yes there is. The most absolute evidence is to be found only in the secret teachings of some African tribes of today. But there is plenty of physical evidence left in the cultures of ancient Sumer, India, and Egypt. When read and interpreted correctly, the tomb writings of ancient Egypt talk very clearly about ascension and resurrection. There are some Egyptologists who are aware, for instance, that the Great Pyramids were used as ascension or resurrection machines. But many of them interpret this truth as if it's just allegory instead of fact. They suspect that the ancient pharaohs had burial rites performed inside the Great Pyramids, but make the mistake of expecting to find their bodies in there. The chambers of the pyramids were indeed used for ascension, but the bodies were always removed after the soul ascended and buried in a proper underground tomb. You will also find information where the Egyptians expected the soul of the king to ascend to the star Sirius, and the pyramids in fact have chambers aligned to that star. Such ascension to Sirius did take place at a certain point, and I'll discuss it later. If one is not in a position to directly study the tomb drawings and papyri of the ancients, then one has to learn to read between the lines of the writings of modern Egyptologists, Sumerologists, and the like, because they attempt to explain matters in which they are not properly initiated, and hence confuse many clear facts. Our Earth and Solar System were created 78 trillion years ago. As soon as the Earth was ready, 144,000 ancestors came from another star system, the star called Sirius that was worshipped by the ancient Egyptians. They inhabited the Earth after preparing it by seeding it with plant and animal life. After about 7,000 years since their arrival, their population increased from 144,000 to 1 billion 8 million, 1 B8M. The first part, I believe. Can you provide any evidence to support the rest? Is this merely your belief? Does everything have to have evidence for you to know it? And what kind of evidence are you talking about? Does it have to be an ancient scripture? Everything cannot come in evidence like that. You have to figure a lot of things out from the God inside you. What good would you be if everything we find out has to come from something physically in front of us? 
Not only does Malachi Z. York know certain truths, but a lot of other people do too. Is the Caucasian media just saying that something happened any more evidence than when it comes from a brother that presents hardcore facts hardly anyone else is? The brother answered your question very well. But I'll go even further. There are many among our people whose idea of good scholarly research is to absorb many things they get from white people of the past and present, while ignoring or rejecting what comes from black people. Whites are too young to know the truth. They're like little children on a discovery trip and take their discoveries for the actual ancient truth. All that they and their ancestors have said about pre-Greek ancient history pertains to events in which our ancestors, not theirs, were the participants. Only the descendants of those ancient participants know what really happened. Whites, on the other hand, only speculate. There will come a time when all people on earth will realize that the only truth is actually that which is known by black people and none by whites. Thanks for that response. But as few as it may be there are some whites in the world that are down for the cause and know the truth. Zakaria Sitchin for one has written books on ancient Egypt and Samaria, the mothership Nibiru, and ancient Egypt technology, gods and goddesses. Yes, there are many like him who have discovered part of the truth, but not the whole truth. They fill the rest with a lot of self-serving speculations, so one still has to be careful and not take everything they say wholesale. Only the descendants of those ancient participants know what really happened. May I ask why this is true? Are you suggesting blacks are more knowledgeable because they are black? Only they know what happened because the information was passed to them by their ancestors by means of ancient rituals of initiation. They in turn passed it down the same way, and so on ever since 6,000 years ago. And that is how it came to me. Such information is the only true truth there is. The rest, either written or spoken, that comes down to us, is full of error. That cannot be helped because of the way in which it is brought down, a way that relies mainly on individual memories rather than infallible rituals. Please, inform me, how may such knowledge come to me? By a true desire to have it. The mind, consciousness, is of two kinds. The first is the unconscious mind. It is simply the memory given to us as a gift by our ancestors. It contains all the life experiences of our lineage of ancestors all the way back to the first God, who created our universe. Part of my learning regarding the subconscious. Subconsciousing. Reasoning is not necessarily conscious in its operations, and that, in fact, a large part of the rational processes of the mind are performed below or above the field of consciousness. The subconscious field of the intellect worked out problems, and then after a time passed on to the conscious field of the intellect the solution of the matter. We purpose instructing you in the methods by which this part of the intellect may be set to work for you. Many have stumbled upon bits of this truth for themselves, and, in fact, the majority of successful men and men who have attained eminence in any walk of life have made more or less use of this truth, although they seldom understand the reason of it. The brother went on to quote a long passage of Raja Yoga by Yogi Ramakaraka from http colon slash slash www.ibiblio.org slash srepedia slash ebook slash Raja Yoga slash 10.txt which ended thus. 87. In the next lesson we will call your attention to other features and qualities of this great field of mind, showing you how you can put it to work and master it. Remember, always, the I is the master and its mastery must always be remembered and asserted over all phases and planes of the mind. Do not be a slave to the subconscious, but be its master. What is being described in the long quote you posted is nothing other than mental inspiration. Inspiration comes in two different ways, one way for black people and a different way for non-blacks. Among black people, inspiration always comes from your first self, one of the B8M original gods. Among non-blacks, the source of their inspiration is always their maker, Yahweh, or the Elohim. When Yahweh uses part of his mind this way to guide them, they call it the collective unconscious. The inspiration can come in many different ways, in dreams, concepts, images of ancestors, dead famous people, relatives, etc. But all these images and ideas have Yahweh as their source. 
Similarly, inspiration among black people always has the first self as its source. That's how mental inspiration occurs. Non-blacks, having been created in ignorance, are naturally ignorant of the origin of their inspiration. So they claim that it comes from their subconscious mind. They further make the claim that they can master this subconscious mind. Well, the so-called subconscious mind of non-blacks is actually the mind of their maker, Yahweh. He is their creator and they are his creatures. No creature can be the master of his creator. Such a wishful thought is self-delusion born of pride and ignorance. The exercises described in the quote only help to open the person up to higher inspirations, not to be God's master. 92. As for black people, we do not master our first self. We become the first self in divine unity. Parents, neighbors, culture, society, siblings, teachers, education, religion, spiritual teachings, all have some effect on your subconscious. You will probably even remember something they've said in passing 30 years down the line for no real reason you can think of. It's not the real you so to speak, it is however what defines you and your perception of the world, its imagery even influences how you react to whatever life throws at you, in fact subconsciously we've already decided how to react to life situations based on similar past experiences. The subconscious also doesn't know the differences between good and bad, and it is the source of your thinking, daydreams, and dream, so whatever you think of the most in life, your attitudes, beliefs, opinions, etc., etc., is normally derived from whatever imagery you have stored in your subconscious, whether you've developed that imagery yourself or got it from your peers, media, and the rest, doesn't really matter. Bad people or evil people have mostly negative imagery influencing them, so-called good people have good imagery to influence them naturally. In my eyes, there's little difference between the two. You can work out why based on what I've said here. The people you share imagery with, or I should say the people who have their subconscious imagery arranged in a similar fashion are normally the people you get on with the most, i.e. you have an affinity with them, and the ones that don't share your imagery, or have it arranged differently you won't like, or you will feel repelled by them. It's pretty much that simple. With understanding it's easy to think differently of all people whatever their station in life. 96. The soul, or pure consciousness, self, or whatever people call themselves these days is just along for the ride, because it doesn't know itself. Basically we could all end up believing anything if we don't know exactly how our own subconscious works. The soul's only option is to follow whatever imagery the subconscious gives it, which in reality is the images we've got from life and other people. And we are the ones who perpetuate that imagery regardless of whatever it is. It's why folks even up to today have been saying know thyself, be careful what you wish for, and we judge ourselves, etc., etc. The subconscious is pretty much our own personal heaven or hell, depending on how we think in life. I grant that what you say is presently true about the subconscious. But I'll add two important points that are generally overlooked in this discussion. One, the subconscious mind as you have described it has not always been the way you observe it today. This is a very recent phenomenon in comparison to the length of our history on Earth. As a matter of fact, it became this way starting only 50,000 years ago, but more especially so in the last 6,000 years. There was a great change in the human mind 6,000 years ago that is not observable by scientists in their theories of the evolution of the human mind. This change was caused by a great change in our genetic structure, namely our DNA, that I'll discuss at length soon. So today's subconscious mind, which you have analyzed quite accurately, is actually an anomaly. 2. Even today, the subconscious mind as you've described it is not that way in all people. What causes this phenomenon in most people is the fact that, generally speaking, we exist in a dreamy kind of consciousness. Even in daytime wakefulness, most people are not entirely awake. Their memories are as hazy as those of their night dreams. But there are people in whom such is not the case. There are certain people in my culture that can be said to have total recall. Such people never forget anything they've ever experienced since their conception, beginning right in the womb, as soon as their nervous system could register stimuli. And by total recall, I mean they are able to relive their past experiences exactly as they happened then. 
Such people are not in that class you described, whose minds and actions are dictated by habits rising up from their repressed memories. They simply do not have any repressed memories. So their actions, decisions, and reactions are genuine and new every moment, being dictated by their willful reaction to present situations, regardless of how they reacted in the past. DNA has nothing to do with the subconscious mind, period. The conscious mind is another matter. DNA has everything to do with how memory is preserved. What you call the subconscious memory was at one time conscious memory. After time, it became repressed and thus became subconscious, meaning below conscious, and DNA is part of our nervous system and brain, where memories are preserved. The soul doesn't enter the body until birth. The soul is nothing other than personality. It does not enter the body. It's formed anew, moment by moment, by each person. What enters the body is the gift of ancestral memory, or what is commonly called the mind of God. It always enters at conception, not at birth. It preserves and records all the baby's experiences while in the womb, and for the rest of his her life. During certain rituals, it's quite easy for initiates to relive these memories. When a child is born, they are crying for weeks on end for some, because they know what they've come back to. She cries because the doctor has metal forceps tight around her tender head, pulling hard. Then he grabs her by her tiny ankles and slaps her. No wonder they cry. You say, there are certain people in my culture that can be said to have total recall. Again, you've got to have made conscious effort in the past life to become that way now. Incorrect. This assumes that the mystical concept of reincarnation and karma taught in the East, especially India, is true. It is not. It's a complete fabrication. Every person born is brand new, never having lived before. It's God's way of renewing himself slash herself. Only the mind of God, or as it's called, the spirit of God, is eternal in the person. It has no karma and does not take part in the so-called spiritual evolution, which is a fallacy. 98. Every person is brand new when born. That is true, but only in that particular body. Most of the time souls have lived before in another time and another body. The body and brain is brand new, which is why it's hard to remember past lives. There is a confusion of words in the English language, where people sometimes speak interchangeably of the soul and spirit. Other times they speak of them in such a way that they mean two different things. So it's hard sometimes to know what a person is referring to when they say soul. In ancient times, the human entity was described as being made of three things, namely body, soul, and spirit. I'm using the English words, obviously. The ancient words are different. Obviously, the ancients meant two different things by soul and spirit. Otherwise, if they were the same, then the human entity would be made of two, not three things, either body and soul or body and spirit. But it's clear that we are made of three, not two. The modern language defines them much more clearly. We all know what the body is. We also all know what personality is. Thirdly, we all know what the mind is. Even if we cannot quite define it, we use it, and are aware when we use it that we are using the mind, which is a different part of ourselves than our body or personality. Some call the mind consciousness. The reality of these three things, body, personality, and mind, is clear to every normal person. So I'll put it to you that when the ancients spoke of body, soul, and spirit, they meant what we today call body, personality, and mind, or consciousness. In other words, by soul they meant personality, and by spirit they meant mind or consciousness. I'll also put it to you that no matter how hard you try, you will not find any other component of the human entity other than these three. Some would suggest that life is a fourth component. Life is not a thing that we are uniquely composed of. Only these three define our uniqueness as individuals. Life is what unites the three and enables the human entity to live and function on earth. Now, if body, soul, and spirit mean body, personality, and mind, then where is the soul that lived before? To say the soul lived before is tantamount to saying our personality lived before, which is impossible because our personality is formed directly by our present experiences. 
we have no experiences when we are conceived. Conception is the starting point for every person, who then accumulates experiences that mold his her unique personality or soul. So when you refer to the soul as something that lived before, then surely by soul you must mean spirit or mind. The mind of God, or spirit of God as others call it, or consciousness of God, is the only eternal part of the human entity. It's the same in every black person because the B8M gods live in a permanent state of divine unity. To say that you yourself are the exact same person that lived before when the God incarnated previously is to diminish your unique individuality. Your ancestor that you deign to be you would also resent the diminishing of himself as a complete, unique individual. You are a unique individual who has never lived before. Your experience of the world is totally brand new, uncontaminated by any previous experiences. And so is mine and everyone else. God who is incarnated in me, and you wanted it that way, and has it that way for a simple reason, to experience himself anew. If God brought a personality, soul, that has lived before into you, then the newness would surely be contaminated. The reason that compels a loving parent to allow his son to go out into the world and experience it for himself without undue influence from him is the very same reason by which God will have it no other way than to bring new life to the world in the form of a brand new personality. This method makes sure that the rediscovery of God is 100% guaranteed to be a pure, new experience. Only in that does he find his whole delight and ecstasy. If you were to form new personalities by mixing them with the souls of dead persons, then this newness and uniqueness would be compromised. And yet, that very same ancient God is incarnated in the new person as his her guide of conscience. Each person is brought into the world to gain certain experiences. The guide, the first self, leads him her to them so that the purpose may be fulfilled. At some point the new person and the eternal self will unite as one, and then, and only then, does the new person know that he she has lived before, not as a past version of the present personality, but as the original self, the only our reincarnator. He she will then send his her mind into yet another new person so he she can live again anew. And again and again. It has been going on since eternity that has no beginning. So each one of the B8M gods has innumerable personalities. When you experience divine unity, you realize that you are the original God, that's what oneness or unity means. So all the innumerable personalities are your very own personalities as an original God. That's what true reincarnation means. I was reading UR posts about how the non-blacks conscious individual minds go to the same place called heaven where all black PPL go today, and how those non-blacks can be saved. So are you saying that there are good divine non-blacks? And that after this cycle there could possibly be white PPL still living among us? Because we are black PPL, God can dwell in us, but because white PPL cannot be lived in, how can they be saved? Are they going to become black in the next cycle? How have white PPL been led to a sinful existence? I thought they were evil by nature, that that was just who they are. I hope these questions do not appear to be an attack on your knowledge, because that is farthest from what I'm trying to do. I am just confused, and seek understanding. Thank you. There are no divine non-blacks, and they'll never become divine. Divine means to unite with the original self and attain full godhood. The non-blacks do not have an original self. They have a collective unconscious that was given to them by their maker from part of his mind. And yes, they're evil by nature. They can never become black by their own effort. The only way they can become black is if they intermarry with black people and their descendants do the same until they become black. That would be grafting them back into the black nation. But this they'll never do wholesale. To them, it would mean the end of their race. They're more concerned about the survival of their race than they are about eternal life, which is possible only in a black body in the physical universe. In the mental universe, the so-called heaven, everlasting life is possible for all races. The primary difference between the physical universe and the mental realms is this. The physical universe is the only place where new beings or new life can be created. In the mental realms, after ascension, it's not possible to create new creations. 
This distinction is important in order to understand why the non-blacks cannot have everlasting life in the universe, but can have it in the mental realms. The non-blacks are impotent beings. They don't have the ability to create due to the absence of the creative black germ. All creativity resides in the dominant black germ. A human body that is made by removing the black germ survives only on momentum. Everything in creation is given an initial momentum and obeys the law of momentum. A simple example of momentum is when you throw a ball. Depending on how hard you throw it, it will go only that far. That is its momentum. Life also has this quality. The gods designed the lives of human beings to have a momentum of 7,000 years. At the end of it, the life force that produced the life momentum must be renewed. If it's not renewed, then the people as a species will perish. To prevent their own self-destruction, black people put the germ of regeneration inside their own bodies. This is the black germ. It's the guarantee of self-regeneration. A new generation of black people is born every 1,000 years in our natural world. Therefore, after 7,000 years, there's a completion and regeneration, otherwise the black nation would perish. The probability of that ever happening has been permanently made zero by the presence of the black germ, which is called the throne of God in his temple, the body. The ancient Israelites called it the Ark of the Covenant in the Tabernacle of God. It's a guarantee or covenant for eternal life in the physical universe. Now, after the 7,000-year momentum elapses, then the species that cannot self-regenerate can continue to exist in the mental realms. Ascension to the mental realms requires only one condition, self-consciousness. That's the quality by which a person remembers who he, she is, and is aware of his, her own existence. This awareness slash memory is all that's needed for a person to transport himself slash herself into the mental realms after death. So because the non-blacks have self-consciousness, they too will ascend to Yahweh's heavens, where black people also ascend to in this age. But they did not make these heavens. They were made for them by their maker. So their survival in them will depend entirely on Yahweh. Yahweh made the races for a reason, which is this. First and foremost, they were made to manifest the evil in God. Secondly, they were made so God could experience the absence of perfection. You may wonder, why would God want to manifest evil and to experience non-perfection? Well, aren't all things contained in God? God is fearless. He, she will experience all that is in him, her, whatever it is. Fortunately, it so happens, as I already stated, that all things are given a set amount of momentum when they are made. The momentum of evil is 6,000 years. Because of the absence of the black germ in the races, they don't have the power of self-regeneration or self-renewal. Their 6,000-year time span of evil has now run its course. After 1,000 more years, they'll completely perish, and there'll only be black people on earth. But the non-blacks, those who so choose, will continue to live forever in Yahweh's heavens, because the second reason for their creation continues. That reason, as I stated, is God's desire to experience what it's like to seek absolute perfection and never find it. God has always been absolutely perfect. But every one of his qualities has its opposite, and all the opposites must be experienced also. God is afraid of nothing. The only way for him her to experience the opposites is to make beings that can manifest them. In the case of the absence of perfection, which starts as evil, self-forgetfulness, the light races are the necessary vehicles to bring the experience. Evil itself can only be manifested in the physical universe. It depends on the concept of time, which does not exist in the mental realms. Over there, there is no time delayed between error and correction, or between sin and punishment. The wages of sin there are paid almost immediately after the sin is committed. So evil cannot exist for long there, because sinners would quickly self-destruct. The physical universe is the only ideal place for it. But the mental realms are ideal for manifesting the second purpose. So the non-blacks who choose salvation will live forever in Yahweh's heavens and provide God with the experience he she intended to have. Although the non-blacks are independent, self-conscious beings with free will, their lives are nonetheless in their maker. In him they live, move, and have their being. 
All their experiences are his property, as ours are the property of our real self. We incarnated on earth for that, and we will unite with and become the first self. Non-blacks live for Yahweh. They cannot unite with him and his soulmate and the Elohim, but he is conscious in them as their collective consciousness, and all their experiences belong to him. In a similar way, you yourself have creatures that you created long ago for a particular reason. They exist even now in your heavens, and will continue to exist forever, providing God, your first self, with the experiences for which they were created. Such is the case with Yahweh's creatures, the non-blacks. They will cease to exist on earth because they refuse to be grafted back, but they'll continue to live forever in heaven through the benevolence of their maker, and his mind. Questions I thank God for AIDS and the cure. You say, I thank God for AIDS and the cure. Could you elaborate? Not really since a God doesn't exist. Just because most people don't know exactly why the universe exists doesn't mean a God created everything. Besides, most religions say that the soul or consciousness existed before the creation. Question is how did we get inside this creation and why did we decide to come here in the first place? People can only think in physical terms and then call it spiritual. It's the main reason why everybody attributes everything to a god, because they don't know why in reality, they only know the physical reality and physical explanations. And it's no coincidence that every religion though out the whole of history does this no matter where they are on earth, because people are naturality superstitious, and when they don't know anything they pass it off onto some divine being or some sort of god, then they all claim it's the only god, without really seeking to understand the spiritual reality. And when they don't understand and pass it off onto a god, it's the work of the devil or demons and the like. The idea of heaven and hell is only pleasing to the human because they think of the body and its physical senses instead of the soul. Think 1000 virgins in paradise and the like. What makes people think the soul has a gender? Does the eternal soul need to procreate? Sex is official experience after all. So again people can only think of spiritual things using physical comparisons. The cliché is above so below actually false. Believe me they don't think of the soul because they don't know what it is. The fact that people talk about the soul like it's outside of themselves a point to note, especially when it's talked about like it's everything else but themselves. You'll burn in hell for eternity. Point 1. For eternity to exist, there has to be no thing such as time and space. Point 2. No physical matter lasts for eternity. Point 3. If the soul or consciousness is incorporeal then how can it burn? In fact how can pain be felt when pain such as burning is only physical? Point 4. Fire needs oxygen to burn. You don't even have to breath or have oxygen in yours dreams, what makes people think it exists in heaven or hell, in fact would it need to exist unless heaven or hell is a physical experience in reality. Point 5. Funny how people can only listen to the physical people who spread the so-called word of God or gospel to believe in the spiritual in the first place. You say, God doesn't exist. God does exist. I'll prove it to you right here. Forget for a minute about every religion you've ever heard of and answer this question. Do you exist? Of course you do. And so do I. Therefore God exists. God is the black person. There is no other God or God. Black root science is the explanation of why this is true. Please read what I've presented so far and what will follow. Secondly, the statement you'll burn in hell for eternity was not made by me. Separate the words of various people accordingly. Thirdly, why do you say the statement as above, so below is false? God doesn't exist. I'd bet eternity on it. The universe is too mechanical for starters for there to be a being to have created it. Something exists, but certainly not a God, unless God is a system of course that has no consciousness, or knows not the differences between good or bad, positive and negative, and love or hate. Whatever it is just exists, and it functions far too perfectly, and also has a cyclic nature to it. One thing I have noticed is that it does react to our own individual desires, based upon what's in our subconscious. 
If we are negative or have lots of violent thoughts then somehow people of similar thinking are drawn to us or us to them. People call it attraction. God does exist. I'll prove it to you right here. No you think you'll prove it, that's the problem, not knowing that you don't know it all. You can't physical or spiritually prove anything of this nature to anyone, no one can. You only listen and dismiss or listen and agree. People don't investigate things enough for themselves, if they did they might discover something instead of being told something. Forget for a minute about every religion you've ever heard of and answer this question. My answers would be the same. I'm not the same as I was yesterday, and I won't be the same tomorrow as I am today. There is just one constant, and that is my attention, which is focused in the now. Do you exist? Naturally. Of course you do. And so do I. Naturally. Therefore God exists. Interesting deduction. You can only base that on a physical assumption of a God. Children don't think about God or religion until life's experiences brings it into their path. The same goes for death. God is the black person. There is no other God or God. Really, the truth is in the darkness however, people are too addicted to the white light imagery of their minds though. Like how moths fly into fire. Black root science is the explanation of why this is true. Please read what I've presented so far and what will follow. I've read it already. Why do you say the statement as above, so below is false? Because you're supposed to go within not above. A lot easier when people stop thinking that the mind is the soul. The mind is in control of the soul or consciousness, therefore it gets lead around a lot by the mind's constant thinking. It's supposed to be the other way around. People might stop talking about the soul as if it's alien and separate from themselves then. It's totally identified to being the mind though, that's why people are repetitive and develop habits of thinking and acting and speaking. The mind is supposed to be a tool, not your slave master. Do people really choose to feel bad about something? Even something they might see on TV? Or are they running on automatic, i.e. a habitual way of behaving? Depression is only habitual negative thinking, and that illness has only increased since the world has become more of a depressing place. People don't shed a tear about the events in the world, but they will if they read a book or see a film. If your soul is your attention, which doesn't change as you grow older, what do you think you are going to think about other than what's in the contents of your mind? Only what you have learned in life, of course. Only the contents of our minds and body change as we grow older. The soul doesn't need to change if it's immortal, it shouldn't need to. It just doesn't know itself so it can only recognize what's in the mind which could be any old belief or theory to be frank about it or any murderous or perverted feeling. The soul is totally absorbed in the mind. Frankly at the moment we're just along for the ride, just like we are in a dream, until we wake up. Until then people are only as good or bad as what's in their subconscious minds controlling them. Sages have been saying go within for eons, but people only thought they talking about the mind. And things are so far gone now it's all about the physical brain, which is physical organ, which does nothing much other than to aid the mind and soul to express itself here in the flesh. Modern psychology is the worst religion on the planet, it limits people's scope of thinking. If the universe is too mechanical, why does that imply God didn't create it? It's like saying a car is too mechanical therefore man didn't create it. You say something exists. I say not something, but you and me, or black people. There is no one else at the beginning. You challenge the first statement leading to my proof by saying I don't know that I don't know at all. This implies that you know that I don't know. If you have this capacity to know what I do and don't know, why can't I have the same capacity? I assert that we all have this capacity, therefore I do know it all. You call the conclusion of my proof an interesting deduction, meaning you disagree with the conclusion. Why do you disagree with error-free logic? If I say A equals B and B equals C, therefore A equals C, is this an interesting deduction? If I say I exist and therefore God exists because God is the black person, is this not error-free logic? Now I'm not implying that you should agree with the last statement, that God is the black person. 
but it's obvious to me that this is your only objection to my proof, and not the logic in it. If you agree with this assessment, then we'll make this the basis of our argument. I'll restate it. God exists because God is the black person. Our argument. Is God really the black person? Or is the black person really God? If I've properly defined the point of departure for our argument, please say so. If not, I'd like to hear your objection. That should, I think, be the main focus of our discussion. The last issue, as above, so below, is secondary at this point, and I'll address it briefly, but would not dwell on it for now. You object to going above, and would rather go within. What's wrong with doing both? I can go above to the stars, either physically in a craft or in my imagination, and I can also go within into my consciousness. What's wrong with going above and within, if I can do both? And since my analysis of the universe depends on going above to compare it to what's below, then I choose the one over the other in this case, and the other over the first in appropriate circumstances. You say something exists. I say not something, but you and me, or black people. There is no one else at the beginning. Other races exist too you know whether you like them or not, they exist for exactly the same reason ours does. Unfortunately people aren't even looking for the reason. They don't desire it. You challenge the first statement leading to my proof by saying I don't know that I don't know at all. This implies that you know that I don't know. I know more than most when it comes to spirituality, so much so that I hold back most things, because I know people won't understand. No point in talking about reincarnation, its purpose, and why people don't remember previous ones if you don't believe in it is there. No, not at all. Plus I've no intention to help people one bit with spiritual matters, not my bloody job to preach to people. And the way I see it is, if you ain't seeking you're not interested. Since people are only interested in the contents of their own minds. If you have this capacity to know what I do and don't know, why can't I have the same capacity? You can, but you're going about it the wrong way. Life is about experience after all, so it's not a major point. It's supposed to happen either way. I assert that we all have this capacity, therefore I do know it all. Actually not all of us do it all, not in this lifetime anyway. The fact that you don't know the differences between the mind, subconscious, and the consciousness, soul, says a lot. Know thyself has been said a lot too. Even that silly religion Scientology has grasped that point to a degree. But Mr. Hubbard got a bit too carried with the contents of his subconscious as does everybody else I've noticed. Way too much fiction. The thing is I know where it comes from so I find it easy to identify. You call the conclusion of my proof an interesting deduction, meaning you disagree with the conclusion. Why do you disagree with error-free logic? It's devoid of logic. God is an emotional concept for starters. It doesn't even begin in logic so how is it going to end in logic? And logic has its limits also. I doubt you can't understand something spiritual when you haven't had first-hand experience of the spiritual. Even worse what people think is spiritual actually isn't for the most part. If I say A equals B and B equals C therefore A equals C, is this an interesting deduction? If I say I exist and therefore God exists because God is the black person, is this not error-free logic? Again it's not logic. You are fully identified to being a black person, instead of individual soul inside a black form having the black experience. It's fine when it comes to material earthly matters, but it means squat when it comes to so-called spiritual matters. You body isn't going with you when you are dead. Buddha was close when he mentioned something about earthly attachments, but even he got carried away with the doctrine of karma which is also false. It's all about the physical world again. The soul isn't black or white nor male or female. Now I'm not implying that you should agree with the last statement, that God is the black person. But it's obvious to me that this is your only objection to my proof, and not the logic in it. I have no objections as to how and what you think is correct. If you agree with this assessment, then we'll make this the basis of our argument. I don't agree with you at all on any point whatsoever. I'll restate it. God exists because God is the black person. God is not a person. 
spiritual assumptions based on material speculation won't get you far with me I'm afraid. Our argument. Is God really the black person? Or is the black person really God? Simple answer no. If I've properly defined the point of departure for our argument, please say so. If not, I'd like to hear your objection. That should, I think, be the main focus of our discussion. The last issue, as above, so below, is secondary at this point, and I'll address it briefly, but would not dwell on it for now. You object to going above, and would rather go within. What's wrong with doing both? I can go above to the stars, either physically in a craft or in my imagination, and I can also go within into my consciousness. No, you can't you since you are the consciousness. You can go outside into the mind maybe which is the subconscious. A few occult practices and religions teach that. Hate to say it, but they're on the right track, but for the wrong reasons. But like I've said, going within has been misunderstood and will continue to be so until people stop listening to other people and reading so-called spiritual books and actually get to work on it. No one said it would be easy. What's wrong with going above and within if I can do both? And since my analysis of the universe depends on going above to compare it to what's below, then I choose the one over the other in this case, and the other over the first in appropriate circumstances. Going above is going without. You're doing it already so no need to worry about that, most people are doing the same. Since that's where yours and everybody else's goal is, the things of the earth. You come back to what you know as they say. Since you reject that God is the black person, and quite emphatically with a single word, I'll put that aside for now. I want to look at some of your statements concerning the races, the reason for their existence, the soul, consciousness, and so on. Obviously the light-skinned races exist today. My statement is that they did not exist prior to some point in the past. You say they've existed at least as long as black people have. Is that an accurate statement of your position? Then you say they exist for the same reason as black people. What is that reason? 2NDLY, you say I can have the same capacity for knowledge that you have, but I go about it the wrong way. What is the right way? Third, you say the concept of God does not begin in logic, but is an emotional concept. My feeling for why you say this is that you recognize the emotional concept of God, but reject the logical truth of him. My goal in my writings is to make it clear to all those interested that God is not an emotional fabrication of our desire, by our I mean black people. The God of religion is indeed an emotional fabrication of minds that are not anchored in remote ancestral history. Only by following ancestral history to the very beginning will we know the first God, the one and only. This is a logical and clear-eyed process, not obscured by emotional immaturity. That is my way. It's a way taught to me by my ancestors, and taught to them by the first gods at the beginning of the universe. Fourth, you say that I don't know the difference between the mind and the soul. Which statement in my writings caused you to come to this conclusion? Nonetheless, I'll define mind and soul. You say the mind is the subconscious, and the soul is consciousness. I differ. Consciousness and the subconscious are both the mind. One is unconscious, or subconscious, and the other is conscious. By mind I do not mean the process of thinking, but consciousness itself. Those two aspects mean the mind is divided into two. The first is the unconscious mind, which is unconscious memory. The origin of unconscious memory, or the unconscious mind, or subconscious mind, is our ancestors. It comes as a gift from them, so it's called ancestral memory. This type of memory enters every child at conception, and is completely settled in the depth of his, her mind by the time of birth. The second type of mind is the awareness with which I am aware right now, in the present. This is the conscious mind. This second type of mind forms what I'll call present-derived memory, as opposed to ancestral memory. This memory is responsible for the formation of the individual's personality. Every person interprets life events differently. This interpretation colors the memory that results from these events. This coloring forms the individual's unique personality. This unique personality is the soul of the individual. To summarize, 
the mind, consciousness, is of two kinds. The first is the subconscious mind. It is simply the memory given to us as a gift by our ancestors. It contains all the life experiences of our lineage of ancestors all the way back to the first God, who created our universe. The second is the conscious mind, our everyday awareness. From this second mind is formed present time memory, which in turn forms the individual soul, which is personality. There is no such thing as an individual eternal soul in the sense that you imply. Every individual soul, or personality, is formed by him per in the present, from life experiences. What people call the eternal soul is actually our first self, the original God. This is not a soul. The first self is not anything that can be described, yet he, she is the source of all things. Now even though there is no eternal individual soul, there is something eternal in every individual. It's the unconscious mind, which is unconscious only in individuals, but is conscious in the 24 elders. This mind, ancestral memory, comes from eternity that has no beginning. It's called the mind of God, and lives in every black person. Obviously the light-skinned races exist today. My statement is that they did not exist prior to some point in the past. You say they've existed at least as long as black people have. Is that an accurate statement of your position? Then you say they exist for the same reason as black people. What is that reason? You see this is why I keep race and spirituality well far apart, they have nothing at all to do with each as far as I'm concerned. As a race know the lighter skinned races haven't existed as long. But the consciousness in the lighter skinned races have. Consciousness doesn't just pop out of thin air once you're born, and if everybody realized that there are the consciousness inside the body first and foremost, and I mean everybody, then I doubt this earth would have so many problems, certainly not with race as it's a temporary thing anyway with being human really. But people are so addicted and fully identified with the body and brain then this is what we get. Life as it is now. Because people don't know themselves. People say embrace diversity while thinking that the way someone may look makes them think differently. Yet even thinking comes from within the mind, but no they just see a face and its race. How many adverts do you see on TV telling you how to improve your thinking or behavior? Absolutely none. You know why? Because they don't want us to improve as people. 2NDLY, you say I can have the same capacity for knowledge that you have, but I go about it the wrong way. What is the right way? As I've said going within and awakening the self. Not going say any more than that since it would take ages and probably a whole website when I think about it. Third. You say the concept of God does not begin in logic but is an emotional concept. My feeling for why you say this is that you recognize the emotional concept of God but reject the logical truth of him. I reject it for a reason I know better than that. My goal in my writings is to make it clear to all those interested that God is not an emotional fabrication of our desire, by our I mean black people. The God of religion is indeed an emotional fabrication of minds that are not anchored in remote ancestral history. Only by following ancestral history to the very beginning will we know the first God, the one and only. This is a logical and clear-eyed process, not obscured by emotional immaturity. That is my way. It's a way taught to me by my ancestors, and taught to them by the first gods at the beginning of the universe. Fourth, you say that I don't know the difference between the mind and the soul. Which statement in my writings caused you to come to this conclusion? Nonetheless, I'll define mind and soul. You say the mind is the subconscious, and the soul is consciousness. I differ. Then you're wrong simple as. And you make the same mistakes as everybody else I doubt you worship of the body and mind. Subject closed as far as I'm concerned. There is no such thing as an individual eternal soul. Every individual soul or personality is formed by him per in the present from life experiences. Then even Christians, Muslims and the rest are closer to the truth than you are. You're rejecting free will for starters which comes from the consciousness not the subconscious. The subconscious influences our thinking, however, the same way it gives us our memory and emotions. The subconscious doesn't discriminate between good or evil. 
it will pop any type of thought for the consciousness to either accept or reject. Those who haven't developed their consciousness to a certain degree will act out any fantasy given to it by the subconscious. Like we all do in a dream. It's the same mind, so why isn't it doing it now? That's right you think you're fully awake. Now even though there is no eternal individual soul, there is something eternal in every individual. It's the unconscious mind, which is unconscious only in individuals, but is conscious in the 24 elders. This mind, ancestral memory, comes from eternity that has no beginning. It's called the mind of God, and lives in every black person. That is false. It's not eternal for starters. Very old maybe, but far from eternal. It's connected to the human mind, and is sometimes called the collective unconscious. It's nothing more than a sea of imagination, which people sometimes call God, or as you call it, 24 elders, and as others have called it, Satan or Mother Kundalini. It would help if people knew how it actually operated, then people would stop giving it stupid names. As you think it will give, and it operates on the individual's desire whether that desire is good or evil, and it won't help you either certainly not with spiritual matters. It has a purpose and a function, which is to bring people the experiences they need and desire. Like attracts like. That's all I've got to say on the subject. No point wasting my time with someone who doesn't even recognize that their own attention is their consciousness. It's so absorbed in the mind's contents that it's as pretty much in a daydream. Acting out its fantasies totally oblivious to the world around them. Never mind way too many religions and spiritual beliefs on this earth in the first place for it not to be the fantasy of someone's mind. Why do you think they exist in the first place? If a pure consciousness or alpha consciousness put a virtual reality helmet on it would take everything it sees for real too and lose all identity of self. This is why we have a mind and body, to learn and experience things. Many, many times over if needs be. Until we actually desire to get it right and leave. Right now the mind is self to most people. Actually most people don't even think about these things, which says a lot since we're all amused and distracted by this amusement park experience. You wrote, that's all I've got to say on the subject. No point wasting my time with someone who doesn't even recognize that their own attention is their consciousness. Very well. I'll be ready to continue when it's no longer a waste of your time. Mr. Intrigue. To my knowledge, Mr. Muhammad never taught that blacks existed before the creation of Earth. If he did, please, present evidence. If he did not, are you stating he was incorrect? As you read my posts, you'll find many things in them that Elijah Muhammad did not mention. This should not surprise you, considering my explanation of how I learned this knowledge. Now, your question above contains a logical contradiction which comes as a result of a lack of understanding of Elijah's teaching. He clearly taught that. The original man is none other than the black man. The black man, woman, is the first and last, creator and owner of the universe. Message to the Black Man, Chapter 29 If blacks did not exist before the creation of the earth, how did they create it? You also ask, why do I use Elijah's statements to support my own? The reason is because truth supports truth. I use statements from anyone and everyone that I judge to be true. This is the most effective way to communicate written and spoken truth. There is another kind of truth called absolute truth, which needs no external support. But as long as black people are still excluded, by their own choice, from the rites and methods of initiation that lead to absolute truth, I'll continue to use this method. When the natural way of learning of our people comes back into use, then every individual will know the truth directly, without any intermediary. Until then, the truth will remain relative to them, and second-hand at best. So I'll continue to support it by external means. But sir, Mr. Muhammad's quote did not support yours. Yes, Elijah's statements do support my statement that black people existed before the creation of the earth. Look at it logically. In the I-40 lessons he says, Who is the original man? Answer, the original man is the Asiatic black man, the maker, the owner, the cream of the planet earth, father of civilization and god of the universe. 82. 
Clearly, if the black man is the maker and God of the universe, he existed before the universe he created, otherwise how could he create it? It seems that your objection is that other black people did not exist before the creation of the earth, but only one black man, Allah, existed. It seems also you think that this black man, Allah, has existed continuously since the beginning, and is the same today. This is a gross misunderstanding of who God is. Elijah made it clear that the 24 elders select one among them every 25,000 years, and this one is called God, Allah. He, or she, dies and ascends after some time and a new God, Allah, takes his or her place. And on and on it has been going since the creation of our universe. Thus there is no single man called God who lives continuously forever in the way you think. The question then is, who is Allah? Clearly he is a black man, as Elijah says. But which black man? And is it only one black man? Elijah answers this in The Theology of Time, Book 2, where he says, Who is Allah? I am Allah. You are Allah. We are all Allah. That means all black people are Allah, and only black people because the other races did not exist then, they came out of the black man. Now, I came upon my knowledge independently, before I heard of Elijah Muhammad. When I came upon his teachings and saw that they were true, I used them because I'm communicating with people who are somewhat familiar with them. But there is much more that he never revealed. So you'll find many statements in my posts that he never said. Do not take the sum total of Elijah's publications and speeches as the complete standard by which to measure the truth. Those who were close to him know that there were certain things he revealed only to them and never made public. So do not measure my statements by whether or not they are included in Elijah's teachings. If you do that, you will raise your own stumbling block and fail to understand the greater truth. You might ask, who is this tribe of Shabazz? Originally, they were the tribe that came with the earth, or this part, 66 trillion years ago when a great explosion on our planet divided it into two parts. One we call Earth and the other Moon. Excerpt of Message to the Black Men by Mr. Muhammad If you were correct, this statement would be contradictory. There were the tribe that came with the Earth, or this part, 66 trillion years ago. This statement does not mean that the Earth began 66 trillion years ago. It also does not mean that there were no people on it prior to that time. All it means is that 66 TR years ago the Moon was separated from the Earth. A certain group of our people were on that larger part that remained as the earth. It is this group that Elijah refers to as Shabazz. Now, he makes the mistake of saying Shabazz is a tribe. This is not so. The word Shabazz means nation, not tribe. The nation has twelve tribes. This word comes from the ancient word Shaba or Chaba, or as we say today in my language, Sekaba. It means nation. Therefore, Shabazz is the entire black nation. Please read more about this incident of separating the moon. You'll see that Elijah weaves a story that he says led to the incident. He says that a certain scientist was displeased with the fact that there were 12 different languages on earth. He wanted to have only one language. When he could not achieve this, he became angry and blew up the earth with a large bomb, causing part of it to separate and become the moon. This story is only a legend to illustrate the separation of the moon from the earth. It did not happen that way. But the point is that there were black people already on earth. They had been living here for over 12 trillion years before the moon separated. Therefore the entire black nation, or Shabazz, did not come with the earth 66 trillion years ago, as that statement seems to imply when taken out of context. I urge you to read the rest of what he said on this topic. You further answered me by saying, 1. In the sense that the Creator was black, this is true. 2. More than one person is not meant. 3. The Supreme Being is not being referred to when it is said you are Allah. Your first statement is correct. Your second statement is correct in the sense that at the end of the universe all people unite as one person. This one person is the true absolute God, yet he lives in many people united as one. Your third statement is incorrect. You imply that there is another supreme being outside of the black man slash woman such as you and me. 
there is no supreme being outside of the black man slash woman. By trying to separate the supreme being from the ordinary black man slash woman, you fall into the trap laid by all the religions of the light races, including white Islam. The trap is that there is some supreme being somewhere who is separate from you and me as black people. This is the greatest lie of the devils. It removes power from where power belongs and transfers it to some father figure outside of yourself in some non-existent place that nobody knows where. It even goes further and implies that since this supreme being is separate from us and our ancestors, then he most likely is some spook or spirit being. There is no such being or God. The only God there is, is incarnated as you and me. But you are presently unaware that you are the supreme being that you seek far away. The reason you are unaware is because you have yet to experience divine unity with your higher self. When the time comes and you experience it, you'll know without a shadow of a doubt that there is no supreme being. There is only you and your natural perfection, divided into endless trillions of personalities. Do you believe everything stated by Mr. Elijah Muhammad was correct or not? It's not possible for Elijah Muhammad, myself, you, or God to speak or write the full truth. It's simply impossible, even using our ancient language which is so perfect that it admits of no misinterpretation. The reason for this is because God designed the universe to be a place of experience. So the full, correct truth can only be known by direct personal experience. All written and spoken truth is a guide to path to be used to comfort and encourage as long as those hearing it are not in a position to experience the truth directly. So how can the full truth be experienced directly? Through the rites of initiation established for us by the B8M original people at the beginning of the universe. These rites lead a person into the past where he, she can relive the truth directly. There is no other way, past, present, or future. This way set by the original gods is the only way to full truth. Mr. Muhammad stated, God appeared in the person of Master Fard. Sir, in your opinion, did God appear in the person of Master Farid Muhammad? Yes. And he also appeared in the person of Elijah Muhammad. Not only that, but he is appearing right now in your person. The only difference between you and Fard is that he was aware of it, whereas you have yet to be aware. FYI Mr. Muhammad specifically mentioned God appearing in the person of Master Fard. What you have stated is partially true. Mr. Muhammad stated Mr. Fard was the supreme being. Do you believe that? No. And it's not a matter of belief. I know that he is not the supreme being in the way you think. The supreme being is the divine unity of all black people, the one and only true God. Any black person who reaches that indescribable state knows himself slash herself as the one and only supreme being, although in that state there is no one else, so there is no one over whom you can be supreme. How do you explain the similarities? 24 elders? 6,000 years? 78 trillion years? Yakub, etc. spelled exactly as Mr. Muhammad did, Yakub. Why are your teachings similar to Mr. Muhammad's teachings? He has taught the basis of some of your info since the early 1930s. Now someone has obviously stolen info from someone. Why do you expect true information to be different? Why are you surprised that I mentioned the 24 elders, 6,000 years, etc.? This information is true, regardless of who it comes from. Do you know that these are the same 24 elders mentioned in the book of Revelations of the Exchange Bible? Elijah and Fard did not invent this info in 1930. It has been true for 6,000 years and more. Where do you think Fard got his knowledge? He was trained and initiated by the elders of his own tribe, of which his father, a black man, was one. This knowledge has been passed from generation to generation for thousands of years. Before Elijah and Fard, there were others who were also initiated into this knowledge, many others, to ensure that this knowledge never dies. So don't be surprised that there are others who know. In the near future, many other Africans like myself are going to be allowed to come into the open. Do not make the mistake of rejecting them when they do, because you will reject vital information that is crucial to overcome the deceptions of the coming false messiah. I don't derive my knowledge from the teachings of Elijah Muhammad. 
Instead, I base my discussions on his teachings for two reasons. They are the most accurate representation of the truth in the West. They are relatively well known, and so provide a perfect launching pad for the larger truth. Knowledge as it is taught in Africa is somewhat different than some of Elijah's teachings. Read some of my posts on numbers, chemistry, biology, the trinity, and so on to get an idea of what is taught in our initiations. Elijah is taught a bit differently. This is not to say he was misguided. Rather, he tempered his teachings to accommodate the minds of his students. Today, many black people are much more sophisticated in their thinking and can grasp the larger truth more so than was possible in Elijah's time, at least till the time of his death. This has been made possible by widespread education and literacy, especially since the advent of the Internet. People may think that the Internet was invented for the sole purpose of advancing the civilization of the light races, as they claim. Not so. The primary purpose for the invention of the Internet was to make it possible to reach many black people here in America and the West, and to a lesser extent in Africa. The fact that mostly white people were responsible for its invention is neither here nor there. Properly speaking, the singular most important idea that finally made it possible for the Internet to take off had to do with large-scale parallel processing of data, or so-called supercomputing, and was invented by a Nigerian man. But it's not important how technology comes about. What is important is its use. It made information easily available to many black people. 113. The powers responsible for this age will use whatever means are convenient to achieve their goal. I'm speaking here of Yahweh and the Elohim. Their goal is to awaken black people from 6,000 years of slumber. In Elijah's time, such mass scale availability of information was not possible. So people of that era, generally speaking, were not as ready as people are today to know the greater truth. For that reason, Elijah held back on many things and taught in a way that made it easy for the masses to digest what he said. It's a case of feeding milk to babies, so to speak. But today, black people are far more mentally mature, thanks partly to worldwide television, radio, and the internet. As I pointed out before, all things in the world are a reflection of what is inside us. When the time is ready, we project it outward and this results in so-called modern inventions. It's not important in this respect as to who receives the inspiration to make it real. The result is the same, namely the expansion of the mind so people can understand the larger truth. And that larger truth is this. God is incarnated in you, black one. You are God incarnated as a new person. There is no truth greater than this. But Elijah could not teach this to the masses of his followers in the beginning because he was dealing with babes, as I said, who were hearing this for the first time. Them having not yet developed mental teeth, he could not feed them meat, but only milk. That's the reason he gave them a representation of God in the person of Fard Muhammad, his teacher. Who else to present as God than the man he revered the most? Now, this teaching is not a lie. Fard was conscious of his first self. Any person who comes in conscious contact with his her first self cannot help but know that he she is the incarnation of the one and only true God. But at the end of his life, Elijah began to suggest to them that the greater truth is greater than the person of Fard, and said most emphatically to them all, You are Allah. About your other posts, the ones by Mr. True Islam. These are a mixture of truths and falsehoods. As they say, Elijah Muhammad would be turning in his grave if he could see some of these quotes you put here. They carelessly mix some of his true teachings with the falsehoods of white people. These lies, notably those about Shambhala, Shangri-La, Agartha, the Masters of Destiny, Dervish Order, Lords of Souls, Godmen, the Hierarchy, the Great White Brotherhood, the Hidden Directorate, the Golden Dawn, Brahitma, the Tibetan lies coming from the monks, lamas, the Dalai Lama, the Goros or Gurus, the so-called adepts and on and on. All these falsehoods and deceptions come from the perverted imaginations of mainly two groups. Both were started thousands of years ago and survive today in a modified form under the two names of theosophists and their archenemies called Rosicrucians. The first is made up mostly of Semites and Yellow Asians. The second, Rosicrucians, is made up mostly of Caucasians. 
the so-called godmen they worship are not the 24 elders. Do you really think white men and secret societies would worship black people? These two secret societies are fighting for control of the world before the appearance of the true king of this age, Yahweh. Both groups have for millennia been preparing all this nonsensical and useless mysticism that is reflected in some of the material you cut and pasted here. They intend to prepare the world through these lies for the appearance of their false messiah, a white man part Semitic, part Caucasian, who they will claim is the expected king of the world. It's all a well-fabricated deception. I'll try and make it understandable to the layperson by going back to the very beginning of these secret societies and show how and where they originated. I'll do that in a series of posts in the near future. For now, I intend to start a discussion on the true Israelites, as this is more important. When I finish, hopefully in a few weeks, then I'll address your quotes and separate some of Elijah's teachings from the chaff mixed in with it by the people you quote such as Samuel Mathers, Manley Hall, and other deceivers who spew this kind of venom to promote their evil masters. He, or she, dies and ascends after some time. Ascending to where? All people who die ascend to the minds of the 24 elders. They are the custodians of divine unity, a state of mind that has been called eternity by some who have experienced it, and heaven by others. All personalities, without exception, ascend to this heaven when they die. Personalities cannot be destroyed. They remain in the minds of all who ever had interactions with them. You can see this for yourself from the fact that even though you no longer see some of your childhood friends, yet they remain alive in your mind because now and then you dream about them. That is how personalities are preserved forever. Now, the mind of an ordinary individual is imperfect, especially in this age when initiation rites are no longer used as public education to improve the mind. But the minds of the 24 elders remain perfect forever. Therefore they have, in their minds, all the personalities that ever lived on earth since its creation. In the same way that your dream personalities are independent and act independently in your dreams, so too do all personalities regain their independence and self-consciousness after ascending into the minds of the elders. The difference is that whereas your dreams are unconscious, the elders' heavens are not dreams at all, but a wide-awake reality much more so than this reality in which we live today. That is what ascension means. Therefore heaven exists in the minds of the 24 elders until the end of the universe, when all people will unite as one. That is the meaning of the statement that God is one. This is so only in the state of divine unity. Personally, I think anyone who bases their spirituality around race issues is lying and manipulating people. Our spirituality is not based on race. Race is incidental to it. It's like this, black people have been alive on earth and in the universe for countless trillions of years. About 6,000 years ago, the other races suddenly appeared. The vast majority of our ancestors know nothing about them. They lived at a time when there were no races. Our minds today are colored with the concept of race because we live in racial times. Imagine countless trillions of other people who lived at different times when races were entirely unknown. They were the only race on earth. But they didn't call themselves a race. How could they? The concept of race is relative and depends of the existence of the other races. If other races don't exist, and our people are the only people, how could they even conceive of the idea of race? The knowledge of our ancestors, our spirituality, comes from far, far distant times, so far that it's impossible for people to comprehend just how ancient it is. This knowledge is set in stone, so to speak. It's like a wise old man who is set in his ways. It cannot be changed by something as temporary as race, which has a lifespan of only 7,000 years. Such a short span is nothing compared to the 78 trillion years of our Earth's history. To say that our spirituality, our knowledge, is based on race is to have a short-sighted view of our true history. If you could only see the panorama of our history laid out in front of you the way it appears to me, then you'd see clearly that this racial period we live in is so short as to be insignificant. It counts for nothing in the larger scheme of our knowledge. When I stress repeatedly that God is black, this is not a racial statement, 
It's a statement designed to try and awaken people to the fact that from the eternal point of view, or even from the point of view of 78 trillion years of our Earth's history, black people are the only people there are. The other races will pass just as surely as many other species have come and gone on Earth. They'll go the way of the ancient dinosaurs. But black people will always be here, as we've been since the beginning. The reason God is black is because the black color contains all other colors in itself. It's the only one like that. God needs all the colors inside the black germ to give color to plants and animals and all of nature. This is a purely natural fact, not at all racial. There's no way to say this today without sounding racist, even though that's not the intent. But be that as it may, I have just spent an hour and a half reading this post. Very interesting, but has many similarities between different teachings of 5% heirs, NOI, and the House of David. All of which has no real true evidential basis or truth in though. Another question is why these sciences were lost for so many centuries and only now the truth has only emerged in the last couple of decades? If all the sciences were true, why is it that black people are in the situation they are in now? Why are they not the kings and queens as the sciences predict they would be? I'm sorry if I am being pessimistic about all this, but it just seems to me this black root science has just been made up using a mixed mash of different ed legends and stories from the Middle East and Bible slash Quran slash Torah. I just wonder why, if this was all true, why the lighter skinned races slash non-black races are more populous than the black race. As India and China already are two-sixths of the world population. Like I said, just my opinion. Yes, there's similarity to 5% and NOI, the NOI of Elijah Muhammad, not the modern version. The reason is because what Elijah taught is the best approximation of the truth ever revealed in America. 5% is also on target as an evolution of Elijah's teachings. They've taken it to a higher level by teaching that every black man is God, not just Fard Muhammad. Where they make a mistake is by saying the black woman is less than the man. The truth is that the woman is the man's complement, just as the man is her complement. Neither one is complete without the other. 136. Other than that, 5% is by far the most advanced system of truth since the death of Elijah. You make the mistake made by most learned black people when you seek intellectual evidence. The only true evidence of anything is direct personal experience. Whatever other evidence one can find, can be turned upside down by anyone with a clever mind for debating. So external evidence cannot replace direct experience as the final arbiter and judge of the truth. How does one get direct experience of spiritual matters? There are different ways. The best way is by listening to your conscience, the voice of your higher self. He, she is the only one who knows the full truth. You can practice listening to your higher self by doing the mental exercise I gave before. Diligent practice will eventually answer your quest for real evidence. On the question of why it took 6,000 years for this knowledge to surface, that's not really accurate. The knowledge has been revealed six times before Elijah, about once every 1,000 years. But because the devils rule the world, they corrupt it, challenge it, call it lies, denigrate it, and do everything they can to turn black people away from it. So every time it has to be revealed anew, as Elijah has done. It must be that way because it's the devil's destiny to rule the world for 6,000 years. This is preordained and written in stone by the elders, whose will is the will of the B8M original gods. Therefore black people had to be oppressed for 6,000 years to fulfill the destiny. We chose for it to be like that for the sake of experience. The fact that what I say in my lessons contains legends from other people and ancient scripts should not be a reason to reject it. That logic would have us rejecting mathematical truths, for example, simply because someone else mentioned them before us. Obviously, this is faulty logic. Don't reject it because you've heard it before, or because someone said it before me. Reject it only if your conscience tells you it's untrue. I'm considered by my teachers, my elders, to be an unsurpassed summator of facts. I have a natural ability to collect disparate facts and bring them together to illustrate a higher truth. This is not self-praise. I was trained that way since childhood because of a natural talent that those who know recognized in me. 
Now, I could have tried to teach these lessons the way they are taught in Africa. But that would have required that I define many new concepts that are totally foreign to the Western minds of our people here. Such a task would be beyond my means. And even then, it's doubtful if there would be any real understanding. As it is, Elijah laid a solid foundation, and I use it to advantage. And why not? Some call this stealing, lying, etc. They use the white man's standards and method, which lay claim to the truth as intellectual property. In my culture we know that truth belongs to no one person. Anyone who speaks the truth does so by inspiration, and should thank God for it, meaning the higher self. White people, lacking a higher self, claim the truth as personal property. This is an affront to God even to their collective mind, the mind of Yahweh. The divine unity we call God is the only true owner of the truth, which is like sunlight. It does not belong to any one person. So if this is stealing, then I'm happy to steal anything and everything that I can use to cause the light to shine in our people the way it was caused to shine in me. The light of truth cannot be held back. It must be shared. When enough people receive it, a minimum of 144,000, then the present cycle will end along with the rule of the non-blacks and all our suffering. Where they make a mistake is by saying the black woman is less than the man. Won't you, please, provide proof? The 5% is also called the nation of gods and earths. They teach that the man is God and the woman is earth. To the common sense, earth is less than God, therefore they imply that women are less than men. The fact that women have different roles than men does not imply superiority. This is good then. If they mean that men and women are equal in spirit and only different in roles, then I applaud them. So external evidence cannot replace direct experience as the final arbiter and judge of the truth. But, what if no direct experience is to be had? What then? One keeps practicing until communion with the self is achieved. That will provide direct experience. That's what our ritual system of education is for. But for those now divorced from rituals, there are other spiritual exercises, such as the one I gave. In the case of historical matters, what you suggest is not relevant. Sure it is. All things come from the mind or spirit and can be investigated without regard to artificial classifications such as historical. The mind makes no such distinctions. The only requirement is for one to make contact with the first self who then takes care of it. So, are you suggesting by mere meditation I may divine events of the past? Definitely not. The idea is to make contact with the first self. Simply meditating won't do it. After contact, there is no divining involved. The first self has experienced all and can lead you to any part of it. Shall the first self inform me there was WWI and World War II? Of course. God can inform you on any topic whatsoever. Endrig. I have been checking out your posts for some time now and I have a few questions for you, if you don't mind. So this is what you come up with to answer the reasons for all of the horrible things that white folks do to black people? What difference does any of it make if you are not aware of it? Like you saying we are really some gods reincarnated? Anybody could say whatever if they expect someone to believe something that happened before they were born? Or if it happened after they were dead? How could we ever know? How does this info supposed to help us deal with all the madness going on now? So is this the same as what the Christians say about suffer here on earth and get your rewards in some far off place called heaven after you die? I mean what you say sounds nice and encouraging. Maybe that's your purpose with all this, is for us to feel as though there will be something for us because we have to deal with all this craziness. Hopefully, you'll let me know something. The fact that we black people are gods is not a feel-good thing, neither is it a religion or a delayed promise that cannot be realized until we reach heaven. It's an absolute reality. It's the most real and true thing in the whole universe. Try and imagine God forgetting who he she is. That's the situation we are in today and have been for 6,000 years. I assure you that this is a condition we chose to experience, regardless of how else it seems in our daily lives. What causes most of our suffering is not the actual acts of evil that never seem to stop coming our way. 
It's really caused by the fact that we have forgotten who we are. If we could remember, and genuinely so, the suffering would only amount to experiences that we can take in stride, never missing a beat. But I admit this is hard to do. For now, does it not make sense for us to learn as much as we can about who we are, how we came to be in this situation, and what is to be the end result of it? It may cause intense emotional pain at first to learn that, at a deeper level, God caused his her own suffering. But isn't this knowledge more empowering than to believe we are at the mercy of whites and they have more power than we? That's my purpose, to remind black people that we are the architects of our own experiences. We are not under the mercy of anyone or anything. There is no being or thing more powerful than you. These should be empowering words, my sister. This power belongs to you and is still in you, even though you have forgotten it. With regard to melanin and natural morality, many blacks participate in this day and age, in the West, perhaps other places, in many forms of immorality, watching porn, adultery, lying, same-sex activities, murder, stealing, etc., and are in possession of large quantities of melanin, at the same time, let's just say hypothetically, since I can't necessarily give any definite examples, some, probably very few, whites do not participate in such activities and live a pretty moral life. 168. If whites are naturally evil because of the absence of the brown germ, which I believe is true by the way, what is the difference between blacks committing various perversions slash so-called sinful behavior and whites committing the same? Are there different consequences for the two, and if there are or aren't, what are the unlimited consequences of a sinful life i.e. watching porn, premarital sex, adultery, etc. in terms of what happens to us after we leave this plane to join the 24 elders slash go to the various planes within the mind of God? Basically, do black sinners slash participants in morality go to hell with white people or is hell a myth? Will there be a judgment of the non-believers? What is a believer defined as? Please explain. Black people made a decision when they created the universe that part of its purpose would be to manifest what we call evil. To do this, the gods decided to make a man in our image who would be evil by nature. In addition, they deteriorated their bodies to the state that we are in today. The light-skinned races, called devils in ancient scriptures, were made 6,000 years ago from these bodies by the process I've outlined before. Prior to that time, evil was impossible to manifest on earth. For evil to appear, there must be self-forgetfulness. So black people brought themselves into a state of deep self-forgetfulness, and from that state of ignorance, they made the devils. Still, the black people who made them could not originate evil by themselves. Even though they were in a deep state of self-forgetfulness even as we are today, they were not evil by nature. Evil acts can only be originated by people who are evil by nature because of the way they were made, by removing the black germ, the seat of morality. Black people still have the black germ, even in our state of complete self-forgetfulness. Now, evil started to manifest on earth as soon as the devils were born. They took their evil acts, perversions, and deceptions into the peaceful societies of our ancestors of that time. Over a period of many centuries, and eventually many millennia, they managed to corrupt those black people to such an extent that they too began to act in evil ways. This was possible because of our state of self-forgetfulness. In that state an influential, evil person can cause a peaceful person to imitate him. This is a universal occurrence that can be observed even today. Look at any African or other indigenous society before contact with the West, then look at them again after such contact. More often than not, you'll soon see our people beginning to imitate the evil behavior of non-blacks. Women who were upright and decent soon begin to imitate the indecency of white women. They're forced into this behavior when they notice that their men are attracted to such indecent light women. So they imitate these women to try and regain their men's attention. Why are some black men attracted to the indecency and immorality exhibited by these immoral light race women? Because they, in turn, are imitating white men who are naturally attracted to such indecency. Black men who fall into this trap believe they can become powerful and influential like white men if they can be seen with the kind of women that white men find attractive. Soon it becomes a domino effect. 
Other black people begin to imitate their westernized brothers and sisters, and before long, entire societies are changed and corrupted. Where before there was peace, there is now jealousies, violence, fornication, homosexuality, and every other foul, evil act imaginable. Black people, being naturally more imaginative than the light races, will even take their imitation of evil behavior to an extreme, outdoing the mothers and fathers of evil themselves, in which case you'll hear the devil say, see, black people are naturally more evil than we are exactly as they are saying today about the behavior of some black people caught in the desperate devastation of New Orleans. Imitation caused by deception is the main cause of sin among black people. But it leads to secondary causes such as vengeance, resentment, frustration, feeling slighted, oppressed, abused, or taken advantage of. But think back to the original cause and ask yourself. Were there murders, rapes, fornications, deceptions, and other full-scale evil acts among black societies before the appearance of non-blacks? The answer is an emphatic no. You can confirm this for yourself by reading the writings of the whites themselves. There are white and Arab travelers who have written about black societies in Africa during the Middle Ages and before. They were all unfailingly impressed by the high morality of our ancestors. Some of them admit that only after contact with non-blacks did black societies lose their naturally high moral standards. So now here we are 6,000 years later. We have arrived at a time when all evil that has overtaken the world must be reversed in order to restore nature's balance. This means the devils and their descendants must reverse the harm of every single evil act or thought they've ever had in the last 6,000 years. The world will not regain its full and perfect balance until those who caused it through their actions and thoughts have corrected every single imbalance, no matter how large or small. To properly correct anything, the only correct way is to go to the first cause. The punishment of evildoers is nature's job. Nature's laws are impersonal. Nature only looks at the first cause and goes directly to it. So the question becomes, what is the cause of the evil acts performed by black people? 183. The undeniable, demonstrable, and easily verifiable fact is that black people did not know evil until it was introduced to them by non-blacks. If a child imitates the evil acts of his or her parents, who is to blame? If the child gets into the habit of evil acts because of the imitation and grows into an adult evildoer, who is to blame? In both cases, the parents are to blame. Even after he, she has become an adult. One may make a logical analysis and conclude that as an adult, he, she should know right from wrong. That's true, but easier said than done. It's difficult to reverse years of habitual behavior, especially if the habits were inculcated in childhood. Those are the hardest to erase or correct, especially in non-supportive communities such as today's. Now, I'm not implying that black people are children. On the contrary, we are infinitely more ancient than the non-blacks. But our state of self-forgetfulness has put us in a vulnerable position as a people where we are easily influenced by the appearance of false power. The devils, especially whites, appear to us to have a lot of power. The average black person, mired as we are in lack of knowledge of self, is easily influenced by this apparent power. That's the reason why some so-called progressive blacks want to assimilate and integrate with their very enemies. They're blinded by the false, artificial power wielded by whites. As far as nature is concerned, temporary, artificial causes of evil such as imitation do not count. Nature strips all false appearances and facades and goes straight to the roots, and she says, who caused the imbalance in me? The devils did. So I'll punish and remove them, and that will be that. 187. Nature cannot be distracted by any detours, deceptions, logical explanations, or machinations of any kind that try to make her look away from first causes. She looks straight at it and removes it without hesitation or regret. 188. So the ultimate answer to your question of whether black people will be punished for their sins by being sent to hell is simply no. The great judge will simply overlook them in her direct march to the cause of their behavior, which is as clear to her as the sun shines. In Yahweh's heavens, such punishment is self-imposed as part of natural law. People there will be in a state of mind where nothing can be hidden. 
All their intentions and those of their forefathers will be clearly visible to everyone. Their evil natures will be totally exposed. Their natures will compel them to place themselves in the appropriate sections of heaven. Some of these sections are occupied by such foul and debased people that they are called hell. As I mentioned before, the heavens of Yahweh range from the lowest and most foul to the highest and most glorious. The hellish conditions in the lowest of these heavens are so severe that most of the inhabitants have very little chance of accepting salvation and everlasting life. Many of them will perish and die the second and final death, from which there is no resurrection. 190. Please think about these words, brother, and see whether or not there is truth in them that explains why some black people commit sins, and why they cannot possibly be punished by being sent to hell along with the rest by the wise and fair judge who knows the true causes of all things. I wanted to ask you a few questions, if that's cool. I was wondering about the white folks, and their purpose. If their purpose is to show the evil side of God, or the self-forgetfulness, why do black people need to be here? And how can black people be self-forgetful, and not be evil as well, being that you use both words to mean the same thing? Are black people evil in this cycle, being that they have self-forgetfulness? I recall that you said that if someone dilute the black race on purpose that they shall be punished, and on another post someone asked you if blacks committed sinful acts will they be punished, and this is what you said. Please think about these words, brother, and see whether or not there is truth in them that explains why some black people commit sins, and why they cannot possibly be punished by being sent to hell along with the rest by the wise and fair judge who knows the true causes of all things. Is there a difference? If being evil is their nature, whites, then how can they repent, being that that is the whole purpose of their creation? Is that not familiar to a tiger apologizing for its stripes and blaming a lion for eating antelopes? Wouldn't that just be the way they were made? Wouldn't it make more sense for the whites to live out their purpose and then it ends and they just disappear, being that you said that they were not here prior to 6,000 years ago? You make it seem as if white folks have a choice about their lack of morality, like they can change that they were born absence of the black germ. If it is true that white folks are here for the purpose in which you state, wouldn't there be enough needed to experience self-forgetfulness? Once again, I don't understand why black people have to be here and live in the same state that white folks are, in a state of self-forgetfulness, or evil, since we are the ones that created them. Why do we have to live among them? I hope these questions that I have asked make sense, it kinda sounds like I'm rambling, so I will stop here, and hope that you get what I'm asking. Thank you again. I get the sense that your most pertinent question is why black people have to be here for this evil experience, since we already created whites for that purpose. So I'll answer it last. First then, your question is, how can black people be self-forgetful and not be evil, given that evil and self-forgetfulness mean one and the same thing? Black people can be evil. By evil we mean doing evil acts. We do them, as you well know. Black people commit murders, rape, steal, etc. So we can be, and are, evil just like the non-blacks. But we cannot be punished for it. It's impossible. When I said that the light races will be punished by being sent to hell, I was oversimplifying. In truth, no one is sent to hell. All who go there send themselves. They are irresistibly drawn there by their nature. After people ascend to the mental realms, their true natures become exposed. This applies to all people, black and non-black. When you are in that state, you can see a person's true nature as plainly as you see the clothes you are wearing. The person's body is deformed in such a way as to expose every part of his her nature. If the person has a good nature, or has learned to be moral, the body is transformed accordingly, so that you can read slash see slash smell slash hear their true nature simply by being in their presence. That's what compels them to go to that part of the mental realm that's suitable for their nature. So the grossly evil will be among their kind, and their environment will reflect their community, and they will act accordingly, torturing, maiming, and trying to kill each other for as long as they remain there. Those who survive and receive the light of forgiveness that is constantly cast by their God into those places will be able to depart of their own free will and ascend to better heavens. 
after a certain period that will seem like an eternity to the inhabitants, but is only one thousand years of earthly time, the hellish realms will be destroyed along with those who remain in them. That's the second death, the final punishment. Now, the nature of a person is not something that can be obtained by imitation. It's either their nature or it's not. A tiger cannot become an antelope by imitation, even if it eats nothing but grass. It's still a tiger according to its nature. Similarly, black people have become evil by 6,000 years worth of imitation. But that is not our true nature. As soon as the causes and conditions leading to such imitative behavior are removed, black people return to their true nature, which is good. That's what happens in the mental realms. Not only are the physical circumstances leading to evil behavior removed, such as poverty, sickness, etc., but psychological factors are also removed, such as vengeance, being slighted, abused, exploited, oppressed, etc. All these physical and psychological factors are the handles by which evil latches onto us and causes some of us to commit evil acts. But they are not part of our nature. Study the old histories of our people and you'll discover that our societies did not have these conditions, including physical ones such as poverty and most diseases. They were introduced into our communities by outsiders. In heaven where such conditions are absent, the causes of evil among black people also become absent, and we revert back to our base nature, which is good. So we cannot be compelled to hellish realms by a nature that is not genuinely ours. The opposite is true for non-blacks. They also revert to their base nature, which is evil. But here's something interesting. Non-blacks, even though they are evil by nature, do not have to commit evil acts. Nothing compels them to commit these acts. This may sound like a contradiction, but remember, they are free will people, not animals. Animals cannot resist their true nature, but people can because they have will power, which animals do not. Even so, the likelihood is that when given half a chance, they'll be evil rather than good. But they don't have to be. That's why there are whites that appear to be moral. They become so by learning the moral behavior of other people. Their second lesson in this was given to them ages ago by Moses, who taught them civility after they had forgotten Yahweh's first teachings. Since then, a small percentage of them have kept a reasonable modicum of civility and moral behavior, and made it available to the rest of their races to copy. It's those non-blacks who will eventually accept the mercy of everlasting life, and ascend to Yahweh's endless higher heavens. On the punishment of black people who dilute our race by marrying non-blacks, their punishment will come in the form of them losing their lineages of descendants. There will come a time when such light-skinned blacks are no longer able to procreate, as will non-blacks. Black people pride themselves and their descendants almost as much as some of us revere our ancestors. To have our line of descendants die out is punishment enough, they will certainly not be sent to hell. Would it not make more sense for whites to just disappear after this cycle? Definitely. That's exactly what will happen. After this 7,000 year period, 6,000 years plus 1,000 years of peace, there will not be a single non-black left on earth. They will live only in Yahweh's mind, in his heavens. You never ever have to see them again. You are not part of Yahweh's mind. You are your own God, one of the B8M. You don't have to see Yahweh's creatures again if you don't want to, just as no one has to see your own creatures either, of which you have many in that part of your mind reserved for them. Now, on to the important question of why are we here among whites. 2.16, the answer is simply, to experience evil. We cannot experience it unless we are here physically. I have stated previously that all their experiences will become our experiences because of our coming divine unity with Yahweh and his soul mate. But that is divine experience. It's not the same as universal experience. The state of divine unity is impossible to describe. It's totally unlike anything known in the universe. It's as different as sound is different than color. Both realities, universal reality and divine reality, are necessary for God to complete the creation. So we are here to experience and witness self-forgetfulness firsthand. There is no other way to gain the experience except by actually living it. Let me know if there are some points still unclear. 
I know that you have been answering so many questions about so many things. I have been feeling extremely uplifted by your wisdom. I truly anticipate more. I would like to ask you a question. It relates to the recent tragedies in New Orleans and the other torn areas. There is so many black people dying and suffering. Is this one of the ways that are planned for the end of this cycle? Don't know if you have answered this before. Usually, during a major tragedy like this and 9-11, as well as other weather disasters, I often feel like it is near the end of the world, and the only thing that lies ahead is tragedy and despair. But, since I have been led to your writings of wisdom, I don't feel as hopeless. I still wonder about life and the future of it as it pertains to black people. You're absolutely right in your feeling that these catastrophes signal the end of the white world. We are in a period of seven years of major catastrophes. It started two years ago with a major earthquake that hit Iran in December 2003, killing many thousands. That catastrophe signaled the beginning of ever stronger disasters that will occur worldwide. Each one will be stronger than the last in its power to disrupt modern society until all of it finally crumbles. In addition, there will be man-made disasters, wars, and diseases. The next five years are going to see an unprecedented depopulation of the Earth. When it's all over, only about one-third of the Earth's population will be left alive. Unfortunately, many black people are going to suffer in these disasters. Whites deliberately distribute the populations of their cities in such a way that they are able to barricade themselves behind black people in case disaster strikes, forcing them to take the full brunt of it. Using economic pressure, they force black people into areas that are the most vulnerable to natural and man-made disasters. New Orleans is a good example of this. Black people of that city have been forced into the low-lying areas, which the city planners knew would be the first to be flooded in case the lake or river burst its banks. Also in every major city all over the world, black people are economically forced into areas surrounded by toxic wastes, sewage plants, trash dumps, eroded land, and so on. Thus when disaster strikes, they are most often the first and worst to suffer. This tragic event in New Orleans and other Gulf areas is a wake-up call to all black people who still love and cherish our enemies. It'll force them to ask themselves why it is that when a natural or other kind of major disaster strikes, black people suffer the worst. Even the most progressive, assimilation-preaching, integration-loving blacks will be forced to stop and admit that perhaps there is a deliberate design by white people to put black people in harm's way whenever they can. Not only that, but the lack of pre-planning to provide support is stark and obvious in this case. It was known at least three days in advance where in Louisiana the hurricane would hit and what its strength would be. Engineers also calculated that there was a likelihood of over 75% that lake barriers and levees could not hold back the force of such a powerful hurricane. Yet there was no pre-planning to have dozens of buses standing by ready to evaluate the poor residents who have no other means of transportation. If that city had been 67% white instead of black, you know the planning would have been different. All this points to a lack of caring. Look how sluggish the reaction was. This clearly demonstrates these people have absolutely no love for black people. Today the hypocrites among them are screaming loud, criticizing as if they care and would have handled the situation better. All they really care about is driving a stake in the hearts of their opponents so they can take over power. They have just as little concern for black people, they're only interested in upsetting the present powers and taking over. Any black person who still has love and sympathy for whites is now being forced to stop and reconsider, whether they like it or not. The true nature of these people is being revealed right before our eyes. Even the most blind and deceived among our people cannot help but rethink how the situation really is between us and them. There is a separation coming between us and them. Those among our people who have already seen the light know that such a separation is inevitable. Those who still stubbornly cling to them will be torn away by force of circumstances. Whites are trying to insulate themselves by placing blacks in front of them as their shields, but sooner or later the disasters will reach them and hit them the hardest. The king of the earth knows what he is doing. When it's all over, they'll all be down on their knees, trembling before his might and glory. Endrig. 
What about biracial people? Are they considered black? If so, how is it that it that it took so many generations to remove the black germ, but only one generation to make it reappear? Also on here you said whites would have to intermarry and their descendants would have to do the same until they became black. So how could a child that has one black parent and one white parent be black? Children of black slash white parents are black, as I've stated. And yes, it takes one generation to put back the black germ, but seven to remove it. In genetics as it is in mathematics, seven is the number of completion. The reason it takes only one generation to make a person black again is nature's genetic safety mechanism to guarantee that the black race will never become bleached out of existence. It should not come as a surprise that nature favors the black race over all others. We were the first, and all firstborns are favored over the rest. Now, it takes seven generations to remove it only from purely black people. When the first light race was made, the makers started with purely black people, as we were the only people on earth then. They bred them lighter and lighter for 200 years, or seven generations, until the germ was completely removed. Before the complete removal in the seventh, it was progressively weakened for six generations. Those sixth generation people were still black, they still had the black germ, no matter how attenuated. God incarnated in them because all he she needs is the slightest presence of it. Such people are in somewhat the same state as albinos. In order for them to successfully complete our ritual education, they have to take part in special rituals designed for them. This makes it hard, almost impossible, for them to succeed. So as a general rule, mulattoes and albinos do not take part in our higher initiations. There have been rare exceptions, one such as Fard Muhammad, a mulatto who underwent severe trials and came out successfully. So it's not impossible, but extremely difficult, to the point where death may result. White people who want to be grafted back into the black nation have to go back several generations before their progeny can be fit to take part in our system of education and be considered truly black. 233. To summarize, a biracial child with a black parent is black because he she has the throne of God for God to incarnate. But to be considered for our system of ritual education, he she has to be grafted back another three or four generations. Only then is she considered black enough to take part. Those biracial slash mulattoes slash albinos etc. who die and ascend will have all the non-black blood removed from them. In the mental realms, non-black genes are considered as dross and are removed by a spiritual fire along with all the physical and psychological imperfections, such as deformities and madness, etc. They are purified until only their pristine blackness is left in its purity. That becomes the foundation upon which their ritual education begins. I am very intrigued by the things you are saying. Will there be more? Most definitely. That's great because you seem to have awakened the truth seeker in me. Your words were the stepping stone I needed to validate the path I am already on. Truth is. P.S. Will you address the melanin issue? Here's a short response I made before on melanin in response to a question from another brother. The condition for our incarnation in a human body is the presence of what is called the black germ. Every black person has two procreative germs or genes. The first is dark and dominant. The second is light and recessive. It's possible to suppress the dark germ such that the light one becomes dominant, in which case a light-skinned person is born. When this happens accidentally or in an uncontrolled manner, the resulting child is a black albino. Such a person still has a dark germ, but it's suppressed at conception. It's possible to completely remove the dark germ by selective breeding. It's natural for a black person who is a shade lighter to be born to two purely black parents because of the presence of the recessive light gene. Such people can be selectively bred with each other to produce a whole group of a shade lighter black people. This can be repeated over many generations until the dark gene is completely removed. When this is achieved, the dark gene is not suppressed, but is completely absent. This genetic situation cannot be reversed except by interbreeding again with black people. This type of genetic removal of the black gene by selective breeding happened 6,000 years ago and resulted in the birth of the first light race.
It took exactly seven generations of selective breeding to completely remove the dark germ to make the first light race. Three more races were made in the same way from the first race, the final one being Caucasians. They are the last stage of this type of genetic bleaching. Now in the same way that the ocean bleaches soil and removes its value, turning it into lifeless beach sand, and the way sugar is turned valueless by bleaching it white, so too does genetic bleaching remove human value, or natural morality. The B8M gods cannot incarnate in the bodies of the four light races due to this absence of the dark gene, which is the source of what modern scientists call melanin. Melanin is the seat of morality. Without it, God has no throne on which to be seated in the human body. Whenever any person of the light-skinned races interbreeds with a black person, even a sixth-generation melanin-deficient black, their child regains the seed of morality or melanin and God can incarnate as ancestral memory in that child. That child is then called black. If that child grows into adulthood and breeds with a non-black, he, she reaches the seventh stage of total melanin absence in the born child, and their child is non-black. That's how a black person is defined genetically. Now ancestral memory on the other hand does not follow biological lineage. It is not handed down from generation to generation. It's a gift of incarnation that enters the child's mind at conception. The gods choose where they incarnate and do not necessarily follow biological lineage. In other words, the original god, you for example, can incarnate as a black person in England. After that person dies, the same god can then incarnate in a newborn black person in America who is biologically unrelated to the first. The British black person who died is the true ancestor of the newborn American, even though they are biologically unrelated. Thus all your true ancestors are the previous incarnations of the first self in you going all the way back to the beginning of the universe. In the case of the light races, the incarnating ancestral memory only goes back 6,000 years, because they did not exist as a people prior to then. The eternal gods cannot incarnate in them due to the absence of the seed of morality, which is the black germ. Intrigue, I'm finding all this deep black science v. interesting. Where are your sources? Also, would you say that science today is backward, slow? Science today is backward in more ways than one. It's backward in the sense of slow, but more importantly it's the opposite of true science in many ways. For instance, the entire story of evolution of people from animals is the opposite of the truth. So too are their teachings in many other disciplines. True science is taught in rituals designed for them, and is related to life. It cannot be learned intellectually as modern scientists try to do. It's a matter of direct experience, as is all true learning. We are taught that to know is to be. In other words, to truly know a thing is to be that thing. This includes so-called abstract concepts of science. Even abstract concepts have a concrete reality when one enters the proper state of mind. Feeling the posts 100% as they are. I was not at all surprised that women were chiefs. I was, however, surprised at the phrase his wife when they were each other's compliments. Also surprised at God as he. God, consciousness, created slash became slash manifested she and he and therefore could not have been exclusively he nor she. Otherwise, thank you for aiding us to remember ourselves. Incidentally, what of the Ozit slash Ozar metaphorian in Blackroot science? Is it, like number 144? Also, what of the number 9? A secondary number? 144 is equal to 9, 144,000 is equal to 9, 1b8m equals 9. Another thing, are the boy and girl soulmate necessarily born at the same time? I use he for God only for convenience. God is both he and she. In my language we have only one word. O, oh, for both he and she. It applies to God, as he, she is before separating into man and woman. So this is a problem of English and not of our ancient language. The wife and husband part is because they were really married. Marriage is a sacred, eternal institution and the basis for raising children. It has been perverted by the light races, but it's still divine in its original form. 
Soulmates are not born at exactly the same time. They can be born at about the same time, but mostly they're separated by a few years. Before separation they exist in a state of divine unity where there is no time. So the few years of separation between their births appears only as a moment to the mate who is born later. The number nine is important in true astrology. Modern astrology is a false science because it takes the birth of a person as the basis for considering planetary alignments. In true astrology only the alignment that occurs at conception is considered as influential. So nine becomes important as it takes nine months from conception to birth, therefore one has to calculate nine months back and study the constellation as it was at that time. But it's not one of the seven primary numbers. Those have to do only with the division of God from one to the multitudes of black people in the universe. As for the legends of Azar slash Ozit, these and many other such legends are teaching aids. They are mythologies used in mystery schools to teach about the activities that took place 6,000 years ago that led to the appearance of the light skin races. I've just been reading some of your teachings on Desti and after reading it, decided to go your website to find out more. I have to tell you, I wanted to cry when I read that the Messiah is a black man with all his angel included. I immediately felt imbued with renewed and increased strength in myself and pride and in my people. It was like visiting the neighborhood I lived in as a child. It all makes so much perfect sense, it all falls into place so neatly. I was brought up a Catholic and I always got the sense that I was hated ever since I was a little child by both clergy and laity alike, who were all white, or as you put it, light-skinned. Whenever we, my family, turned up for church, the resentment stirring within the congregational flock just beneath the surface was palpable and I was extremely aware of what I recognized as a depressive evil uneasiness inherent in the service. I left the church at the age of 15 against my father's wishes but I refused to go anymore, I knew something was wrong it did not feel right to me, I did not belong there. It was like I sensed a grain of truth in the message, but it was obscure and deformed, and not meant for me. I have felt the same way with every denomination of the Christian faith that I have briefly adhered to, I felt like an outsider. But when I began to read your teachings, the nature and history of the universe, something jumped in me, even before you discussed black people's place in and outside of it, it was exciting and new, yet familiar. 263. I have read about European secret societies such as the Rosicrucians, the Knights of Malta etc., and I know that they are behind some, if not all, the atrocities that are occurring and have occurred in Africa. Not to mention the theosophical influences of the European elite during the first half of the 20th century that led to a world war. What can I say? It makes all the sense in the world, my heart leaps when I think about it the Messiah is black and not only that, but I, as a black man, am a brother to him, literally. Please excuse my long email, but may I ask you a question? Some black people, at times, have not behaved in a morally appropriate manner that befits who slash what it is they really are, myself, I'm only just finding out, I would never have dared to believe that I am, we, all black people together, are God. As I have said, I have read what you posted thus far on Desti, and as I understand it, these black people will be able to redeem themselves through initiation rites, and once more achieve full God status, perfection. Am I correct? The reason I ask is, you refer to the light skin races as inherently evil, or in a state of self-forgetfulness. Black people can do, and have done, evil too. I just want to know what the difference is. Again thank you for sharing your teachings, and anything you can say to shed light on the question I just asked will be greatly appreciated. My apologies brother, but can I ask a second question? If there are some among the light-skinned peoples of the earth that know the truth, wouldn't they be doing their utmost to ensure this information does not reach the ears and eyes of black people? 269. The thought of losing control would drive them insane, if they're not there already. They would do anything to prevent what you describe as having to happen, including nuking the planet out of existence if all else failed. Wouldn't you be in some sort of danger? Or at the very least, wouldn't your information be in danger of being taken offline? Thank you. It's a great pleasure to meet you. I'll answer your second email first. 
There is indeed the danger you mention, and others as well that you can imagine. But it's like this. Their time is up. They were given 6,000 years to rule the earth. This ended in 1914, then they were given 100 years of mercy to reform themselves. The vast majority of them have turned their back in pride. What has to happen will happen. There's nothing they can do to stop it. It's now way beyond their means to control. Stopping me and others who are coming to teach along with me will not do it. The stage is already set and all the powerful players are in position. Now it's just a matter of time. About your first question of whether black people are evil as well, since we too commit crimes, murders and so on. I've been asked this question many times. I'll compile the answer that I gave before to others and send it to you, hopefully it'll clarify that. These black people will be able to redeem themselves through initiation rites, and once more achieve full God status perfection. Am I correct? That's correct. Thank you for the clarification brother. What you have said sounds very reasonable to me when L factor in my own personal, predominantly unpleasant, experiences with these creatures. My whole life gives authority to what you've said in my mind. 275. Compound that with the historical and contemporary facts of our collective experience and your teachings resonate powerfully with a truth that's hard to objectively deny. Keep up the good work. Peace and good health to you. I know your time is precious and you are a busy man, but another question popped into my head while meditating on what I have read on your website so far. Perhaps I should wait a while for all the questions to form in my mind then send them in one go, but again that would use up some more of your time. Then again, I'll probably have more questions after that. I am of full African ancestry, but what about when someone is of part African descent? I mean, you say black people together are God, is there a definition of what exactly constitutes a black person in terms of one's level of genetic mixing with the blood of the non-black races? To make myself clearer, do mulattoes qualify as black people, or, because of their genetic contamination, are they considered light-skinned, or devils? Will they spend eternity working to better their moral character, if they so choose, but never achieving perfection, in the heavenly realms of Yahweh? or are they destined for godhood like blacks? Or is it a matter of where their individual heads are at? Thank you for your time. Reading some more of your site just now, I came across the answer to my most recent question about who is black. If I have any more questions, I hope I can ask freely without taxing you too much. Feel free, my brother, to ask whenever you have a question. I'm glad you found the answer to your last one. Book Roots. I'm reading your updates at the GeoCities site. Couple of questions for you. When you're paying homage, libation, etc. to the ancestors, you're actually summoning your own personalities not separate beings? 284. How could biological lineage not play a part in the reincarnation of the B8M? The child would have to be black right? Is meditation useful to one of the B8M in accessing their inner guide, or is this a tool more useful for non-blacks? What tools are useful for the B8M stationed on this plane? How could there really be a concept of sin or evil if the god slash desses created the light race beings to do exactly what they are doing to the B8M now? This does not make a lot of sense to me. It's sort of like punishing a dog for barking, if it's a quality that was created as part of that being, how can that being face justice or suffer for what's being done? When you're paying homage, libation, etc. You are summoning your first self. Your first self is responsible for your very existence. It's through him, her that you even exist as a person. The same is true of all other persons that have died, our ancestors. They, and you, are all personalities of the first self. But the first self is you. Self-forgetfulness or evil for us means forgetting this. The knowledge will again become a reality at the time of divine unity with the original self. So to speak in absolute terms, you are summoning yourself. That is the highest truth, than which there's none higher. When you pray to your biological ancestors, true, they are separate beings in that they are separate gods among the B8M. But since all the gods live in permanent unity, 
the result is the same. Because most people don't know the difference between spiritual and biological ancestors, they go in a roundabout way, focusing on that which they know. And yes, the child must be black because God incarnates only in black people. Read the question following the section on reincarnation, where I answered a similar question. Meditation as described by white people is not the best way to reach the self, although it doesn't do harm if that's the purpose. It's more useful for non-blacks because it was originally designed for people with a group consciousness, or a collective, as a way to reach the mind of Yahweh and the Elohim. For black people the technique I described earlier works better, as it is personal and direct. Sin or evil, practically speaking, means imbalance. When people commit a sin, they cause an imbalance in nature. To restore it, nature punishes those responsible. In truth, they punish themselves. In their true nature, everybody is aware of the contrast between good and evil. So when a person's true nature is revealed to themselves, as happens in the mental realms, they cannot help but punish themselves for their own sins. Nature overwhelms them in its work of restoring balance. If their evil nature stubbornly stands in the way, natural law destroys them the same way hurricanes destroy those who stand in their path. But in the mental realms, it's not a matter of accidentally being in the way of disaster. It's a question of one's actions being deliberately contrary to natural laws. If such a person refuses to repent, then he, she is destroyed. If he accepts repentance, then his evil nature will be transformed by education, the same way you can teach a dog not to bark. The fact that we created these people to be evil by nature does not make us responsible for their actions. They have complete free will. Being evil by nature doesn't mean they have to act it out. If that were the case, there wouldn't be a single moral white person. But you know that's not so. Morality can be learned, if the person is willing. They are evil by nature because we made them that way, but they do evil acts because they choose to. Unlike animals, they have the willpower to abstain from evil acts. When they don't, they guarantee their own punishment. Book Roots Something else, you mentioned a series of rites that blacks used to drastically improve the memories of their griots. Are you at liberty to reveal those particular rites, or is that secret information as well? They are not necessary for simply improving memory. They're used by griots to relive the experiences, and be in that state as they tell them, making it as close to first hand as possible for those listening. To improve memory, we are trained by the method I explained to you before. Try it. I finally finished reading Black Roots in its entirety. You have done a wonderful job in the simplification of these writings. It is indeed a gift to write about something so sacred, scientific and expansive in truth while delivering it so clearly, much of your information has served to verify a great many truths which I have been connecting the dots on. Thank you, my sister. The true Israelites the chosen people of Yahweh. Countless eons ago, the B8M original people decided that part of the purpose of this universe would be to manifest the evil hidden in. God. God, who is the personification of all that is good, has in him, her the opposite of every good quality. This comes from the fact that the mind, being limitless in its natural state, cannot have its imaginations suppressed. In other words, whenever the mind thinks of up, it simultaneously thinks of down. Whenever it conceives of long, it instantly conceives of its opposite, short. This is a perfectly natural ability. Thus it's also natural that God, who is omnipotent, omniscient and omni-everything else, and who loves to manifest these qualities in the universe, will also, at some point in time, manifest their opposites. The opposite of all God's good qualities can be summed up in one word, self-forgetfulness, or evil as it's commonly called. These opposites have never been manifested on earth before in all eternity. God is unable to manifest them in his, her natural body, which is perfect. To overcome this limitation, God decided that a new type of human would be made. This human would have the throne of God, the black germ removed from his temple, the physical body. Such a being would soon replace the missing throne with idols of evil. The black germ is the seed of morality. 
It is the altar upon which God sacrifices divine unity for the sake of individual personality and self-renewal. It is also the seed of creativity. It is to the body what blackness is to fertile soil, or what molasses are to dark sugar. Just as bleached flour, beach sand and white sugar are dead and infertile, so too is a human without the black germ immoral and impotent, i.e. unable to create or prolong life. Just as white sugar without the black molasses is poisonous and disease-causing, so too is a human being poisonous to the planet who is without the seat of morality. This was the type of image the gods decided they had to make in order to bring out the evil in them. I'll describe shortly how the gods prepared to make this man starting 50,000 years ago and how, when all was ready 6,000 years ago, a god was born on earth by the name of Yahweh, also called Yakub. He gathered about 60,000 volunteers called the Elohim and said to them, Let us make man in our image. Does this mean that there is only 60,000 plus one original light race gods? There are exactly 60,000. Yahweh slash Yakub is one of the 60,000. He's singled out by name because he's the leader. They all have individual names, but the entire 60,000 including Yahweh slash Yaakob are called Elohim, which is plural for El, in Hebrew, or Allah in Arabic. So if there are 1b8m black gods incarnating and 60,000 light race gods incarnating, who is incarnating in the rest of the people on earth? No one. They are brand new people who have never existed before. And a slight correction. There are not 60,000 light race gods in addition to the B8M gods. There are only 1B8M gods on earth, and to call them light race gods would be incorrect. They are black men and women, so they're black gods. The rest of the population are brand new souls. The 60,000 are all black people who created the light races in our image. They're called the Elohim and traveled in a manner I'll discuss later, to the star Sirius, where they now live. Do the Elohim continue to incarnate on earth? Or are the black gods incarnating on earth the 1b8m minus the 60,000 Elohim, who are people slash gods living on Sirius? Again, I've heard these details before by Drunvalo Mihalik, only he omitted one salient point, the black germ being the throne of God. The original gods who are incarnated on Sirius as the 60,000 are also incarnated here on Earth as regular black people like you and me, i.e. as different personalities. See, the B8M gods not only incarnate again and again here on Earth, but also simultaneously on other Earths throughout the universe. You yourself, as one of the original B8M, are right now also incarnated on Sirius. You have a twin personality there as does every black person. The coming posts will explain this in greater detail. Who is Drunvalo? Do you have internet info about him? Peace brother BLK Roots. Thank you for your explanations. Drunvalo Melchizedek, I spelled it wrong in the last missive, wrote several books on sacred geometry and the flower of life. He had underground tapes going around the LA area some years ago now. I assume his popularity has grown quite a bit since then, after seeing his websites, but he gives a similar account of things, only like I said he seems to leave out the one salient point of the black germ being the throne of God, although bear in mind I haven't read everything he's written so maybe he mentions it somewhere else. I believe he says he's guided by Thoth. He lost me after I saw the cult-like mentality of his followers and the $2,000 lectures and workshops seemed like some good info, but I'm not one for bandwagons. I don't know how much he reveals for free on his websites, but I'm certainly curious what you think. Anyway, thanks again, I look forward to the continuation of our story. One Love and Guidance Yakub slash Yahweh took the 59,999 volunteers to a secluded island and proceeded to make the four light-skinned races whose descendants are all the non-blacks on earth today. This happened 6,000 years ago. The races were made in stages. The first stage took seven generations, 200 years, of deliberate breeding. It involved starting with black people and getting dark brown children from them. The dark brown children were then encouraged to marry one another, and they produced lighter brown children. The people continued this, 
getting lighter and lighter children until after seven generations the black germ was completely removed. At that point the first light-skinned race was born. This new race was bred for another seven generations or 200 years until the second light race emerged from them. Then, after another 200 years the third race, the yellow race, came out of the second race. The last race, the white race, came out of the yellow race after only 66 years. Thus the four light-skinned races were complete after 666 years. During the breeding of the first race from black people, many black children were born along with them to the same families. In other words, many families that gave birth to dark brown children also gave birth to ordinary black children as their siblings. Many of these black children were murdered on that island. They were killed in order to instill a light-skinned supremacy complex among the people of the island. Such a complex was absolutely essential for those people to succeed with their project. However, the instilling of the complex, though necessary for the success of the project, did not have to be achieved through murder. But that is how they did it. There are legends in ancient texts describing the history of this violent time. One such legend is reported in the Old Testament where Pharaoh apparently orders all the firstborn sons of Israel to be killed. This is a garbled legend distorted by Jewish transcribers of the ancient scripts, who replaced the leaders of the island nation with the Egyptian pharaoh. But the original legend describes much more ancient events set in the island called Pelin, and not in Egypt, and it relates to the killing of black children. Even though many black infants perished on that island, not all were killed. Many parents succeeded in hiding their children, and eventually taking them off the island. There are also legends describing how some of the children were removed. A popular legend is the story of how Moses was spirited away behind the reeds of a river hidden in a woven basket. However, Moses was not involved in this desperate adventure. Because he was a legendary figure by the time the Old Testament was transcribed, the transcribers used his name to lend emphasis to the story, which actually happened some millennia before Moses was born. Many of the children and their parents and guardians who managed to escape ended up in Northeast Africa and the Middle East. They emigrated mostly to the country today called Israel and Palestine and other nearby locations joined to Africa by a natural land bridge. This land bridge, which today has become the Suez Canal, was used in those days by people traveling between Africa and the Middle East. All the people escaping from the island were the adherents of Yahweh's religion which he had established for them and their descendants before he died. Among the tenets of the religion was one that some priests claimed had been instituted by him, which in fact was not at all part of his teachings. This was the tenet of child sacrifice. The people who made this false claim were the surgeons, midwives, and other health officials on that island. They made this abhorrent claim, which they falsely attributed to Yahweh saying that all black children had to be killed in order for the lighter-skinned children to prosper. Their reasoning, which they also falsely attributed to Yahweh, was that if the black children were allowed to live, they would undermine the lighter races and destroy their chances of taking over the world. They reasoned that the black children would overwhelm the lighter-skinned children with their naturally superior intelligence and morality. These qualities were compromised in the light-skinned generations and the lighter the generation, the more compromised they were. Now, this latter fact was true, that black children could possibly overwhelm the other children, and possibly delay the success of the project. But Yahweh had foreseen this possibility and taken the necessary steps to make sure it would not happen. He had left a plan with the first leaders whereby the black children would be taken off the island and resettled in the Middle East and North Africa. As the years went by, and as the first leaders of Yahweh's generation passed away along with him, the succeeding generations of leaders who were by now very light-skinned hatched a plan to start killing black people right there on that island, a plan that they intended to export to the rest of the world in the coming 6,000 years. They lied and said that part of Yahweh's religion involved child sacrifice, which according to them meant to kill every newborn black child. Many people believe these leaders, especially those people that were themselves light-skinned, but the black citizens of the island rejected this false tenet of their religion. The result was that very early on, 
the island community was divided into two opposing factions, black people against light-skinned people. This division gave rise to the first enmity on earth. It was a hostility between brothers, essentially people of the same blood at that early stage before the first light race was born. As the new people became lighter and lighter and increased in number, the hostility grew to such an extent that the black residents decided it was best to leave the island. By the time the first light-skinned race was fully formed, all the black people that survived had already emigrated from the island and settled in the Middle East and Africa. The story of the making of the light races is reported in the Bible as the making of Adam and Eve. The enmity that arose between the original black people of that island and their light-skinned brethren is portrayed as the legend of Abel and Cain. Abel represents black people and Cain represents non-blacks. Cain's mark is white skin, by which he would be easily recognized as soon as he left the island and ventured into the cities of the world, which at that time were occupied exclusively by black people. He was cursed so that the ground would never yield good food for him. Everything he got from the ground would be tainted and poisonous. So would the water and the air become poison in his hands. He became a vagabond that left his birthplace and wandered all over the earth, as well a fugitive wanted for committing unspeakable crimes against the black nation. But Yahweh also protected him from being destroyed prematurely, so he could rule the world for the allotted time. The legend of Abel and Cain portrays the first act of hostility to ever occur on earth. Before then, the people of the earth had known only peace. As stated, the most important facet of the animosity between blacks and the light-skinned races was the religious aspect. This continues to this day, but in a form that is so totally different and unexpected that it has deceived all the nations of the world as to its true nature, let alone its true origin. The oldest strife on earth began as animosity between the black inhabitants of the island of Pelin, the descendants of Yahweh and the Elohim against the light-skinned races that were made there. Today it continues as the hatred between the Semitic tribe of Jews against Arabs and other Semites. The history of how it came to be this way, no longer involving black people, is very long, spanning a period of 4,000 years. The events that actually led to the present state of affairs are themselves very simple and straightforward. But they happened over such a long period of time that the slow change was not seen until it had been completed. Briefly speaking, it happened in the following way. When black people left the island to avoid having their children murdered, they took their religion with them, given to them by Yahweh. They practiced the religion in their new country where they settled, in the part of the Middle East today called Israel and Palestine. As the millennia went by, after about 2,000 years since black people left the island, the light-skinned races followed them and started settling in the Middle East, including in the land of Israel. Those who settled in Israel-slash-Palestine quickly adopted the culture and religion of the black inhabitants, the original natives of that land. Their culture and religion was far superior to that of the races, and they couldn't help but adopt it. The ancient hatred between them was soon rekindled. After many centuries, the original inhabitants of that area were outnumbered and overwhelmed by the hordes of arriving light-skinned people. Soon they were forced off their land. Some of them emigrated to Egypt, where they were given land by a benevolent Egyptian king of that time. During the time that they shared the land of Israel with the newcomers, the light races, the black inhabitants decided to hide the true practices of their religion from the hordes, who they knew would soon corrupt it. The true religion was thus made secret, and what was left for the masses was just superficial rites and practices. These were adopted by the light races as their religion, and it became the new worship of Yahweh. Around 2,000 years ago, the last group of black people left the land of Israel during the Roman invasion. They crossed the land bridge to join their people in Egypt who had left earlier. Soon thereafter most of these black people, the descendants of Yahweh and the Elohim, migrated south and west into Africa, where they settled among the many African tribes who had been living there for many millennia. Their migration into the African continent occurred at the same time that the natives of Egypt also migrated deeper into Africa. They abandoned their great civilization after the invasion of the Semites and others, mostly Persians, Greeks, and Romans. 
By this time, the religion of Yahweh had gone into such deep secrecy that it was practiced by only a few who were initiated into it. In the meantime, the superficial form of their religion had gained a large following among the Semites who would later be known as Jews. At the early period of the unfolding of these events, the name Semites did not yet exist. These people were simply known as the second race from the fact that they were the second to be made. But I use the name Semite because it defines them better than any other name in modern times. That race includes all the non-black people of today's Middle East and North Africa, including Pakistanis, Persians, Jews, Arabs, non-black Indians and so on. The Jews corrupted the religion of Yahweh so much that it was barely recognizable by the time of Jesus 2000 years ago. Today this corrupt version is being practiced in Israel and other places where Jews live and is called Judaism. The other Semites, Arabs, Persians, etc., practice a version of Yahweh's religion that was brought much later by Muhammad. Muhammad, a black man, was visited by one of the Elohim who identified himself as the angel Gabriel, or Gabriel. The word Elohim is the Hebrew plural of the word El or Eloah, which means God. There are 59,999 Els or Elohim, along with their leader Yahweh, making a total of 60,000. In the Bible they are called angels, the most well-known being Gabriel, Gabriel, meaning the God, Gabri. There is also Mikael, Michael, Uriel, Uriel, Raphael, Raphael, Ariel, Ariel, etc. They are the ones that have visited the earth more often than the rest. All of them are gods equal to Yahweh. They are not angels in the Christian sense, where Christians claim that they were created by Yahweh. They are actually Yahweh's brothers and sisters who volunteered to help him make the light races in our image 6,000 years ago. The word angel should be interpreted to mean messenger. Yahweh is their leader and they are his messengers. The Hebrew word Eloah in Arabic is Allah. When Gabriel, or Jibrael, visited Muhammad 1,400 years ago, he told him that he was sent by the other Elohim and their leader, whom he called Allah, God. Muhammad and his people at that time were speaking a different language, the predecessor of modern Arabic, and no longer understood old Hebrew names such as Yahweh or Elohim. Gabriel taught him the original, forgotten religion of his ancestors, the religion of Yahweh, which he then called the religion of Allah. A few years after Muhammad established the religion of Allah, it too was adopted by the Semites of that region. They soon abandoned their old religions and adopted Islam. That is how the Semites split into two main groups, the first practicing the old but corrupt religion of Yahweh that they adopted from the original black inhabitants of Israel. They still practice this religion today and call it Judaism. They consider themselves to be the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and ultimately of Yahweh and the Elohim the 60,000 original black inhabitants of the island of Pelin. But now they claim that all those ancients were white like them. That is the first group of Semites called Jews, the false Israelites. The second group of Semites adopted the religion of Allah, called Islam. They still practice it today in as much a corrupted version as the Jews corrupted the religion of Yahweh. When the ancestors of the modern-day Jews and Arabs took over the religions of Yahweh and Allah, they adopted the history that goes with those religions, as much as was available to them. The rest they filled with fabrications, which are rampant in the Old Testament. Nonetheless, this includes the history of the first animosity to ever occur on earth depicted in the legend of Abel and Cain. This legend was reformulated later. It is depicted in the story of the sons of Noah, Shem and Ham, and their descendants. The Jews have taken one side of this animosity and the Arabs and other white Muslims have taken the other side. So today we have the incredible situation where the Jews and white Muslims fight one another, the Jews believing they are the true Israelites, and the others believing they are their original enemies. As stated before, the original strife started on the island of Pelin between the black inhabitants and the light-skinned races. It is this very same animosity that now exists between Jews and Muslims, having been appropriated by them due to an unprecedented misinterpretation of historical facts, 
fed by the practicing of two superficial religions Judaism and White Islam, which are corruptions of the original religion of Yahweh or Allah. That in brief is the history of how this second light-skinned race, the Semites, stole the legacy of the true Israelites that is recorded in the Quran, the Old Testament Bible, and other ancient texts. The descendants of the 60,000 Elohim continued to practice the true religion of Yahweh after they left the island. They were scattered by wars all over the Middle East and North Africa. A small number of them were left in Israel until about 2,000 years ago, when they were forced off that land by the Roman invasions. The rest were already in Africa, having migrated into the continent over the course of many centuries. After settling among other Africans, the descendants of Yahweh kept their religious practices separate from the religions of other African tribes. There was no physical difference between them and other Africans, but they were distinguished by their religion. They were known as the worshippers and descendants of the god of Sirius, even as their other brethren, the Dogon people, are still known today. The fact that the Israelites separated themselves religiously from other Africans caused some measure of resentment in the people who had been living in Africa longer and worshipping older gods. The ill feelings were nevertheless not deep enough to cause violent hostilities between them, but this religious exclusiveness of the Israelites worked against their favor when Caucasians and Arabs entered Africa later on and introduced the evil form of trade called slavery. The Israelite Africans, due to living in small communities spread over many African countries, became easy targets for slave hunters. They were hunted and captured mostly by the light races, but in some instances non-Israelite African chiefs made wicked deals with the white slavers to capture the Israelites and sell them in order to save their own tribe's people. This unfortunate situation resulted in the Israelites being the most enslaved of all Africans. The entire Israelite nation was captured and enslaved out of Africa, except only two tribes that managed to avoid enslavement. One of these is the Dogon tribe of Mali, and the other are the Israelites who managed to settle on the eastern and southern parts of Africa, away from the slave trade routes. The rest of the Israelites, consisting of ten tribes, were almost all removed by force and enslaved in the Americas, Britain, Europe, and some Arab countries. Their religion was disrupted at that time to such an extent that shortly after they arrived in the Americas, they totally forgot it. The few who still practiced it died without being able to teach it to their children because of the severe restrictions placed on them by their Caucasian slavers. Thus after only a couple of generations in the diaspora their religion had totally perished. They became known to their African and Asian relatives as the Lost Tribes of Israel. It was said that they would be lost and forgotten for 400 years, exactly as predicted in the ancient writings of their ancestors, the Hebrews. The Israelites were not the only Africans enslaved. Non-Israelite Africans were also enslaved at the same time. After they had all been in slavery for about two generations, they all lost their cultures and religions, except for isolated small groups here and there who kept the flames alive at great cost of life and limb. The slavers separated the people in such a way that they had no common languages, even to the point of separating children from their mothers. As a result of this, there was widespread intermarriage between Israelite and non-Israelite African slaves. This caused an increase in the Israelite population. In other words, when a non-Israelite African slave married an Israelite, their children naturally became Israelites either through the mother or father. The Elohim considered such children to be their descendants, and they were recorded as such in the Book of Life by the angels of Yahweh who are responsible for keeping track of all the births of their descendants. 57. So widespread was intermarriage between the two groups that today, practically all black people of slave descent in the diaspora are the descendants of Yahweh and the Elohim. And now 400 years later, the ten lost tribes of Israel have been found. They are today's black people of the diaspora who are the descendants of slaves. They are the true Israelites, the chosen people of Yahweh. About 6,000 years ago, their ancestors were forced off the island of Pelin in the Mediterranean, into Israel and then into Africa. Many millennia later, they were forcefully taken out of Africa and enslaved in foreign countries. 
they are chosen not because of an arbitrary or mystical reason given by a non-existent spirit god. The reason they are the chosen people is because they are the direct descendants of Yahweh and the Elohim. 15,000 years ago, about 9,000 years before Yahweh was born, the king of the earth built the structures in present-day Giza, Egypt, known as the Great Pyramids. There are three of these pyramids, symbolically representing the leadership of our nation, the elders, chiefs, and judges. The first to be built was the smallest one. It is the most sacred of the three and represents the 24 elders. The second one in the middle represents the 144 chiefs, and the largest one represents the 144,000 judges. The Great Pyramids were built to have seven functions. Their highest function had to do with the facilitation of divine unity during certain important rituals. Their lowest function was as generators and distributors of energy for the great civilization of the ancient Ethiopian-slash-Egyptian kingdom. Another one of their uses is important in these discussions. They were used as resurrection machines. This particular function was built into their construction in anticipation of the birth of Yahweh, the god of the light races. They were used to transport the souls of the 60,000 gods, Yahweh and the Elohim, to the star Sirius. Yahweh and his angels died at a time when black people no longer ascended consciously. At the time they were born, our ancestors had already deteriorated their bodies for about 44,000 years, making it difficult for people of his generation to die without losing consciousness. Since then, all people who die lose consciousness at the moment of death. Some regain it quickly, others sleep for a long time before realizing that they are dead. Before Yahweh's time, all people died by willingly laying their bodies down at the end of their life and consciously ascending to the minds of the elders. That was the time before the mass exodus of people who deliberately isolated themselves from civilization. Their bodies were still perfect then. They all lived to be around 7,000 years old. They stopped aging when they were between 16 and 28 years old. Senior citizens, those older than 6,000 years, appeared to be between 25 and 28 years of age. All other adults who were under 6,000 years of age appeared to be between 16 and 25 years old by modern looks, except that they were much taller and incomparably more beautiful. Their skin color was the smoothest, deepest black. The men were about 71-2 feet tall on average, and the women a few inches shorter. 50,000 years ago, when the decision to make the light races was finalized, black people started to deliberately change their bodies. The bodies of our ancestors have a genetic perfection that makes it impossible to suppress the dominant black germ and allow the recessive light germ to surface. In all of eternity, the light germ had never surfaced before. Therefore black people knew of albinos only as a possibility, and had seen them only in their imagination during rituals directed to that type of teaching. They had never seen an actual albino in the flesh, as none had ever been born before. To allow for the necessary suppression of the black germ, they decided to genetically alter their bodies and cause a deterioration that would enable the dominant black germ to be easily suppressed and give way to the appearance of the recessive light germ. Now, all things in the body are a manifestation of the 144,000 aspects of God's perfect character. Any type of genetic manipulation of the body is ultimately achieved by controlling one or more of the 144,000 aspects of morality. In a perfect society, such as our ancestors had prior to 6,000 years ago, the 144,000 aspects were perfectly balanced, made so by the education of youth in their first 77 years of life. This perfect balance of the body and its aspects resulted in a perfect morality where right and wrong were clearly known. A perfect character or morality results in clear communication with the first self. The clear communication is the cause of the high state of inner guidance that our ancestors enjoyed. Their society was so perfectly balanced and well established that evil or error or self-forgetfulness was impossible to manifest. It's a natural fact that a perfect body and mind and a perfect balance of the 144,000 aspects of character lead to a perfect morality and a perfect society. All of them are mutually inclusive and interdependent. Hence in order to genetically alter their bodies, 
the ancestors had to disrupt their perfect society and cause the imbalance in their character that would result in the necessary genetic change. The ancients decided therefore that in order to corrupt their perfect bodies to allow the recessive light gene to emerge, they had to live far away from their perfect society. They had to move away from civilization and live in surroundings that would cause the necessary genetic mutations needed to enable the deliberate suppression of the black germ. So 50,000 years ago, many people volunteered for a self-imposed isolation. Many people moved from the major cities of the world, away from civilization, into the wild areas of Africa, America, and Asia. Asia and the Americas were geographically different then than they are now. During those days, the large island of Australia was part of a large continent in the Pacific. The Caribbean islands were also part of another continent in the Atlantic. Both continents have since sunk under the oceans, changing those areas of the earth to how they look today. The two continents were occupied in those days by some of the people that volunteered for self-isolation, those who didn't migrate directly to the wilderness. They set up two distinct civilizations, one in the Pacific region that is called Lemuria or Mu today, and another in the Atlantic region that is called Atlantis today. These two civilizations started off being imperfect. They were based on an imbalance of our 144,000 aspects of morality. As a result, they started to decline only a few thousand years after they were established. The 144,000 aspects of morality are the foundation of God's temple, the human body. The aspects are reflected in our genetic structure by the strands of DNA. Modern scientists have discovered two of these strands. These are the only two that are active in our bodies in this age. Hidden alongside the two are 10 inactive strands of DNA. We have 12 strands of DNA in total. Each strand is the basis or reflection of 12,000 aspects of our creative nature. All 12 strands, when they are all active, account for the entire 144,000 aspects of creativity or morality. It took about 42,000 years of harsh living in the forests of the earth, away from civilization, for the 10 strands of DNA that were previously active in our perfect ancient bodies to become inactive. That left only two active. That is the condition in which our bodies are today. The people of Lemuria and Atlantis established great material civilizations. But they were not destined to last because of the imbalance in the people that created them. They made an imbalance in themselves by neglecting to practice the major and great rituals of our nation. They soon forgot their true selves and forgot who God really is. They lost touch with their inner self, their moral guide. Their civilization soon thereafter became excessively materialistic. After about 10,000 years, it quickly began to deteriorate. They were still peaceful people. The aspect of peace in the morality of black people is one of the most tenacious. It's always nearly the last one to be lost in a deteriorating environment. Thus they never fought wars against one another. The decline of their communities was solely due to the imbalance in their morality caused by the neglect of the major rituals, especially the seven great rituals used to attain divine unity with the first self. This decline in their civilization was accompanied by a decline in their bodies. All things are interrelated. When morality is corrupt, social conditions decline, and this causes mental and physical corruptions of the body. They manifest as genetic mutations, directly affecting and altering the DNA. The decline of their societies was thus slowly but surely accompanied by a stagnation of 10 out of 12 strands of their DNA. After 10,000 years, Many of the people of Lemuria had become so imbalanced that the leaders removed them to remote, wild areas. Hence as time went by, they deteriorated from perfect, totally balanced people with 12 active strands of DNA to the point where the lack of use caused 10 of the strands to become inactive. The continued and proper activity of our entire DNA as well as our various glands can be guaranteed only in one way, by taking part in the rituals designed to keep them active. When people stop engaging in these rites, our glands and genes are adversely affected, to the point where they become dormant. In response, their bodies changed drastically, 
and became short-lived to where their average lifespan was reduced over a period of many millennia to only 60 years. About 21,000 years ago, the first civilization, that of Lemuria, totally collapsed. The continent sank under the ocean after being devastated by natural cataclysms. The people were still wise enough to anticipate this, and they moved to Asia and Africa and joined their other people who had moved there many millennia before. The second civilization of Atlantis lasted about 7,000 years after Lemuria disappeared. It too collapsed about 14,000 years ago, and the continent also sank beneath the ocean. All that is left of Lemuria and Atlantis are the Pacific Islands and Australia slash New Zealand, and the Caribbean Islands. The people anticipated the cataclysms, and had already moved into the forests of Africa, Asia, and the Americas where they joined their brothers and sisters who had moved there earlier. Their bodies continued to deteriorate further due to the harsher living conditions. Those among them that started hunting and eating meat were the most affected. In Africa and Asia primarily, some of the people deteriorated to the point where they became almost entirely new beings. Their remains that have been found are wrongly dated by the unreliable modern dating methods and classified by modern scientists as distinct species, such as Homo erectus. While on this point of the different human species, let me add that no black people deteriorated to the point where they actually lost their humanity. This is impossible because even in the worst biological stage, such as that of Homo erectus, the mind of God was still incarnated in them. They had lost almost all communication with the first self, but not entirely. They had enough conscience in them that they were still moral human beings. A different scenario happened in Europe many thousands of years later after the light-skinned races had been made. It gave rise to today's human-like apes. These apes came about as a result of the deterioration of the human bodies of white people who were expelled into the mountains and caves of Europe. They were expelled from civilization by the black citizens of the cities in the Middle East and North Africa. They were isolated beyond the Caucasus Mountains, where they were totally cut off from culture and civil life. Over a period of only 2,000 years, they deteriorated so much that some of them completely lost their humanness and became what are called Neanderthal. Others declined even further until they crawled on hands and feet and became human-like apes, such as can be seen today. These human-looking apes are the descendants of those people from about 4,000 years ago. I mention this so that the distinction is clear as to where the different human-like species came from. Other black people deteriorated to the condition of the people still alive today called aborigines, like the San and Koi, Hottentots, the Biame Beauty and TWA, Pygmies, and Maori, Australian aborigines. Now, those were the extreme cases. The vast majority of self-isolated black people, even those who lived under severe conditions in the forest, deteriorated only to the point that we are in today. They became the new people of the earth. When Yahweh was ready to make the light races, he invited some of these new people to be his helpers. At the beginning of the period of self-isolation, the ancients decided that they would gradually depopulate the earth of all the perfect people, and repopulate it with the new people. They did this in two basic ways. All the people who wanted, volunteered to leave the ancient cities. They moved to the new cities of Lemuria and Atlantis. Others who desired the immediate experience of a totally new type of existence moved directly to the forests of Africa, South America, and Asia. They soon became food gatherers, and after several centuries, many of them became hunters and meat eaters. Their new lifestyle, especially the killing of animals and meat eating, contributed greatly to the fast deterioration of their once perfect bodies. The rest of the isolationists, those who moved to the new cities of Lemuria and Atlantis, had the same experience but at a much slower pace. When their civilizations ended many thousands of years later, they too moved to the forests and joined their people who had been there a long time. This accelerated their deterioration until all the groups of isolationists had lost 10 out of 12 strands of their DNA. They became a new type of people, such as we are today. During that approximately 44,000-year period, the ancients who remained in the original cities decided to reduce their population, 
in order to complete the transformation from a world of perfect people to a different world full of new people. They did this by slowing down their reproduction of children gradually over a period of six generations, or about 42,000 years. By the time of the birth of Yahweh, no perfect people were being born on earth. All the senior citizens who were left soon died. Eventually, at around 6,000 years ago, the only perfect people left on earth were the long-lived leaders, the 24 elders and the 144 chiefs. The last group of judges passed away at the time of the birth of Yahweh. Today, the 168 leaders are the only people left on earth still with the perfect ancient type of bodies with 12 active strands of DNA. About 1,000 years before the birth of Yahweh, some of the new people started to gradually move back to the ancient cities. In a period of less than 1,000 years, they had resettled the major cities of the world that had been evacuated by their ancestors more than 40,000 years before. Yahweh was born to the new people. He had a body very much like ours today, with only two active strands of DNA. The 59,999 Elohim that he invited to help him were also the same type of people. So 6,000 years ago the whole world was exclusively inhabited by black people with two active strands of DNA, and also by 168 long-lived leaders with perfect original 12 DNA bodies. They still remain perfect to this day. The world was thus ready for the breeding of the light-skinned races. 100. One more note on the relationship between the physical body and everything that is manifested outwardly in creation. Everything that exists in creation has a counterpart in the physical body. Creation is an outward projection of the human body, more correctly, it's the projection of our ancient 12 DNA perfect bodies. So the physical body is the microcosmos from which is projected the macrocosmos, the universe, using the mind. Ultimately, everything is a projection of the mind. But the mind is anchored in the physical body, and has 144,000 anchor points. These anchor points are the foundation of all creativity in that all things are the physical manifestation of the 144,000 aspects of God's perfect morality. The aspects are centered on God's throne or altar in the body, which is the black germ, the center of all creativity. When the ancients spoke, they sometimes spoke interchangeably about things within and things without as if they're one and the same. In truth, they are one and the same. Everything outward is a reflection of something inward. So in ancient texts they speak of the ten lost tribes of Israel. These are real people, as already explained. They are the modern black descendants of slaves. But their reflection in the human body are the ten inactive strands of DNA. The twelve active strands represent or are reflected by the twelve tribes of the black nation in our natural state, prior to and after this six thousand year cycle. The ten inactive or lost strands of DNA represent or are reflected by the ten lost tribes of Israel. The lost tribes of Israel were found by a certain black man who lived in the Middle East. This man had an epiphany, a revelation. He was doing research back in the late 1800s on the history of black people when one day it suddenly occurred to him that the black people in America, the descendants of slaves, were actually the lost tribes of Israel, his brothers and sisters. He became determined at that time to reclaim his lost people. His revelation was confirmed soon thereafter by the elders of his tribe. They told him that it was his destiny to reclaim our people, that's why the revelation had come to him. Because of his lack of a Western education and inability to speak English, he could not come to America himself to reclaim them. He formulated a plan to raise a son and teach him Western education, and send him to America for this important mission. He raised a son and named him Farid. Thus in the early part of last century, Farid or Fard Muhammad came to America and told the people whom he called his aunts and uncles that they had been lost and now were found. Shortly before Fard's arrival in America, there began a new reverse mutation in the genes of black people. All biological changes on earth are the direct result of the thoughts of people. When animals and plants mutate into new forms or functions, they are simply reflecting the state of mind of the people on earth who happen to be wielding that influence, which directs the biological life to mutate and evolve in a particular direction. 
When the true Israelites were found, there was great joy in heaven among Yahweh's angels, as well as on earth among those initiated into the spiritual events of our earth. The joy that flooded the subconscious minds of all black people when Fard Muhammad's mission was revealed for the first time among the initiated elders in 1912, was so great that it reverberated throughout the entire black nation and caused the beginning of a reverse mutation in our deteriorated genes. Over the following 100 years or so, starting in 1912 until 2014, the 10 inactive strands of our DNA will become active again. After a period of 49 years since the beginning of the reactivation, the first group of genetically different children were born on Earth. This happened on the spring equinox day of 1961, spring in the Northern Hemisphere. Since about March 20, 1961, all black children born have been different than all the previous generations of the past 6,000 years. The reverse mutation is progressing steadily in their bodies as they grow, and will reach a definite plateau when they reach the age of 49 years old in 2010. In that year, the 10 formerly stagnant strands of their DNA will begin to vibrate back into activity. There will be a definite physical and mental difference between those black people and others born before March 1961. All black children born during and after the year 2012 will be physically different right from birth. Their genetic structure will clearly show 12 strands of DNA as opposed to two in all other people. Now, when the king built the Great Pyramids, he incorporated the function of resurrection in them in anticipation of the time when black people would have lost the ten strands of DNA. They were no longer able to ascend consciously. Prior to 6,000 years ago, especially prior to 50,000 years ago, black people ascended consciously. When they died, they never lost consciousness. To them death was just like sleep, which they also experienced lucidly. Except that death was the final sleep. But there was no loss of consciousness like we have today either in sleep or death. Yahweh and the Elohim must remain conscious without the interruption of their memories by the process of unconscious death. The mechanics of death in this 6,000-year cycle are such that conscious memory is interrupted at the moment of death and has to be rebuilt after ascension, sometimes slowly, sometimes quickly depending on the person. The light races were conceived in Yahweh's mind and actually live and have their being supported directly by that part of his mind they call their collective unconscious. For him to successfully complete his creation, he cannot enter a state of unconsciousness such as comes at the moment of death. He and his helpers, the Elohim, must remain conscious at all times for the sake of their creation. But since Yahweh and the rest of the 60,000 Elohim were born at a time when black people were short-lived and no longer ascended consciously, a way had to be made to ensure the uninterrupted continuation of their individuality, or their souls. Hence the king incorporated this function of conscious ascension, or resurrection in the Great Pyramid. Modern Egyptologists have discovered that at least one of the chambers of the Great Pyramid has passages aligned toward the star Sirius. They have also discovered in the art of the ancient Egyptians, scenes depicting the worship of that star, or the god of that star. Included in many paintings are scenes where the pharaoh is shown as the resurrected Osiris, the god of Sirius. 112. In order to explain this symbolism, we must prepare our minds to grasp and understand some of the practices of our ancestors that were perfectly normal to them, but that would appear miraculous to us today. There are many such activities, to mention some of which would stretch our incredulity to the limit. Such activities were not at all miraculous to them but were natural and performed as a matter of course. One such activity involves the interrelationship between alternate souls, or what may be called twin souls. Twin souls are not the same as soulmates. They are souls or personalities of the same God. As stated before, the B8M gods not only incarnate repeatedly on earth, but they simultaneously incarnate on every earth inhabited by black people. All the simultaneous incarnations of the same God are what we mean by twin souls. Every black person on earth has a twin soul on the star Sirius, as well as on every other inhabited earth in the universe. All the attributes that were real that led to miraculous acts by the ancients are still in us, in a dormant or semi-dormant state. They also exist in the light races, 
but they're mostly turned inside out or upside down, so to speak. They manifest in the opposite of what they should be. An example relevant to this discussion is the condition found mostly in white people called multiple personality syndrome. This is a psychological disorder where a person loses his present sense of identity and takes on a totally different one. When he comes out of it, he doesn't remember anything that happened. This psychotic condition is a reverse shadow of a real attribute that was common to all black people prior to 6,000 years ago, especially prior to 50,000 years ago. All black people in ancient days had multiple personalities, the reason being the following. All black people that are incarnated here on earth, meaning you and me, we are also incarnated on trillions upon trillions of other earths in the universe. There are two ways to visit other star systems in the universe. One is to go there physically, and the other is to go mentally. It's much easier, or at least it was in ancient days, to travel mentally. Traveling across space physically can be done in one of two ways, either by use of an interstellar spacecraft, or by dematerializing the body and rematerializing it at the chosen destination. Both methods are used by Yahweh and the Elohim and were also used in ancient times. But by far the most common way to travel was by mental transportation. All the personalities of each god that are incarnated in various star systems act as hosts to those traveling mentally. They make their bodies available to such visitors. In other words, when a person travels mentally to another planet, he, she finds his, her twin personality on that earth who then acts as a host, and uses his mind and body. In modern rituals such travel still goes on to a limited extent. The host in such a ritual is called a gatekeeper. The same principle applies when an initiate travels to the past. He, she finds a gatekeeper, a past incarnation of his, her first self who was a twin personality at that time. During the visit, the host or twin soul takes on the personality of the visitor, and becomes him, her in the fullest sense of the word. In modern times, if such a visitation were to occur outside the safe space of a ritual, such a phenomenon would be called a possession. The host behaves and thinks exactly as the visitor would. He literally becomes him. Since every god has innumerable simultaneous incarnations, every black person is potentially of multiple personality of the highest order. This attribute was as normal to the ancients as changing clothes is to us. The perversion of this attribute in modern bodies and minds is the cause of today's psychosis called multiple personality syndrome. When an inhabitant of another planet hosts a visitor in this way, he, she does not lose or forget her own identity. He remains perfectly conscious, but stays in the background of his own mind as an observer. In other cases he may also depart his own body and go on a visit to another part of the universe, in which case the first self is left in charge of his body hosting the visitor. When the visitation is over, the visitor has had the benefit of a body by which he could investigate another world, but he also contributes his own experiences to the host, such that the visitation is mutually beneficial to both twin souls. That's how the ancients traveled to other stars and back in time. After we lost most of our DNA, we lost the ability for such travel, except in the ritual setting of initiation. By incorporating the function of conscious resurrection in the Great Pyramid, the leaders made it possible for Yahweh and the Elohim to travel as the ancients used to do to the star Sirius. They were taken at the moment of their death and placed in a sarcophagus, a stone coffin, in the chambers of the pyramid. When each person approached natural death, his or her conscious mind or soul was transported to that star. There they found a host or twin personality waiting for them and they joined the other Elohim who had been resurrected before them. After a few dozen years, all 60,000 Elohim, including Yahweh, had been transported in this manner. They now occupy 60,000 long-lived bodies of the people of Sirius, and have been for the past 6,000 years. When they are engaged in ordinary activities on their planet, they take on their native personalities, their earth personalities go into the background as observers. But when they meet concerning matters that have to do with our earth, they naturally assume their earth personalities. They become as they knew themselves here on earth before their death. 
This multiple personality feat of the gods is depicted in ancient Egyptian art where the god Osiris or the goddess Isis is shown standing behind or beside the pharaoh or the queen. Pharaoh and the queen represent each Elohim and his, her soulmate as they were on earth in their old bodies. Osiris and Isis represent them as they are today in their long-lived bodies in their new home. When the present cycle ends, it will become normal again for people to visit their twins on other earths and to host them in their bodies here on earth. During this intervening 6,000 years of diaspora, Yahweh and his angels traveled on numerous occasions in their spaceships from Sirius to visit their chosen people on earth. Prior to the time of Christianity, they came here openly. Many instances of their visits are recorded in the Old Testament as well as in the old legends of some tribes. A well-known legend is that of the Dogon people of West Africa, who report that the gods came from Sirius to visit their ancestors. After the birth of Christianity, Yahweh and the Elohim stopped coming openly to earth. Their visits became rare and only to a few people. The reason is because when Christianity became widespread, the Christians began teaching the lie that God is a spirit. Anyone who appeared in the skies in a chariot or a cloud, as the spaceships were called, was considered to be of the devil. Around the same time, they started painting the devil as a black-colored being, instead of white as had been done before. People naturally started to become afraid of such visitations. Anyone who reported space beings was persecuted or even put to death. Eventually Yahweh stopped coming regularly to earth to avoid putting individuals at risk. The situation was made worse 600 years later when white Islam became widespread. They also taught of a false spirit god, and persecuted anyone who came in contact with a true, living human god. Thus Yahweh and the Elohim have for the most part been absent from their people for 2000 years. All this was destined to happen. It was predicted many millennia ago in the ancient writings of the Hebrews. But now the time of Yahweh's separation from his people has come to an end. The coming few years will be the time of Yahweh's people, the true Israelites. Some of them will return to their homeland of Israel slash Palestine. There they will set up a holy government under their rightful ruler and God, Yahweh, that will last for 1,000 years. The light-skinned races will obey and serve them until every imbalance caused by them and their ancestors in the last 6,000 years has been made right. The world will be brought back to its balanced condition in preparation for the true king and God of the earth, the leader of the 24 elders, who will rule after Yahweh for the remainder of his 25,000-year period. Hello Brother Afknru, I'm trying to understand why the B8M wanted to manifest the opposites of God. Does it have anything to do with them wanting to experience the knowledge they had of self? The reason is because all things are contained in God, both the positive good things and all their opposites. God is fearless. He, she wills to experience all that is in him, her. Brother Afkn Roots, I was briefly dialoguing with a brother here. He states that the earth is not our home, which I agree, and we are but cattle to the Caucasian beings, which I will not accept. That we was not meant to achieve honorable political slash economical standing here, henceforth the present conditions of the black race. I know that your presence here is to teach us our original heritage, but what are your thought on this? What must black people to do to sever this cattle mentality to our original true essence? Thank you in advance brother. The earth is now our permanent home, but we did not originate here. Our ancestors migrated here from the star Sirius 78 trillion years ago. Since then, we have been permanent residents here. Now, our existence here on earth is divided into cycles, some lasting trillions of years, others millions of years, others much shorter. Presently we are in a 6,000 year cycle called the cycle of self-forgetfulness. This era, which is near its end, was initiated 6,000 years ago by a god named Yahweh, the same one of the Old Testament. He's also called Yakub. This god made the present world such that black people can no longer remember our ancient glory, and the fact that we are gods. He made it that way so that his creatures that he brought into being could rule us. These are of course the light-skinned races. So they have made us strangers in our own house which they now rule as if it's their own. 
This work of the God Yahweh has resulted in many black people feeling that we don't belong here on earth. This is a reasonable belief. How can we suppose we belong here when we are so hated? We have been the most hated and despised of all people by all the other races, and this has been so for 6,000 years. Is it any wonder that black people feel we don't belong here on earth? So this is understandable, but it's totally untrue. This earth is ours, created by our ancestors, as is the whole universe. When this cycle ends around the year 2012, then we will regain our lost knowledge, and every person on earth will know at that time that the earth belongs to black people, and all others are temporary visitors. I'm not sure I follow you, are you saying that we, black people, migrated into Africa? The descendants of Yahweh did. As well as the ancient Egyptians. They joined the Africans who had been living in Africa for many thousands of years. Thank you for sharing Brother African Roots. My family entered America through South Carolina as slaves from Africa, would that make us a part of the B8M? All black people are part of the billion eight million original gods. Those who are the descendants of slaves are the direct descendants of Yahweh or the 60,000 Elohim. They are the true Israelites, the chosen people of Yahweh. This includes all black people of slave descent in all the Americas, Britain and Europe, and wherever else they were enslaved by either whites or Arabs 400 years ago. They were specially picked out among other Africans and sold for reasons that I've discussed. Hi Brother African Roots. Something I've been meaning to ask you. You have posted a wealth of information and never once did you state your reason for posting it. I have been to your web page and ventured into your questions page. Maybe I missed the answer to this particular questions. Brother, what is your reasons for posting all this? I mean, I understand it's for purpose of us knowing our origin, but by us knowing this, what do you hope will happen or not happen for the descendants of the B8M? What should black people be doing until the end of the 60 hundred year cycle? Is there more besides knowing our origin? How should we use this information in the course of our everyday life? My sister. There are several reasons why I'm posting this info. I'll tell you the first reason. It was explained to me by my mentor when he started teaching me. He said to me, the first step toward waking up is the knowledge of oneself and one's history. If a person does not have the knowledge of self and ancestors, and the enemy has power over him, then everything he does is done blindly, and will benefit his enemy before it benefits him, if ever. All the riches such a person accumulates, and every positive thing he contributes to society, will benefit his enemy before his people, if ever. In fact, it will most likely be detrimental to his people, because his enemy can then use it against him. That is the first step towards freedom, knowledge of self and knowledge of ancestors. Without this first step, everything else is moot. You said, the descendants of the 60,000 Elohim continued to practice the true religion of Yahweh after they left the island. They were scattered by wars all over the Middle East and North Africa. I am not critical of your findings, but obviously the teachings of Master Fard Muhammad are in direct opposition. NOI doctrine teaches that 59,000 blacks and Yakub, making 60,000, went to the island and selectively bred their genetics and came up with the albinized white race. They then left the island and went back to Africa slash Asia and caused bloodshed to the original blacks. So it has been hell ever since. I can take sides and bear witness to both theories, but only one can be correct. It's not in opposition. I think you misunderstood me. The first albinized race left the island and went into the cities of the original people, as Fard Muhammad said. That happened 200 years after the 60,000 black people first came to that island. But Fard did not mention what happened to the original black people and their descendants in that intervening 200 years. Some of them died on that island, but many escaped during that first 200 years and settled in Israel. OMG, this is exactly what I was debating on an NOI settlement forum, I, of course, got booted. My thread stated, black, brown, red, yellow races escape Pelin. I was picked on and was singled out for petty grammatical errors. Typical. 
I also got grilled because I mentioned that there weren't any women present on this mother plane. If there are a succession of human gods, and they are born every so many years, how could it be so without women? Their studies show that the 23 scientists are men only. So from that finding, I suggested they were making test tube babies slash gods when these so-called alien abductees were being swept aboard. These individuals, mainly white, under hypnosis claimed their genitals slash DNA were experimented with. I figured what you say was true. It is also rumored that THEM falsified some of MFM's teachings to quench his appetite for power. From what I remember, the last grafted color was whites which took 600 years to make. Also if anybody was in opposition, including escapees, off with their heads, maybe MFM was being a little extreme in his findings slash knowledge. Your sense of the truth was serving you well to think the gods could not be men only. Elijah Muhammad wasn't falsifying. He was caught in a dilemma about how to present such radical information. During his time, men were still very chauvinistic, even black men. They learned this well from whites. So Elijah felt his info would be hard for them to swallow if he said some of the gods were women. Men just were not ready to accept that God can be a woman. There are other things as well that he held back, some of which he taught only to his closest associates. This is natural and happens with every teacher of the truth. Not all people are ready to hear certain things, so one talks to the general public differently than he does to serious students. I had a quick question. Of the twelve tribes of the black nation is one of them the tribe of Shabazz? And if so are the blacks in the west descendants of that tribe? I grew up as a Christian, but as I reached a Duthid is converted to Islam. Since my conversion I have been exposed to so much knowledge that I never knew before. I agree with you on the purpose and nature of Christian Judaism Islamic religions. Now I am searching for my origins and purpose in life. I asked the above questions because this is what I have been taught through Islam. And even though I converted feeling like this was the best thing for me, I now question its teaching. The name of our entire black nation is Shabazz, not just one tribe. The word Shabazz means nation, the whole black nation of twelve tribes. In my language, Setswana, we call the nation Chaba or Sekaba. The Arabs, just like the Greeks and Romans before them, have a peculiar thing of adding the letter Z or S to the end of ancient words. For instance, the Greeks took the ancient Egyptian name like Khufu and added an S at the end to make it Kefs or Keeps or Cheops. Or the name Manu they changed to Menes. Another one is Haru, which they changed to Horus, always adding S at the end. The Arabs do the same thing, adding a Z. So the word Shaba became Shabaz or Shabaz. But the point is that the original word means nation not tribe. So all black people belong to Shabazz. The black people in the West are the descendants of the Israelites. Actually, they are the descendants of Yahweh, Yaakov, and the Elohim, the 60,000 people who bred the light-skinned races on the island of Pelin. 158. The original religion of the Israelites and the Islam religion both came from Yahweh. They are one and the same religion with one and the same God Yahweh or Allah. The differences came only because the first religion, that of the Israelites, was given first, long long ago. After it was stolen by the whites whose descendants today call themselves Jews, then Yahweh sent one of the Elohim, Gabriel, to reveal the religion again, this time to Muhammad. By then the name El or Eloah had changed to Arabic as Allah. So the religion of Yahweh became the religion of Allah, and they called it Islam. 159. I think when you know the background of the religions, it may be easier to stay in Islam and not be misled by the ignorant. The true and full name of Yahweh. The name YHWH, Yahweh, should be spelled Yahweh. The first H sound following YA should be clearly pronounced, as should. The last H in HU. For proper pronunciation, the sounds should be separated as follows. Yahweh who. H-W-E should not be pronounced as W-E-H. It should be pronounced starting with the H sound, as H-W-E, the way some black folks pronounce the H sound in the word Y. 
They clearly start it with the H sound, as if it were spelled highway. The H sound in HWE should be pronounced the same way. To put it another way, the name should be pronounced as it usually is, but making sure to distinctly pronounce the H after YA and end it with HU. Now, the meaning of the name Yahweh who is King of the white-skinned races The sound Yahweh who is how it was pronounced by the ancient white-skinned races that were taught about their God 4,000 years ago. The black people who lived then did not pronounce the name like that. You have to realize that the non-blacks were taught language like little children, even though they were adults. The reason is because soon after they were made, they completely lost the ability to speak when they were incarcerated behind the Caucasus Mountains in the caves of Europe. This happened when they were expelled from the Garden of Eden 6,000 years ago. They lost all contact with civilization and soon thereafter, they lost the ability to speak or carry on any civilized human activities. That happened because they became separated into small family groups, each one living in its own enclosure, without much interaction. Their entire time was taken up by survival amid the wild animals with which they had to compete for food and shelter. This went on for 2,000 years. These severe conditions led to the total loss of language and culture. When Moses was sent to gather them together and bring them back to the Middle East and Africa, they could only make animal sounds as a way of speech, and he had to teach them how to speak. So after the most intelligent ones were rehabilitated and taught the rudiments of language, it should be understandable that their tongues were like the tongues of young children learning how to speak for the first time. Young children tend to condense and shorten words, leaving out the pronunciation of what to them seems as unnecessary parts of speech. This is clear to anyone who has heard the speech of children. The black people of that time, the original owners of language, pronounced the name in its proper pronunciation as Yabiawahu. The non-black races left out B.A. and shortened it to Yawahu. The word Wahu means white or light-colored. In modern Setswana, as well as Sisutu and other so-called Bantu languages, we say S.W.E.U. or Swahu. In ancient Setswana, which is still our language of initiation, we say HWEU or Wehu, exactly as it was said by the ancients. Now, consider the name YA be a Wehu. The word YA means of, as in king of. The white races. The word BA is a prefix used in our language to refer to people. Whenever BA is used, then the speaker is talking about people. You'll find this prefix attached to the names of many tribes of Africa, such as Bombuti, Basotho, Botswana, etc. So important was this word to the ancients that in the times of ancient Egypt, they used it to refer to that spiritual aspect we call humanist that separates us from animals. That includes all the aspects of being human such as self-consciousness, self-will, morality, etc. All these aspects were summed up in that one word B.A. Side by side with the concept of B.A., which means all humanity, they also had the concept of K.A., which means individuality. In our language when we say Y-A-K-A, of mine, we refer to individuality, we also say Y-A-Me. The words K-A and Me are synonyms. The word Me is the origin of the English word Me. This word K-A in modern days has become the German word Ich or the Dutch word Ek, both of which are identical to the English word I or Me. These two concepts of K.A. and B.A. together define the totality of God who is simultaneously an individual and the unity of all people. Now, I said Y.A. B.A.W.E.H.U. means king of the white-skinned people. Y.A. means of, B.A. refers to people, and Wehu means white or light-colored. You'll notice that there is no part of that name that stands for king. So Y.A. B.A.W.E.H.U. literally means of the white races. What of the white races? King of the white races. The fact that of is in reference to king is a given. It was so obvious to the ancients that it was not necessary to include king in the name. That is how many African names are still structured even today. Perhaps a modern Western example will help to prove this. Consider the German name von Braun. Von means of in German. Rudolf von Braun means Rudolf of Braun. What of Braun? Son of Braun. 
but sun is so obvious a part of it that it's not included in the name. Instead of calling him Rudolf son of Braun he's just called Rudolf of Braun. This was also the case with the king of the white races. It became customary to leave king out because whenever the name Yabiawehu was said, all who recognized it knew that it referred to the king. Only one person is the king of the white races, so the name could not be misinterpreted by any who recognized it. As a matter of fact, during those times it was so obvious who this name belonged to that people, especially the ancient Hebrews, went to the extreme point of totally ceasing to say it altogether. That is how it became the most sacred name in this age among all who spoke Hebrew or belonged to the Israelite religion. They then began to substitute the name Lord, Adonai, for the sacred name. Now, the reason he was called King of the White Races and not God of the White Races is because the word God was not used by black people for any living person. It refers only to ancestors. Even today the 24 elders are not called gods, but kings and queens. That is the highest title of respect among black people. The word God in our language is Emodimo. The plural of that is Biedimo. As you can see, it contains the sacred prefix B.A., which refers to people. M.O. refers to one person and is the singular of B.A. So Emodimo means one ancestor, and Biedimo means all the ancestors. M.O., singular, and B.A., plural, in Emodimo and Biedimo are the same as those in the tribal names of many African tribes, such as Emotswana, Botswana, and Emosotho, Biasotho, etc. The word Dimo means high up or ascended. Therefore Biedimo, gods, means all the ancestors on high and Emodimo means the most high one, which is the name of the one person, the divine unity of all black people. This word Dimo is the origin of the Latin word Deos, God, which became the modern word Theo used in theology, from the Greek Theos. The Greeks and Latins after them had a tendency to add S to the end of words as they were learning our language, such as when they change Manu to Manus or Minis and Haru to Horus. So they changed Dimo to Demos and finally to Deos. As soon as the white races, all the non-blacks, learned of their maker, the concept of worship came into being, and they worshipped YHWH as their god. So the true concept of God, which belongs only to ancestors, was brought down from on high and applied to a living person for the first time in the person of Yabiawehu. Before then, the concepts of worship and fear were unknown, and black people would never have used the word God, Matamo, to refer to a person still living on earth. It would result in a clear contradiction because a person cannot be living and ascended, dead, at the same time, since Matamo means one who is ascended. But the white races saw no such contradiction because they lacked knowledge of the intricate details of our language. They just took our language and modified it in almost endless ways until it suited their childish concepts and eventually gave rise to the multitudes of white languages in existence today. Perhaps they can be forgiven for calling YHWH the Most High because when they were taught of him by Moses, YHWH was by then living on the earth of the star Sirius which I suppose can be considered as on high. Therefore by reason of their childish tongue, Yabiawehu became Yahwehu and eventually Yahweh, as it remains to this day. Those who are interested to know the full name King of the White Races in the ancient language, I'll tell you. It's Kosi Yabiawehu. Kosi means king. That word is the origin of the word Kaiser and Caesar, king. In some West African languages, Kosi is pronounced Kwesi. In modern Setswana, we say Kosi Y-A-B-A-S-W-E-U. So the full name of Y-H-W-H is Kwesi Y-A-B-A-W-E-H-U or Kosi Y-A-B-A-W-E-H-U. The Rapture Many Christians believe that there is going to be a rapture when their Jesus comes back to earth. What is the rapture? The Christians say that the rapture is when Christ will remove his believers from earth in the twinkling of an eye. One moment they'll be going about their business, and the next moment they'll all disappear, taken by Jesus. Only the non-believers will be left on earth, according to this Christian teaching called the rapture. Where did this idea or teaching come from? You won't find it anywhere in the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. 
and you won't find it anywhere in the Old Testament prophesies either. The Old Testament prophets talked at great length about the end times, the times we're living in now. They talked about pestilences, earthquakes, droughts, starvation, wars, etc. that will occur at the end time. Jesus did the same. In Matthew chapter 24 and 25 he talks for a long time about the end times. He mentions all the things that we see happening today, such as wars, famines, diseases, etc. Then he says after those tribulations, the sun and the moon will be darkened, and the sign of the Son of Man shall appear in heaven, and all the nations shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and glory. Nowhere does he say that the Son of Man will cause a rapture, taking believers off the earth. You'd think he would mention such a momentous event if it was part of the divine plan at the end time, since his entire long speech in those chapters was exclusively about the end times. But he never mentions it. The same is the case with all the prophets of the Old Testament. They talk at great length about the end time, but not a single one of them says that God will take believers off the earth by making them disappear. Moreover, this idea of the rapture is not mentioned by any of the contemporaries of Paul who were preaching with him, such as Peter, James, etc. So where did this idea come from? It was introduced to Christians by Paul. The Christians call Paul an apostle. If you know anything about the story of Jesus, you'll remember that Jesus had twelve apostles. There were others also who followed him and his teachings as he moved from place to place, and some of them perhaps could be called apostles, especially if Jesus gave them permission to spread his teachings. But all these apostles, the twelve that are known as well as any others there may have been, were all people taught and authorized directly by Jesus while he was still alive on earth. Anyone else who discovered his teachings after he died, and taught them, cannot be said to be an apostle because he was not one of the chosen twelve or authorized directly by Jesus to represent his teachings. If you look at the encyclopedia definition of apostle, you'll notice that it lists the twelve apostles, or thirteen, due to the Judas event, and then as a side note is says, St. Paul is always classed as an apostle, without giving the reason why. So why do the Christians insist that Paul is one of the apostles? Because by doing that they automatically make it seem like he's authorized to represent Jesus' teachings exactly the same way as the twelve apostles. Why do they want to give this power and authority to Paul? Because Paul says many things that they agree with. In other words, the teachings of Paul suit them very well, and they bestowed artificial authority on his teachings by making him an apostle of Jesus even though he clearly was not. He discovered the teachings of Jesus after Jesus was dead. He never met him. In fact, he was a persecutor of the followers of Jesus, calling for their slaughter, until one day his guilt got the better of him and he joined the very people he was persecuting. This turnaround appealed to many Christians of his time, and they reasoned to themselves, this man Paul, who was formerly Saul, was a persecutor of the Christians, but now he has repented and joined the people he used to persecute. Therefore he must have been overcome by the Spirit of Jesus, causing him to repent. Therefore what he teaches must be true. 14. They were won over by his repentance and complete turnabout, and he became the most respected authority of his time among the Christians. How did Paul come to be filled with the Holy Spirit? According to him and his companions, they were traveling on the road to Damascus one day on their way to hunt and persecute Christians and all of a sudden a bright light shone on him and blinded him. Then a voice spoke and told him to stop persecuting the Christians and join them instead. Later he was healed of his blindness and he started teaching. What was it that he taught that the Christians liked so much that they gave him the title of apostle, thereby conferring the authority of Jesus on his words? For one, he taught this false idea of the rapture where believers are to be taken off the earth to heaven. He and others of his time, and many Christians even today, quote the words of Jesus in Matthew 24 verse 40 and 41 where Jesus says, Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, and the other left. If you read the verses before this, you'll see that Jesus was not talking about a rapture. He was talking about how the natural disasters of the end times will take people from their friends, brothers from their sisters and so on, 
exactly as happens when there is a major earthquake or tsunami or other cataclysm. Children are taken from their mothers and fathers, from their sons. He said this quite clearly by comparing the coming disasters to the time of Noah, when there was a major flood and people were taken from their loved ones. In Matthew 24 verse 39 he says, For as in the days that were before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. And knew not until the flood came, and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. In other words, he was comparing the catastrophes that are to come with those of the time of Noah, where people were taken away, killed, by disasters, not taken away by God. But Christians, led by Paul, misinterpret his words to mean that the Son of Man will take people away by making them vanish in the blink of an eye, with no trace left of them except their empty clothes, their jewelry, wallets, their shoes, and everything else they had on them left in a pile following the rapture. I'll talk more about Paul's idea called the rapture. First let me briefly address another false teaching of Paul that the Christians like very much. It's the false doctrine of salvation by faith alone. This false doctrine claims that you'll live eternal life in heaven with Jesus if you only accept that he died for all your sins. You don't have to do anything else. Just believe that, and you're free and clear to fly all the way to heaven. It doesn't matter if you were a murderer or rapist, a child molester, a slaver, or a genocidal maniac. All you have to do just before you die, is to say, Jesus, I accept you as the Son of God who died for all my sins, and off to heaven you go. This doctrine is the chief cause of all the evil that Christian white men and women have committed against black people, especially the twin evils of slavery and colonialism. They committed unspeakable crimes against our people, knowing fully well that they were sinning, and at the same time planning to accept Jesus as their Savior just before they died as a way to buy their ticket into heaven. This doctrine is nothing less than a license to commit crimes. It tells them they can commit every kind of despicable act and sin, even as Christian priests continue to sexually molest young boys, as long as they repent just before they die and believe that Jesus already took all their sins away when he died 2,000 years ago. So blatant is their attitude about child molestation that these priests have named their place of living and molestation as a seminary and rectory, alluding unashamedly to the rectum and the depositing of their semen. These and much worse and vile acts have white Christians committed and continue to commit in the name of their Jesus and their doctrine of salvation by faith alone. As harmful as this doctrine is, even potentially more harmful to black people is the idea of the rapture. Where did Paul get this idea that believers in Christ are going to be lifted off the earth and taken to paradise? He got it from extraterrestrials. If you're familiar with the story of Paul, you'll remember that he was temporarily blinded by a light from heaven and told to stop persecuting Christians. He was taken by the extraterrestrials and given information over a period of three days, while he remained blind. They communicated the doctrine of the rapture to him which he then taught to all the disciples and the founders of the Christian church. This doctrine is crucial for the survival of the extraterrestrial races. Without it, they will not survive the coming 1,000 years. They need it to prolong their lives until all the made races perish from the universe at the end of their allotted time, which has only 1,000 years left. How will the doctrine of the rapture help them to survive? As I mentioned before, the extraterrestrial races need genetic material from the light-skinned races in order to survive. They would take it also from black people if they could convince them to believe in the idea of the rapture. There will be an event equivalent to the rapture in the near future. But it will not be performed by the Son of Man, Yahweh, as Paul has claimed. It will be performed by the extraterrestrial races. They have prepared many planets across our galaxy and turned them into paradises. They have prepared them for all the people who expect to be raptured and taken to paradise. In the near future, as the tribulations that are happening on earth increase, as the wars increase, as the diseases and natural disasters increase, the extraterrestrial races are going to appear in the skies over the world in order to perform their rapture. Many people have already been conditioned to expect such an event, especially Christians, but also many other people of different religions as well as those without religions. 
many of those people who expect to be lifted up to heaven when the troubles on earth increase, will indeed be lifted up into spaceships and taken to the paradises prepared for them. There they will live an ideal life, with no more wars, no starvation, no pain or suffering. It will seem like heaven to them when they first arrive there. Unfortunately, the honeymoon period in their new paradises will not last for long. Soon, the extraterrestrials will begin their true mission, which is to milk them for their genetic material. This will continue for the rest of the coming 1,000 years, because they need it to prolong their physical existence. Their bodies are weak, having been made from bodies that were themselves weak, the bodies of the light races. Hence they desperately need a constant renewal of genetic material to replenish their depleted gene pool. They believe that as long as they have a constant source of genes, they can prolong their existence forever. That's the real reason for the so-called rapture, which has been in planning and preparation for over 2,000 years. Now, many black people are going to fall victim to this deception. Many will choose to accompany the light-skinned races to the new paradises promised by these angels. The responsibility will be on each individual of the black nation whether he, she chooses to go and live in these temporary paradises prepared by the extraterrestrial races, or whether they choose to stay on earth under the rule of the Son of Man, Yahweh, when he returns. The former choice will delay their ritual education and conscious ascension, and eventually cause them a great deal of suffering when rebellions and wars break out on these paradises. The latter choice will guarantee them timely education and ascension to the true heavens of the black nation, which is in the minds of the elders. The paradisiacal conditions on these prepared planets will be very short-lived. As soon as the people discover why they were brought there, they will rebel. Their true natures and the true natures of their masters will soon show themselves. In the end, their masters will have no choice but to use force to put down any insurrections and to get what they need. The paradises will then be turned into hells of the worst kind. The inhabitants will live under severe oppression. Their only reason for existence will be to provide the needed genetic substances. They will be no better than cattle. Sometime after those events have started, all the black people who chose to be raptured along with the light-skinned races will be removed from their misery and brought back to earth, but after much suffering. Many will wish they had remained on earth with the rest of their people under Yahweh's protection. Hence it's extremely important to inform black people, especially Christians, about the truth behind this great deception called the rapture. The ego. Unless they are born. Again. It is said that a person cannot enter the kingdom of heaven unless he, she die and be born again. Person here refers to non-blacks. Dying refers to the dying of the ego. The ego is formed when a person refuses to accept the truth about his, her maker. Rejection of one's creator and the formation of the ego are one and the same phenomenon, like walking and moving the legs in a particular way. When a person moves his legs in a particular way, we say he's walking. When he's walking, he moves his legs in a particular way. The two are as inseparable as a word and its meaning. Similarly, the ego and the rejection of the maker are just as inseparable. The one defines the other. It's not possible for a person to have an ego without rejecting his maker, and it's not possible for a person to reject his maker and not develop an ego. Therefore only non-blacks have or are capable of developing a real ego. The reason is straightforward, only non-blacks have a maker. Black people are self-created, without beginning. There is no maker that they can reject. Therefore they cannot develop a real ego, because a real ego can be developed if and only if one rejects his creator, as was said about the pride of Lucifer, the being of light skin. Non-blacks are made beings, they have a maker, by the name of Yahweh. They also have free will, given to them by their maker in his own image. Thus they have the ability to reject their God, their very own maker and sustainer of their existence. This is something of a dilemma because in order for them to rule the world, they had to take it over from their makers, black people. To do this, they had to see their makers as being inferior to themselves, so they could have the courage to conquer and rule them. This rejection of their maker automatically caused them to develop an ego. 
Thus all non-blacks have developed an ego of some kind. The proudest of them have what is called an overinflated ego, which is potentially the most dangerous kind in terms of their everlasting salvation. The most humble of them have only a mild ego, but an ego nonetheless. The rest fall in degrees somewhere in between these two extremes. They can be born again only if this ego dies. When the ego dies, then they have the opportunity to discover the truth, which is that their God is a black man. Alternatively, which is the same thing, if they accept their God, their ego will automatically die. This is the hardest thing for the vast majority of non-blacks to accept. They were raised by their own kind to see black people as inferior beings hardly worthy of respect, let alone love or worship. For them to worship a black person is well near impossible. It's for this reason that they have manufactured every form of conceivable idol to worship. The most religious of them have concocted an invisible spirit god and worship this god in the forms provided by their various religions. The least religious of them have given up on worshipping any type of god at all, and instead worship their own physical existence in the form of greed. They live only to accumulate as much material possessions and pleasures as possible in an effort to satisfy their greed their insatiable god. They know deep down that this is futile, yet they'd rather worship that than their real god simply because he's black. Those who worship a spirit god also know deep down that they're deceiving themselves so they manufactured this god in such a way that he can never be found or known. Those who seek him, especially children who will innocently ask where god is, their reply is that he's in heaven where they can't go until they die. That puts the brakes on most children, who then stop searching for the invisible god. That solves their problem of having to disclose the whereabouts of their spirit god. Just to make sure, they further add that if by some chance someone happens to see this god, he will surely die, because his face is not meant to be seen. All this effort they put into the manufacture of false gods is for one purpose only, to hide the identity of their true god. But a black person is their maker. He holds their destiny in his hands. They cannot have everlasting life unless they recognize and accept their maker. This is not egotistical on Yahweh's part. It's simply because for them to have everlasting life, they must exist within his everlasting mind. For them to reject him is like a fish rejecting water. How else can it live? But they cannot accept him as long as they have egos because an ego is the crust formed when they reject him who made them. This crust, depending on how thick it is, and how much they identify with it, will blind some of them permanently such that they will even choose to cease to exist rather than shed it. That is the meaning of the teaching that one must die and be born again as an egoless child in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. This teaching by Jesus and other messiahs was directed only at non-blacks. Being what they are, ruled by their egos, they perverted the teaching and deflected it away from themselves, to the point where now many believe that it applies to all people. This is a sad lie for black people to believe. Black people by nature do not develop egos. But they can get a false ego by imitation. They imitate the egocentricity of the non-blacks, especially in the West or so-called developed countries. So many have this imitation ego that they flaunt around as if it's their true self. Non-blacks are always clamoring for more material things to satisfy their greed. Some black people see this behavior and envy it, causing many to behave in ways that make it seem like they have real egos. But such is not the case. As with every form of evil, they learn it from non-blacks. They get caught up in their culture because frankly, many have no idea of any other type of life except that which they see among the enemy. The truth remains though that egocentricity is not part of our nature. More questions. I still don't understand the information in your test questions, because some answers concerning the earth as the universe seem contradictory to my understanding. I am hoping to get clarification if possible. If the universe is bigger than the solar system and the law is as above so below, how can the earth be a mini-universe, an electron, when it's smaller than the solar system, an atom? I was doing well understanding the science, but you got me confused here. I really like the teaching that the lower life forms evolved from the black with slash man and not the reverse. 
makes sense to me as science says reactions flow from high to low. As a scientist I have always thought to myself that the current dogma may be totally backward. I'm learning a lot. On the question of the Earth being a mini-universe, think of it this way, as you know, being yourself a biological scientist, organisms are made of cells. The cell in biology is equivalent to the atom in physics and the solar system in astronomy. All of them have a central nucleus surrounded by other components. Many cells unite together to form larger organs until, in our case, the entire human body is complete. Similarly solar systems unite to form the entire universe, and atoms unite in the same way to form the Earth. So atoms are exactly the same in function as solar systems and cells. All these three mini-components, cells, atoms, and solar systems, consider themselves, and proudly so, to be part of a larger universal being. In the case of our cells, their universal being is the human body. In the case of solar systems, Theirs is the entire universe. What then is it in the case of atoms? Their universe is the Earth. So the human body is a micro universe, the Earth is a mini universe, and the universe is the prototype after which the other two model themselves. You can go further down and consider that electrons orbit their nucleus the same way the Earth orbits the Sun. So electrons are equivalent to the Earth and are nano universes, and so on down to infinity. Now, it's a fact that before our universe was created, there was another universe before it, much smaller. That universe was actually the Earth, and its stars were the atoms that make up the Earth. The people who lived in it, our most remote ancestors, were microscopic in size. This doesn't mean they were microscopic in actuality, but if we could see them with our present eyes, they would appear small, living on Earths the size of electrons. Because the present universe did not yet exist, there were no people our size to see them as being small. To them, their universe was as normal a size as ours is to us. Similarly, when our universe attains its purpose and comes to an end, it will become an Earth for the next universe. Our stars, which seem so incomprehensibly large now, will be reduced to the size of atoms by the expansion of our minds, and will become the atoms of that new Earth. After our minds have expanded to the new boundary, then we will create new bodies for ourselves that are as much larger than our present bodies as our present bodies are larger than atoms and electrons and our remote ancestors who lived on them. As you can see, size is relative. It depends solely on the expansion of consciousness. Please keep writing as I am interested to learn more about the 1 billion 8 million black gods. The light race's desire to kill us so we don't reach that sacred number in hopes of prolonging their reign? I'm still undoing much damage to my psyche that has been done over the years. Yet I realize I don't hate the light races and know a few white people who sincerely hate the wickedness committed by these people. These few people speak out against and work against this corruption when they can. Yet I still realize we as black people are different. We seem able if we search diligently to access a connection to the divine that is unavailable to the other races. Besides I read a simple equation the other day that stated, A equals black with slash man and B equals foundation and C equals the Almighty. Since A equals B and B equals C then A equals C. This brother hence concluded that the black with slash man is the supreme being, the origin of everything. Your teachings confirm support this view, too. I was especially drawn when I saw your recent post a few days ago where you acknowledge black people of the diaspora as the true Israelites. You also acknowledge the oppression, especially of women, associated with the laws in the Torah, which is also a sore spot for me. I finally realized through study that the religious practices attributed to Israel are likely due to significant Babylonian and Persian influences and are not the commands as handed down to Israel by Yah. I also like that you pointed out that Moshe gave Israel the Ten Commands, which to me seem a good set of rules for living. Importantly, too, it seems from your teachings, don't have a better word to call them, that Yah and the Elohim have physical bodies, as do all the B'Adem gods which also fits since from reading the Old Testament I know that Israel saw Yah as a man as claimed by the prophets Isaiah, Ezekiel, Amos, and by Daniel to name a few. 
Ezekiel makes his vision of Yah as a man plain in Ezekiel CHP 1. Similarly, the Elohim like Michael and Gabriel were seen as men. This vision of Yah as having the appearance of a human in the Old Testament fits with your explanation of Yah and the Elohim in the creation of people on this earth and adds more to my understanding of how we Africans of the diaspora are the people of Yah. I do have questions about the true religion of Yah, Yahweh, and should I be practicing it? Many Israelites who know they are descended from Israel expect Yah to deliver us back to the land of Israel in the Middle East if they keep the commandments as written in the Old Testament, oppressive though they are. I figure there is something better than to return to that blood-stained place. It can be found by re-establishing my connection to Yah through knowing myself. In Comet the people said know thyself and you will know the gods, because we are the gods? You're right that the light races will resort to anything within their power to try and prolong their rule of the earth. But they will not succeed. Their time is up, simple as that. The god of this age has protected them for six thousand years so they could live for their allotted time, otherwise black people would have destroyed them long ago. But now they've reached the end of God's mercy as far as their existence on earth. There is nothing they can do about it. Soon their power, which depends on guns and bombs, will be taken away. Yahweh's angels, the Elohim, visited their descendants, your ancestors before they were enslaved, many times in the past. With each visit, the circumstances were different, deteriorating for the most part as the centuries rolled on. In order to preserve the Israelites, Yahweh, through his angels and prophets, added sterner commands to the fundamental laws first given to Moses. This was necessary then to ensure that the people would survive, no matter how dire the circumstances got or how oppressive their enemies became. Since the woman is the cradle of society, it's understandable why some of the rules directed at women were so strict. It's one thing for men to break the rules of morality, especially sexual morality, but it's detrimental to the entire nation when women do the same. Of course, the ideal situation is for both men and women to obey the laws designed to safeguard the nation's survival, but it's imperative for women to be the last one standing, if it comes to that. That's the reason behind the stricter laws directed at the mothers, sisters and daughters of the nation. 18. Now, people being what they are in the state of self-forgetfulness, especially men, they couldn't resist the temptation to use these laws against women. Having imitated our enemies for thousands of years, they fell into the trap of using these very same laws to oppress women, instead of cooperating with them to lighten their burden of being the preservers of the nation. Today people are much more enlightened, and men and women understand one another and communicate much better than in the past centuries of this age. 19. So fair-minded Intelligent people should understand why the rules were stricter towards women in the past. But they should not continue this oppression today, when circumstances are so different and people are much more open-minded. The religion of Yahweh should not be fossilized as if every rule is carved in stone. There are some rules that always apply, but others were given according to the prevailing circumstances of their time. In practicing Yahweh's religion, Fair-minded people should use flexible judgment. By following their conscience, they can know without doubt which rules are to be obeyed to the letter, and which are to be adjusted to suit modern times. That's how Yahweh intended for the people to practice his religion. He did not intend for them to become semi-robotic and take every word literally even when circumstances dictate otherwise. Yahweh's people will return to Israel. But at that time, the Jews and Arabs who live there will vacate that land. All the blood they've spilt, they will atone for in many ways, which they'll be directed to do in order to restore the earth and its spirit to the former natural, balanced condition. Israel is going to be the headquarters or capital of the world, from where the true Israelites will govern the whole world. The light races will receive their instructions from there concerning what to do to restore everything they've corrupted. The earth has 12 primary nodes of energy transmission. Israel slash Palestine and that entire area of the Middle East is the foremost nodal point in this age, from which the earth's healing energies will be directed. So in the coming years, many black people of slave descent will relocate there. They'll turn that desert into fertile greenery, after which more people will follow to live in that area. 
I'm sorry that I'm slow. I was born before March 1961, but I am having trouble understanding how, as described under Black Roots Science 18 Mathematics, three divides to become seven. I understand how one becomes two and two becomes three, father, mother, child for example, but I get lost in understanding how three becomes seven and seven become twelve. The first three divisions are when God incarnates as people. God is unity, or one. Then God divides into soulmates, man and woman or two. Then the soulmates become three when a child is born. Those are the divisions of persons. Next come the divisions of creation. First come people, then people create the universe, or nature. So the next division from three to seven is the division of how the three persons create nature. The three people, man, woman and child, are called the Holy Trinity. On the highest level they are represented by the three groups of leaders, the elders, chiefs and judges. You can think of the elders as representing man, the chief's woman and the judges as representing child in a patriarchal society. In a matriarchal society, when the earth is ruled by a queen, then you can think of the elders representing woman and the chief's man. So we have one, two, three, or man, woman, and child. But we also have one, two, three as elders, chiefs, and judges as far as creating is concerned. They are the primary leaders in creation, and the fact that there are three groups creating results in seven creations, or seven versions of things, such as colors. The reason is as follows, all three groups can create independently, which they do. But they can also create in collaboration, which they also do. How many creations will there be if they create independently? There'll be three, because there are three groups. How many more if they collaborate? There'll be four more, because there are only four ways in which they can collaborate. Think of your husband as representing the elders, yourself as representing the chiefs, and let's say you have a child representing the judges. Your husband can create all by himself, that's one independent creation. You can also create all by yourself, that's the second creation. Your son, or daughter, can also create by him slash herself. That's the third type. So there are three independent creations. Then you all decide to collaborate. First it's your husband collaborating with you, that's the fourth type of creation. Then he collaborates with your son to make the fifth type. Then you collaborate with your son to make the sixth type. Then all three of you work together to make the seventh and final type. That's all the combinations possible. That's why there are seven colors in the rainbow and seven tones in music. As far as the number 12, you'll have to read the section again where I make a comparison with 12 spheres surrounding one sphere. This is also a natural limit, so the number of tribes of the black nation cannot exceed 12. For those black people like myself born before March 1961, our 10 inactive strands of DNA will thus stay inactive, if I read and understand installment 15 the chosen people of Yahweh correctly, will the exercises really help us? Not trying to be difficult just trying to understand. Maybe I have more difficulty understanding because I have only two active DNA strands. That's okay, it just is what it is. You can reactivate your DNA. In people born after March equinox of 1961, the reactivation started spontaneously. But in other people it can be reactivated by their own effort. The memory exercises of level 2 are meant to do precisely this. The mind and body are linked. When you gain control of your mind, your body cannot help but respond accordingly. It will increase its ability to perceive by reactivating all your glands, the so-called chakras, as well as reactivating the lost strands of DNA. Okay, I get that the exercises will help to activate my inactive strands of DNA. What is more difficult to comprehend is if the 10 inactive strands are spontaneously reactivated in black people born after 1961, why are so many young people still following the old ways to glorify sex and violence? Why does the reaction spontaneously occur in those born after March 1961? My nephew was born after 1961 but he still died of a brain tumor. Wouldn't having his 10 inactive strands spontaneously activated make him stronger? I'm just trying to understand. 
I read in Blackroots that sickness is due to a character flaw. If sickness is due to a character flaw, then why is the world still terrorized by healthy but hateful white men of the ruling elite? Their characters are not flawed? My understanding is that reactivating my 10 strands of DNA will allow me to begin answering these questions myself? I can link to that which is within me. I hope so. I'll answer your second question first. Why does the reaction spontaneously occur in those born after March? 1961? The human entity, body and mind, goes through seven stages to reach completeness. After birth, the body takes seven years to leave the stage of infancy, or proper childhood. Then another seven years to reach puberty. Then it reaches adulthood or maturity at 21. At 28, it reaches dietary or metabolic maturity. At 35, the person reaches emotional maturity, and then mental maturity at 42. The six stages then coalesce over the next seven years, until they form a complete, unified person at age 49. That's the ideal situation, where the person is nurtured and supported by an enlightened community, using proper rituals. What happens to the individual also happens to the subconscious mind or the spirit of the entire black nation. After a spiritual seed has been planted in the nation's subconscious, it also goes through the seven stages to reach completeness. These are equivalent to the physical stages like infancy, puberty, etc., but on a spiritual level. Each spiritual stage also lasts for seven years. In 1911, the seed was planted whereby a Messiah would come and reclaim the ten lost tribes of Israel. It germinated and was born into reality exactly as happens with the conception of a baby. The birth of this idea happened in 1912, when Fard Muhammad was introduced to the elders of all the tribes as the Messiah who would go on this mission. He was formally told of his mission nine months earlier in 1911. From that date for the following 49 years, the messianic mission went through seven stages until it reached completeness on the summer solstice in 1960. So from its conception in June 1911 until June 1960 is 49 years. From its birth nine months later in March 1912 until March 1961 is also 49 years. All this took place on the spiritual level or rather in the subconscious minds of the black nation. As soon as it reached maturity, those children conceived on or after the day of the solstice in June 1960, and born about nine months later on the day of the equinox in March 1961, the spiritual seed was born into physical manifestation in their bodies. The result was a genetic reverse mutation that began the reactivation of their DNA. Why are so many young people still lost morally and others dying of brain tumors etc. when they're supposed to be genetically stronger? Just like any seed planted, it must be nurtured. If a seed is planted in good soil but is never watered and is denied sunlight, it will never sprout, let alone flower. We don't have an enlightened community of dedicated black people who can guide our youth. They're genetically and mentally ready to be guided, but there's no one to guide them. Why are there healthy white men ruling slash terrorizing the world when they're supposed to be unhealthy due to their moral bankruptcy? They're not healthy. They're very sick. They are propped up, walking chemical cauldrons supported by artificial medicines, or drugs as they call them. They admit it themselves in their biographies, that some of them exist on upwards of 100 pills per day. One influential American talk show host elitist admitted to spending thousands of dollars a month on his prop-up supplies. He used to send his maid into dark alleys in the middle of the night to get his drugs. If these chemicals could be taken from them, they'd fall apart and disintegrate. They're very unhealthy precisely because of their moral bankruptcy. This doesn't mean that black people who also depend on these chemical poisons and suffer the same kinds of diseases are as morally bankrupt. The reason they suffer is because they are not yet ready to get rid of their sympathy for white people. They attract their diseases to themselves just like a dog will get the diseases of its owner. The dog has unconditional sympathy with its owner's system of life and accepts all the vibrations that come from him, including his illnesses. We live in a world of resonance fueled by sympathy. As long as black people have love or sympathy for the white system, 
they'll suffer all its emanations, good and bad, and take them upon themselves by the law of sympathetic resonance. That's why we need a minimum of 144,000 people today who are willing to give up all love and sympathy for the light races, so we can dedicate ourselves fully to our inevitable destiny, which is to retake control of the world. That's the only way we can put to good use what nature has prepared in the bodies and minds of our youths. Thanks for answering, but of course this only leads to more questions. I'm sure you are bombarded with plenty of them. Why is Fard Muhammad considered the Messiah when he is not the first to proclaim that black people in America are descended from the lost tribes of Israel? Clearly other black people knew of their Israelite identity and taught other Israelites this truth prior to Fard Muhammad appearing. The ten lost tribes? All twelve tribes are lost. If only ten tribes were lost, where are the other two tribes? According to biblical history, Yehuda with Levite primarily were the last to be scattered. Yehuda endured the Babylonian captivity which was ended when the Persians conquered the Babylonians. Also the Torah was written by Ezra after the Babylonian captivity when Yehuda was under Persian rule. By this time, the ten tribes supposedly had been long scattered when taken into captivity under the Assyrians. In fact Jehoshua, some call Jesus, was supposedly a member of the tribe of Yehuda although if one reads carefully he actually is a Levite, who also claimed in the book of Luke that Israel would be led captive into the nations. Yehuda was scattered after the Romans destroyed Jerusalem in 70 A.D. Why is Fard Muhammad considered the Messiah when he is not the first to proclaim? To be the seventh Messiah, Fard did not have to be the first to proclaim. It was his destiny. Destiny does not go by who's first as common sense will tell you. As part of his destiny, it was his mission to organize the Israelites into a coherent group. Now, he used the later religion of Islam to do this, because that's the one he grew up in. As it turns out, that was the best way to do it, as history has shown by the success of the nation of Islam during the times of Elijah. The choice of religions that any black person makes today is a personal matter. It doesn't concern Yahweh at all whether his people come to him through Islam or Israel, or even Christianity. Islam and Israel are identical. Both religions came from Yahweh. Don't make the mistake of rejecting what Fard did because of the bad things you may have heard about him. Wait till the truth is revealed to you as direct knowledge through your inner self, then you can make a wise decision. Otherwise you'll fall into the trap of divide and conquer laid for us by those who want to separate us. The ten lost tribes? All twelve tribes are lost. If only ten tribes were lost, where are the other two tribes? One is the Dagara slash Dogon people of Mali and Burkina Faso. The other is spread along the east coast of Africa from Sudan to South Africa. These two tribes were never conquered by whites and never enslaved. So they are not lost, and never were. They still practice the original religion as Yahweh gave it to them, and obey his commandments. If the adults are not enlightened and don't care to be, what do we do? We become enlightened ourselves and take charge. The world is in need of at least 144,000 enlightened black people to take charge of our inevitable destiny, which is to regain control of the world. That's our immediate goal as the white man's system self-destructs right before our eyes. Many people are working towards this from different directions, and we need to do our part also. Greetings warrior, I always says that religion is different than spirituality, may I humbly from the depths of my being ask you, you mention, true Israelites right, why not African peoples, just a thought, it sounds like the Israelite nation here in Toronto, I do love all your information bro. I did attend one time the Israelite nation meeting and sounded cultish in many ways, I am open to new concept and ideas, because the human mind is always evolving, I practice the spirituality of my ancestors in Africa, if you have any reference material on the Dogons in Africa, I will greatly appreciate they have great and vast knowledge of the cosmos. The word Israelite has been used and abused badly, especially by the whites in Israel, the Jews, who consider themselves Israelites, which is not true. Others have begun cults based on this idea and so forth. You may or may not be aware of this, 
but the British monarchy is involved in a centuries-old cult where they claim they are the lost tribes of Israel. And so black people started their Israelite cults also, which you may find offensive. But the historical facts behind this name don't change. History remains the same regardless of how people try to distort it. The true Israelites are black people of slave descent. They descended from Yahweh and the Elohim, the 60,000 black people who settled on an island 6,000 years ago and bred the light-skinned races. Their descendants here in the Americas and elsewhere have intermarried with non-Israelite Africans. So today practically all black people of slave descent are Israelites, related to the 60,000 ancestors in one way or another. 63. But they're still Africans. That's where they were enslaved from. Their Israelite heritage is noted and registered in Yahweh's Book of Life for the sake of the future of all black people, because the Israelites are going to become the new rulers of the world when the present system self-destructs. I'm not trying to take away from their Africanness. I'm simply singling them out as the most important people in this 6,000-year age. I've been pondering this for a while. A large proportion of people in the world are a mixed product of black people and the other races. Now, due to the natural dominance of the black gene, most of these people have the black gene, strongly exhibit the presence of melanin and have some features that reveals their black ancestry. Now, because these people have the dominant black gene, and are therefore genetically black, their temples should contain the throne of God in which he, she can sit. However, just because these mixed people have the black gene doesn't mean any of the 1B8M gods are incarnate in them, save Yahweh, or does it? Also, when the world's population was much less than it is now, and the black population likewise, did the 1B8M gods incarnate in black people who were less than obviously slash visibly black, e.g. the Honorable Fard Muhammad? If that is so, then that could mean that even now there are still black people who are not visibly black, due to miscegenation, albinism etc., but yet are incarnations of the 1B8M gods other than Yahweh. A large proportion of people in the world are a mixed product of black people and the other races. That is true. Now, due to the natural dominance of the black gene, most of these people have the black gene. Now, because these people have the dominant black gene, and are therefore genetically black, their temples should contain the throne of God in which he, she can sit. That is not true. Most of these people have some mixture of black blood in them, but they don't have the black gene. The black gene is not the same thing as melanin. The dominant black gene, the seed of God, is actually the dark reproductive gene found in black people only. As I've said before, black people have both the dominant black gene and the recessive light gene. Most of the mixed races that you mention are attenuated beyond the seventh generation where the black gene of procreation has been completely removed. In other words, most of them cannot give birth to a black child, the same as whites cannot. They still have some melanin, but all people on earth have some melanin, including whites. About the 1B8M gods, does that mean of the 6.5 plus billion human beings on earth only 1B8M are incarnate gods? Are the 1B8M purely black people? If that is so, then that means there can only be a maximum number of 1B8M purely black people on earth. What of the rest of the 5 billion plus humans, many of which are mixed black people, are these exclusively incarnations of Yahweh and the Elohim or do the other gods incarnate in them as well? What of the beings that totally lack the throne of God, the purely white people? I assume these are all definitely exclusive figments of the mind of Yahweh. There are only 1B8M black people on earth. All of them have the black germ or the throne of God, so each one is an incarnation of one of the B8M gods. The rest are non-blacks. They don't have the throne of God in them. They have what is called a group soul, which is a part of Yahweh's mind that they call their collective unconscious, or their collective mind. Now, the B8M black people on earth such as you and me are not pure. The only pure black people on earth are the 24 elders and the 144 chiefs, who never lost their original 12 DNA. We'll become pure again when we regain our inactive DNA. Let's look at the population figures, 
and you'll see that the actual number of black people does not exceed 1B8M. Africa, about 790 million total. Of these, about 140 mil are North African Arabs. That leaves about 650 mil black Africans. Subtract that from 1B8M. That leaves about 358 mil blacks outside Africa. Brazil has the next largest population of people of African descent, about 60 mil subtract that. That leaves about 298 mil subtract 36 mil African Americans, and about 12 mil other blacks in the Americas and that leaves 250 mil. Of these 250 mil, most are in India, about 160 mil. That leaves about 90 to 100 mil other blacks. That's a large number, and they're spread all over the world, in Europe, Asia, many there, and Australia etc. It accounts for all the other mixed-race black people you mentioned. So over 5 billion people on Earth are non-black. Many of them are melanated in all shades of medium to very light brown, all the way to yellow and white, but none of them have the black procreative gene. They simply cannot give birth to a black child by themselves, unless they procreate with a black person. In ancient times, three or four or five thousand years ago, the gods did not all incarnate at once. They took turns. Some gods would incarnate in one generation, then another group of gods would incarnate in the following generations and so on, until the black population increased where all the gods can incarnate at the same time. Black people like Fard actually have the black gene. There are very light-skinned black mulattoes like that, if one of the parents was black. Are there other beings existing on Earth? Yes. There are many different kinds of beings that have been created by the gods over the ages. Some of them exist here on Earth, others in the rest of the universe as well as in non-physical realms. But none of them are evil. This is the first time that such beings have been created. Their evil minds have also spawned otherworldly or supernatural creatures that haunt, scare, and otherwise intrude in people's lives, but all of them are psychic manifestations, such as ghosts, vampires, etc. They will all cease to exist at the end of this age, when white people come to their end. Since our race permeate the universe in our destiny to fully comprehend, encompass and finally transcend it, there are others like us on many other planets. Do our kindred come to us here from their habitations in space, and vice versa? Also, are we the only black nation in the entire universe that are experiencing evil at this time cycle? If not or if so, are the other planetary colonies of our cosmic brothers and sisters going through different or similar cycles to us? Do our kindred come to us here on Earth? They used to come openly before Christianity came into being. There are numberless stories of them visiting the earth written in ancient texts, including the Bible. They are reported as coming in clouds, chariots of fire, etc. All these refer to interstellar spaceships. Christianity made it difficult for people to continue reporting the visits of gods and angels, because they started persecuting people, saying such visits are demonic. So the gods stopped coming openly but they still come to select individuals or remote tribes. Soon, they'll begin to come again openly, led by Yahweh and his angels. Also, are we the only black nation in the entire universe that are experiencing evil at this time cycle? If not or if so, are the other planetary colonies of our cosmic brothers and sisters going through different or similar cycles to us? Our Earth is the only place where the light races were made. So we're the only ones going through this experience. But all black people unite through rituals, so all other black people in the universe will know about evil exactly as we know it. The gods that are incarnated here as us, are also the same gods incarnated all over the universe. The nature of black people throughout the universe is to share experiences through unity. So all souls in the universe know, or will know the experience of evil. If, as you say, the requirement for the 144000 is to possess the black gene, to have a complete sympathy for the black race and a total lack of sympathy for the white races, then surely the current number of such individuals has exceeded that number. If not, then it must surely already have been reached. 
How fitting that the 144,000 represent and personify the 144,000 aspects of the character of God. The 144,000 are potentially all here. But we must organize and remove ourselves from dependence on the present system. We must start a new type of community that's totally independent, where the whites can't touch us. But first we must recover our memories and get out of our self-forgetfulness. The students of the Nuwabian nation that I've spoken with seem to say that there are other requirements for the 144000, three of which is the ability to speak the Nuwabic language, the ability to practice Wanuabu, right knowledge, right wisdom, and right overstanding, and the ability to teach the former two. Do you agree with them? Yes, I agree. The most important is the practice of Bunabwabo, Wanuabu. It's the gateway to the rest. The second level of Black Roots science is precisely about that. By gaining control of our memories we'll come in contact with our first ancestor. That's the key to understanding, knowledge, and wisdom. He, she will teach us the ancient language. You already know the original language, but it's buried deep in your subconscious memories. After you complete the second level, you'll very likely feel a strong desire to teach others. That's how the number will increase quickly. Would you consider yourself one of the 144,000? I suspect you are. Only if you consider yourself one also. By myself, I'm only one. Together with the others we'll teach, we'll reach 144,000. I find it ironic that the white races plan to do battle with that deity Yakub when he finally reveals himself to them and the world. How can the personalities of a mind hope to combat the entirety of that mind? It would be like me trying to fight and conquer my first self. Vainly, foolishly, and hopelessly impossible. True. I want to ask you a question on Elijah Muhammad. Why do you say he succeeded in his mission far beyond his wildest dreams? Is the success of his mission linked to the mission of Malachi York and his Nuwabian nation? I suspect it is because I'm sure there was far more to Elijah's task than establishing the nation of Islam, which to all appearances presently looks like a defunct and flandering organization. Think of all the offshoots that came out of his work. All the gods that build together today, from the Nawabians to the 5% heirs to all the rap artists and other ordinary people who know that the black man is God, all that is the result of his ministry. And it's spreading all over the world where there are black people to be found. Also, are there remnants of the extraterrestrial creatures of the pale races, the insectoid slash reptilian slash mammalian aliens, still existing outside of this planet, on other planets, star systems, etc., or have they all been compelled back to the earth? What of the pale races themselves, are they even capable of escaping the confines of this planet, especially in this day and time? They haven't all been compelled to the earth. All the extraterrestrials still live on their planets in different places in the galaxy. The ones that are here are astronauts, scientists, geneticists, linguists, etc. They're sent by their people on a mission, and they go back and forth between Earth and their homes. I would like to ask you your thoughts on the seeming Messiah that was promised, Yahweh ben Yahweh. I'm only recently come into knowledge of Yahweh ben Yahweh and his organization, so I don't know much about them as yet. But from what I am reading from their writings and their journey, they seem to be the one thing I've been searching for, Hebrew Israelites that have remembered and retaken their heritage and, having done that, are taking the important step of moving out from the place of their captivity to their place of redemption, which is their ancient homeland. Are you strong enough to join such a group as an independent mind and not a follower? If yes, then I would encourage you to indeed ally yourself with this or other black Hebrew slash Israelite organizations. You may get the opportunity to learn, as well as gain and contribute to the atmosphere of black brotherhood that exists in some of them. There are several such organizations, as you probably know. One of the more serious ones, called Black Hebrews, already has members living permanently in Demona, Israel. This is only the beginning of the return of Yahweh's people back to the land of their ancestors. On the other hand, if you're not strong enough to resist the charisma of the leaders of some of the organizations, then you could find yourself trapped as a cult follower rather than a leader. 
We are now at the end of the 6,000-year cycle where the time for following is over. It is now the time for leading. 144,000 black people are needed now who will take this leadership role and open the way for all black people to be free. Black people are not followers by nature, as each one is an independent god in reality. These 144,000 will eventually open the way for the establishment of the new society, or rather a return to the ancient-slash-eternal society, where each god incarnates on earth not to follow but to create, and each one uniquely. I have seen satellite images of what appear to be impressive spaceships currently orbiting the sun. They seem to be doing something to the sun, most likely, they are increasing its power to put the heat on the pale races on the surface of the earth. Which is the reason why the pale races are currently shooting missiles into space, aiming at the sun or the Elohim themselves, or both. Foolish creatures. To see this, go to this web pages, http colon slash slash www.cyberspacerbit.com slash index back four six dot html http colon slash slash www.cyberspacerbit.com slash more underscore perseus dot html as for the spaceships around the sun, the Elohim are involved in a process that will eventually result in the removal of oxygen from the Earth. You may know that oxygen is necessary for combustion to take place. That means guns, bombs, even automobile engines, internal combustion engines, cannot function without oxygen, neither can a fire be lit. When they complete this mission, all Whitey's weapons, guns, bombs, missiles, torpedoes, nukes, etc., will become useless, as well as the rest of his technology, because it all depends on combustion of oxygen. They will substitute the oxygen with a form of ozone. There will be a new type of air for breathing made of this form of ozone. All this requires certain adjustments of the sun's magnetic field and its relation to the Earth's atmosphere. That's why Nibiru, so-called twelfth planet, is now parked between the Earth and the sun, where it cannot be seen due to the sun's glare. The primary reason for replacing the oxygen with a higher form is not to neutralize Whitey's weapons. That's just a side benefit. The real reason is because the new kinds of bodies that will survive on Earth, which will be similar to our ancient bodies, will need it for breathing. Peace brother. I have been reading your lessons online for the past three months and I am very impressed. I am not the type of man to believe in any and everything I come across, but there are just some some things you feel, and your knowledge is one of them. I applaud you. My question. I am what the world calls an homosexual and I have some serious concerns with my choices and how they fit into society. I truthfully don't have a problem with my sexuality being that I've been with both males and females and I like both, but one a little more, I'm just trying to be frank. Please don't take this as a disrespect. According to your knowledge, am I to be doomed forever, cut away from my people, which is God, correct? Why does it feel natural for me if everybody says it isn't? I love my people and I would rather be able to coexist at the highest form of love possible, but is that possible given my sexuality? If my sexuality is seen as going against nature and God, does that make me a devil? I sincerely hope not. I appreciate any response you can give me, I have searched so long for truth. My brother. We were all born in this 6,000 year cycle, in order to overcome challenges. All of us chose a particular challenge, some more brave than others, that would be ours to experience and defeat. Some people, the braver ones, incarnate into bodies wrecked with paralysis, disease, blindness, etc. Others are born into situations that encourage them to become thieves, murderers, rapists, and so on. All of these are challenges meant to be overcome. That's the only way we can build our character in this age. In past ages, all black people went through the trials and rigors of initiation, and their character was perfected that way. Presently, the rituals of initiation are no longer publicly available to black people so they must perfect their character in other ways, hence the challenges and hardships of life. The same is true of the challenge of homosexuality. Many people are either born with a genetic proclivity that makes them prone to succumb to homosexuality, while others, especially children, are forced into experiences and situations that turn their psyche towards homosexuality. 
Both these methods of becoming homosexual i.e. being genetically predisposed to it, or being forced by the circumstances of your upbringing both these ways can be overcome if one wills. If people can overcome the challenges of polio, physical disabilities, blindness, deafness, etc. and become productive members of society who don't add to its decay, so too can one overcome the challenges of homosexuality. To embrace it as if it's a natural thing is to delude oneself. It's like giving in to one's tendency to commit murder, thievery, etc., however that tendency came about. It's a sign of a weak character. In the case of male homosexuals, to overcome it does not mean you have to force yourself to sexually embrace a woman. Not at all. Sex is not an absolute necessity for every member of society. Society will continue even when there are some individuals who don't procreate, as long as they don't do the opposite, which is to encourage racially genocidal behavior. So when a man feels no sexual attraction towards women, he can still lead a happy, loving life without engaging in sex. As a matter of fact, there are definite spiritual benefits to conserving sexual energy. The challenge to you is whether you'll overcome the temptation to give in to reckless, unnatural sexual pleasures, or whether you're morally strong enough to resist and thereby build a strong character. You may ask, what's the point of building a strong character in this morally corrupt world? Why should you give up your physical pleasure? The reason, brother, is because a moral character is your only key to true love, divine unity. Many homosexuals use the word love to refer to their relationships. This is not love. It's a self-deception necessary to justify their failure to rise up to the challenge and overcome the easy temptations of homosexuality. Just like in the case of rape, pedophilia, etc., it takes no effort whatsoever to give in to these temptations. They are the ultimate mark of irresponsibility. It takes more strength and courage to get up in the morning and go to work than it does to wait at a dark corner and rob an old lady. Similarly it's a sign of moral weakness and irresponsibility to find other weak men and engage in individually unhealthy and societally harmful acts. It's much more responsible to resist the temptation. It's a question of whether or not you're up to the challenge to face it courageously and overcome it, or take the easy way and give in to it without a struggle. As to the question of whether you'll be doomed forever, no, it's impossible for any black person to be doomed. All the evil acts we engage in during this 6,000-year cycle were introduced to us by the light-skinned races. They were unknown to us before then. We only came here to prove that God can overcome all challenges, whether it's the challenge of slavery or attempted genocide meant to destroy us as a nation, or the challenge of homosexuality meant to morally bankrupt us as individuals. If you don't overcome your challenges here, you'll overcome them in Yahweh's heavens, but at a greater cost. This is not a punishment but a choice, because ultimately you are one of the B8M gods, and no one can punish God. Peace bro. I appreciate you getting back to me and answering my question in full. Perhaps it will take me a lifetime to consider the weights of my decisions in this world. Keep doing what you do brother and again I appreciate the knowledge that you are spreading. I for one have benefited.